Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wa al-mursaleen. Sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Welcome. Alhamdulillah. I hope you're all doing well. This is our second session since post-Ramadan and mashallah, we're in the uh, month of the Al-Hijjah. Um, this is the second official day, uh, inshallah. All of you are well and enjoying this Mubarak time. I didn't realize it was going to be the Al-Hijjah last time, but alhamdulillah, you know, what we shared last time, for those of you who were uh, with us or weren't with us, I'll just kind of recap. We talked about the effects of post Ramadan, you know, where we are spiritually. And so I just read from something that I had created. It's just a little short list of 10 qualities that are helpful to know if you are growing spiritually or not. So I read from that. Um, and so Alhamdulillah, here we are, it's a little hijjah. And I mean, it's kind of um, time, you know, it makes you think about how time moves so quickly sometimes. And of course, there's periods where time is stretched for us. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to stretch these next uh, Mubarak nights for all of us and days for all of us so that we can really maximize the benefit. I um, actually wanted to start off with a few uh, hadith just to you know get our hearts prepared um, on Dhul Hijjah, but then just to give you the agenda for today. Uh, interesting that I said agenda, but um, there is a text. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but it's a a transformative, life-changing text. So in a similar vein to what we talked about last time, which is really looking at the trajectory of our spiritual path, kind of assessing whether or not we're growing or not, we I wanted to continue that conversation, but in a more proactive way. So I'm going to be reading selections from a text called Agenda to Change Our Condition. And I'll go ahead and show you an image of the book if you don't have it, I highly recommend this textbook. Um, the authors are Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and Imam Zaid Shakir. Uh, of course, alhamdulillah, for those of us in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, we, we are very uh, familiar with both of these uh, incredible gems. May Allah preserve them and protect them. But this work is um, one of, I think, you know, there's certain things in the, in the uh, Muslim Home Library that, that I think every Muslim Home Library should have, certain books. Of course, the Quran, Hadith, but there's certain transformative texts that, for all ages, really in many ways, um, they're relevant. You could always, uh, you know, use them to educate your families, to come together for discussions, for individual uh, reading. So this is one of those texts, and so I'll get into that um, for the majority of the discussion. But let's go ahead and start off by just reflecting on some Hadith about this month, inshallah. I'm going to screen share. So I will go ahead and I, I want to, you guys to have a visual. I know sometimes when people are reading, it's hard to follow along if you don't have that. So I prepared some slides. So I'll go ahead and screen share here. And um, let me see, Bismillah. <clears throat> I hope you guys can see this. All right, don't do that. So inshallah, you guys can see where we are here. Um, and your everything is clear for you. But this is the list that I read from last week, um, or it was two weeks ago, excuse me, two weeks ago from today, we read from this list. Like I said, I created this image, created the list based on just some of the readings that I've had of, of different scholars where they talk about spiritual growth. And so came up with this short list just to give us, you know, some guy, some something to test whether or not we're really growing spiritually. You're free to uh, tune into that session. It's up on the MCC website, alhamdulillah, if you want to listen to that talk. But this is the slide that accompanies that talk. Unfortunately, I didn't have it last time on hand, but I wanted to provide it at least here. So let's go ahead and look at the virtues of this beautiful time of the year for all of us. Um, you know, it's amazing when you think about how many opportunities we have every day and throughout the year where Allah subhanahu wa is in many ways throwing us a lifeline spiritually. Ramadan is certainly a big one and all of us are so uh, in need of those 30 days to really renew our faith, to commit, to get into good habits. But as we talked about last time, it's very normal because the ego is so strong and we don't have the incredible um, gift that we have gotten, that we, uh, we had for so long and maybe even took for granted, may Allah forgive us, of our jama'ah, right? 
the Jama'a in many ways other than this virtual space has been taken from most of us now for months and it's uh, been very spiritually taxing. I've heard from many people who are struggling with prayers, uh, struggling with hijab, struggling with different spiritual uh, works, because, even reading the Quran because what they had before, this consistent weekly at least dosage of whether it was Salatul Jama'a or programs at the masjid where they could see community members they no longer have that, and then it's difficult to manage the online uh, classes, even though, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, we still have um, a great many teachers and organizations that are still providing programs. Of course, MCC is included among them. May Allah protect and preserve all of uh, the staff and everybody involved with MCC for, for facilitating. But still, people are feeling the effects of this quarantine that has just stretched out for so long. And so the spiritual Real, or the reality is that many people are spiritually in those in that um, you know that, that state of just vacillating between um, you know uh, with highs and lows and, and that's natural. So here, Subhanallah, a few uh, a couple months after Ramadan ends, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gives us this next great windfall, spiritual windfall of the Hijjah of the first ten days. So Alhamdulillah, this is again from the mercy of uh, of our Lord. And when you reflect on the hadith and you realize what uh, an opportunity this is, then it makes you it kind of reinvigorates you, you know, and inshallah, we need to, we need that. We need that reinvigoration whenever we find ourselves slipping and just sort of losing momentum. So alhamdulillah for our deen, alhamdulillah for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his generosity for blessing us to witness these Mubarak days. May we make the most of them. So let's look at what the Prophet ﷺ told us. He said here, in this first hadith, <clears throat> the Prophet ﷺ said, There are no days in which righteous deeds are more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than in these 10 days. So, mashallah, um, you know, having ha made Hajj, I know from personal experience, the preparation of the excitement in the heart of the believer who's going for the journey of Hajj is uh, it's really hard to capture in words. Uh, for those who've been, you know what I'm talking about. Even for Umrah, any time you visit the sacred cities, but Hajj has a distinct quality of excitement, fear. There's just so much emotion preparing for that. But um, again, just reflecting on the mercy of Allah that he has made this period accessible to not just the Hajjaj and those on the journey, but for all of us in order of maximizing our our uh, our deeds and the potential of of of, uh, of you know of uh, amassing as many rewards as we possibly can. So Subhanallah, we have to reflect on that because you know every year I'm sure. Well, this with the exception of this year, every year there's always that um, you know feeling from those who are left behind, like wanting so much, yearning so much to be able to make this journey, whether it's Hajj or Umrah, but especially during this this month. And so the fact that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala uh, kind of levels the playing field, if you would, by telling us that all of our righteous deeds are, are beloved to Allah subhanahu wa in this time more than any other time, to me is just such a profound thing and something we should not take for granted, which means really being mindful of what we're doing in this time. You know, so this is the period of time where you want to make sure you're not squandering it on anything that's wasteful. Um, you know, doing things that are no benefit or just engaging in, uh, in wrong deeds obviously would be um, reprehensible more so in this time than any other time because of the sanctity of this time. So you want to really watch yourself and say, what am I going to do in the next eight days now that we're in the second you know, day already? What's my plan? Or do I have a goal? You know, much some of the sisters on some of these threads that I'm, I'm you know, we're all on WhatsApp threads, um, but I received from a couple of sisters this uh, Dhul Hijjah PDF and it was really like a chart or a way of keeping yourself motivated every single day of, the, of these 10 days. And I thought that was really great, especially for young children to get involved if, if you want to start uh, creating that system of, of, you know, just holding yourself uh, to account or having accountability, right? Because if you have a chart or something where you're writing things down, it's really easy to see your progress and it's good to get the kids started on something like that early. Similar to how we do it uh, for Ramadan, right? We have the Ramadan calendars and a lot of parents get their kids excited with incentives and things like that. We can do the same for this period of the month. 
So taking yourself into account, setting some goals, what are you planning to do? If you're gonna to plan to read more Quran, are you doing selected uh, prayers or making up for missed prayers? Um, are you planning to do anything, attending classes? Something of virtue uh, or the more the merrier, right? But really thinking um, for the next few days what, or eight days or so, what is your plan and, and taking advantage of the potential of it. The next hadith here we have, uh, the Prophet said, uh, or was reported to have said, there are no days greater and more beloved to Allah than these 10 days of the Hijjah. So increase in them your declaration of the oneness of Allah, right? La ilaha illallah. Uh, your exaltation of him, so any praise of him, right? SubhanAllah. And your praise of him, alhamdulillah, right? All of the adhkar that we know, the dhikr, the tasbih that we would do on a normal, even more so during this Mubarak time. And in the last hadith here, the Prophet ﷺ said, no good deeds can be done at a time better than these first 10 days of the hijjah And one of the Sahaba asked, not even jihad in the way of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ said, not even jihad in the way of Allah. Again, telling us, how important it is that we take advantage of this windfall of the hijjah and not uh, take it for granted. I know, as I said before, we're all in a slump physically, emotionally, mentally because of the uh, difficulty of this quarantine and maybe other uh, personal issues that people are going with. But uh, the case remains that, or the fact still remains that this is a, uh, an incredible time for all of us to reconnect, maybe get capture what we, we're missing from Ramadan. So inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unify our hearts and really help us to set some practical um, and sustainable goals. You know, you don't want to go uh, too to, to the extreme when you're setting goals for this type of stuff. You want to have practical goals and really listen to yourself and, and work consistently. That's the most important thing, creating habits, spiritual habits that are consistent, even if they're smaller, as we know from the hadith, is better than trying to do too much and then just tapping out or burning out afterwards and leaving it all behind. So we wanna avoid extremes. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us balance and uh, bring our hearts together. So I just wanted to put these reminders um, as we continue the conversation for all of us to reflect on. And so that when we leave this uh, short time that we have together, we have uh, some goals in mind or we start to prepare for some goals inshallah. So with that said, I think this uh, book, Agenda to Change Our Condition, is quite fitting because it really is about helping us to formulate uh, better habits. And there are so many treasures in this book. Um, I, I actually considered starting in a sort of chronological order from the beginning, but I thought about, let's go to the back, actually. I'm going to do something a little different, and I have my own reasons for that, but I really think that we, in order to set on the spiritual path um, and really commit to, to doing something that is consistent and transformative, we have to consider everything in front of us, you know, the, the, what the options are or what, what we're setting out to do. Sort of like when you prepare for travel, right? You have to really think about what your, where your destination is, what you're going to do to prepare for that. Um, and this text, mashallah, from the beginning, it kind of dives right into a lot of uh, very obviously beneficial things. But I feel like the back of the book um, where the appendix uh, is, um, has a lot of great advice. And I, the more advice, uh, the better, right? Especially because we are, um, we're just so bereft. Uh, and uh, you know, there's reasons for that. This is a very difficult time uh, in, in the world. And many of us don't have, as I said, access like we, uh, normally would, or we just simply don't. There are a lot of people I know, sisters and brothers in communities that are far away. They don't have access to teachers. So that's why they're so, um, mashallah, grateful for these types of programs because they really don't have that support system in place. But the more we can learn from our uh, predecessors before us, our spiritual guides before us, the better. So in the back of this book, we have Appendix A, is actually advice from Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, who was a, uh, a, a great scholar and a saint. And he has uh, many different wonderful, um, there's just so much guidance here. So in the time that we have, I'm gonna 
try to t uh, time myself as much as possible, you know, be, uh, be a, uh, try to watch the clock because I can get ahead of myself and not go overboard, but I will, um, go through some of the advice he has. And then whatever we don't complete today, if we can't get to all of it, inshallah, we'll continue um, in our next meeting, which will be two weeks from now. So for those of you, again, who are joining and may not be clear, normally when we do these halakas with the sisters, it was once a month, but for the time being anyway, during this quarantine, we're gonna do them twice a month. So every other week. So we'll be back in two weeks, but let's go ahead and go to the next slide where inshallah, you will see, um, Here's the title of the book. Again, for those who don't have the book, I highly recommend that you get it. Um, you can check Sandala, uh, which is the main publisher, um, and uh, find it there. If you have a local bookstore, inshallah, it's always great to support the local businesses. Um, so check it out there. But this is the name and the authors. So let's go ahead and look at this advice that Sidi Ahmed Zarouk gives us. So this um the first what i like about the way that he structured his advice just to give you a little bit of context before i jump in is that he separates things in fives okay so you'll see as we continue with the slides that there are five uh you know pieces of advice and then each advice is sort of built upon uh what or how should i say it's kind of going backwards like this right here this first slide is the path is the goal right it's the spiritual path so he lays out what the foundations of the path are first in the way, and we'll get to the, the details. But then the next slide, he describes to us how we get to these five. And then the, uh, then the slide after that, or the, the list after that, is how you get to the, the five before. So it's kind of like, in a way, working backwards and deconstructing the spiritual path. But I think it's really brilliantly done because there's so much food for thought and so much uh, content that we can really use for a discussion. So if we look here, he starts off and says, the foundations of our path are five. So first is mindfulness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala privately and publicly. So if you want to be on a spiritual path and really be committed and devoted, this is the most essential point that you are a consistent person in your mindfulness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, from the hadith of Jibreel, we understand the difference between Islam, Iman, and Ihsan, right? Ihsan is to imagine that you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowing you can't see him, but also being aware that he sees you. This is what Jibreel alayhi salam revealed to us so that we understand that is the ultimate goal. Islam, of course, is important. It's, you know, it's actions, right? It's it's a showing display of your faith. Uh, Iman is, cent is what, you're, you know, what you believe in. So of course, those are all essentials. But to take your faith to the next level is to have that awareness at all times. And that, that you're so you know, thinking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether you are uh, with uh, people and they're watching you or not, it doesn't matter, even in the most intimate, isolated moments of your day, that you are aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you um, seek to please him, obviously, but that you have that presence. Um, so I kind of, uh, I've been teaching uh, through the Rahma Foundation, alhamdulillah, for the summer school program, and we've been teaching teens. So we also covered this text. And one of the ways I tried to explain um, how this works, this concept of thinking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is kind of imagining like a cloud above your head that is always telling you uh, to remember Allah, right? The cloud itself has some message, but there's a cloud that follows you everywhere you go. And even though you don't see it in front of you uh, because it's not right in front of you, you have this clear presence that it's above you. Uh, you feel the cloud above you, right? Um, and so that's kind of how you want to imagine this mindset, this consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it doesn't leave you at any point. You're always aware that it's there. And, it, and, and so uh, this analogy of the cloud is useful because sometimes we're distracted by things in front of us, right? That's the dunya. This is the whole test that we're all under is that the dunya is, uh, it bedazzles us. It, 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 it takes us away from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But our objective as believers is to always even in that, those experiences when we're, there, things are trying to pull us away, that we check in regularly, right? 
So we're, the, the cloud doesn't move, it's always there, but we have to also be cognizant of the cloud and bring awareness into our mind of the cloud. So we look up to make sure that it's there, it will be there, but it's just that it's on us. The onus is on us because if we don't do that regularly, right? If we become deluded by all of the distractions around us and we forget the presence of the cloud, then clearly, we uh, will get sucked into whatever it is that's pulling us away. But our responsibility is that we have to actively become aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this way, that we look up and that we realize that his presence is there. And uh, you know, I, I'm speaking not physically, right? We're not placing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a physical space, but I'm talking about the consciousness, the, the awareness of the mind, right? That Allah is always there. So, but having that in public and private space, Okay. And um, he says here, I'm just going to read the commentary. Mindfulness of Allah is realized through scrupulousness and uprightness, right? So this is being scrupulous, being constantly aware of oneself and uh, always, uh, uh, you know, putting the standard uh, of uh, having high standards, right? You're not uh, taking it, uh, taking these matters lightly. So really do your, doing your due diligence and being upright. And then the next point is adherence to the sunnah in word and deed. So this is another very important component. Um, I was speaking to a friend earlier, uh, and we were just having a conversation. But I just said, we have to be willing to always redirect uh, the lens back on ourselves or, or you know, to hold ourselves accountable for the things that we say and the things that we claim. So when we claim to love the Prophet ﷺ, it's easy to say on the tongue, right? But the proof of the claim is in word and action. And so if we don't adhere to his sunnah, if we prefer our own way over his way, then we cannot make that same claim of devotion and love. It's not consistent. If you truly are devoted to him and you truly love him, uh, it's not enough to just weep at the mention of his name or listening to a nasheed or a qasida and your heart moves or doing salawat and you are just repeating it. Those are good th things uh, in and of themselves. But the proof of true devotion, of true love is whether or not you apply his sunnah to your own life. So adhering to his sunnah in word and deed if you're truly wanting to be on the spiritual path, that, that is a foundational principle. You cannot uh, be on the path and, and not be consistent with that. And so he says here um, that adherence to the sunnah through caution and excellent character. Caution and excellent character, right? Thinking about always, what would the Prophet ﷺ do? How, would he be pleased with me, right? And preferring always to have the most beautiful character in every situation. I'll tell you, yesterday, um, my kids were watching the uh, Celebrate Mercy broadcast. And uh, it was uh, Osad, uh, Sidi Hisham Mahmoud and Sheikh Yasser Fahmi. And they were both teaching last night during a class of Surat Al-Mulk. I uh, encourage those of you who don't know to look that class up. It's a wonderful program. It's actually going to be happening soon, uh, but 7.30, I think, to 8.30 or 9 every night. Um, so anyhow, he was, they, they were watching it, and both of the brothers, mashallah, you know, they were in totally uh, prophetic character and the way that they were speaking to each other. So much adab, uh, just preferring one another, just really beautiful display. But my son... Because he was looking at it as a, he didn't understand like how they were so nice to each other, thinking that they were maybe not, they didn't really know each other. You know, it's normal to expect that from uh, from family or from really close friends. But he just thought this is these are two teachers and they're just teaching in class. So he was a little like you know curious, like wow, they're just so nice to each other. And I reminded him, this is the prophetic way. This is the beautiful character of our Prophet Sallallahu that they are displaying. MashaAllah, may Allah protect and preserve them. So we have to you know, continue with that in our own practice. Um, and also I would add to, to this in public and in private. So in our homes and when we're out and about in the company of other people. Um, then we have the next, which is, 
indifference to the acceptance or rejection of others. This is also, subhanAllah, really uh, profound because we're living in a time and era where people pleasing is rampant. And many people sometimes even prefer to please people before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's, you know, they, they're not, they're thinking short term versus long term. So this is where a person may, for, for example, be out with their friends and, you know, adults and youth. I think everybody in between has possibly either been in the situation before or, or you know, close to it. But uh, the prayer, time for prayer comes. You could be out with your friends or even in a social setting, right? A party, a dinner party, um, some, somewhere where, where you may choose to prefer to just keep the peace or, you know, not ruin the fun. Um, and so prayer comes in and you think to yourself, it's okay, I'll pray when I get home later. How many people have done that in our community, right? And we know that Allah Father created us for nothing else but to worship him. But we've gotten into the state of, you know, political correctness or social, you know, anxiety where you just start to think that if you do something and you uh, have, you know, say something, speak up, right, about something that's important, that it might cost you socially. So you retreat, you don't say anything at all. And it's usually because you're too preoccupied with being accepted or rejected by other people. So the believer is not worried about that. The sincere believer always thinks about the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knowing full well that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with them, then everything else will fall into place, right? That whole worry, gain, the, the anxiety that people get caught up in worrying about relationships, worrying about impressing other people, worrying about being included in groups or, or what have you, comes from a place of deep insecurity. But the believer who has strong faith and who prioritizes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in every instance do, isn't afflicted with that because they know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will, uh, you know, he can, he can do anything and he can turn these people's hearts this way or that way. As long as we focus on pleasing him, we don't worry about the, the, the people or anyone else. So really having that concrete, uh, like your focus is, is on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not worrying about other people. So he sa says here, um, indifference to the acceptance or rejection of others through patience and trust, right? So that's what it is. That trust is that confidence, that lack of insecurity, and that patience that, you know, just because someone may not understand you, you uh, uh, or, or not agree with you now, give people time, you know, there's time. Some people need time to process things, but you have to have that trust. Um, we were speaking again earlier during this uh, class with, with the teen girls, and one of the girls asked about, you know, what do you do about hijab? You know, if you want to wear hijab, but your father um, is, you know, isn't, uh, is worried about your safety and security. And so Shaitan, of course, would make that situation for that person black and white. Well, you can't do anything to change your dad, so forget about it. But being patient with people who may not accept something you want to do, even if it's obedience to Allah, in this case anyway, is, is wise, right? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can turn their, their heart eventually, but you have to be patient and strategic and wise and you know, have that emotional intelligence to know how to handle that situation, but not to give up. Same with converts, right? Many converts enter the faith and their parents or their family members in, in the beginning may reject them. But we have to be patient because they're, they might not accept you, but their hearts are in, you know, they're with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that he can do anything. And how many people have come af after some time to say, you know, I, my parents were so against this faith. And now a year later or three months later, my mom wants to take shahada, my dad, my brother, you know, Allah can do anything, subhanAllah. So we have to just have that confidence in him, trust in him, and be patient, not to rush things, right? But really not to be moved or swayed by people. It's all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we have, um, he has here, satisfaction with Allah in hardship and ease. This is also incredibly important. If you are on this path and you want to be sincere on this path, you have to accept that this world is a place of tribulation and that just as our 
prophets and the saints and the great people before us bore their tests with patience. We have to learn from their example and we have to always, always make sure that whether we have uh, hardship or ease, that our opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not affected, right? We're not those like the fair weather friends who are only there when things are going good, but then they disappear when you're having hardships. What? Who wants a friend like that, right? Who wants anybody in their life like that who's only there for the party, but then when there's challenges and difficulties, they're, they've disappeared, right? Nobody wants that. So we should never be that way with our Lord. We have to always have the best opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that ultimately, even in those hardships that we endure, as long as we remain patient, that his pleasure, uh, to, to acquire his pleasure is worth every instance, every millisecond of pain and hardship that we endure because his rida is the, is the prize. So that's the kind of attitude you have. And similarly, when things are going in ease for you that you don't forget to remember and to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where you start to take things for granted. You know, as I said in the beginning, many of us just got so used to the liberties we had, um, whether it was traveling or ease of movement, you know, going in and out of the house, visiting our, um, our uh, friends and family, uh, going shopping, all the ease we had, the masjid, you know, being able to just, oh, I'm going to go pray, you know, Maghrib at the masjid or Fajr or Isha, inshallah, Fajr and Isha. But, you know, I'm going to go pray at the masjid. It was something that we just thought would, would always be consistent and available to us as long as we walked and drove over there. Well, here we are, right? Um, uh, that ease that we had, did we, we have to ask ourselves, with all of the ease that we were given, did we truly show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gratitude or did we just kind of take it as it's just, you know, it's what I deserve. Like it's, there's a form of entitlement almost, right? Privilege. This is what privilege is. When you forget that it's actually all a blessing. And even now, despite everything we're going through, the reality is the hardships we are enduring are nothing compared to what so many other people are suffering now, before us, after us. I mean, really, when we compare the lives that we have living in the West, living uh, for those of us who are here in California, it's one of the most coveted areas in the entire world. We really don't have much to complain about. So we are still in Netma, and we have to check ourselves whenever our nafs wants to take us into a dark place where we start to get ungrateful check for yourself. No, astaghfirullah, be grateful for my limbs. I mean, we have to, there's times during the day, if, if, it's, if this isn't something that's second nature to you, that you might have to just start doing, where you actually start to look at yourself in a way that is, you know, almost like you're outside of your body um, and, and you're observing yourself. Because that moment of just looking at your hands, for example, should really put you in a state of subhanallah, right? Just your hands alone are such a blessing. Um, your eyesight, sense of smell. So we could go through the entire body, right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us so much to be grateful for um, and, and continue. This is the process of gratitude. This is exactly how people who are, um, you know, trying to be grateful and always be mindful of their blessings. These are the practices it's taking account, it's, it's listing mentally or by hand, making actual lists or doing these type of exercises where you are becoming conscious of, of the blessings and bringing awareness to your blessings. So, you know, doing that as, as a regular consistent practice and, and not ever complaining to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, audhu billah from ever complaining about Allah or to Allah about what he's puts uh, us in. May Allah protect our hearts from being of those who complain to our Lord when he is so generous. Uh, the generosity of Allah is, is something we can't even measure, uh, we can't fathom, but may, seek protection from Allah from being of those who are ungrateful and complain, and rather um, ask him to make you of those who are patient, right? May Allah subhanahu wa make us all patient and grateful, right? So the last point here, he says, turning to Allah in prosperity and adversity. So similar, 
right? That whether or not from a material lens, you have prosperity, success, right? Everything's sort of going well for you. Uh, you have ample uh, wealth. You're able to, uh, you know, provide for yourself, your family, you have financial security, whether you're in that situation or you are in debt or experiencing uh, real challenges financially, that you, your protocol is to turn to him always in a state of immense gratitude and obligation, right? When you have wealth, it's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it's also a test. It's supposed to, you're supposed to do something with that wealth. And he's watching to see how you are responding, right? So you have to become aware that it's not just for me to enjoy this wealth and take advantage of this wealth, but I also have to respond in a way that pleases him the most. So it's an amana to have wealth. And that's where the turning uh, to Allah would take place that, Ya Allah, please guide my decisions with this wealth that you've given me. Please you know, be be pleased with me. Please don't take me into account. Purify my wealth. This is the type of mindset that one has when they have wealth. And when they have adversity, similar, they turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Allah, please increase my risk. Ya Allah, I have nothing without you. You are the one who sustains. You are the most generous. And really having that yaqeen that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to be able to provide for you. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nobody else will, will give you, and if he uses um, the means, obviously people can be the means to how that reaches you, but the source is always Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you, you have this solid in your mind uh, where it's just default, you know exactly what to do in these situations, and you don't stray from that. Um, and so Sidi Ahmed Zarouq, again, uh, on the last two points, he said that um, what, with the satisfaction with Allah and hardship, he says, satisfaction through acceptance of what one is given and consignment of one's affairs to Allah, and then turning to Allah through praise and gratitude in times of prosperity and through asylum with Allah in times of affliction. So he's uh, much more eloquent than I am in the way that he simplified that. But inshallah, it's the same message of really having uh, the proper response to these situations. So now, as I mentioned, if anybody's joining late, the way that this uh, this advice that Sidi Ahmed Zarouk has, construct, uh, has provided is, is constructed is that it has, uh, it's building upon itself. So we're going to deconstruct it in a way. We're going backwards. So these five foundations he starts with, then here we get here, where he gives us an insight on the qualities we need to have in order to get back to here, right? So we have to possess these and then we can get here. So I love again how he's done this um, and that's why I was really excited to share this with all of you. But let's look here, possessing celestial aspirations. I love his terminology because it's just so, it's enough, right? It's very, uh, it's, it's so telling, uh, it's clear, but just to offer a little bit more insight, you know, having high aspirations, this dunya, is not our goal. We don't plan for this world as the end all be all. You know, we just, there are people who are really focused on success in the dunya. And it's sad because they compromise their akhira for it. They're, they're that obsessed with material success that they'll compromise their akhira for it. Um, and so we want to have higher aspirations because if you really think about it, no matter what you achieve in a material way, it, it pales in comparison, pales in comparison to any type of success in the akhirah. And why? Because this life is fleeting, it's temporal, and it, it really, in, in the grand scheme of things, it's uh, very little weight, right, uh, in terms of, of, uh, of, of uh, what it means. It's not very meaningful. The weight of our deeds will be really realized in the next life. So you want to have celestial aspirations. Look beyond the material world. Look to the next world. How can I get to Jannah? How can I please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How can I be among those who love the Prophet and he loves them and that we are with him? How can I have the ultimate, ultimate prize ever that we could possibly fathom, which is the beatific vision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Jannah al How can we have that? How can I get there? What do I need to do to get there? 
So we don't look to this world and just think about degrees and money and homes and cars and wealth and accumulation of worldly things as being the, the drive that wakes us up every morning. You know, it's sad because for those of you anyway who are in California before all this happened, you know, I remember when I used to commute and go to work early when I used to work full time or part time, wherever I was working, um, I was always amazed that there were so many people on the streets so early in the morning because I would I had early shifts. So, you know, Fudger and then get, I'd have to go teach at a school or go to the office. But I was always a kind of an early riser. But I, it was kind of bittersweet. It was, it was heartbreaking, right? Because you realize while you were up early because Fajr came in and you were praying to Allah and now you're going to go get your sustenance, most people on the road with you driving on the freeway were likely doing many other things other than remembering Allah. They were maybe listening to the morning news or having their breakfast, curling their uh, hair, uh, having you know their coffee or uh, doing their makeup for two to three hours, but they weren't remembering Allah. And now they're on the streets in pursuit of their dunya. And so, you know, this is what a lot of people, like I said, they'll go to great lengths for the dunya, but when it comes to Allah, they're forgetful. So may Allah protect us from that, but always seeking higher goals, right? Then we have uh, preserving reverence for Allah. So key, you know, if you have a bad opinion or bad adab with Allah, it's going to be very difficult to elevate your spiritual path, right? If you start to question, like, you know, people, this is why it's so important to read the books, uh, like Purification of the Heart by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, because he will explain to you that displeasure with the divine decree is a disease of the heart. So anytime you ever say, why Allah? Why did you do this to me? That is having su'adhan of Allah. You are literally having a bad opinion of Allah. It's a disease of the heart. But how many times do people just become so loose with their tongues that they will say things like that because they're frustrated with the dunya or frustrated with something that didn't go their way. And so they end up in many ways, I, this is my opinion anyway, but I think they anthropomorphize Allah because when you start to speak to Allah in those human terms, you're forgetting that he is the Lord and master of the universe. He is the one who created everything in existence. You cannot talk to the creator of the universe in that way. Humble yourself as the stars and the mountains and all of the celestial beings and everything in creation, the fish in the sea and the rocks and the trees and the great prophets before, like all of the greatest things in this existence have prostrated and, and humbled themselves before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here we are in 2020, because, uh, you know, in many ways, we've reached the height of human arrogance with, with uh, the modern, you know, scientific sort of mindset that we all have acquired that where we think we can talk to about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this way. We have to really make astaghfir from that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above everything. Uh, and uh, when we say Allahu Akbar, we, we have to mean that literally. Allahu Akbar, he deserves the best of the best of the best of the best and nothing less. And even if you're going through really difficult times, and I, I'm not saying this uh, you know, from a soapbox. I hope people understand. I have been through challenges in life. Uh, and so I'm, I'm speaking from lived experiences of, I know it's difficult when you're going through a test to see the silver lining, to see what could possibly be the wisdom of this. Ya Allah, I didn't plan for this. I didn't ask for this. I've had some people come to me and say, I made a sakhara and you know, how could this happen? Subhanallah, you know, this is why suhba is so important. If you don't watch the company that you keep and you don't have the teachers who reorient, reorient you when you're getting out of line to remind you, wait, wait, wait a second, who do you think you are, right? Who do you think you are when you have prophets who suffered for decades, who suffered immense, uh, you know, things that most of us couldn't even fathom being ostracized, being pushed away, having stricken with disease and illness, having your children taken from you or killed, uh, so much betrayal. Our own beloved Sallallahu look what he endured. So we have to really ask ourselves, who do I think I am that I can you know, have this attitude that tells me that I deserve everything a certain way and if I don't get that way, I can go back to Allah and challenge him 
right? Billah, and question him in this way of, I don't deserve this. Astaghfirullah. It's uh, from Iblis, those thoughts. And so we have to reject that. And this is why when you commit to this path, you have to understand we are asked about everything that we do because we were brought into existence by Allah and He, we were nothing and he brought us into existence. And then he gave us the incredible gift of existence. It's a gift of consciousness of to be aware of him. He gave us life. He gave us all that for one reason, which was to worship him. And then he told us we will be held accountable for what we do. And it's pretty simple formula, right? Um, but we are not, it's not equal. We, this isn't an equal relationship where we can question Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on what he's decreed for us. Rather, we surrender. We submit, Ya Allah, I don't know what's good for me. I have no clue. But if you're putting me through this challenge, even though I am frustrated, I'm angry, and you can feel those emotions, sometimes people are testing you. Maybe you're in your family. There's relationships that are testing you. You're not a robot to turn off that emotion. So feel the emotion, but assigning blame to Allah, that's where we have to be very careful. So we never assign any negative emotion or blame to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We accept if he's given us something, whether it's a, you know, a positive thing or, uh, you know, something about a blessing or a tribulation that there's always khair in it, always. It's just a promise, right? Because he knows better. So having that vision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always with, as they say, rose-colored glasses, always husnavan, never even entertaining a negative thought about Allah is so key and so important. Um, and so the next is excelling in service of others. So again, if you want to be on the spiritual path and you want to, and you're sincere in your desire to be on the spiritual path, you have to be willing to sacrifice your ego, your comforts, um, and to think of the other, right? Self-centered people are not spiritually very successful because it's not the prophetic way. The Prophet was in khidmah all the time. He was always caring for people, always taking care of everyone. So you can't try to you know, be on his path, but not uh, be, be up for service of other people, right? And always thinking of your own self. It just doesn't work. It's not consistent. Um, then he says, fulfilling, uh, fulfilling one's results, right? Uh, whatever resolutions that you have. So if you commit to something or you say you're going to do something, take your word seriously. Um, follow through. Again, this is just a very difficult time in existence because uh, people do a lot of lip service. They say a lot of things. They promise things that they can't come deliver. Um, and so we want to be very careful of falling into any of that type of behavior where we are very lofty in our goals and aspirations, but then when it com comes time to execute them, we kind of give up. So hold yourselves to account. And of course, you know, when there's uh, moments of weakness, that, that's normal. Don't be too hard on yourself, but look at it like something you still have to achieve. I said it, I have to follow through. If I said it, my word is serious. I'm, if, even if it takes me a lifetime, I'm going to do it. Uh, because I committed to it, right? Oaths are important to, and we value them. So fulfilling one's resolves and then um, exalting one's blessings, right? Being always in a state of gratitude. You, as we said earlier, if you cannot, uh, if it takes you a long time to think of your blessings, it's probably because you don't reflect on them enough. But if if you were asked quickly, could you give me 30 of the things that you are the most grateful for in like five minutes? If that was an exercise that you were asked to do and it took you more than five minutes to do, you need to be better. You should be able to list quickly every single blessing that you can, I mean, it should just come to you quickly because it's a habit. It's something that you reflect on enough. But I've been in those situations. You know, I do a lot of group work. So I've sometimes given exercises like that for people. And of course, I understand not everybody... Um, you know, people process information differently. Some people are very quick and they can list things out fast. 
other people might take their time. But the point is, is you have to ask yourself, am I doing this exercise of being able to really show my gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for different things enough? Uh, or is recall difficult for me because I don't do it enough? I might know the big things like, oh yeah, I'm grateful for my health, for my family. We have the cliche pat responses that everybody knows, right? But I'm talking about detail. I'm talking about Things like, you know, our teachers, mashallah, would remind us, like Shahamza would talk about eyelashes, you know, like think about eyelashes. That is something when, who, who thinks about eyelashes? Like who, who sits there and, and reflects like, wow, what a blessing it is that I have eyelashes. Unless, except for the person who thinks about eyelashes, right? If you're, if you're aware because you're purposely bringing things into your consciousness to think about, wow. I should be grateful for this. You're going to do it. But if you've never done that before, then it wouldn't occur to you to be grateful for your eyelashes or grateful for, you know, uh, saliva, right? Grateful for the hairs in your nose. These are things that we don't think about when we think about gratitude. Like I said, we think about the big obvious things, but there are so many more things that we should be grateful for uh, that when you start to compare yourself to people who don't have those things, then it suddenly hits you, right? Like, oh, wow. When you watch a documentary, for example, on someone who lost, is a paraplegic and they lost their limbs, all of a sudden, everybody becomes super grateful for the ability to move and walk and run. But maybe without watching something like that, we don't even think about it. So this is, you know, something we have to take seriously enough where it's automatic. We don't have to deliberate heavily on it. It's not something that takes a long time. So being in the habit of, all, of, of being uh, able to recall your blessings. And he just says in his commentary quickly, for the first point, possessing celestial aspirations, he says, when one aspires to heights, one station rises. Subhanallah. Again, <laughs> I can't even compete. I won't even try to how beautifully he captures each of these points. You know, you, you want to rise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or you want you have that as your goal Allah will elevate you right um, when one preserves Allah's sanctity one's sanctity is preserved subhanallah so beautiful we all want to be you know uh, saved and and have that that safety and that just uh feeling of of sakina <coughs> excuse me so how do we do that well we we of course have uh, we preserve the reverence for Allah. When one excels in service, one's standing is assured. So when you put other people before uh, yourself, excuse me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be pleased with you. So you are in at that safe, safe state. When one fulfills resolutions, one's guidance continues. So subhanAllah, the more you are hold yourself accountable for those things that you um, say that you're going to do and that you commit to doing and you follow through, Allah subhanahu wa draws you nearer and nearer and your guidance continues. It's a, that's the, the byproduct of that, mashallah. And then when one exalts blessings, one is grateful and gratitude in, ensures increase from the ever giving in accord with his sincere promise. So subhanAllah, Allah is a, again reminding us how generous he is because by telling us that the more grateful you are, the more he will add, increase us. It's just a proof of 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 his uh, of why he is uh, to be worshipped as he deserves because there's just you know his praises are innumerable but we have to look at these things as as reasons for us to reflect and to follow through so subhanallah now as I mentioned these five precede qualities precede the five foundations that I mentioned earlier, right? So in order to get to, sorry, the slide shows a little slow at the moment. Let me see, I'm trying to move the slide. Okay, so in order to get to here, we need these, right? But how do we get here? Well, we need these. So you see how it works? We're going backwards, right? So let's look at <clears throat> what he has to say. And I know we have just a couple of minutes left, so, or a few minutes left, so I'll try to be quick. But he has here um, the five foundations of proper conduct. So first, pursuing knowledge to fulfill the sacred affair. Really important, right? We want to pursue knowledge. Um, and we have to be serious in our commitment to pursuing knowledge. We can't just uh, say we want to be on a spiritual path, but be 
you know, negligent or ignorant and, you know, kind of accept that. As I say, ignorance is bliss. No, that's not right. And we will be held accountable. We're in the West. We all have access to knowledge, even if we are not in communities where maybe they have Islamic centers and teachers. We still have access to knowledge through this very medium that we're on right now, the internet. So we really have to take seriously the pursuit of knowledge and, and be consistent in that. Um, accompanying a spiritual guide and a fraternity to gain insight. You know, not only should we seek knowledge, but we should seek knowledge from the correct sources. There's a lot of people out there um, who presume to have uh, knowledge and to, and they, uh, you know, they amass a following and, and, you know, Allah will judge them. But it's very important that you recognize who the true scholar is or who the, who a qualified teacher is versus someone who, may have ulterior motives um, and you know that's there's a way to vet teachers finding out where they've studied who they studied with whether or not their sources are authentic you know we have to do that do due diligence uh, because there are people unfortunately who take advantage of other people uh, the, with with faith they're charlatans out there so you have to be really careful um, before you just take someone's word or or follow them and then also you want to follow or you want to have a group that you are able to lean on as well. So that, because in our own minds, sometimes when we're processing knowledge or taking knowledge, we might come to conclusions, but it's really helpful to have a jama, a group maybe that you're studying with to bounce off ideas, to share ideas and to gain from their wisdom and knowledge and vice versa. And not to take this, uh, endeavor as, 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 as something that you do alone, because shaitan draws to those who are always uh, alone in, in things, you know, so you want to lean on the jama'ah, but seek those uh, people who are trustworthy, inshallah, and vet people correctly. Um, next, abandoning dispensations and excuses for one's own protection. So, you know, there's... Um, <clears throat> A lot of times we're easy on ourselves, right? We let the ego uh, make excuses and we take the shortcuts and we find loopholes so that things are made easy for us. You want to really be careful of doing that where you are uh, cherry picking things and you're not consistent. It's just all about ease for you because now your nafs is in control, right? So really being careful of that. Managing one's time for litanies that result in the presence of the heart. So litanies are prayers, right? Formulaic prayers that we do, um, all taken from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, and they include all of the daily protective du'as that he left for us. Uh, throughout history, different scholars created their own formulas of how to take his prayers and adopt them during the day. So some would, you know, have selective prayers in a certain, you know, as I said, a formula, um, and they were different. So you, there's the word the Latif by Imam al Haddad is one of the more common ones that our teachers uh, have told us. But Imam al Nawi has them. There's other scholars who have their own awrad or litany. But in here, managing one's time for litanies, making sure that you are doing them, but not doing them where you are not you've lost mindfulness right of what you're saying making sure that it's um, an exercise where you're truly aware of the purpose of it so when you're listening to the web or you're reading the web you're citing the word whatever you're doing that you're bringing those words into your consciousness that you're really internalizing the meanings um, and focusing it's not just words coming out of your mouth that you don't know what you're saying like many of us in our prayers this is a challenge uh, for all everybody gets distracted which is normal but many people have a very hard time connecting to the prayer because they don't know the words so that's always the starting place if you're having a hard time connecting to your prayer maybe you need to look into the deeper meanings of what you're saying and uh, be able to recall all of those meanings while you're reciting. But if you if it's just a foreign language to you, it's gonna be hard. So really having presence of heart when you're doing those litanies. And then guarding against the ego to free it of whims and save it from destructive tendencies. The nafs is, uh, works against us, right? It's a part of us that works against us. 
it is uh, very, it, it's the portal or the access point for Iblis, you know, to, to, to really reach us. So we have to be very careful and make sure that we can control it and command it. And that's what the whole Tasqiyat and Nafs process is, is to become so aware of one's nafs that you're able to dictate to it instead of letting it always dictate to you. So an example would be, um, you wake up, uh, let's say Fajr alarm goes off or maybe even before Fajr, you know, let's say Fajr now in, in where I am, I think it comes in like around 4.55, 4.56, something like that, very close to the 5 a.m. mark. But if you wake up at 4.30, your eyes are wide open. At that point, your nafs is going to battle you because there's a part of you that is awake and maybe even aware that it's earlier than Fajr. And maybe the thought may occur to you, you should get up, right? You should get up. Um, this is a Mubarak time. This is counted still as the Hajjad. Even though it's 30 minutes more till Fajr, you should get up. If that thought comes to you, you want to look at it that maybe that was my angel. My, you know, I have angels that are around me, or maybe it was an invitation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like who Allah knows, right? We have different inspirations that reach us, the khawatir, right? So that internal dialogue of maybe I should get up versus what the nafs is gonna tell you. It's you got 30 minutes, it's way too early. You have to go to work after that. You have a, a morning meeting later, you gotta catch up on your sleep, otherwise you're gonna be groggy, you're gonna be cranky. And so you start to confuse, you know, uh, make a really good argument for why you should remain in bed, right? Now, remember, this is your nafs working against you, um, but of course, Iblis will, would, uh, you know, monopolize or, or, or uh, pounce on that opportunity because it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to completely make you miss your prayer. How many people has that happened to where they delude themselves to thinking that they'll just wake up for Fajr or set the alarm you know, at Fajr time, okay, I woke up, my alarm hasn't gone off yet, it's okay, I'll just close my eyes and wake up when the alarm goes off. But what happens to them, right? They don't hear the alarm, because you've woken up, and now you're going to enter your deep sleep again. And deep sleep for some people, they're logs, even like if there was, you know, a fire bell, some people can sometimes sleep through really intense sounds like that, because they're just so in their deep sleep. The point I'm making is that we are presented with opportunities like that all the time where the nafs is battling us because we have the ruh, which is always longing to, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wanting to do the right thing. And then we have the lower self. And when those two are at it, you'll, you have to pay attention because whenever you don't do what you know you should do, your ego has won. And so that means that if that's a constant, then you are... Your ego dictates to you. But when you can push yourself out of bed in that example I gave, even though you are so tired and you are warm and it's so comfortable, but you throw off your covers and you change your body position quickly and you force your body out of that bed, that is you dictating to your ego because it's going to not want you to do that. And then when you go make wudu, it's a whole other experience, right? The hadith is clear what happens when the person wakes up and the knots are untied. Uh, but the point is, is, you know, this is, this is our jihad every single day. So guarding against the ego um, to free its winds. So much wisdom, and there's a lot more to cover. Uh, subhanallah, Sidi Ahmed Zarouk, he again, um, may Allah bless him, has given us so much to reflect on and to think about. Uh, this is, uh, it continues. So what I would like to do is I'm going to stop here because we are at time, a little bit over time, and uh, invite you to join me in a couple of weeks where we will continue the advice from Sidi Ahmed Zarouk, inshallah. And if there are any questions, um, you know, next time, I, let me actually quickly look because I do have access to the Facebook link. Um, on Zoom, unfortunately, I can't see the uh, questions in Zoom because it's uh, it's not it's a private room. But let me quickly look on the Facebook page to see if there are any questions or anything that anybody has. I forgive me for going over. Um, I don't want to keep you on too long. 
Uh, mashallah, Jazakallah khairan. <laughs> there's some very sweet comments here. But if there's anybody who has any questions about anything that was shared, I can stay on for another, maybe we'll go to 810, just to, um, to follow the questions, if there's any questions. I am on the Facebook group. Actually, let me see, sorry, YouTube, I know there's, we're so uh, high tech here at MCC, mashallah, may Allah reward Brother Munir and his fantastic team because they've got, uh, you know, every, we're on everything. We're on Facebook, we're on YouTube. Um, I'm on my own Facebook. So there's a lot of uh, screens here. I'm gonna try to find where this is to see, um, inshallah, if there are any questions on the YouTube page. So let me look here. Bismillah. Um, okay, sorry. Oh, you're going to hear me. <laughs> let me mute myself. All right. So I'm going to just quickly check the chat room or the, there's a chat happening here. I want to make sure that I get all of your questions. Um, sorry. Uh-oh. Hmm. Okay. I can't open up the, the chat. It just says there's a verse in the, Quran, someone's posting. Okay, so I don't know if there's any uh, further questions, but I don't see anything there. So let me quickly go back to the Facebook page of uh, MCC and see if there's any questions there. If not, then inshallah, we can wrap it up for tonight. And I will, um, I look forward to seeing you guys in a couple of weeks. But let me do a refresh. I don't want to miss any questions and see them afterwards. Okay, so I don't see anything, uh, ladies and maybe brothers. I think brothers are uh, watching on YouTube. Um, I don't see anything. So I want to thank you all for tuning in. And Jazakumullah khairan. Uh, inshallah, we will see each other in two weeks. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of you, preserve all of you, give you an incredible remainder of, of the rest of this Mubarak month of Hijjah, but especially in, in these first 10 days. I hope that all of your prayers are answered. If you're fasting, inshallah, your fasts are accepted. Any charity you give, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it and increase it for you, inshallah, and reward you uh, without measure in this world and the next, all of you and your families. I know it's a hard time for our world and our community, but inshallah, we have to always put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He knows what's best for all of us. And just remember, he's in control. And uh, we just have to be grateful for our community because there are many people who have no community that they belong to. They have really nobody, very, very isolated in this world. Some of them are orphans. Some of them have no family or have left parted ways with their family. And they're trying to manage this world without even a faith. It's just, it's remarkable if you think about how people uh, can have existence in this world without faith. I, 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 it's really something that's, that shocks me. But alhamdulillah, I'm always so grateful. Alhamdulillah, ni'mat al-Islam. This is my my dua uh, always. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again protect all of you. Let's go ahead and end in dua inshallah and we'll see you in two weeks. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa al-Asr inna al-Insana lafi khusr illa al-Ladhina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasaw bil-Haqqi wa tawasaw bil-Sabr. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdika ashadu an la ilaha illa anta nasakhfiruka wa natubu ilayka. Allahumma salli wa salli wa barik ala Sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alayhi wa sallam wa sallam taslim al kathira. Alhamdulillah. Jazakum Allah khairan. Inshallah, we'll see you soon. And please uh, continue to support MCC. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal mursaleen. Sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. I hope everyone is doing well. And inshallah, you all had a blessed Eid celebration with your families and your loved ones. Inshallah. Um, alhamdulillah. Last time we were together, we covered a text. And I'm going to just reference it for those who are possibly joining us for the first time. The text is called Agenda to Change Our Condition. I'll go ahead and hold it up for you so you can see it yourself. Uh, this is written by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and Imam Zaid Shakir. And there are so many gems in this book, mashallah. Um, and I encouraged everyone who was tuning in last time to get the book for themselves because it really is a transformative text, as the title reflects. Um, you know, anyone who reads this from beginning to end should really walk away with a much clearer understanding about how to 
transform their themselves and and hopefully for the better obviously uh, and really set uh, themselves on a successful spiritual path so there's so much content in this book but i'm choosing for the sake of our discussion and purpose to to look to the appendix section at the uh, back of the book so if you have the book you can follow along um, but appendix a is uh, is called or titled Foundations of the Spiritual Path by Sidi Ahmed Zarruq. And this is advice. It's nasiha. And I personally uh, benefit tremendously. Every time I read it, I, I go back over the list and I think of more things. So it's one of those lists that's really, uh, mashallah, it just it bears a lot of fruit. So I, 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 I think that this is the state we're all in. We're all in need of guidance. We're in need of nasiha. Uh, may Allah protect and preserve all of our scholars past and present for what they've uh, blessed us with. But this advice is really timeless. I mean, to think that he passed in uh, 1493, but this advice speaks so, it rings so true to us today, I think uh, just really uh, speaks volumes about how insightful he was and how well he knew um, the human condition and, and, and human beings and human behavior. So I, I really wanted to go back to this text because we only partially covered the advice that he, uh, he gave us. So I'm going to go ahead and screen share. Um, excuse me, I have to mute myself here. I'm going to go ahead and screen share, inshallah, uh, so that you can follow along because I did put together just a quick summary, uh, sort of a slideshow, I guess, of the points that he makes um, so that as we're talking about it, you have something to follow. So let me go ahead and do the screen share, inshallah, and we will bring this up. Um, Bismillah. One, oh, excuse me. Let me share it and then present. All right, Bismillah. So here's the presentation um, that, again, just follow along. I'll, I'll try to go over what we already covered as quick as possible so that those who are uh, tuning in can follow along as well. So Sidi Ahmed Zarouk, this um, advice that he's giving is really about the spiritual path. All of us, inshallah, we all are on a spiritual path of our own or we want to be on one and obviously we want to succeed. So he's giving us advice on how to be successful on our spiritual path and he starts off by giving us a list of the five foundations of the spiritual path, which are covered here. Now, again, if you're tuning in and you weren't with us last time, for the sake of uh, time, I'm going to ask that you go and watch that session to get more in-depth commentary on these points, uh, because I'm just going to show you the slides, but we're going to move on so that we continue from last uh, the, where we left off. But what he's, what I appreciated so much, and I shared this last time as well, is that the structure that he has this advice is working, you know, backwards in a way. He starts off with giving you the foundation of the spiritual path, but then he sort of, you know, deconstructs it in a way where you understand how you build this path. And so he, he, uh, he goes into several different areas, but I'll go ahead and move along so that you can see. So he gives us these five foundations, and then he says that these foundations are predicated on these uh, other qualities. So if in order to get to, to the, you know, the slide that we just looked at, um, you have to have these five qualities first. And then he, again, continuing in this you know, building phase where he's showing you how to get here, he, t he says that in order to get to those um, five qualities, there's a certain... Uh, conduct that's required of you. And so he lists those out for us. Um, and this is, I believe, where we left off on this particular slide. And we went and, you know, covered it. But the next slide is related to this, obviously, as we're continuing, all of them build on each other. So I'm going to go ahead and start today's discussion on this slide, which are the five pitfalls of the soul. So um, as 
you know, he lists that in the previous slide that these foundations of proper conduct, right, are, are listed here. Well, there's pitfalls that are associated with them. And so, you know, things that we have to look out for and be vigilant. Uh, so th this is where this next set, set of five comes into play. So he lists here that in our pursuit of knowledge, right, as we want to increase our knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, you know, that's part of our path, we have to be aware that there are pitfalls to that. And he lists here that specifically pursuing your knowledge or academic knowledge, spiritual knowledge, that one can fall into company with uh, the immature, right? So you can meet people along the way that uh, are perhaps not at the same level of maturity as you are, or uh, they in some way or another can take you down, whether it's age or, you know, their understanding, um, devotional practices, um, or uh, because they themselves lack, you know, maybe moral, uh, you know, the virtue, so they don't really have, uh, they're, they're unprincipled, they're ungrounded themselves. So this is part of um, the reality of, of a lot of people who are seeking uh, spiritual uh, knowledge or otherwise. And if you look in our modern context, and this is certainly true um, in any type of schooling, right? A lot of serious students, some of their struggles doesn't really have anything to do with the knowledge, uh, you know, acquiring the knowledge. It has to do with the social aspect. Um, there's other distractions that can get, that can pull them away, that can, you know, uh, take their focus away. So a lot of college students or even high school students, well, throughout really, throughout our lives, we, we find that uh, that people struggle in this way because there's so many other people that share, are on the same path with them, but may not be at the same level of maturity. And so you have to be vigilant about this when you are uh, seeking knowledge. Who are you going to learn from? And are you doing this, um, you know, with a group? And have you vetted that group of people? Are there people that you have to be careful of? Because perhaps they, um, you know, have those domineering and strong personality types that uh, that do tend to sort of take over. And there are, and this is why, you know, self-knowledge is important and, and knowing, uh, you know, how, how different personalities work with one another. These are all really important knowledges. But something to just be cautious of, that this is a potential pitfall because you could be really sincere in your desire to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but if you're not paying attention to the company that you keep, it could contribute to you uh, not doing very well, especially if you are on a very serious or rigorous path, right? So he mentions that. Then he talks about um, another pitfall because, you know, proper conduct, which again, in the previous slide he listed, uh, the second uh, uh, foundation of proper conduct, he said was accompanying a spiritual guide and having a fraternity to gain insight. So having, you know, uh, someone to look up to or having a jama that you belong to, it also comes with some pitfalls, which he lists as the pitfall of spiritual company is arrogance, deception, and meddling in the affairs of others. Uh, and this is really important because, you know, if we look at, I'm just looking at my own experience, I've heard from several people that they have felt as, you know, arrogance coming from religious people, you know, from people who are, uh, who look outwardly religious and have knowledge, but they felt arrogance from them. And so sometimes, you know, it, you can fall into that if you're not cautious, that self-righteousness can enter the heart and you suddenly feel you're more superior because you have more Quran memorized, or you've, wear, you know, you, you dress modestly as more than other people, or you um, are fluent in Arabic, or, you know, it could be a, a range of things. But if, if you're not cautious of the, you know, what are the, the conversations that you're having in those, in those jama, you know, is it a lot of just um, everybody's praising one another, and, you know, you're feeling really puffed up every time you leave those gatherings? Or are they gatherings that really do the opposite, and they leave you feeling 
humbled about how little you know. Um, and so we have to be careful. And you, you certainly see this, not necessarily always in, in religious context, but even in academia, this is certainly an issue that a lot of people, once they you know, get a, a degree or are in a program, they can have a more elitist attitude and suddenly you know, just think of themselves is better than so these are all spiritual you know pitfalls that, that we can fall into if we're not vigilant so just pointing these uh, you know really important things out the second um so the third uh, foundation of proper conduct that he lists is abandoning dispensations and excuses for one's own protection and so you know this is again there are um, he has listed here the pitfalls of foregoing dispensations and excuses is, is self-pity. So falling into, uh, you know, just a, a feeling of, of that you, there's exceptions to the rule. A lot of times, you know, this, the nafs is very uh, indulgent, so it can certainly make a person feel that uh, that they, um, you know, that they're an exception to certain rules, and so that's also one of the the dangers. Uh, we have to be very careful not to to take to, to, to take our our faith seriously and not to look for those excuses or loopholes or whatever just because we feel that we may um, may need you know an exception. Uh, for whatever the issue is. Um, the next rule or, or uh, uh, foundation of proper conduct he lists is managing one's time for litanies that result in the in, in presence of the heart. So obviously it's very important that we uh, establish an awrad or a wird and, and to, to make that a practice, a daily practice, because the, it was the practice of the Prophet and he, he, he did protective du'as, he had you know, he was very disciplined. His his life was scheduled around prayer, around uh, worshiping Allah at every different point, du'as. There was always a remembrance of Allah happening. And so we should be in the practice of that as well. Uh, but the pitfalls that he mentions here are that... Um, and the pitfall of managing time for litanies is spectacle and ritualized devotion so that you start to maybe seek attention. It becomes more performative, right? Um, and, and so, and also you, you fall into um, doing things almost mechanically mechanically or robotically because it's something that you're just you've habituated to so the presence may be lacking you're you're not really focusing anymore but it's just now something you have to do or because you've habituated to and of course forming good habits is is very important but mindfulness is also important we can't just mentally check out uh, when we're praying or doing dhikr and so if we're we're not aware of our mindfulness this is one of the pitfalls of of falling of, of taking on those practices without that that awareness of what we're doing and, and how we're doing it um, and then he says the last uh, foundation of proper conduct he says guarding against the ego to free it of whims and save it from destructive tendencies and so one of the pitfalls is guarding against the ego is complacency due to its excellence and probity so you know if you start to think that you are doing really well um, or because you're consistent in, in, uh, in a practice, this can lead to complacency. And again, that, send, that, that, I, that notion that you're, you're, you're doing really well. And so there's a you know, delusion there because the believer never is satisfied with, with what they do. Like the true seeker and the true believer always feels inadequate there's always a sense of inadequacy, no matter how much you learn, how much you do, how much you've done, it's never seems enough. And you always feel that you should be doing more. And so one of the pitfalls of, of, again, the soul uh, is that you would start to think of yourself as being uh, better than or safe in, in that regard. So these are uh, things that he's pointed out. Again, really a lot of uh, food for thought if we if we take each one of these and just uh, apply it to our own selves you know all of us can do that where are we uh, with regards to all of these pitfalls have we fallen short are we in uh, have we are we in in one right now and how can we emerge from that but 
you know, the, the starting point is to become aware of the pitfalls. So, you know, once you're on a spiritual path, if you just think it's onward and upward and you're not paying attention to the fact that Iblis is always in pursuit and he's, uh, he doesn't rest from what he, his aim is, which is to destroy us spiritually. He doesn't take rest. Uh, this is a 24-hour constant, you know, thing for him. So we have to be vigilant. And that's why, mashallah, this this type of nasiha is so useful because, as I mentioned in the beginning, it, it's still relevant to all of us. It's timeless advice. I think throughout, you know, until we leave this uh, world, uh, this would be useful to anybody who read who read it, a believer who read it. Um, so, mashallah, again, there's so much... Uh, so much information here. So let's look at what he shares next. Um, so he says now, so he goes from, you know, the pitfalls to the five foundations of treatment of illnesses of the soul. So now, you know, if you find yourself having maybe fallen, as we just uh, discussed, then how can we emerge? How can we get ourselves out of those illnesses? So he focuses first on um, relieving digestion by reducing the amount of food. And this is, you know, if, you, if you've studied any of Imam al-Ghazali's works and many of the great, uh, you know, scholars of the past, there's a lot of emphasis on food and spiritual habit. And, you know, not only how much you're eating, the quality of what you're eating, we believe in that. We do believe that it affects your state. If you're obviously eating anything from the haram, it would affect your spiritual state. Likewise, if you are overindulging or excessive in your consumption of food, it's going to affect you spiritually in many ways. Uh, primarily, you know, sloth. The sloth is associated with overconsumption of food. You just find that, and it's it makes sense because uh, physically, physiologically, you know, the as we know, just basic information about digestion that when you're consuming foods, especially if they're different types of qualities of food, the food is heavy and it can, you know, weigh you down and your energy seem, goes directly to, to, you know, breaking all that food down. So that's why after a big meal, you know, how many people feel suddenly, uh, you know, like they want to jump up and, and go and pray uh, 20 rakah. It's very difficult after you eat a large meal to feel that sense of that burst of energy. It's usually the opposite. Um, and so you, you, this is just basic knowledge that food would make a person feel, especially if they're eating a lot or heavy foods, that they would um, feel spiritually ill because of that. So that's the first line uh, that he uh, attacks or uh, that he offers, the first advice that he offers, which is to, to reduce the amount of food that you're eating. Then um, he says to seek asylum with Allah from harm at the time of its occurrence. So, you know, we have to be in that mindset of seeking refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. That when, when something happens, whatever it is, a tribulation, personal, uh, you know, a, a personal circumstance, or even on a large scale, like what we're dealing with now, that our heart, mind, soul, body, it just immediately defaults to going to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. Uh, instead of, you know, turning to other people, panicking, um, you know, just having that calm sense of trust in Allah and, and getting in that practice. And it's not, you know, it's it's something that, of course, we have to all work on because uh, it's, it's not uh, always easy. It's, it's not always the first thing that comes to mind. But if you, you know, the more and more you read, I was speaking to someone earlier today about her own personal you know, struggles. She's going through a very big calamity right now. And I just reminded her that this is why we have stories of people of the past, you know, of the prophets, of the saints, of the scholars. We have those stories to to look at how they responded and to take from their example. And of course, the Prophet's story in and of itself is enough, but you can look back to all of these incredible you know, figures of the past and see how whatever their circumstance was, we do have answers in terms of how to properly respond. 
um, and we can gain strength from their example. So alhamdulillah that we have all of those examples. But just, you know, it's something that we have to work on and, and invest in thinking about and learning how to do. Um, the next advice here he has for treating the soul, illnesses of the soul, is shunning places where one fears misdeeds will occur. Is although we're in quarantine right now and we might physically not be able to go to places that are sinful uh, because of the modern, you know, the technology that we have access to, places can come to us just in the palm of our hand. We have these devices and machines that can transport us to, to several different places depending on where we want to go. And so I think this is really quite relevant now because you see a lot of people um, maybe, as I said, not physically or, or interpreting something like that as meaning to say, you know, I'm walking somewhere, I'm, I'm deliberately moving my physical body from this place to this place. But there are a lot of places that, um, that again, we can go to mentally, visually, uh, that are harmful. And so we have to really look at what we're doing right now with our time, um, because a lot of sinful behavior is happening, even though people are in their homes and they aren't physically going somewhere. And it's because their eyes are, are, are seeing things that they shouldn't see. Their ears are listening to things they shouldn't be listening to. And so in many ways, you know, those are still uh, places that we choose to, to go to, right? I mean, if you're watching uh, certain television or films that are inappropriate, or as I said, social media, the internet, there's a plethora of opportunities to engage in very, very harmful and sinful things. So really being cautious about what you're doing with your time and what you choose to engage in and and making sure that if there are places where you your guard is down and you're you know you're more likely to fall into sinful behavior that you practice that uh, you know that that you, you restraint and you you prevent yourself from even you know opening those doors so that's uh, the third treatment that he has there. The fourth treatment is continual repentance coupled with prayers upon the Prophet in solitude and society. Um, this is important because we are in a time of immense, you know, just there's a lot of darkness in our world today um, and we need light. And what better light than the Prophet uh, and of course, Toba. Toba is light. Toba erases sins. Toba, those black spots that we all accumulate every day because of the sins that we commit, it, it, we need a way to erase those sins. And Alhamdulillah, Allah has given us uh, a way, very easy way, really. If you think about how merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is and how many hadith and how many ayahs in the Quran, He's constantly reminding us that no matter what we've done, how much we've done it, that he that the doors of Toba are always open, and it really is just a matter of true, sincere repentance and remorse, and then words. You're just articulating words when you make Toba. Of course, they should be in the heart, but it's really such a simple thing that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala asks of us after we've, you know, gone astray and and done things that we shouldn't ever do. Alhamdulillah. May Allah forgive us that He's willing to erase all of it just based on words that we say. So this is the mercy of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. But you know, doing that as a daily practice, and then of course the salawat and the Prophet I said, I'm doing those together is how we remove so much of our past, you know, misdeeds and all that darkness as we mentioned, but also open up our heart for openings for light. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I have so many people I know in my life and as well as my own experience of when you're in this constant state of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or in salawat of the Prophet uh, things will happen and, and it's just amazing. You'll start to 
see vision dreams of many people I've spoken to, the more that they, um, you know, say their salawat, that subhanAllah, all of a sudden they're having openings. And these are people, I mean, I remember I once gave a halaqa and we talked about the importance of salawat and, you know, seeing the Prophet in our dreams. And there were uh, all sisters and one of the sisters was really uh, sad because she was, you know, she lamented that she had never seen the Prophet in, in, in her dreams and she really wanted to see him. And so we just talked about, you know, salawat and how often are you, you know, it's it's one thing to wish to see the Prophet him, but to remember him often, to sing, you know, say praises upon him is is a different form of of reverence and and love that we need to be in the pra- regular practice of. So when we talked about you know, how often are we doing salawat? She admitted that that wasn't something that she was doing enough. And so she started to do that. And I believe it was that night, subhanAllah, you know, and we Allah knows best, but she called me the next day after this halaqa because we talked about the importance of salawat. And she said that, subhanAllah, she spent all night after the halaqa just doing a lot of salawat. And then she saw a dream of him. And it was the first time ever. And so she was so excited the next day to tell me that Allah had was so immensely generous with her because, you know, she just in one night, subhanAllah, he fulfilled that wish for her. So Allah can do anything as we know, but we have to be in the practice of these things to remedy the spiritual illnesses in our heart, but also to open up experiences for, for ourselves. You know, sometimes people don't realize that it's, you know, I, I've heard from, for example, many people who uh, who have a hard time, you know, getting themselves to start a practice, whether it's their five daily prayers or reading Quran or doing something consistently, because they feel that they don't have the feeling in their heart to do those things, like the khushu or that you know sincerity, that that burst of iman that they're all seeking. We're all always seeking, right? Because they don't feel it it's hard for them to actually get up and to do it. And they're waiting for that feeling to be the catalyst for them to do those things. Uh, Well, those feelings, you know, are gifts, immense gifts, but they're the fruits of your labor. You're going to get, inshallah, those feelings increase the more you work towards it, but you can't expect it right off the bat. I mean, of course, Allah, again, can do as he wills. So maybe for some people, that's their experience that with very little effort, they have these amazing spiritual openings. But for most of us, you know, we have to kind of realize that our efforts will be rewarded with the more we display our sincerity. And how do we display our sincerity? It's with consistency. So, you know, just to be consistent in our practice will, inshallah, open up those openings for us, inshallah, as Allah wills. And, you know, he again does as he wills. So that was the fourth um, advice that he offered to treat the illnesses of the soul. And then he talks about the fifth one, accompanying a guide to Allah or to the fear of Allah. Unfortunately, such a person no longer exists. SubhanAllah, I mean, he's talking again, 1493 is when he passed. I'm not sure when exactly he wrote this advice, but it was around that time. Uh, several centuries ago, and he's saying that back then, these amazing spiritual guides uh, didn't exist. So what can we say about our state today? You know, Allah knows, of course, um, sometimes our scholars would would say these things just really as a, as a statement, you know, of, of the state and the condition of the ummah. And so we have to seek Allah's uh, forgiveness and, and pray that Allah brings people like that in our lives People who remind us of Allah, who, you know, and there are people out there. There are certainly people out there who, mashallah, just by looking up, upon them, um, as soon as they speak a few words, one's iman, you can feel your iman increase. And Allah's given that ability to to certain people, mashallah. So, you know, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring people like that in our lives. So, alhamdulillah, he, um, again, we're just following the text and it's, everything that I'm presenting is written exactly as he's, uh, you know, written it here. This next section are, he's, he followed up that section about the illnesses with um, advice that he inserted from another famous scholar, Abul Hassan al-Shadiri. And he, 
he says here, and, and he shares this advice. And again, it's all related because we're looking at, you know, spiritual illness and how can we protect ourselves from those things? Well, he's just sharing this further counsel. And he says, this is, um, these are advices. So let's start with the first four. There's there's more that follow. He says, first, don't set foot in a place unless you expect a divine recompense. Um, subhanAllah, that's really profound because like, we have options. We have free will. We have the ability to go right, left, you know, forward, backwards. Allah has given us the ability and the, you know, the, the mental um, or the intellect to be able to discern what is, beneficial and what's not but to make it a rule sort of you know it's just just don't ever go somewhere unless you expect a reward for being there that's immense discipline right and that's showing you the level of awareness these people had about their movements about their words about every every moment of their lives subhanallah may may allah give us that type of awareness but to have this as a as an advice that you live by, that unless I know that I'm going to be rewarded, I won't go there. And of course, um, there's ample opportunity for reward because Allah is so generous. Uh, you can go anywhere unless obviously it's a haram place, but somewhere, you know, um, that there's many places we can go where there, there is an abundance of reward. So that's the level of awareness and thinking and contemplation that we all should be in the practice of, of maximizing the reward because actions are judged by intentions. So inshallah, if you go with the intention to uh, please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, that would be the first step, right? Before you even think of going somewhere that it's, you're purifying your niyyah that inshallah you're going to go and take care of whatever it is, whether you go to the store or the post office or you're visiting someone that you're very clear on your intention and that you're very clear on how you're going to go about uh, your, you know, that, that process, like what's your plan of action? Uh, for example, something that I think is lost on so many people uh, today and, uh, and may Allah guide us, but it is absolutely um, a, a, a foundational principle of our faith uh, in terms of interacting with other people is lowering the gaze, you know, how many people think about that before they even step outside the house that I have to intention, make that intention that Allah, I'm going to go and take care of what I need to take care of, but I'm going to consciously be aware of myself and lower my gaze because I anticipate seeing things that I shouldn't be looking at, especially in this season that we're in. I mean, I live in California uh, the weather is warm, and this is why summer is u- usually not my very my least favorite season, because I I you know there's just so many so much that we're not that that it's hard you know everywhere you look subhanallah and for women as well as men we all have to be very vigilant about these things because it seems to be getting worse and worse and worse. I remember um, just the other day, uh, yesterday maybe or the day before, there was a big news story on the cover of one of these websites about this woman who, astaghfirullah, she went to, um, I think it was in Southern California. She was at a beach and she was practically, just she was practically naked. She was wearing very little. And there was a family who apparently called the police on this woman. Um, And she was, the police came and, and had to, argue back and forth with her and the party that she was with, they were all very angry because they felt totally justified um, that she wasn't doing anything wrong, that she was not naked. Whereas, you know, she was, she was, you know, from the small glimpse that I saw, it was enough to say, all the bilat, this woman is completely naked. But, you know, there's, that's what we're up against. It's getting worse and worse. People are very free, carefree um, with their bodies. And so whether you're at the beach or you're, at a shopping mall or at a store or just driving by, you might see things that um, we shouldn't be looking at. So, but how many of us have the presence of mind to make that intention before we leave the house? Like, Ya Allah, I'm going to do my best to lower my gaze and be in that practice so that I don't bring on that harm to myself, right? So it's really a matter of having such discipline and awareness. But 
um, you know, in this particular point that, that the advice, I just find it profound because tells you again how ahead these people were where they made these rules for themselves like unless i know there's a reward i'm not going there so you know shall we learn from that um the next advice is to never sit in a place unless you feel safe from sin so it's one thing that you don't enter a place unless you expect a reward but also that you refuse to uh, participate or go somewhere um if you, uh, unless you feel safe from sin. So think about professionally how many, um, I remember I used to work, you know, for, for a corporation uh, before I, I, I started teaching and they would have Christmas parties and there was always a lot of pressure, you know, from fellow employees to come because it was going to be so fun. But Alhamdulillah, I was young, you know, I was in my twenties, but I had to make those very clear boundaries for my coworkers that I don't drink alcohol and I'm sorry, but I cannot be in an environment where I know that there's going to be a lot of alcohol, you know, there and everybody's, it's just, it was very uncomfortable. And I think, um, you know, it, they, they understood it and they respected it. Uh, there was, you know, always those little, you know, teasing comments here and there. And, and even afterwards about how much I would miss out on all the fun but they respected my decision. And so we have to, as Muslims, be principled people and be confident and never uh, lack that courage to speak up about our beliefs and, our, and, and to feel shy about that. But it is a problem that, you're see that we're seeing more and more. People are afraid to, um, you know, they don't want to rock the boat or offend people. They don't want to come across as too religious or extreme or fundamental. Uh, so they tend to make those excuses and it's hard. I, I've certainly been in environments myself with family where it's very difficult because you know that there might be certain things and it's out of your control. Um, but you know, this is just showing you the level of discipline that these people had and may Allah guide us uh, to have that strong conviction so that we can also apply these uh, this advice in in of course the best way possible uh, but it's certainly something to think about moving forward how are we as you know how are we going to do this you know are we going to be able to um when, when things open up, you know, I'm still, I'm kind of in the quarantine mo mindset that right now we're safe from a lot of these things because we, we're not really socializing, but perhaps that's what we need to be doing is thinking, you know, taking ourselves into account about past behaviors, past mistakes. How can I improve? Because that's what the point of all this is, right? It's all advice to help us better ourselves on the spiritual path. So the best thing to do is to listen to these points and then to go back on oneself and say, well, there, there was that time or I have done this in the past. How can I change that moving forward? Uh, so that's where I think we should all be. This is, you know, all, we're all in the same situation of, of really taking ourselves into account and reflection. Hopefully that's what we're doing anyway. Uh, but, um, but really thinking about moving forward when things open up again and we're able to visit people and we're able to you know, socialize and do things like we did before, are we just going to go back to how things were and, and just, you know, status quo, whatever it is, I'll just go along with it. Or are we going to maybe take things a little bit more seriously and, and create those boundaries, uh, you know, from the, uh, uh, just just be more open and honest with people. Um, so something to think about. Uh, but again, I'm just appreciating, mashallah, the level of these scholars because they were just so strong, you know, to have this deep conviction to be able to, to, to do these things is um, certainly not easy. So the third advice that um, uh, Abu Hassan al-Shadri has for us is, do not accompany anyone unless you find him or her supporting your duties to Allah. Um, subhanallah. And the next one is, in, is similar, right? Do not select anyone as a friend unless he or she has increased your certainty. So really this is about the company that we keep, you know, if you are, you know, sharing time and being influenced by people who really don't respect your religious values, um, then it's going to affect you eventually. 
this is why people who are uh, disciplined in their faith, the more and more they hang out with people who have weaker faith, you find them changing, right? And so we have to, you know, look at the company we keep and, and try to surround ourselves with people who increase our belief, increase our certainty with Allah, and that we, you know, those intimate uh, people that we bring close in those in, inner circles, that they are those people, that they're, they're the people who, uh, as, you know, the advice says, they increase our certainty, that inner, inner circle should be those people. We have acquaintances, there's family, there's friends, there's extended people in our lives that we may have to meet periodically, but when we assign the label a friend or confidant um, to someone, they should be people that, again, remind us of Allah, that increase us in our iman, that they support us when it's time to pray, that they're not the ones going, oh man, really? Can you do that later? You know, stuff for Allah. There are people who, who would get annoyed if uh, being around you know, a religious family member. I've, I've, I've had those experiences personally, and I know of others who've had as well, that, you know, if your religiosity doesn't match the people that you're with, it can make them uncomfortable. And they may indirectly or directly expect you to tone it down, dial it down a little bit, you know, whether it's directly telling you to not do something or to not make a big deal out about something or just kind of you know, passively, aggressively making comments, you may start to find yourself being influenced by that. So being very vigilant about the company that you keep and the influences that are around you and making sure that those people, again, share your faith and, and respect your faith and also uh, increase your faith. And those are really the primary qualities you want to look for. So, Mashallah, he continues to, to give even more uh, advice that he's listed here um, about the, you know, the people that, that are in our lives that we should all think about again. First, um, whoever directs you to the ephemeral cheats you. The ephemeral is what's you know, temporary. It's not lasting. So th this is dunya, right? The dunya is not going to last, and the dunya is very... Uh, intoxicating and, and very tempting. But if we have people in our lives that are always reminding us of um, the dunya and pushing us towards, uh, towards, you know, towards the dunya and away from Allah, no matter how close they are, no matter how much they claim to love us and, uh, and how much we, we love them, they are in many ways cheating us because this dunya as we said it is fleeting, it's going, it's dying, it's not going to last. And so for us to put all of our focus and time and energy on that uh, and become heedless of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's clearly uh, we're, we're on the losing end of that. And the opposite would be true, that the one who is reminding you of the next life and to work towards that life and to uh, not fall into this dunya and temptation and your desires that they're actually your greatest ally and greatest friend. Even if sometimes, you know, it's, it's a bitter uh, pill to swallow. Some Nasiha, sometimes people give you advice or, you know, they may be a little hard, but if you really analyze their words and look at which is, which of the two is, is looking out for my soul, right? One may be wanting me to have fun and to enjoy uh, life and to, you know, um, to, to, to ride this, this wave with them, uh, this wave of life. But the other one is looking out for my soul, for my eternity. And if they're telling me not to go to this place or not to go to that place because it's haram, even though I, my nafs might not like that to be reminded, I have to appreciate that that person is looking out for my soul. And that's a true friend. So, you know, just very simple reminder but it's also profound because we tend to blur uh, the line sometimes when it comes to how we define friendships and we forget that the true friend the true companion in this world is the one who is looking out for your akhirah not just who's your ride or die or you know the person you can have fun with um no that i mean they're they're you know they might be good uh, for, for those things, but in terms of 
true uh, friendship, the true friend is the one who's always trying to prevent you from slipping for, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, whoever directs you to activity exhausts you. So this is actually, it was sort of, uh, I separated the three, but um, it was in one statement. So he's making distinctions for us so that we can see different categories of people. There are going to be those people who, again, pull us towards um, that you know, to, to do things, right? To, to be out and about. And I think for, for youth, this is certainly true. I remember, you know, if you look back into your earlier years, your teen years or your 20s and maybe early 30s, um, that's the, sort of the prime of, of life. And there's the zest for life that a lot of people feel. And so everybody wants to do things and have experiences and travel and do fun things. And let's jump out of a plane and, you know, kind of throw caution to the wind and just be uh, free spirited. And so there's a lot of, you know, push to do those things because you've tasted freedom. You're out of, you know, your parents' home. You have maybe your own financial, uh, you know, freedom to do things the way you want to do. You're in a relationship, whatever the case may be. There's a sense of I can do whatever I want. Let's just go and explore, but it can be exhausting. And so he's just making that distinction that people who direct you to always do things with them, they can exhaust you. People who direct you to the ephemeral cheat you. And then the last point he says is, whoever directs you to Allah, that counsels you. This is a deen and nasiha, right? This is what we want. We want those types of friends and those types of people in our lives who are always reminding us of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you're in a group setting, you know, sometimes it's all fun and games and people can get really silly. Uh, but you want to look out for where's that friend who whenever they speak, it's sort of like pin drop silence. They always have wisdom to share. Um, they're maybe not the ones goofing off and dancing or acting silly or Aldabla participating in the, you know, that gossipy corner over there. You know, they're, they're not those people. They're the people who are hey, what time is it? Has Maghrib come in? Um, or, hey, you know what? We should go, we should check out this, this you know, talk or, or let's listen to uh, this awesome new nasheed that came out instead of, you know, the other type of music that may, may not have any benefit to it. So there are those people who are always kind of trying to redirect people back to Allah. And when conversations get out of hand, even, they may have really thoughtful things to talk about, maybe not always necessarily religious topics, but at least thoughtful, responsible, worthy. It's not idle talk. You know, you want to think about those people and that's, those are the people you gravitate towards. And if they, if there aren't any of those people, you should be that person. You should be the one who is, you know, thinking about these things ahead of time. And so I've, you know, I've counseled people who have sort of social anxiety sometimes and they, they're afraid of, of misspeaking or not really having much to say or being put on the spot. So my advice is always to, you know, to arm yourself with different topics that you can talk about. Why are you waiting always for someone to invite you into a conversation? Whereas if you're taking initiative and pro being proactive, you come up with topics that are going to be uh, important, you know, whether it's, it's, it's incidences of, of social anxiety or others. Like I've heard from many people who are like, well, what do you do when you're with family and friends? But then they always gossip and they're, they're always talking about haram and or doing things that they shouldn't be doing. And you don't want to, you know, cause fitna and, and, you know, have a big blowout. What do you, how do you deal with that situation? Same advice, same advice, be proactive, you know, come up with a short list of topics that maybe interests everybody there. It could be a political topic. It could be scientific. You know, people like science. People like to know facts that they, um, you know, that that, that they uh, never heard before. But be creative. Be think about these things and work so that uh, ahead of time, so that when you're in those situations, you don't find yourself suddenly doing something you shouldn't be doing. So, you know, again, if you can't, if you don't. Uh, grab or if there are, those people aren't around in those circles and be that person for for everybody else inshallah um, but I, I like the the way that he just sort of distinguished these different 
categories so that we can really think about the company that we keep and realize where where are those beneficial people in my life that remind me of Allah and to appreciate them more, inshallah. And then he says, uh, make mindfulness of Allah your abode and the delight of your ego will do you no harm as long as it is not content with vice nor persists in sin and you do not lose your awareness of Allah in private. So if you are aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and try to be at all times, then you can enjoy life basically as long as you don't fall into you know, uh, vice and, and harmful uh, habits or things that you shouldn't be doing, sinful behavior, and that you don't forget Allah. So, you know, it's, we don't have to look at being religious as being completely void of, uh, you know, life. I think a lot of people unfortunately have that, that image that if you're uh, always aware of Allah or just of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you kind of lose your is, you know, life, does that, that spirit of life, because you're so serious all the time, you're brooding, you're just constantly, you know, reflecting. And so you can't be too, well, yeah, you can. Uh, some of the most amazing people that I know are fun loving and, and very, you know, energetic people, but subhanAllah, they love Allah and they always infuse the remembrance of Allah in their discussions. They find ways to bring faith into into the discussion, but in an animated and, and relevant and fun way, as opposed to being just, you know, very serious and, and again, and too intense. So this is how we do it, you know, have that awareness of Allah and your ego can enjoy, you know, again, the delights of this, um, whatever this dunya has to offer without harming you because as long as you follow, you know, the guidelines here, that it's not content with vice, so you don't fall into bad habits, you certainly abstain from sinful behavior, and you do not lose your awareness of Allah in private. That's also a very important distinction. Because, you know, if you're in public, and you, 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 you make a lot of these claims, and you're very, you know, overtly, um, you know, you, you're very forthcoming with your reflections about God when you're around people, then you want to make sure that's consistent. What happens when those people leave? Are you still thinking about Allah or do you completely turn into a different person entirely? And now it's just like, you know, you do whatever you want and it's all about your whims and desires. So there's, that's the, the test. The test of sincerity is, is it, you know, are you sustaining that same or maintaining that same state of awareness even in private, or is it just, you know, a public thing? Because maybe there's an image that you're putting out. So that's how we know uh, whether or not we're, we're sincere. Um, so let's see here. I want to see how much time I have. Okay. So I'm going to stop here because there's more slides and there's more discussions to have, inshallah. And I really want to hear from all of you to see if there are any questions. I tried to do this last time, so let me see on my page if there are any questions, and then I'll see on the YouTube page. I um, We have just about five minutes left. Um, so bismillah, let me see. I'm gonna go back to the MCC page. Just bear with me for just a moment, because sometimes the questions come, like last time I tried to answer your questions, but subhanAllah, um, I saw them pop up as soon as I logged off and I felt so bad. So I'm really sorry for anybody who asked um, questions. For people who are asking, I see some questions about the text. I'll put it up again. So here is the text that I'm using. This is agenda to change our condition. So I hope that's clear. It's um, Imam, uh, sorry, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and Imam Zaid Shakir who put this together. You can get it from Sandala. Okay, so that's the text. And the section that I was reading is Sidi Ahmed Zarruq section, the appendix A in the back of the book. So it's, there's a lot of, of, of text uh, here, mashallah, a lot of great information. So we'll continue this in two weeks when we resume, inshallah. 
um, and we'll continue to read. And there's more advice. And like I said, this book, I really encourage all of you to have it um, because there's just so much amazing content that's quite relevant. And uh, if you're a parent, especially, uh, it's useful for ourselves as parents, first and foremost, but in trying to help our children pave their own spiritual path, this is a wonderful tool. It just it outlines so much uh, that will help you and help them. So definitely worth getting. So inshallah, um, I, I'm on the Facebook page. I only saw questions about the text. I don't know if there's any other questions, but let me look at the YouTube page. Sorry, because there's mashallah technology, right? We can broadcast on multiple platforms here. So it's um, a good opportunity for us to see. Uh, let's see, mashallah. Any other questions? So again, if you guys have questions, this is the time because I am going to give it a couple of minutes in case it takes a few, you know, a little bit to load, but I don't want to have, have happen what happened last time where uh, I saw the questions afterwards and I felt really bad. So we'll go ahead and wait just a couple minutes. But if there are no further questions, then we will, inshallah, Continue the discussion next uh, time we meet now. For those who, again, are possibly joining for the first time, these sessions will be broadcast here, same time, 7 to 8 p.m., every other Thursday. So we don't meet every week. This is a bi-monthly or bi-weekly um, halaqa, and alhamdulillah, it's open. I know that there are, um, It's it was, you know, initially when we were on site anyway, it was for sisters, but alhamdulillah, it's open to really anybody who wants to tune in. I don't mind if brothers are watching. I have no issue whatsoever. Uh, it's an open uh, discussion for all of us, inshallah. So feel free to share it with other people if they feel like they want to tune in. Alhamdulillah, they're more than welcome. Uh, so, okay, I'm going to check one more time and just see if there are any questions. And then we will end because I don't think there are. I haven't seen anything pop up yet. Um, but I thank all of you for tuning in. Mashallah. Thank you for the lovely comments. I see some of your very nice comments. Jazakumullah khairan. You guys are very generous mashallah okay so i think we are good um for as i said we'll continue the discussion next time um so uh bismillah yeah i don't see any more questions okay so we will continue the discussion and we'll read continue to read from again this text agenda to change our condition inshallah please get this text um, if you don't have it and benefit from it, and if you have any questions, we can, uh, inshallah, address it for future sessions. But thank you so much for joining. We'll go ahead and end in dua, inshallah, and I look forward to seeing you guys in future broadcasts. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shadu wa la ilaha illa anta nasaqtiruka wa natubu ilayk. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim wal Asr inna linsana la fi khusr inna ladina amanu wa amru salihati wa tuasu bil haqi wa tuasu bil sabr. So alhamdulillah, jazakallah khairan. Again, everybody, inshallah, have a wonderful evening. It's the night of Jummah. Remember us in your du'as, inshallah. And this is the prime time. We talked about salawat. To do your salawat, inshallah, tonight, tomorrow. Um, uh, as we know, there's more reward uh, on, on for salawat on, on the day of Jummah uh, and the night of Jummah, certainly. So inshallah, may Allah increase all of you and uh, may... He bless all of us, inshallah, with visions of our beloved, sallallahu alayhi wa inshallah. That's my hope for all of you. So, jazakumullah khairan. Have a wonderful evening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum, bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrif al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen. Sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, tasliman kathira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear brothers and sisters. Uh, alhamdulillah, today is the first of Muharram, uh, as we all know, of this new year. Um, I woke up this morning with uh, some really just crushing, uh, soul crushing news, subhanAllah. You know, sometimes you hear things that are just beyond your imagination. So all day today I've been consumed with this news and I wanted to just um, mention it here because it's so important uh, and it is in a way relevant to our discussion as we've been focusing on agenda 
to change our condition. This this amazing text, we've been reading from it, if you've been with me for the past few weeks. Um, But the news story that came out this morning was that Netflix uh, was sort of previewing some of the programs that are to come. And I believe in September, they're going to release a movie. It's made in France. Um, it's a French production that won a Sundance Film Award. Um, and so it's called Cuties. And in this film, it shows a story of a young Muslim girl um, who uh, her family is practicing Muslim and she struggles with her, um, with her uh, family over the issue of her wanting to be a part of a dance troupe where they specifically do a, a specific type of dance called twerking. And if you're not familiar with this dance, it's very provocative, very sexualized. It's highly inappropriate. So this film is basically showing um, pedophilia. It's showcasing uh, and encouraging pedophilia because it's showing the sexualization of young girls. It's just very disturbing. And in addition to that, to add insult to injury, it's also attacking Islam and Muslim culture. Some of the clips or the audio uh, the dialogue in the in the trailer are clearly trying to portray Islam and Muslim culture as being, you know, old fashioned, antiquated. It's not progressive. You could just pick up on all of these on the subtext of this film. Just watching that clip, that that short trailer, even the description of the film is an attack on Islam and Muslims. They referred to her family as being dysfunctional, and of course, this is a family that. Uh, I'm sure just watching the, the trailer anyhow, it's clear are not happy with her choice of wanting to be a part of this dance group. Um, anyhow, very upsetting news. And uh, I posted about it on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. As soon as I found out about it, I just, my blood just was, I was very upset. I've been upset pretty much all day watching the news uh, about this waiting, hoping that not just our community, but Americans, people who have also, uh, you know, heard about this film, uh, just, we had an outcry and and it was, uh, it was national. Everybody, I saw a lot of people from different backgrounds, um, protesting this film, angry. If you go to the Netflix Instagram account, a lot of people are very upset, leaving messages. They're basically blasting them. And, uh, of course, you know, um, their response, was uh, what we should expect from uh, such a large entity. They addressed, they focused on one thing, which is the poster that they released was very different than the one that was released in France. And that poster was actually horrible. I mean, it was atrocious on every level, highly inappropriate. So the apology that they issued only dealt with the poster. And it's amazing to me that all of the other complaints that they're receiving, they're just not even addressing those things. Um, and you know, this is where we're at. I'm still monitoring the situation. There is a petition on change.org. You can follow my Facebook post about this film and you'll find some, some action items there. One of them is to petition, to sign the petition. Another is to leave really low ratings on the IMDb Um, page and anywhere else just this is how we get the attention of these people this is serious an attack on children I mean we 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 have to you know when we again say agenda to change our condition this is um, this is a perfect opportunity we cannot expect our world to um, you know to, to improve or the state of our world to improve if we continue to turn a blind eye or just become apathetic to, to things like this. This is a very big deal. When you start to promote something as depraved as pedophilia and gloss it over and make it, you know, like, oh, it's just this cute little movie about um, dancing and, and teen girls and coming into their own and, and struggling with their sexuality. I mean, why does an 11, 12, 13 year old girl, why do we have to again exploit children? It just, it's mind boggling that this is happening in our world. Subhanallah, and that um, that you know, as as we remarked through this uh, through the day, about the fact that it's not the fault of one person, right? We can't blame necessarily the director or the producer or the person who put this story together. There are hundreds of people involved in the making of a film. 
the cast, the crew, the writers, the directors, the producers, every single person is complicit in, in this story being shown to billions of people. It's a global market, right, with film. Um, and so it can fall into many different uh, markets and, and audiences. But the point is, is what's the message? The message is that young girls, you know, that to, to look at them with this, you know, again, uh, in this horrible way, in this inappropriate way to exploit them. Uh, so we have to, as Muslims, when we see things like this, um, have the right response. I really wanted to start off my conversation today with all of you about this because it's just been weighing on my soul that this is happening so openly. You know, there was a time where pedophiles and people who promoted this were hidden. They were, the, you know, they were, they were, they knew better. They, they, you know, they did whatever they did, but in, in darkness and, and God, I mean, we, we pray that there weren't many of them, but Allah really is the only one who knows, but they at least didn't feel bold to, to act out their, their, in depravity in public but now we see films being made and nobody's blinking an eye that this is really inappropriate to see girls you know doing these to dressed in the way that they're dressed in the film you'll see them um and just giving off this these or, or sending these messages that are so dangerous for them what are we teaching our, our children um boys and girls men and women when we allow this to happen and then, you know, so we have to turn to ourselves and all of us. We really have some decisions to make. There are people who are um, calling for a boycott of Netflix if they don't remove this. And we know, I mean, if you're, if you're paying attention to any of the programming, this isn't, you know, um, an outlier situation. There's many programs on Netflix that are completely against our faith. And so we have to reconsider um, where, you know, what, what we're going to do moving forward when it comes to these types. Uh, of, of scenarios that we find ourselves in. Are we going to just, you know, turn again? And all of us have to have this internal conversation. We all have to think about the choices we make, whether it's subscribing to a streaming service like Netflix or whatever. If we are promoting, uh, are, we, are we somehow complicit in what they're doing by supporting them, by giving them the, our monthly subscriptions, by in any way, you know, supporting them? Are, uh, is this going to be, are we going to be held accountable? So may Allah forgive us and guide us. It's a difficult conversation to have, but I think all of us have to become aware. My uh, niece, just a few minutes before this broadcast started, she messaged me. She saw my post. She's off to college soon, uh, but she was so upset herself being a young Muslim girl seeing this trailer that she became activated by my post and decided to address it but she was also asking what more can we do other than sign this petition and you know try to affect the ratings and the reviews so my um response to her was i think the best thing right now to do is to just become aware and to share this with people because the more uh people are, are upset and and outraged then that's how we get these people to pay attention, right? If this just becomes a small little group in our own corner and we're just, you know, screaming to the top of our lungs, we're likely not going to get much traction because it's a, you know, for them, it's all about money. It's all about what, am, are we risking people canceling subscriptions? Is that worth it? Or are we risking losing uh, potential multi-million dollar, you know, film uh, contractor agreement? I don't know. I don't, we don't obviously know the terms of, of, of these things, but clearly money is what talks. And so sometimes the best thing to do is to, uh, you know, just try to uh, mobilize uh, and, and and make sure that our voices are heard so that they take us seriously. So I would say, please share this information with your family, your friends, tell them about the petition for now. It's uh, probably already passed 200,000 signatures since this morning, but we can do better. I mean, there's, you know, how many million people uh, in, in, in just the U.S. alone, but Muslims globally, we're looking at 2 billion Muslims. And if we started to wake up to the details and the ramifications of a, of, of a story like this being normalized, and that's really the danger is that this is just the beginning. You know, you start with uh, and we've seen it already. Look in the past five years. Just look at the programs. Look what's happening to cartoons, to television, to film, to social media. 
um, everything, music. It's just, it's, it, it's getting worse and worse. And part of that problem is that we're not pushing back strong enough. So I think people of conscience, people of faith, we need to stand up to these people and tell them, you've crossed the line by, by normalizing this, especially when so much attention has been brought about human trafficking and the trafficking of children and the exploitation of children already. Just this year alone, we've seen so much with the Epstein case. And it's just mind boggling that they would think that this was um, an acceptable choice to promote this film. But I think that's really telling of where we're at, that many of these people, this is normal in their world and uh, they don't see anything wrong with it. Um, and may Allah, all the Bila, just anybody who who engages in, in this behavior or, uh, you know, even because, you know, they hide, many of them hide behind uh, their their uh, their wealth, their power, their status. Uh, we, we have to get out of that um, idea that people who do this, th- these things are, you know, just hidden in their seedy and their in their in their own like corners of the world. It's actually much bigger. There's people in very high positions, people with a lot of power who, um, who engage in this. But may Allah, again, protect our children, protect our families, let us make better choices, inshallah. So I just wanted to put that out there because it's weighing on my soul, like I said, um, and I want to just uh, get the word out. Now, let's uh, change gears, inshallah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So... For the past couple of weeks, we have um, been reading from this amazing text called Agenda to Change Our Condition by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and Imam Zaid Shakir. And if you um, have not been following along, I invite you to go to the MCC Facebook page or YouTube page to look at the previous sessions. Um, this book, mashallah, is amazing. It's life-changing. It's transforming. And I think everybody should have it and should read it. Um, and we should especially be teaching this type of content to our youth. They need to be uh, taught skills and, and given the tools to navigate this world. And this is the type of content that will do that for them. So I encourage everybody to get it. But the area that I've been focusing on in the past co- couple of books is actually at the end of the book. So we're doing things a little differently. And the reason why is because it's just so profound um, what's in the appendix. I mean, the whole book is, as I said, transforming, uh, transformative. But this uh, section in the back, the appendix A, there is uh, advice here from Sidi Ahmed Zarouk. Um, and he is a noble scholar uh, of, of his time. Um, but he wrote here, Foundations of the Spiritual Path. So with each session, we've been going over this uh, long list of, it really isn't counsel, it's nasiha, but the way that he structured it is that he you know, lists what are the foundations of a spiritual path. So if you decide to commit to a spiritual path, what would you need, right? How do you, what, what are your, your goals? What are you trying to, what are the objectives? So he puts that out there and then from there he proceeds to um, sort of, uh, give you the or deconstruct it to, to tell you what steps you would need to get, you know, the prerequisites before the steps that he's listing. So we're kind of again going in a very interesting way, but that's why this is such a fascinating um, piece. So we covered quite a few different things already, but where we stopped last week, actually, we had just shared because in the in the middle of his um, advice here, he actually inserts advice from another scholar, Abu Hassan al-Shadidi. So he, we covered that last week, the advice that Abu Hassan al-Shadidi gave. And then from there, he goes back. So now we're back to Sidi Ahmed Saruk's counsel. And I'm going to pull up a screen share so you guys can follow along with the, with the content that I'll be reading. So let me go ahead and do that, inshallah. Just give me a minute to pull everything up. Ya Allah. Screen share. So, Bismillah. Let's do present and, oh, sorry. That happened too fast. Share and then present. Okay. So, after, um, as I said, he shared Abu Hassan al Shadri's Nasiha, which I'll, let me actually show you that. So, the last thing that we covered last week was this. Um, which, again, is not from Sidi Ahmed Zarouk, but from this other scholar. 
And so he talked about different people in our lives, right? And what they will direct us to and whether or not they're beneficial or they're harmful. So he, uh, again, you can watch the previous uh, broadcast to, to get more content here, but let's go ahead and move on to see Ahmed Zarus. So now let's look at his wording here. He says, <clears throat> I say complacency, persistent sin, and negligence of Allah in solitude are the roots of all calamities, pitfalls, and faults. They in turn engender five afflictions. So these, you know, just the way that he's written this, complacency and then persistent sin. So every one of us, as we're reading this text, the best way really, I think, to do this is to constantly do that internal check at every point and ask yourself, where do you fall, you know, in, in this spectrum? Are you in a place of complacency where you're just kind of, you know, not really doing much and you've gotten very comfortable with whatever you are doing and you're not really motivated to do more? Are you in a place of sinning and falling into the same sins over and over again? And again, not changing are you totally negligent of Allah? And remember, all of these things, he qualifies them um, in solitude. And I think that's really important as well, because as you, as you study, or as we, we haven't covered it on this, uh, in this uh, program, but I have in previous um, you know, discussions talked about the 25 diseases of the heart that Sheikh Hamza has outlined in Purification of the Heart which is another book that's highly, highly, I uh, highly encourage you to get. But, you know, we talk about the importance of or distinguishing uh, whether or not you are doing things for show, right? Ria, Ria is ostentation. And this is a disease of the heart where you're, you basically perform. It's performative. Your spirituality is all uh, for show. So in public, you have one persona and then in private, you're a totally different person. So we want to, again, look at how we are in private, not how we present ourselves in public, because that really shows us where we're at with Allah. Anybody can perform. The munafiqeen, um, they performed. You know, they, were, they did everything. They, they would pray in the masjid. They would, uh, you know, fast or, or pretend to fast. They would say the shahada. So they were, you know, outwardly, they look like everybody else and they behave like everybody else, but the true believer, our reality re is reflected in how we behave in solitude. So again, as we're going through this, always do that internal check, ask yourself, where do I fall in this spectrum? Where am I with this? Because he's telling us right there that these behaviors, right? That when we become complacent, we persistently sin, and then we become negligent, complete ghafla, heedless, right? Of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the root of all of the calamities, pitfalls, and faults. So all the stuff that we're seeing personally, right, in our own lives, but also look at our world right now. I mean, for those of us who are in the state of California, it's, uh, you know, it looks like the apocalypse outside. It's, I'm getting pictures and videos from people in different parts of the state. Uh, there's a haze that is so strong uh, it's just, it looks like a, one of my cousins, she sent a, a picture. She said, it looks like the, the sepia filter, right? Which is an old name of a filter, but it has that yellow tint. Um, and this was, you know, broad daylight, but there's just, just really gloomy and, and dark and, and quite uh, just, um, uh, it's, it's unsettling to be honest. But this is, you know, subhanAllah, one of so many things we've seen already uh, in the year 2020, right? And of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in full control and, he does as he wills, but we have to take these things seriously. You know, it's not just like, oh, a difficult weather pattern. I mean, that's, of course, the, the scientific or material, uh, you know, world, the lens of, of the science and of the material world. But for us, we, we don't take these things lightly. You know, alhamdulillah, we had, for example, Imam Tahir, uh, may Allah protect and preserve him. But earlier today, he was uh, encouraging and he actually did uh, lead a prayer for rain, you know, because when you see these things happen around you, we can't just whine and, you know, be upset and angry about it. We have to remember to turn to the one who's putting them, you know, putting us in these predicaments and call on him for relief. So 
you know, pray, uh, praying for rain and pray, asking Allah for relief because, you know, people are, have been evacuated. A lot of people are suffering. I, mean, I know people who have uh, asthma and, you know, it's really difficult to breathe, you know, and I was just thinking, subhanAllah, with COVID and, you know, the pollution of, of this world, everything that we've just, you know, we've just caused so much destruction with all of, uh, you know, the chemicals and just everything that we've done to the, to the climate uh, and to, to our world. And then COVID and its attack on the lungs. And then you have these fires. It's like, subhanAllah, there's this, you know, it's like um, there's a, you know, I'm just imagining that the, the earth is suffering, you know, so much as this deep uh, constriction of, of its of its airways and we've we have a hand in that you know we all have done something or not done something to contribute to that so when we find ourselves in this situation we have to ask Allah about that again for relief from that and and uh, so alhamdulillah we do have our our amazing uh, scholars and teachers leading the way in, in those efforts so you know just uh, follow follow their lead we have to restore the balance you know our teachers may Allah bless them do so much for us um, and so we have to make the offer them, remember them, and then follow their lead, inshallah. But it's so important, again, like I said, to, to go back to yourself. And then so here, these uh, these qualities, right, um, that we just discussed, uh, that he just outlined uh, uh, or defined for us, they engender five afflictions. So they'll actually, um, you know, these five uh, other spiritual diseases are related to them. So let's look here. Number one, he lists preferring ignorance over knowledge. So again, there are some people who, you know, they have the fight or flight response to stress, which is normal, right? But if you find yourself always running from the problem or just in denial, not really wanting to hear it, you know, you this is, you know, as they say, remaining blissfully ignorant, um, this is blameworthy, right? We can't just turn away from things that are right in front of us for our own convenience or because there's a discomfort that we feel around it, or we would just rather not know because we're too busy enjoying life. Um, so our, our state of mind as Muslims, as believers, is that we always want the truth. We always prefer knowledge. And, and sometimes it's not going to be easy. You know, I certainly know people who I get it, they have a hard time coping, or maybe they get triggered. And so in those cases, those are exceptional cases, people with trauma, you know, I'm not speaking to that, because those are, we have to be sensitive, everybody's different. But there are amongst us, those who, they just really don't want to be inconvenienced with the truth, right? So they would rather not know. So if you find, you know, that this is something you it just it's a burden to know things you want to redress you know address that because then who else you know if every if there's only a few people who who have to carry the burden and then they you know and the rest just get off and, and don't have to worry about it is that fair right but if everybody is aware and that we're all trying to do something about the problems that we that we see then inshallah likely we'll get solutions faster but also it's just it's a more fair response right so i think we just have to all internally like i said with our own conscience ask ourselves where where again you know do we fall here are we the type that runs from responsibility really that's really what it is essentially right cuz knowledge is power and when you're ignorant you can just be just you know ignorant and you don't have to worry about things so um think about that now the next one being duped by every spiritual charlatan so this is certainly um a reality you know there are many people who fall for those who you know just are eloquent they have the right words they may promise things that you know they really can't promise um, they profit off of whatever you know they're they're selling or their their you know promises they're making or uh, whatever claims they're t they're attesting to that they can profit off of that. So it's if if you're not aware of yourself or you're not really doing the the necessary work to become aware of who you should follow or not, you likely will fall for those people. You know I've seen it many times. 
uh, in our community, um, you know, or heard stories, I should say, about about people, uh, especially back home in, in some of our countries, who they make money off of the innocence, um, but also the ignorance of other people, right? If you've never read, you know, the Quran or never engaged with the, the Book of Allah or engaged with the, the Seerah of the Prophet or know, you know, the uh, know your aqidah well, then sure you may. Uh, believe someone who has again claim who, who makes certain claims and you may fall for it especially if you think about people who are in desperate situations right it's like they they want something so desperate from uh from this world that they may turn and pay you know a pretty penny for oh this person will make dua for you or they'll give you this or they'll give you that and you know people who are alhamdulillah not ignorant or they've actually pursued knowledge which is you know, the first point here, they don't prefer to stay in that state of ignorance. They know not to fall for, for everybody. And they know that, you know, the true uh, alim or the true person of knowledge doesn't, you know, they're, they're not like sorcerers or wizards, you know, they don't have magical powers. Uh, they have strong yaqeen and they can certainly, um, you know, if Allah wills, uh, they can maybe their their du'as or their you know certain things, but it, those aren't they don't they, they themselves would never make a claim about it. They may just out of their uh, grace and generosity offer to make du'a or maybe offer you some you know a formulaic prayer or wird, but they themselves know that everything is in the hands of Allah, so they don't speak definitively about things you know like oh do this for sure this will happen to you nobody can predict those things it's all in the hands of Allah so uh, you know again knowledge would would uh, pr protect uh, you from from falling for those types of people neglecting one's duty in important matters so obviously you know you become just uh, too you know relaxed about about things and we're seeing this you know uh, more and more in our society and in and certainly in our community where there's a watering down right and you see other faith communities have has, have gone through that as well where the the true the core tenets or or practices of their belief are taken seriously by by people in certain you know uh, roles but but then the majority uh, don't really follow through you know, you can see this in other faith communities, and that's the danger that of of not taking your your faith seriously is that we, we we may see that happen. May God protect us from you know from that, where only a handful of of strong Muslims remain, where they pray their far, they they don't question you know the 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 um, what the faraid are. They don't try to you know have a different interpretation of a reverse or hadith and apply their own whims and desires they don't do that they just you know this is what Allah said it's in his book this is the prophet I said I'm sunnah I'm going to follow it that type of just devotion um you know may Allah protect us from from being from that reality where only a handful people handful of people are doing that or you know the numbers are just dwindling um because we're we're, we're taking our faith not as seriously, and we start to um, neglect the important things that we should be doing. So that's the unfortunate result, though. If you start to, again, you're complacent, you persistently sin, uh, you'll just be neglectful. Um, exalting in the spiritual path. So this is when you are, you know, and you can see this. It's, it's interesting because, you know, people um, are at different levels, right? And so you will see people who may not really be doing um, a lot in terms of their prayer and their own personal practice getting swept away or emotionally swept away with with uh, with you know this with the path or certain aspects of the path I should say. So it's like their lens is really off because you know there's we have work to do. You know we're we're here to worship Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and there's work that's required of that. You know you can't just sit back and and um and just want it all to be about your feelings you know and that's in experiences and so that's all that you care about is that you just want to get that spiritual high but then when it comes to actually working for it um you're not doing as much and that's what what 
you know, point number five also is about when you're hastening, like you want certain things. For example, I've heard people say this, you know, and it's again, just not having a clear understanding. Like khushu is something that it's a byproduct of effort, right? It's a byproduct of effort. You have to be working hard to be in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify your heart, sincerely try your hardest to have presence and mindfulness in the acts of worship that you do. But you can't expect khushu to enter your heart without effort. And I've heard people, that's one of the reasons that they don't pray, for example, uh, you know, that, oh, I don't feel it. I've heard people actually say that. Well, when I pray, I feel disconnected. You know, they're just words that I don't quite understand if, you know, if it's a non-Arabic speaker. Um, and so they'll find all these justifications to ba- essentially say, I don't feel a spiritual high in my prayer. So sometimes it's like, ah, why bother? That's a total waswasa. It's complete, you know, astaghfirullah, because, you know, th- those are gifts from Allah. You know, to have a spiritual, spiritual opening is not something that you should feel entitled to without any effort. You should, I mean, if, if you get that, that's incredible, and you should be in a state of absolute gratitude. But this idea that it is a prerequisite to you worshiping just shows uh, an entitlement that you should really deal with and say, Astaghfirullah, you know, why do I feel that I'm entitled to that? You know, like people who, who get upset and angry and then demand that God reveal himself somehow you know sometimes people get in and it's you know these are just uh when you study aqidah with with the you know teacher properly and you understand it you'll know that that behavior it's just that's not uh from from the from the believer we shouldn't do things like that where we expect uh, anything from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we are completely at his mercy and no matter how much we do and how well we think we do it at the end of the day, as uh, Sheikh Hamza always says, you know, um, that we should all, all always ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his mercy, not assuming that any of us have done enough to, to warrant some reward from him, because we have it. And that's why, you know, the famous hadith about the man who, who worshipped for 500 years, and then he shows up on the Day of Judgment. And the, I mean, it's a, it's a lengthy story, but just quickly... You know, he, he's told to enter Jannah by, you know, by the mercy of Allah. And when he hears that, he's kind of taken aback because he worshiped perfectly for 500 years. So there's this transaction that happens between him and the angels. And then um, when the angels, you know, uh, uh, um, recanted the story or, or, you know, relayed the story back to Allah, and of course Allah knows, already knows, um, but but still, in the story, it's it's stated this way. Uh, Allah tells uh, them to reply that okay, all of that worship of 500 years was for just the blessing of eyesight. And so when the man heard that, then he said, okay, by by his mercy, I'll enter. Like he realized it was foolish to think that you know, even though he was devoted and he did all that he did for that much time, Allah gave him that that much time that it wasn't, it didn't warrant the, the reward of Jannah. And that the only way we enter Jannah is through the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's many other hadith that support that. Even the Prophet Sallallahu was asked about that from the Sahaba. And he said, even himself, it's all by the mercy of Allah that he will even enter. So we have to get out of this mindset that we're entitled to things, you know. But um, this idea, again, of wanting some big opening or some your dua to be answered you know i made a stikhara why didn't it get answered and i i you know i've dealt with people who have been through a lot so i'm, I'm in no way trying to trivialize or diminish people's states everybody has to find out again where they are in this but there are people who've been through a lot and so shaitan attacks those people with these types of ideas you know and so we have to remember all this place is a place of tribulation. It's a place of difficulty. We've been told that from the very beginning. You know, it's throughout the Quran, throughout the Hadith, where these reminders are there that this is, we're only here to be tested. So, you know, we're here to work and we're here to 
to uh, to show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we take our covenant seriously. You know, when we testified that he's our Lord, we took we take it seriously. It's not just lip service. You know, it's not just, um, we're not nominally Muslim. You know, we actually mean it. And the way that you prove that is through your actions. And so, you know, just keeping that in mind that, we're not owed anything and that we have to strive and work hard for it. So these, um, this is the advice that he shared here. Now, the next slide. So these five, um, so yeah, so just to be clear, um, when you are complacent, persistent in sin and negligent of Allah, then it engenders, it causes this to happen. Now these five are then, uh, then cause five more. So let me go ahead and move to the next slide here. But there's, of course, a delay. Just, okay, went too far. Bismillah. Okay, here we go. So these foster five other afflictions. First, preferring innovations to the sunnah. So, you know, if you again, know that the Prophet did things a certain way, but you'd rather do it your own way. This is where you have to, you know, be very careful. Um, because Sahrullah, I mean, nobody's way is better than the Prophet. No matter how good it might be or logical or you know, sometimes people make things appear to make more sense. But this isn't, you know, we don't look to logic or we don't look at to convenience or efficiency necessarily. We look really to how did he do it, you know, if he prayed a certain way, um, all of the, obviously the different acts of worship, but we, he's our example and that's it. But if you find that you would rather listen to, um, you know, someone else's, uh, and there are, there are these people who come up with their own ideas, you know, this and we're living in a time, Sahrullah, where these ideas aren't just, you know, they're spreading because we're, you know, we're, we have we have the internet and we have access to uh, to things that by the, you know, just a click of a button, you can access someone else's ideas. You know, you don't have to wait to meet with them or hear from them or wait for them to do anything public. You can just, it's within seconds, someone just has an idea and you can go follow them on some social media platform and you'll you'll suddenly be aware of their ideas. So there's a lot of people who have ideas and you have to be careful not to um, fall for that trap that because they're smart, you know, they have that degree, they, um, you know, they, they, they're accomplished, they're successful, they're wealthy, they're in a position of power um, that, that because they speak a certain way that maybe their idea is, refreshing you know it's new it's progressive all these words that are used to make it sound shiny and and uh possibly better if it's against the sunnah of the prophet it's nothing right that's how you have to be and you have to uh have to keep that in mind right that nothing is better than the son of the prophet and and again like i said you're gonna see a lot of people who make claims um, but you have to be careful not to, uh, in any way, you know, fall, fall for those claims. Um, because when they, it's arrogance. I mean, if you think that you have some, your knowledge or you've, you know, a, a, a more, um, again, you're, you're more profound in your insight about something, than the Prophet you're deluded and you're, you know, all the bala, that's just straight up arrogance. So be careful of following people like that and also following messages like that. Um, next is imitating vacuous people instead of those of substance. You know, so vacuous are people who are just not smart, and un, you know, ignorant people. Um, again, you know, there are a lot of ignorant people who claim to know. There are people um, who don't, for example, who don't even know. Uh, Arabic, but then they will um, claim that they have some nuanced ideas about certain verses in the Quran or certain hadith. I mean, come on, you have to know that that right then there discredits them. I mean, if you don't even know the language of the text that you are attempting to analyze and you know and uh, 
and comment on, then you are clearly deluded. But unfortunately, again, a lot of people, they speak well, or they have a platform, or they have some status, and then, you know, people fall for that. So make sure that you can distinguish between the two. Because again, all of those material or worldly things are not what make a person, uh, you know, give give credit, don't give credibility to someone when it comes to um, religious, religious understanding or, or, or insight. It's really their character, you know, and people of, of the path are, they're just, you can tell, you can tell when you meet them, they're humble, they remind you of the prophetic example. Um, and they, their actions follow their words, you know, so they don't have that duality where sometimes, you know, and we see a lot of that too. We see a lot of duality in our world today, but people of Allah are very consistent people because the Prophet was consistent and they're on his path. So you don't find, you know, duplicitousness. You don't find, you know, one way with, with this group. And, and, and then I present myself differently here. It's just, you're consistent. So that people of substance are consistent. And of course, they fear Allah and they have taqwa and knowledge and all of those virtues. Um, behaving capriciously in both trivial and weighty matters. So, you know, when you constantly follow your whims and desires, you, your ego, your nafs is in control. That's it. If you don't take life seriously, this is the kind of person you end up being. Someone who's just always, you know, making light of really heavy matters um, and even maybe a mockery out of, uh, of out of things, just because you're you know you're kind of in that uh, place of of you know nothing really matters. What's the point? Everything's a joke. And you see a lot of that um, in our world today. Just so much cynicism. Um, people don't really take things seriously. Everything's a joke. Uh, you know, it's stuff for a lot. It's very dangerous because the world is very serious. We're in a very serious place here. And if you're not aware of that or you're so deluded and, and distracted by all the entertainment and just, you know, nuffs, just giving into your whims and desires and catering to your base desires, then sure, if that's all you do all day, play video games or watch movies and listen to music and eat and go out and laugh and have fun and shop. And, you know, it's just constant, you know, distractions from, then you're not going to see the seriousness of this world because you are medicating or kind of putting yourself in that stupor, right? That, that sleep state. Um, although you're waking, you're wakeful, you, because you're you're in denial of reality, which is this is a place again of tribulation, of grief, of loss, of pain. You're gonna suffer, suffering. It's suffering is everywhere. You know, there's innocent people who are suffering every second of every minute of every day. Innocent people who don't deserve, you know, uh, as we as people say, right? They don't deserve what they're getting. Suffering is just part of dunya, right? It's here, but it's a very serious place and we should take our lives seriously. I mean, that's not to say don't enjoy aspects of dunya. No, as the Prophet said, you know, he enjoyed aspects of this dunya and it, this is again, following his sunnah, but it's in balance. It's not that you live to play all day and you live to entertain all day. You, we live to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why the believer that's your priority every single day. When you wake up, you should be thinking about, you know, where what your objectives are for, for that day in terms of your worship of Allah. Number one, most important, of course, is your prayers. You know, there's people who don't take their prayers seriously. Um, and that's a very weighty issue. It's the first thing, subhanAllah, that we're going to be asked about on the Day of Judgment is our prayers. Um, so if you don't take your prayer seriously, then sure, you're likely not going to um, take other things seriously as well. But being be very careful because this is what that behavior leads to. When you're negligent of Allah, you're just persisting in sin, you're complacent, right? All the things that we talked about in the previous slide, all of those things happen. And then this is uh, what further happens. It's like a, even more spiritual, you know, disease entering the heart that, that is uh, manifests with this type of behavior. 
preferring fantasies over realities. You know, this is one of the diseases of the heart. Living in, um, like having false hope and just living, you know, fantasizing and getting lost in your thoughts and not really, again, you're not really present because if you're present, then you're aware of what? Your own mortality, right? You're aware of it. It's like right in your face. You can't deny it. But if you're not really present in the day because you're, you know, again, getting lost in dreams and hopes. And again, it's not to say we shouldn't have goals and hopes and dreams. It's about you, what do you, how do you preoccupy your time? If you, you know, are, are doing things where you're always in a dreamland situation um, and not, you're likely not going to fulfill the obligations that are in, right in front of you, you know? And there's people who, I mean, just think about this, for example. There are people who read a lot of books, okay? Like nonfiction, they just like stories. And so they, they're in book clubs and they have their Kindles and they're always reading, reading, reading other books, right? Just regular, any subject books. Um, but they'll get so caught up in those books that they will forget to pray or that they don't prioritize prayer. Same with television, you know, movies, social media. If those things, because again, you're lost in the fantasy of what those things, the worlds that are open up to you through those mediums, you know, which is really what it is if you think about it. Social media, film, television, music, books, literature, all of these things are like portals to other worlds, right? To escape our own reality. Um, and so if you get lost in those other worlds, then what happens to your reality? Well, you know, obviously it's going to go to the wayside. And that's exactly what we're seeing every single day in this world. But it's not, you know, when we zoom out, we don't have to always focus on, on just spiritual matters, but reality in general. There are people who get so lost or obsessed with their addictions, whatever they are, because again, they're escaping their own reality, that they neglect their children, they neglect their spouses, they neglect their parents, they um, go into debt, they don't take their finances seriously, they you know lose their employment, all because they have gotten into this uh, habit, destructive habit of just escaping whatever reality they, they're in, with the vice of their choice, right? And and what does that do? It ends up eventually destroying them. So we have to accept that people who are successful spiritually and worldly don't do that. And there are there are people who are very successful. They're not, you know, for example, you know, there's people I just I forgot who it was, but I was just um recently watching something and someone was saying that how they you know, they've never, they're not Muslim, but they were saying they never drink alcohol, never drink it uh, because they don't, they're, the, their mind is focused. They, you know, they know what they want. They're very, um, you know, clear about their, their goals and objectives and they don't want to uh, compromise that, right? So they don't engage in that type of behavior where, you know, I want to buzz and I just want to escape reality. Uh, so a lot of people who are successful in the world also don't they don't uh they don't fall into that behavior they don't do drugs they don't do alcohol uh they just stay away from it you know of course there's certainly people who do that stuff a lot of people but it's interesting right to see that you know they ha they could right it's not that like they uh, necessarily have something that prevents them other than the fact that they you know made that that choice that i don't want to compromise myself or put myself in in that situation so i'm not going to do that but again, you know, spiritually successful people, worldly successful people, they're not always trying to run away. So we have to look at our behavior and find out, you know, or figure out where our particular escapes are and whether or not they're affecting our spiritual health, you know, because it could seem benign. Oh, what's the harm? I'm just playing, um, you know, Tetris, <laughs> okay, or watching sports. Sure, you know, those could be totally innocent, you know, leisurely activities or fun games that you're engaged in. But again, if you are defaulting or, or, or shirking your other responsibilities, um, right, you're not um, fulfilling your, 
your obligations to Allah first and foremost. You're not growing, you know, because there's the ritual acts that we do, but there's also a simultaneous growth. You should, you should, inshallah, we should all see growth, right? Like from where we were last year, the year before, the year before. Our hope is that we're growing um, and, and our understanding in our practice that we're incrementally getting better. So if we're not seeing that, but then we're escaping and we're giving time to these other things, this is clearly a problem. And unfortunately, I think because again, the world that we're in, these are so ubiquitous. It's everywhere. You really, it's very hard to escape from it, you know, because it's just, everybody's doing it. A lot of these things. And it's just so normal. It's so normal, normalized in our culture. But when you're assessing your spiritual path, which is what this text is all about, right? Just trying to figure out where you are on the path. You do need to take inventory about what you're engaging in, where your time is being used, what you're not doing enough of. We all have to do that. That's, that's muhasaba. It's literally taking inventory, taking account. Uh, And you can do this daily, every day, you know, you can mentally just kind of check in where did you mess up that day, but also in general, trying to see where you, you know, were from maybe, as I said, a couple of, you know, months ago, like in Ramadan of this year to now, what has changed for the better or worse. So you can do those regular check-ins and then do the larger check-in where you see like, man, you know, last year at this time, where was I, you know, did I do anything? Have I done anything big or made any strides in a particular area? You know, and, and that's what, what we should be doing regularly. Declaring insincere claims, you know, some people stuff like again, they will um, just, it's a delusion, you know, they'll make claims of, and it could be many things, many examples, but like, you know, dreams, for example, a lot of times we have to be very careful about our dreams, you know, like sharing them, but also sort of exaggerating them to maybe um, convince ourselves or other people about where we are. I know there's, um, yeah, it's, it, I mean, shaitan could easily delude someone to think of themselves as being what they're not through these types of tricks, you know, where you start to make claims that are just not true, whether it's about yourself or other people, or you have, there's insincerity, right? You you don't really mean what you're saying. You you might, you know, um, you might, again, for the sake of your own reputation, uh, maybe claim that you will do something, that you're not going to do something. It's just the, the, the sincerity is missing. So it could be either trying to exaggerate things and make yourself appear a certain way or to, again, protect yourself from maybe some consequence or, you know, just to be liked maybe by other people um, that you will make insincere claims. But these are all, again, they should all trouble us and may Allah protect us from, from having these types of qualities. Um, how much time do we have here? Oh, we have just a few minutes, subhanAllah. Time goes so quickly. It's interesting because it's like, I always think it's an hour. I hope there's enough content, but then... <laughs> Mashallah, we start talking and it just ends so fast. So let me stop the screen share because there's there is there's more advice to come, more comments. But I want to see if there are any questions or anything like that. So I'm going to check the Facebook page, see what we have here, Inshallah. And if you do have any um, questions, please let me know now. Let's see. Okay. So I don't see anything on the on the Facebook page, but let me check the YouTube because I know sometimes there are questions there. Okay. So I don't see anything here. Um, 
Yeah. Does anyone have any questions before we end? I'll keep all of these open. I have a lot of windows open right now just so that I can see the thread. But no questions or any questions? You know, it's a, like I said, um, it's a really transformative text and there's a lot of food for thought with the text like this that sometimes um, questions and realizations may come after the fact. So I'm happy, you know, I don't know if, um, well, you guys should all know where, where to find me, but I am on social media. So you can always message me on Facebook or Instagram and let me know if you have any questions. But for now, I don't see anything. So just have a few minutes left. I didn't want to start the next section because it's five more points. And so I stopped beforehand. But for next week, we'll continue with the same um, you know, text or the same section of this text uh, of Agenda to Change Our Condition, the Appendix A. We'll continue and see uh, what more insights uh, are to come. It's really, again, fascinating. SubhanAllah. So thank you again. I didn't see any questions. I hope they don't pop up like last time after I hang up or um, after I end the call, hang up. <laughs> Uh, after I end the Zoom. Uh, but inshallah, if you have any questions, please feel free to message me privately um, in the meantime. Okay? All right. Thank you all. Let's go ahead and inshallah end in dua. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wa al-asr inna l-insana la fi khusr illa ladina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasul bil haqqi wa tawasul bil sabr. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika ashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الحمد لله جزاكم الله خيرا ان شاء الله we will see you guys in two weeks where we will continue with the agenda to change our condition and uh, we'll see you guys then all right السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته everyone i want to apologize first of all um, for being late uh, we uh, changed the time, and I'm not sure if you guys all saw the changes to the time change. It was done a little bit uh, hastily, and that's my fault. I actually um, wanted to change the time from 8 to 9, and I completely forgot to do that. So please forgive me for that. We uh, here in California, our Maghrib comes in around 7.30, 7.35. So I just thought it might be better to change the class time to after prayer so that people aren't anxious or rushed about the prayer, myself included, um, and we can just peacefully uh, have the class. So I requested the time change a little too late, um, but then in addition to that, I've uh, we were just uh, going through some technical issues. My internet is a little unstable right now. I don't know why. I haven't gotten any uh, notices from our uh, provider that there's issues, but um, it's pretty slow and I'm having a very difficult time loading the page. So if there's any... Uh, issues with the broadcast, I want to apologize in advance. I'm going to just do my best, inshallah, to get through this hour, and hopefully you guys will stick around with me. But thank you for uh, being here. We have been doing a class now um, with, uh, uh, I mean, here at MCC, covering a text, and you can watch the previous broadcast. The class is on Agenda to Change Our Condition. We, we're going to, inshallah, I hope, my hope is to go through the book properly. But I wanted to start off with this particular section, uh, which is in the back, the appendix section. And so that's where we've, we've kind of done things a little backwards, but it's okay. There's a, um, you know, there's a, there's wisdom in, in inshallah and hopefully inshallah and in doing it this way. Um, but anyway, let's, I'm going to try to broadcast this. If you just give me a minute to, subhanAllah. Okay, something's going on. I don't even know if you guys are with me right now. I'm getting a message that says fail to live broadcast. So I might be talking to myself, but khair, we record these sessions. So if the live broadcast fails because of internet issues, then inshallah, we'll at least have the recording and we can do the class, I mean, post the class later. But let me see if it's just my internet or if it is actually on the web page. I'm not sure. 
Just give me one moment, Bismillah. Okay, I don't see the broadcast for today just yet. Maybe it'll kick in in a little bit or in a minute. Oh, wait, there we go. All right, I see something. Uh, let me see if I can share it now. That would be very helpful. So that way it's on my page as well. Um, okay. Bismillah. It's, it's very slow. All right, I don't know how to share, or it's just not loading. So I'm just going to share it after we're done. All right, so Bismillah, um, we went over the advices that um, Sidi Ahmed Zarruq gave on foundations of the spiritual path. And as I've explained in previous videos, he sort of does, um, you know, a deconstruction in a way of the path and how one uh, lays the foundation of their spiritual path, but goes, you know, in this order that's very interesting in terms of what to look out for, what, you know, the objectives and the pitfalls, the dangers of the path. And so last session, which was two weeks ago now, right, we meet every other Thursday, um, we started off on this section, and I do have a presentation. Let me see if I can at least post that. Um, I'll share screen, inshallah, so that you guys can see what I am doing here. So let me, bismillah, present and uh, share. Let's see if this works. Present. Okay, so this presentation, oh, we ended on last time, let's see, was it this one? No. We ended on this one. So this is the slide that we covered at the very end of our last session, which um, again, there's different advices that he gives about the spiritual path and each one sort of leads into the previous one. So we talked about how he says here, I say that complacency, persistent sin, and negligence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in solitude are the roots of all calamities, pitfalls, and faults. They in turn engender five afflictions. So when you are complacent with your spiritual practice, you're persistently sinning, and you're negligent of Allah when you're alone, okay? These are the roots. The, this is where all of the spiritual calamities will befall you and faults. You'll start to, you know, really display faults. And once you do those things, you're going to follow up with five more things. And so he lists these. So we went over this. You can watch the previous session where we talked about all five of these. And then for today, we're going to talk about what he says. These five qualities right here, they actually foster five more afflictions. So if you, you know, do these things where, and that are listed here, you're going to eventually do the next five. And that's this list here. So... Number one, having obsessive compulsive thoughts during worship. Um, you know, as someone who, alhamdulillah, you know, has been, again, working with different people throughout um, the community for the past 20 plus years uh, and hearing talks and hearing, you know, even our teachers talk about these realities. This has been a constant theme that I've heard uh, from from many people about how to control one's thoughts, especially during prayer, right? The waswasa, we're all afflicted with, with, with waswasa, right, during prayer. But some people have this, um, you know, really uh, to a degree that's very difficult for them to have any peace or khushu in their prayer because, you know, they're under a clear spiritual attack uh, during their prayer, but it can come in the form of this, of this type of, you know, obsessive compulsive thoughts. And it can be about anything and everything, you know, just being distracted. Maybe sometimes you're looking at the prayer rug and instead of thinking about, you know, the, the verses that you're reciting or reflecting on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now you get lost in the pattern of the carpet that you're praying on or in some other thought that you've been maybe thinking about or dwelling about. So this is one of the, uh, you know, um, the afflictions that can manifest if you, again, have what we just covered in the previous set of five. The other one is, um, oh, actually, I'm sorry, Sidi Ahmed Zarruf, he talks about this, about obsessive compulsive thoughts, and he says, they arise from innovation, the basis of which is ignorance of the sunnah, uh, or some psychological affliction. So if you have obsessive compulsive thoughts, you might likely be innovating or, or adding things to your practice that are not from the sunnah. 
Um, and this is, you know, when you become very sort of too relaxed about your spiritual practice and you don't take it as seriously, you're not as committed to following the sunnah um, and disciplined in that way, you may, um, you know, follow your own whims and desires and start to innovate or introduce ideas that are new to worship. Um, and then from that, this can uh, happen where you start to just have thoughts and you don't have real peace and for sure. Another obvious, and he also, you know, talks about psychological affliction. So that is true for some people. This just could be, you know, a condition or some disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, right? There's uh, real problems that people may have that could contribute to this. So it's important to make the distinction there. Um, then he says, overindulging in normal human activities. So his commentary, he says, as for those overindulging in worldly matters, right? Had they realized they would know that worldly engagements are a dispensation due to human frailties and should be limited to the necessities of life, nothing more. So indulging in worldly matters or just being excessive in, uh, you know, leisurely activities, for example, things of pleasure, enjoyment, when you're overindulging in those things, um, you're, you know, prone to have have these types of spiritual problems. They'll just become worse because those things are just given to us, you know, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, we're human beings, we're weak, right? We have certain needs. And so we're allowed to enjoy some of this dunya, but not to become completely obsessed with it and uh, distracted by it to the point where we forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we forget our obligations. And so this is the danger of, overindulging is that you will create habits that are very difficult to break and you will likely um, renege on more important matters like your prayer, like your responsibilities and duties to your family. You know, people sometimes get swept away by hobbies and by obsessions and by, you know, things that they really love. It could be music, it could be sports, it could be things that are not necessarily in and of themselves haram, but because they distract one, then that's what happens. So um, it says here, no one is unrestrained in worldly pursuits unless he or she is far from Allah. So it's a sign, right? That if you become so unrestrained and, and just pursuing different things of, from this dunya, that you, you may likely be away from Allah because that's, you know, um, when you're connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's, you know, the, your whole world revolves around worship of him, remembrance of him. So you don't really have that much time to dedicate to just, you know, indulging your desires and whims all the time, right? You don't do that. There's balance and you know your boundaries. But if it's unrestrained because you're just, you know, obsessed or you have these, again, uh, enjoyments that you indulge in all the time, then you're likely going to... Um, It'll come at the expense of your spiritual uh, connection to Allah. So another um, affliction that would manifest if, you know, from, from these bad habits that one would, uh, you know, fall into is gathering ritually for invocation and chanting. Now that might seem like, you know, a little perplexing, like wouldn't that be a good thing? Well, sure, if you're, you know, balanced in your practice and you are, you know, from time to time, just enjoying those experiences, just to, you know, revive the heart. It's one thing. But if you're not even praying your prayers consistently, you don't fast, you don't uh, pay the zakat or do all of your fard, and then you find these opportunities to get together for those types of events, and you'll make time for those things, then you clearly have, you don't have your priorities straight. And there's also a delusion that can come about because you think of yourself as someone who is spiritually, um, you know, practicing and you're, you're really connected. But when in fact, this is uh, this isn't, you know, a reflection of your, of your spirituality. It's just a reflection of you following your own whims and desires, because you may just enjoy, you know, the, the ambiance of those gatherings, you might enjoy the social uh, aspect of it, you might even enjoy the benefit of the, you know, the dhikr and, and whatever enjoyment you get from that. But when it comes to um, a spiritual practice that if, if it comes 
you know, um, if you're not even, as I said, doing the more obligatory acts, then this is just delusion. So he says here, as for devotional gatherings, they are permitted for people overpowered by their states or as a respite for people of excellent character. Indeed, such practice is akin to alighting upon the carpet of truth if done according to its conditions among suitable people and in an appropriate place, not to mention fulfilling its required courtesies and protocols. So there's a decorum. There's, you know, there's certain etiquette about gathering in those places. And you have to be aware of those conditions, aware of those etiquettes. And you also have to be mindful of who you're gathering with. You know, if you're mixing with people who, again, may not know, um, you know, may not have a, a good character or know their faith properly. And they're just sort of doing things based on, again, their own whims and desires. And that's all this ga these gatherings are. And there's really no uh, respect for, for these uh, necessary protocols. And it's also dangerous, right? Um, so then we have drawing attention to oneself at every opportunity. So this is also really dangerous. You know, we live in a time where people want to be seen and heard. And, you know, this is uh, just the reality of our world with social media and the pursuit of fame and popularity. And, you know, it's just, it's very um, intoxicating, right? To want to uh, have people talking about you and, you know, just know, being aware of, of what you're doing and, and having, uh, sorry, I'm seeing all these signs that are saying my internet connection is unstable. I really hope you guys can hear me. Otherwise, I'm talking to myself. But khair, inshallah. So, um, <clears throat> as I said, you know, it um, it's just such a big part of our world now where people are really, they want to be seen and heard and they want that, you know, um, they want um, attention for everything and anything. But if you start to do that, this is really going to, I mean, it's clearly a reflection of your state because the, when you're on a spiritual path, you don't want that. You don't, you want the opposite it actually, um, because you recognize that your deeds, especially that those deeds that you do for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ta are, are best done in, in secret and they're, they're best when they're hidden, not when they're shown. So you don't actually want people to, uh, you don't want to draw attention to yourself for really any reason, right? Um, but unfortunately, again, when you don't have um, clarity about these matters, then you fall prey to the tricks of shaitan, which is what we're seeing, um, you know, a lot of people unfortunately are affected by this, is that he makes <clears throat> the pursuit of fame, notoriety, really exciting and you know it's just what everybody wants now so we have to be wise and realize that that comes with a very serious price um to your spiritual connection when you do things for show for public show it's one of the diseases of the heart if you study you know purification of the heart ostentation riya in arabic summa which is you know wanting people to know what you're doing and you know to talk about you to kind of share boast uh, you know, about what you're doing in front of people so that it gives you some sort of clout, um, you know, or status with people. Those things are diseases of the heart. But if you see our world now, that's what a lot of people are into self-promotion, you know, uh, whether it's uh, on social media or otherwise, they don't mind talking about their, uh, you know, accomplishments, their, uh, their resumes. They're very open about everything, whereas people... Who are on the path, they realize that those things are better left hidden, and uh, and to to keep your oneself sincere, and one's intentions sincere, that you always, um, you know, you fear the opposite, which is um, being known and, and having, uh, you know, attention from people. That's something you actually push away. You don't want it. So if you're drawing attention, then clearly it's a sign of of serious spiritual affliction. A company, the last one is accompanying worldlings, even mixing with members of the opposite sex and adolescents, deluded by events um, that happen. So this is a little bit more, you know, uh, extensive here. And remember, he's speaking uh, in the context of his time. Um, so when he's talking about Sufis, he's speaking about people who are, you know, spiritually, you know, on the path, right? 
um, and then making mention of their judgments and justifications. So this is just in general, you know, mixing with uh, with people without really looking at the quality of those people and being very free with who you're mixing with. You know, um, we see a lot of intermixing now. We see a lot of mi people mixing with different levels of people. So it's like we don't have standards anymore and everything is just free and open. And we're not really mindful of how, uh, you know, mixing with different groups of people may impact our own selves, right? So he says here, <clears throat> And he talks about, he says, resorting to creation is eschewing reality, especially when one resorts to an obsequious pedant, a thoughtless tyrant, or an ignorant Sufi. The company of the immature is oppressive and both a worldly and otherworldly fault. So, you know, really, he, and then he goes into the description of immaturity, like how this is, uh, you know, another, um, you know, sign of someone's state is that if they're not really you know, a, a little bit more um, judicious with the type of company they keep, they invite immaturity, you know, into their uh, lives through the people that they, that they hang out with or that they mingle with and that they, you know, commune with. So he says here, immature means anyone not conforming to the spiritual path you are on, even if he's 90 years of age. I say an immature person is one who never persists in anything, but jumps at each new occurrence and is impassioned by it. You generally find such a person among the devotees of the path. So there are some people, and I think he's specifically, again, speaking in the context of his time, but he's talking about some people who get on the path of spirituality and they are very zealous. You know, they get very excited. They're very excitable people, um, but they're not very serious. You know, they're not disciplined and they kind of maybe jump around from, from one thing to another. And so he's warning about, um, you know, again, surrounding oneself with that type of uh, person is that they may, again, because they're on the path with you, uh, assume to be of, of good character, but you find that they are rather immature in their practice and in just in their worldview. Um, and so then he talks, he says, so then, okay, so, uh, so after he talks about this group of people, he goes on, I mean, these five afflictions, he goes on to talk about um, he says, anyone who claims to have a station with Allah yet reveals any of the following five is either a liar or is deluded. So now he's moving on. So he's, you know, these are five afflictions that are going to come to those who have the previous, you know, uh, signs, right? Uh, the, and let me see if I can move the slides over again. There's a bit of a delay. So I apologize with the internet. I don't know. It's not cooperating with me today. But um, let's see. So this, these five, right, lead to these five. And now that we're done with describing these afflictions, these spiritual afflictions, he's now being very clear about, you know, who is delusional in their spiritual state or who's just a flat out liar. And you have to be careful and know how to recognize those people because there are people, unfortunately, who, um, you know, pose as being spiritually somehow enlightened and they're you know they have so much knowledge but when you look a little deeper you may find some qualities about them that actually say the complete uh, opposite so here are the signs that he's outlined he says that <clears throat> a person who's uh, uses one's limbs in sinful acts right away you no matter how they look right let's look beyond the surface look beyond the hijab, the beard, the, the, you know, garb of, of a practicing or spiritual person, look beyond the surface and look at their actions. <clears throat> if you find that they're engaging in sinful acts, no matter what they say or how, what they claim to, to be, you should know that that person is a liar or he's, or he or she is delusional, right? Feening piety. So if they are acting like they're very pious, um, but in fact, you know, they're, it's, it's kind of performative almost, you know, you have to be aware that these, this is also a delusion because you don't have to be over, you know, the top with P, you know, with acting pious and just, you know, it's all a show that, that kind of behavior is not, um, is not a sign of someone who's genuine and sincere. You know, there's, the, the believer has a comportment that, 
that does display self-respect and humility in a very beautiful way. So if you, you know, uh, completely are over the top and with, with, a, with a display of, of PAT, that's a red flag. Desiring the ephemeral world. So people on the spiritual path, they know that this world is fleeting, right? Ephemeral is like, it's just, it's all going to go. And they don't attach themselves to this dunya because they realize that. So they have loftier goals. They're not, you know, they don't, they're not afflicted with diseases of the heart like, uh, like a, you know, hubba dunya. They don't, they don't, um, you know, want or, or aren't obsessed with the, with this dunya or material wealth or, you know, just things, uh, status, things that are, are from this world. They're always think of, they're always thinking of the next life. So their goals have to do with reaching, you know, Jannah, pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're not stuck in this world, right? So again, people who may make claims about their uh, spiritual level or, you know, awareness or height, whatever they, they claim, you want to look to to these qualities. If they have these qualities, then, then that's clearly a red flag. Um, the next quality is speaking ill of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's servants. So again, people on the path who are sincere, um, they don't talk ill about other people. They don't, you know, uh, they definitely don't engage in things like riba, but they also don't unveil people, you know, like there's some people who are quick to unveil other people and they don't really have a, a problem with doing that. Um, or just speaking in general in very uh, hateful language where it's just, you know, there's, they're, they're quick to condemn they um, they're judgmental. They will, like I said, unveil people. Those are all qualities that you want to stay away from. And lacking the respect that Allah commands toward all Muslims. So, you know, Subhanallah. That's also another. Um, it's sort of ex you know an extension of the previous one because clearly, if you speak ill of people of, of the servants of Allah, then you don't have respect for for them, right? Um, and so this is. Uh, another quality is that if you're speaking in a way that um, where you're insulting or speaking down to, or you're you know thinking of yourself as better and there's little respect, uh, then you're not mindful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, does, ha we do have rules about how to, uh, to treat one another as believers. And part of that is to honor and respect that we have rights over one another. So, a person who is on the path would do that knowingly. They know th those rights, but someone who claims uh, certain things may not do those things. Um, so that's something to be mindful of. So then um, he goes, so after he describes these qualities, right, which are the qualities of liars and delusional people, he then says, let's see, he has, he has commentary, I think, on this section. But he says, after this, he says, such people rarely die in a state of grace. So Allah may Allah protect us from, from having any of these negative qualities. But then he says, so after he describes the, the, these negative qualities, right, of people you should stay clearly away from, then he goes on to say that the qualifications of the spiritual guide with whom the seeker may safely entrust his or her soul are five. So now we're going to go to the opposite. So what do you look out for? I mean, these are all clearly things you want to stay away from. So what do you look for when you're looking for a spiritual guide? So he goes on to say, and again, just give me a moment because the internet is slow and not moving. Okay. Bismillah. Okay. So here we go. So these are the qualities of um, trustworthy spiritual guides, so people that you could trust. So unadulterated spiritual experience, you know, you can just see from maybe what they share or who they are that there's no, you don't question, um, you know, their, uh, their level because their, their level of practice is, al is in alignment with the sunnah, right? They, they're reflecting haq, they're reflecting truth. It's not, there's no bid'ah in there. There's nothing that's strange or just a little makes you uncomfortable. Everything is clear. It's directly from, you know, the Prophet or the Quran. They, they're very clear and transparent in their practice and they're on the path. So it's unadulterated. There's nothing that they're adding 
or omitting um, and changing and altering. It's just, you know, it's very, uh, as I said, crisp and clear in terms of their practice and their experience. Sound outward knowledge, pretty self-explanatory. So again, what they're teaching, what they call you to is from the tradition. It's not their own ideas and just things that they've made up. It's uh, verifiable. You can find it, the evidence, the proofs. So people who are on the path uh, are, are very comfortable, you know, sourcing their knowledge. They're not just speaking without doing things like that. They'll, if you ask them directly, well, where'd you get that? If they're sharing some knowledge with you, where did you hear that? Where did you learn that? They'll be able to cite their sources or tell you exactly where they got that from because their students are committed and they, they're not speaking from themselves. Most of the time, you know, people, again, who are on the path, they um, take their knowledge seriously and they give credit to where it's due. And, uh, and they, um, their, their knowledge, as, as it said, is sound. So you don't question it. Celestial aspirations. This is what I was talking about before, right? Loftier goals. They're not just looking at the dunya and trying to, um, you know, make it big in, in the material sense. They actually really are striving for Jannah. They're striving uh, to against themselves to uh, for the pleasure of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So they take um, the bigger objective, the bigger goals as their as their goal, which is to beyond this dunya, right? It's beyond this world. Um, they also have a pleasing state, right? So when you're around someone who's truly, inshallah, uh, worthy of this, you know, the station of being considered a guide and, and teaching other people, you will draw to them, right? They'll they just have something about them that makes them likable, that makes them lovable, that makes them trustworthy, that uh, gives you a sense of calm and peace. Um, you know, you won't see things in them that make you uncomfortable, inshallah, because they have that beauty, right? And most people who are, again, on this path, especially if they've reached that level of being a guide, they understand the importance of inner beauty. So akhlaq and having you know, all of those beautiful prophetic qualities that they try to develop will, will emanate from them when they speak, when they sit with you, when they look at you. They have a, a way about them that's gentle, right? This, these are all prophetic qualities. So there's just being in their presence is something uh, beautiful and that you enjoy. And then the penetrating spiritual discernment. You know, uh, not everybody, you know, has, um, I mean, there's a lot of people who have knowledge, but they not, might not have wisdom. So to be able to discern things uh, with wisdom, right, to have uh, that, that uh, ability to look at things from a holistic perspective and to weigh things in their proper context and to really, again, have this skill set isn't something that everybody necessarily has, but people who've been on the path for a while and who've studied and who've sat with the ulama and the scholars and they've taken from them, they, uh, they, inshallah, this may be something that they receive from them, which is this ability again to have wisdom in the way and in, in, in insight into things and not just, you know, uh, sort of a sp superficial lens, but they can actually de uh, penetrate deeper with, with, with their insight. So these are all the qualities that he's described about, again, people who are in, uh, who are worthy of being trusted. And then he says, beyond this, he says, whoever has any of these five qualities, right, can, uh, cannot be a true spiritual guide. So now he's switching it again. So we're going back and forth. And you see this, you know, sort of shift happening throughout this list. But now we're going into what you want to also be careful from with spiritual guides. So the previous list, we're talking really about, you know, what can happen with pitfalls, right? Your own spiritual pitfalls. But now he's focusing on guides. Like if someone's making a claim to be a guide, you want to know what to look for and what not to look for. So these are the five qualities that if a person has, they are not qualified to spiritually guide anyone. And they're likely charlatans, right? First and foremost, ignorance of the religion. So they don't really know, you know, um, the dean very well. Uh, they may know, you know, a few things here and there, but 
when you actually um, look to their how much they've studied or how you know who they've studied with what sources they've studied they, it may be very very little and so they don't really have sound knowledge disregard for the reverence of other muslims so again you know there's a certain level of respect that uh, everybody's due every human being is due but when it comes to someone who claims to be a spiritual guide they would know uh, to you know look to others especially other uh, believers, other scholars, maybe other learned people with us, with this, with a level of mutual respect. Right. But if you're, you know, someone who's in it for yourself or just, you know, uh, rep- misrepresenting yourself to be something you're not, you may um, disparage quickly other people. You know, there might be, um, you might have no problem talking bad about other Muslims or other Uh, people that you think are not maybe at your level or whatever so it's just this very negative quality to to talk you know disrespectfully about other people meddling in matters that do not concern him you know this is clear or her this is clearly you know the the prophet told us about minding our own business so people who um make claims you know that they can guide you but then they're also you know really nosy or just want to know and and meddlesome those are qualities that that, that are uh, they're not compatible with anybody who who's truly a spiritual guide. Following whims and everything, so you know, making up their own rules about things on the fly, not really taking the you know the Sharia or fiqh uh, seriously, for example, would be one thing, or just making fatwas for themselves whenever it whenever they need it. You know, it's just like, oh, it's okay. There's people, unfortunately, who are like that in our community who tend to make rules for themselves. You know, there's always these exceptions to to the rules, and they somehow find those exceptions. Um, Or remorseless displays of lack of comportment. So when they do lose their comportment, when they kind of, you know, act out of line, they don't really care. There's no feeling of guilt. Uh, Maybe they justify it. They they uh, they don't really feel or they're not showing any humility because uh, we all I mean people lose sometimes control of their the, themselves they may lose their temper they may say something they don't mean but people who are truly sincere um, and striving against themselves right for the sake of Allah will admonish themselves they'll be quick to you know want to correct themselves but if you're someone who doesn't have that ability then you show show no remorse at all. You'll just uh, act as if nothing happened. So, again, these are the five qualities that Sidi Ahmed Zaruq uh, defines as someone who cannot be a spiritual guide. If they display these qualities, you don't look to that person um, for, for guidance. Now he shifts, and we're almost at the end of this, but he shifts now to the courtesies of the of a student, so now if you're a student and you want to have a, you know, a, a relationship with a spiritual guide and also your f- other students who are on the path with you, there's also, there's expectations of you too um, that are, that are, that need to be made. Like how do you, if you find someone that you want to learn from, um, how do you conduct yourself and what qualities should you want to have? So he talks about that in the next slide here. Let me wait for this to come up. I apologize again. Okay, here we go. So this is the courtesies, right? The adab of a student with his or her guide, as well as other students. So first it says, following the directions of the guide, even if contrary to one's own preference. So this is interesting because I think it's very different than modern... um, academia right where in our modern world it's almost encouraged to uh, be a little contentious with someone who has more knowledge than you so you see a lot of that behavior in classrooms whether it's you know on college campuses or in high school I mean I'm a teacher so I've seen it before where sometimes students feel that you know that they they get rewarded by other their peers um, and sometimes maybe even other adults, but if they, 
you know, can prove, for example, their teacher wrong about something or they go against them or they just show this. There's no real reverence. There's no real respect. There's no humility that this person has, you know, some level of authority or knowledge above me. It's just sort of seen like it's a very different dynamic. But in our tradition, we do look to our teachers with this level of respect and uh, this acceptance that they may uh, ask of us to do things that we may not like in the moment, but it's beneficial to us in the long run. I kind of liken it to a trainer, you know, a, like a, a, a fitness trainer. Um, if you want to get in shape, uh, when you go to the gym and you sign up, your trainer might ask you to do things that are, you just do not want to do because your nuffs doesn't like it. Right. But if you trust them that they are actually trying to get you into a healthier place, then you follow what they tell you to do. Same like with a doctor, you go to a physical doctor and you check, do a checkup and they tell you that you have problems. They may give you a medicine to take or may tell you to do certain lifestyle changes. But if you trust that they have your best interests at heart, then even when they tell you to do things that you don't want to do, you are still accepting of that. So you have to keep that in mind is that you, you trust them with your, your trust, you're entrusting them with your spiritual guidance. So you should also entrust that what they tell you to do, inshallah, is for your benefit avoiding what one's guide forbids, even if doing so seems highly adverse. So the same opposite, right? If they tell you not to do certain things that you don't, um, you know, push back or argue or try to find loopholes or whatever, that you just consider that again, whatever they're telling you to do or not telling you not to do is in the same, with the same intention. It's for your benefit. Honoring one's guide when he or she is present or absent, alive or dead. So, you know, you, you, there's a sense of duty, a sense of loyalty, a sense of fidelity, uh, the same that we would expect from uh, our family members, our loved ones, people who are taking care of us. We do, this isn't, you know, for most people, this is very common sense. You know, why wouldn't you speak well of someone in their absence or when they're present, if they're alive or, or if they've moved on, when you have this sense of connection with them, you know, this, this uh, duty, this, this bond that you've formed. So the guide has the same, right? You, you speak well of them and you defend them. Fulfilling his or her rights to the best of one's ability without neglect. So if there are certain um, rights that they have over you or expect from you, that you try your best to fulfill them. And then the last one is abandoning one's understanding, knowledge, and leadership to that of the guide, unless they are already in accordance with one's guide. Now, here he has a little bit of, he has a footnote because he's, he's going to explain what he means here because it's not what we may think, which is, you know, completely um, abandoning one's uh, own you know, mind and, and taking on or, or doing everything that your guide says. That's not what he's saying. He says here, actually, this, so this last point, he says, this does not mean surrendering one's sovereignty to another person as the relationship of a subject to a tyrant. Rather, the student foregoes the ego's desire to constantly lead and be in control. A true guide does not cultivate a controlling relationship based upon despotic models of domination. So now he's speaking also about, a tr you know, the quality of a true guide. So you, if you're with someone who's really got your best interests and they are actually worthy of this, you know, station again of being a guide, they're not going to want to control you. That's not the objective to, you know, just have you as, you know, some sort of, um, you know, indentured, uh, you know, servant to them that you, they just get to tell you whatever and you do it. That's not the point. Uh, he says, on the other hand, even in the world of material travel, a guide cannot lead someone who has hired him if he refuses to follow his directions. The best model is the Prophet's relationship with his companions. Hence, a guide should exemplify the prophetic character. So, you know, being like the Prophet's lesson where there's a difference between commanding and demanding respect, right? The Prophet ﷺ had this ability where because of his beautiful character and all of the virtues he possessed, 
uh, people wanted to serve him. They wanted to uh, follow him and, and take his opinion. And they preferred his advice over their own all the time. Why wouldn't you? I mean, he's the problem's license, right? But his example is uh, set before us so that we know that the quality also of a spiritual guide should be in aligned with his example, where they're not demanding, they're not, you know, uh, manipulative, they're not in any way tyrannical in the way that they are with you. They're very gentle, but, you know, you not wa wanting to take uh, command of your ego are willing to, um, you know, in, in a way, just take on your teacher's uh teachings above your own so it's really more um, a reflection of your own willingness to go against your own ego and and that need to always be in control and to lead and to say you know what when it comes to my spiritual um, health or my spiritual well-being i don't until i get to that level of real awareness or discipline or practice i should defer to someone who knows better for me and that's what it's about it's about deferring to your teacher because that's exactly the purpose of your teacher is that you're asking them to help you because you need help but if you uh, are resisting their advice or you're not listening or you're willing to go against what they say then you are still your ego is still in charge right and so that's what this is about it's about overcoming that so alhamdulillah this was the full list of again the foundations of the spiritual path of Sidi Ahmed Zarouk. It's one of um, there's another in, in this appendix, there's an appendix B. The next is the Council of Imam al Nawi. So, inshallah, we can likely, yeah, I think it would be good to go over this. And then there's even more advice from Sidi Ahmed Zarouk. So, for future, um, for the next broadcast, I think I'll, I'll still try to finish Sidi Ahmed Zarouk and then we may look at. Um, Imam Anawi to see what he says. Actually, his advice is pretty short. So yeah, for next time, I'll continue um, with Appendix B and C, which are, again, the Council of Imam Anawi and then the Council of, uh, of Sidi Ahmed Zarouk. So we have even more, mashallah, advice from these amazing teachers um, and scholars of our past who've left us such... Um, so much, you know, ad beautiful advice for all of us. So, alhamdulillah, there's a lot of benefit in this book. And we will, inshallah, uh, with future sessions, um, go through the actual text from the beginning. Because there's, you know, chapter one, for example, taqwa, its definition and benefits. Chapter two, the heart and its treatment. Chapter three, practical steps to change our condition. Four is exercising for attaining taqwa. Five, civic involvement, and then it gets into the appendices. So you see that, you know, this is why I feel like this book is so relevant because a lot of us, we need all of this, right? We need all of these advices. But here's the book for those who may uh, be here for the first time. Agenda to Change Our Conditions is by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and Imam Zaid Shakir. Alhamdulillah. So I'm going to go ahead and stop here. I have no idea. I hope the recording <laughs> went through because... Uh, we had so many problems with the internet, but inshallah, you guys all were able to tune in and understand and there wasn't any delays or glitches. I'm going to try to see if there's any comments on the on the chat here, and I thank you for your patience. I again apologize, today was a little rough. Uh, we started late, we had some internet issues, but hopefully next time I won't have these problems. I thank you for your patience, you guys. And I'm again waiting for the for the Facebook page to load so I can see if there are any comments here from anybody. I'll also try YouTube. Uh, so just let me try both of these in the few minutes that we have left. I don't know why this panel of the page is so slow. It's really running very slow today. and I haven't had this problem in a long time. Hmm. Even YouTube is not loading. SubhanAllah. All right. I, oh, you know what I'll do? Let me check my phone. Maybe that will be better because I can get off my internet. So just one moment. I want to make sure I don't um, 
miss any questions if there are any. We have just a few minutes left. I, I, oh. oh, you know what? I'll do them. Sorry. <laughs> so, as a parent of two daughters, I thank you for all that you do. Oh, you're so sweet. Thank you. This is um, Sister Rashad Mushfiq. Or, no, brother. I'm sorry, brother. Sorry. my. <laughs> I, I thought I read it at Rashida. Okay. Thank you so much, brother. That's very kind of you. Jason Ross, alhamdulillah. Thank you for all of your very kind comments. Jazakumullah khairan. Are there any questions anybody has? It's really, um, I can only see the Facebook page right now, but let me check the YouTube page. Maybe there are sometimes, subhanAllah, you know, there's people tuning in from various locations. And so uh, it's, that's, which is really nice. I really appreciate that, that you guys are tuning in. So yeah. Oh, there are a few people still here. Okay. Are there any questions? <laughs> the delay is funny, huh? I don't know. Wow, this is going to come up in the recording. That's funny. Gosh, today is as if it, it's as if it's my first time ever doing these. That's what's funny. Um, okay. So I can't unfortunately see the chat box. Oh man, brother Salman, if you are here with me on Zoom. Do you see any questions that I can't see? I can't see the chat box on the YouTube on my phone. Um, but do you, because you're with, you're humbled I'm moderating. Please make dua for Brother Salman, mashallah. He's very helpful and he helps to uh, arrange these classes for us here at MCC. Please make dua for all of the staff at MCC. They're fantastic. But uh, alhamdulillah, I'm very blessed to have such a great team to work with. If you are still there, I know you, mashallah, um, were also juggling a few things. Can you let me know if there are any questions in our Zoom, maybe chat, and I will follow up also. Let me see. So, um, any questions from the YouTube page? Okay. So let's see. We have like four minutes before this is over. Although I did start late, so I could stay a little longer, and I don't mind. But this is such a – the reason why I love this book is because it's got, alhamdulillah, such a great um, – there's so much conversation that it can generate, you know, just from one of these lists of five. I mean, if you're, if you followed along for the past few weeks, um, you know, each slide that I presented, I think is enough to have a really good, healthy discussion. We're just kind of going through it and doing a very quick reading of it. I do encourage you to get the book and, and study it and look at it and consider all of the points that we've brought up in these past few sessions for yourself because we're all, inshallah, we're all on the spiritual path, right? We're all trying, inshallah, to do our part to, to, to protect our hearts and to cultivate, um, a, you know, that a healthy environment for our spiritual growth, for our families. You know, we're doing our best, inshallah. I know it's not easy, but it's this type of advice is just gold. I mean, you know, it, it lays it all out for you, how to, what the foundations are, how to avoid pitfalls, what to look for, what not to look for, red flags. Because, you know, that's one of the things too about like, for example, the purification of the heart. Why is it such a powerful transformative text? Because you could be practicing this faith for decades and doing everything, you know, but then if internally you haven't figured out that you're, you've got disease, like spiritual disease, um, that could be corroding all of your acts and it could be, you know, destroying the purity of your acts because you haven't worked those things out, then how tragic would that be, right? But that's what this, you know, studying these things, it gives us an opportunity to really do the inner work to say, it's not just a matter of the outward, right? Because even the munafiqeen, they... Uh, they worshiped outwardly, you know, you could, we could all do that outwardly. So you have to find the balance between the outward and the inward. So you, sure, you have to fulfill your, your obligations, but internally you should be constantly working on bettering yourself. So that's why these, these texts are so important. And may Allah, you know, increase us inshallah and protect, protect us from, you know, delusion, protect us from our own uh, arrogance, protection, protect us from all the spiritual diseases. But sometimes that, those are the things that work against us. We think 
of ourselves a certain way, you know, and this is definitely a problem in our world where our own, we get in the way of our own spiritual uh, well-being because of, of the nafs. The nafs can delude you to think of yourself as better. You know, there's people, which is why self-righteousness is, is also a disease of the heart. You can find people who've been practicing for a very long time, but astaghfirullah, they uh, have this affliction where they do think of themselves as better than people who may know very little, who may not do very much in terms of their outward practice. Um, but that right there is a sign that, you know, all of that is, what is it good for? If you just sit um, judging people all day long and thinking of yourself as better than everybody else, because maybe you pray five times a day, maybe you fast for the, all of, you know, your adult years, or you've made 10 hajj, you know, if you've, you've done all these things, but if you're, if that leads you to a place where all you can do is judge other people, then you've clearly missed the point uh, because that's not, Islam, that's that's delusion. It's a matter of you know, like I said, ha aligning yourself with with the example of the Prophet Sallam, and he was is the most beloved to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, the most perfect human being, and yet he was also incredibly humble. So who are we to think of ourselves as anything compared to him, right? But yet you'll find many people, not just Muslim, but many people who have this. Know, arrogance about them. So these are the things we want to seek uh, protection from and ask Allah SWT always to remove that veil of delusion, of self-delusion, so that we see ourselves for what, for who we truly are and are not, um, are, and are willing to admit our own shortcomings and our own faults and are willing to work on those things, which is the benefit of having people in your life who can spiritually guide you, whether it's one teacher or if you have like sahba. I know it's not easy for, for many people. There's people who are uh, maybe they don't have, you know, scholars accessible to them or teachers accessible to them. But if you can find a good group of people that you um, help each other with, you know, you, you, you support one another, sahba, right, which is so important, they can serve as your, you know, spiritual uh, guides in, in a way of, of, you know, doing that checks and balances with one another. You know, when you are with a really strong group of people, you can, you know, ask, you know, where, uh, or, or just sort of see, because the believers are mirrors for one another, right? So you can, uh, they can hold you or hold you to a high standard and you can hold them to a high standard and you can do that for one another. And inshallah, it's mutually beneficial for everybody in that group that you, um, you know, that you, when you're with each other, for example, you don't engage in idle talk, you know, you don't waste your time talking about things that are like other people or have no benefit, um, that you are productive, you know, that you talk about things that are beneficial or you do things that are beneficial, you engage in good works. You know, one of the things like that always puzzles me, um, is in the modern world, for example, like with, um, when we socialize, like socializing is now in, in our world, it's all about passive sort of entertainment or being entertained. That's what we think of socializing, uh, which is sad because if you are working full time and you have all these responsibilities, um, but then as soon as there's some open, you know, opening in your schedule and you have a little bit of time to maybe do something enjoyable, that the only thing you can think of is, oh, let's go watch a movie or let's go you know, do something, go to a concert or something like that with people that you don't see every day, you know, your friends, your family, your cousins, people that are, hopefully you have strong bonds with, but then when you do meet them, that's all you're doing. You don't realize like that's such a waste of your time together because one day we're all going to go. And then do you want to look back at every memory you have? If you had snapshots of all those times you spent with people as just being, you know, things that you were doing in a social setting or would it be more meaningful to get with people and actually have meaningful conversations and connect and get to know each other on a deep level and do the dhikr of Allah, talk about, you know, beautiful stories, share beautiful stories with each other and inspire one another to good, you know, to really have good time with one another. That's quality. That's, that's re that you'll get rewarded for. You know, and as opposed to, 
you may as for a slip and you know say something you shouldn't say or uh, you know, hear something you shouldn't hear which is oftentimes what happens right when you're not on guard but if you're very choice in who you spend your time with and how you spend your time then you can protect your spiritual heart but unfortunately like i said we have this um very interesting concept of how you know work hard play hard so this this is how a lot of people think like i'm just gonna fulfill all my responsibilities and do all these and then the rest of the time all i'm gonna do is seek out entertainment and enjoyment and give in to my my nefs all the time but that doesn't really produce what you think it does it actually from from a spiritual lens it does more harm if that's how you use your time your time is very valuable and even though it might seem counterintuitive to read a book for example when you have free time as opposed to turning on the tv and just watching a movie that movie you're going to forget about it right how many people watch a movie or a show and you don't remember it you cannot remember it afterwards it did nothing for you uh you may have even fallen asleep during it uh, i know that's happened to me several times i know other people too it's like you know you just you're checked out or your your brain can't really uh stay stimulated by whatever you know it is so you you made doze off so it's it's meaningless it has no real impact on you and you wasted that one hour two hours or whatever if it's like a bollywood movie you're looking at three hours sometimes <laughs> um of a waste of your life but then what if you had instead you know like i said taken a book that has been collecting dust on your shelves for years and i know we all have i have in my office here books i'm looking at a bunch of books i have had them for years and you know they're all looking at me every day going when are you going to read us uh so yeah and i've had i have to force myself sometimes to make that decision i'm not going to just go and you know do indulge my nerves i'm going to do something serious so having a a, sh a shift in your perspective about how to use your time is really uh helpful but if you have supportive friends and supportive people in your life that you spend time with they'll encourage you to do things like that they're going to tell you yeah it's a good idea you should do that or they'll give you, they'll give you helpful tips and they'll always be looking out for your best interests those are the kinds of people you want to spend time with not people who are just pulling you away from the remembrance of Allah and pulling you into whatever you know pastime that they're interested in and they're just you know and that might sound fun like i said it might be fun here and there but at the end of the day you know we're all going to be responsible for ourselves and how we use our time so we have to just put on our a more serious thinking hats and contemplate what is the better use of my time you know to always just do frivolous things and nothing really serious or to take myself a little bit more seriously and start to develop myself start to enhance my understanding uh you know uh, grow in my knowledge and uh perfect my practice and even though we'll never be perfect the pursuit of that is also there's great benefit to that if you spend time really trying to think about how can i make my prayer better right and you do that as a sincere act like i want to improve my prayer ya allah i pray let's say you pray inshallah you pray all your five prayers but now your intention is i want it to be quality prayers it's not that i'm just doing them but i want them to be really good so how do i do that what should i do and you know and then there's there's ways to improve your prayer you know our teachers taught us for example that you don't just look at the prayer you have to also look at your wudu you know that's the benefit of having a good teacher is they'll point to you maybe in a direction you didn't think about like sometimes people think of wudu and prayer as being separate but they you know as the saying goes that the quality of your wudu will reflect you know the quality of your prayer or vice versa right however your wudu is it will reflect in your prayer so it's actually that's where you should focus on cuz wudu is an act of worship but a lot of us are very quick with our wudu right we're just you know sloppy and we're it's just a water uh bath all over the place you know water sprayed everywhere and uh we're rushing usually because we don't time manage so if we're doing a hasty wudu likely we'll do a hasty prayer 
yes, inshallah, Allah is the most generous and hopefully inshallah ta'ala he'll accept. Uh, we can only hope what we put forth. But when you start to really want to improve yourself, that's the kind of prioritization you do, you know. Would I rather go watch a game or, like I said, go shop for five hours? Or would I rather study something that will help me in, in my spiritual path? So this would be an area that you then you know dedicate to, which is how can I improve my prayer? And then you start putting it into practice, you know? So you start instead of rushing your will do or rushing your prayer and just doing all the short surahs you know, you start to add a little bit of the lengthier surahs you know. And if you don't know lengthier surahs, then you might start to memorize a few lengthier surahs. And then if you don't know the meanings, you start to memorize the meanings and you start to understand and you start to think and reflect. And so this is how it's like a, you know, um, a domino of, uh, or, or a snowball effect. It just one thing leads to the next. And inshallah, you find yourself busying yourself with more worthwhile things as opposed to frivolous and wasteful things. So, but a lot of that, again, uh, can happen organically because you wake up and inshallah Allah is guiding you and he's putting all of this into your heart and inshallah you're awakening up to that. Or it could just come from having really good friends and really good people that you that you are with and that you spend time with. Um, or that you seek time out, you know, with if you if you know people that you that you admire in in this regard, then you seek them out for their help or for their assistance, for their advice, and you just start to grow. And inshallah, Allah will give you tawfiq because in the malamal biniyat, right? Our actions are judged by intention. So if you want to if you want to draw near to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and you seek Him out in these various ways, inshallah, He will reward you for those intentions and He will increase you. The more you uh, draw closer to Him, inshallah, He'll draw closer to you. So it's this uh, beautiful, you know, um, reciprocation that happens. So inshallah, that's what we want. Um, but again, back to this book for, we'll, we'll continue next time, inshallah, with, um, with, uh, with the further the the rest of the appendix uh, appendix B and C, and then inshallah um, we'll start talking about the actual book. So bear with me. I know there's a method to my madness, but inshallah, if you're sticking around this long, hopefully you're enjoying these sessions. And uh, I'm always uh, open to hearing from you. I don't know what happened with the questions. I did not get anything, so I apologize if you are asking me anything. But you're free to email me. Um, you can email me. Uh, I can actually put my email out there. I don't mind. I have an email for public. Uh, it's events, you know, like um, an event with an S. Events.hosai, my, my, my first name, at gmail.com. Let me know if you're participating here and if your question didn't get answered uh, either in this session or in previous sessions because I know I may have missed some. Please do feel free to message me directly um, and I will, inshallah, respond to you as soon as I can. Uh, but thank you again, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. And uh, Jazakallah khairan for your patience uh, tonight. Inshallah, next time we'll be better. We'll see you in two weeks. Okay, inshallah. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm sorry for the schedule change on Thursday. Um, that was entirely my fault. I had a conflict and something come up, came up. So uh, that's why I had to uh, reschedule this session. But alhamdulillah, MCC was so gracious to allow me to um, to do it this Sunday so that there's not too much time that passes before our next scheduled session, inshallah. So with that said, for those who are maybe tuning in for the first time, you know, it's a new night. I don't know. There might be people who haven't followed um, all these weeks, but it, for those who, who are new, welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, so what I've been doing since we established these bi-weekly uh, halaqas is going over a text that some of you may be familiar with, some of you may have never heard of it before, but it's a very amazing text in my opinion and the opinion of many people, but I'll go ahead and show it to you. It's called Agenda to Change Our Condition, and this was written by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and Imam Zaid Shakir, alhamdulillah. So um, as I've explained in previous sessions, I'm kind of doing a different take on this reading because in the back of the book, there are these gems, these advices, these counsels that, alhamdulillah, they incorporated in the text. And I felt that um, these counsels are so just, there's so much value to 
looking at them and really getting a, a good grounding about the importance of studying and learning and committing to the study of our dean. And so the first um, appendix that we covered, and we talked about it at length for the past maybe three, four sessions, was Appendix A, uh, The Foundations of the Spiritual Path by Sidi Ahmed Zarruq. So we covered, he gave, you know, brilliant uh, just advice, really, but in a very interesting way. And so we did that already. And in the last session, I said that we would continue with the next appendix, which is what we're going to do today. So I invite you to go to the MCC YouTube page and check out the previous um, you know, videos, if you want to catch up and kind of see, you know, what we've been doing all this time. But even if you're just new today, inshallah, what we, we're, we're starting something new. So hopefully you'll, you'll be able to follow along with ease. Um, so with that said, I'm going to share a screen because I want you to be able to follow along as I go through this council. And this council, subhanAllah, I'll show you. It's quite amazing. It's just this one page. That's it. But as we go through it, I hope you'll realize or see why it's, uh, I find it so beneficial or, or I, you know, clearly it's beneficial. It's in this book, but um, why I felt we should dedicate some time to it. So let me go ahead and screen share, inshallah, if you give me just a minute. Um, oh, if I can have uh, Brother Salman, if you can please enable my host, my screen sharing, that would be great. So I, I forgot to ask you to do that. I'm sorry. Um, but if I can get that, then I can screen share. Uh, Brother Salman, are you with us? I don't know if you stepped away, which I um, wouldn't blame you if you had something to do. I know it's late, but if you are there, or maybe I can text you. Bear with me, everyone. Uh, mashallah, we have an awesome team, but I forgot to ask him to do this for me. So let's see. Oh, okay. Alhamdulillah. He did it. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Salma. You were quick to respond. Alhamdulillah. Um, excuse me. So one second. Let me go ahead and screen share. Bismillah. And we will get the screen up here. Okay. Bismillah. I'm going to present. So again, this is the text that we've been covering, Agenda to Change Your Condition. And so Appendix B, this is what we're going to be talking about today. This is the Council of Imam Anawi, okay? And um, this is from his text, Al-Maqasid, and it's the section concerning arrival to the knowledge of Allah. So again, it's one page, but there's just so much incredible information packed in here. So let's talk about this. Here we go. Bismillah. Arriving or arrival to the knowledge of Allah is achieved by... And he says right away, repenting from all things unlawful or offensive. So, you know, all of us, inshallah, we all want to, hopefully we all want to, uh, you know, have um, a nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We want to establish that connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're on the path. We are, you know, we, we testify to the truth of this deen and we believe, inshallah, our actions reflect that. Our heart is, inshallah, committed but there are things that we have to do, sort of like a purging, um, in order to really solidify that intention. And so this is this would be the purging process where we really look at whatever we're doing or have been doing, whatever we've habituated to, that would in any way fall under the unlawful or the offensive, the haram or the makruh. And we would really, you know, be serious about purifying our intentions because you know many people say things and they make claims, but really action is where, um, you know, is the proof of, of your uh, claim. So that's where we want to see, are you truthfully um, on this path with true intention? Then purge, purge the things that you know would displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and really just step away from those things. And everybody's going to, it's, you know, it's subjective. So everybody's going to have a different list of things to purge, but that process is necessary. It's necessary to evaluate yourself to look at what things in your life are potentially harming you, are potentially uh, derailing you uh, in terms of your spiritual growth, and start to remove things, remove bad habits. You know, if you're watching things, for example, we know that the um, eyes and the ears 
and the uh, the mouth. I mean, we we speak things we shouldn't say. We look at things we shouldn't look at. We listen to things we shouldn't look at. So that would be, you know, somewhere to start. What am I taking in? What am I consuming? Is it food? Is it drink? Is it gossip? Is it foul, uh, you know, television or film, lyrics? What am I taking in that is haram? And I know it's it's wrong and I should just stop it and stop making excuses um, and, and start getting rid of those habits. And then even what's makru, what would be disliked or offensive? You want to look at those things that, you know, you're maybe, um, again, taking the easy route uh, with certain things and, and see, well, if I'm really serious about trying to, you know, get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I should be able to sacrifice these vices, these bad habits, these things that I've, uh, you know, over time just, again, habituated to. So that's the starting point, purge. Then we have, you know, seeking sacred knowledge in, according, in accordance with one's needs. And alhamdulillah, I love the phrasing of this because, you know, it's, you can interpret it a couple of different ways, but I think I looked at it like, you know, you, we have to pace ourselves, but also, you know, remember that being too ambitious and, you know, and kind of um, putting, a, you know, putting your, your, your uh, pursuit of knowledge before other obligations, before family obligations, before taking care of the, you know, the people that have rights over you. It could be your parents, it could be your spouse, it could be your children. This would, you know, not be the right course, right? There has to be moderation, there has to be balance. And so where you are, just pace yourself. Because I've, I've, over the years, I've had to work with um, individuals who've either, you know, been in situations where someone in their family was, uh, you know, taking their their spiritual path to that extreme, you know, this, I have to go here, I have to travel to this place, I have to do this. And they were in some time, some cases, they were shirking other responsibilities because they went to this extreme. So I think what I get from this advice is to just be balanced, you know, where you are, we're all in different um, you know, places and levels in our, in our growth and our spiritual understand a path or in our understanding. And so you just, you know, grow organically, naturally, but keep that intention always instead of going into extremes because people burn out, you know, that's, and that's what Shaitan wants. He wants us to get really zealous and, and committed and, and just throw ourselves into it. But then if we don't have balance, we will burn out eventually. And then we, we may never want to pick up a book again. We may never want to attend a class again, Billah, or take on a serious study of a subject again, because it, it just, you know, it, it didn't resonate well with us and it was it may have caused further problems for us. So you create this negative association with something so beautiful and then you abandon it. And this has happened to people. So we are a dean of moderation of the middle way. So you want to take it easy and just pace yourself, inshallah. And then maintaining ritual purity. This is also something, alhamdulillah, that, um, you know, when I understood it and started implementing it, I noticed an immediate change in not only my state, but also the ease of practice. Because, you know, there's sometimes uh, steps, right, to our practice. We have to do certain things. Uh, they're prerequisites before we can do certain things, right? For example, we make wudu before we pray, right? And so... In that example, I found that for a, for a long time, and you know, this is again when you're not aware of, of things and you're not paying attention to what are the things that hinder you. Um, for a long time, it was that inconvenience, quote unquote. Uh, although, but I wish it never, of course, look at any act of worship as an in, inconvenience. But this this is the nafs. You know, we have to know that our nafs will always. Uh, prefer comfort and, you know, try to make uh, worship difficult and, and burdening, all the blah, but it's anything but, right? So anyhow, you know, we, we make these associations with certain things that, uh, that we, um, you know, that stand in our way or that we, we prevent ourselves from, from actually growing because they become, as they say, you know, you make a mountain out of a molehill. So something like we'll do, if you really think about we'll do, it's not difficult at all, is it? I mean, really think about it. What is it? It's getting parts of your, you know, your limbs and parts of, you know, your your face and your body wet for a few minutes, and then you're in a ritual state of purity. And subhanAllah, that facilitates you to read the book of Allah, to pray your prayers, you know, to be in a state of purity and to repel, you know, evil uh, energies and, and, and to attract 
good energy. So there's so much benefit to it. But the actual act itself is not, it doesn't require much effort. However, when you're not in a state of wudu and prayer enters and you think about prayer, sometimes the thought of having to do wudu is what makes you procrastinate, right? So it's like, oh man, um, you know, I, I, it's cold. Let's say it's in the winter months, you know, and I know I, I get it. It's difficult for some people. They don't like to be cold. So the idea of having to go get wet, you know, fudger or isha or, you know, times where the temperatures can drop, it just seems like such a hardship, right? So um, one of the ways that this can, you know, uh, resolve that is that you try to always maintain a state of purity so that you're more efficient in your worship, right? So even with my children, um, well, at least with my oldest one, because he's Mukallaf and he's now, you know, praying uh, his prayers. He's, he's in that age or he's learning that. But he, um, I, I even tell him, you should always be in a state of wudu. So even when you use the restroom, just make it and get in the habit of doing wudu as part of your routine, uh, with using the restroom so that you leave that state in a purified state. And then inshallah, you maintain that likely for your next prayer window, right? And you can immediately, when the, the thought of prayer comes to you, you don't have that additional step. You're already in a clean, purified state. And so, boom, you can, you know, get to the prayer rug, inshallah, and complete your prayers and then go back to your activities. So it's working, you know, around all of these barriers that uh, that your nafs and shaitan, of course, tries to create so that it makes worship hard, right? It's working around it. So being in a state of ritual purity, and of course, as I said earlier, there's other benefits too. You attract good, uh, you know, the angelic uh, realm is attracted to you and the uh, the jinn are repelled by you, the shaitan are repelled, or you repel them, you know, they, they, they can't come, they don't come near you because you're in this beautiful state. So there's, you know, that and and just, as I said, it facilitates worship. So inshallah, trying to always maintain that. And when you step outside the house, that's another thing. You know, we have to consider, you know, if you have to go run errands and you leave without wudu and then you, you know, something happens to your car, let's say, God forbid, or, you know, you end up having to do more things than you thought and time is running out and now wudu, uh, prayer has entered and you don't have wudu. And all of a sudden, what do I do? If you're, you know, not really on top of your uh, prayers, you likely will make that excuse for yourself. Oh, well, I don't have wudu. I guess I'll do it when I get home. And so you've just now missed your prayer, delayed your prayer, all because you're not thinking proactively. So being in a state of virtual purity is proactively uh, operating and working to facilitate your your faith practice, inshallah, and to really make it not such a you know burden where you look at steps that are really quite beneficial to you as being something al-dabla that you don't want to do, but rather something you look forward to doing and something that is quite easy when you really think about it. So inshallah, um, that's one of his advices. Then we have performing the obligatory prayers in the first of their time and in congregation, as well as the, oh, that's a typo, sorry, should be sunnah with an H, sunnah prayers that correspond to each of the obligatory prayers. So this is also really important. Um, and as I was just, you know, you know, alluding to that, once you are in that ritual state of purity, it makes your prayers easy. Well, that's the next goal. The next goal is to not procrastinate your prayers because, you know, inshallah, all of us now anyway, we're in this quarantine, we're home most of the time. We really don't have any reason other than our own bad habits possibly, or just not taking the uh, the time of prayer entering as seriously as we should, that we delay and we procrastinate. You know, we might get caught up in a project or we're really, you know, doing something that we think is really important. And I'm sure everybody has important things to do. But if you habituate yourself to, again, thinking that I need to have really good habits, so I want to be in a state of will do, and I need to start establishing or, or do, uh, do, you know, doing the prayers when they come in when the time enters, like it's just a goal and you start working towards that goal, it becomes something you prioritize. Then you, you know, set your alarms. We all have these devices and, you know, I've seen people, mashallah, uh, some friends who have like, you know, a long list of alarms set um, for everything and anything. So, you know, we're just in that age of, of too much information, too much 
too many responsibilities, too much juggling. So we need those uh, reminders. And alhamdulillah, we, you know, we can benefit from these devices in that way by setting those alarms that, you know, correspond to the, the prayer times so that you're reminded prayer just entered. And even though I'm doing this thing and I really, really want to finish it, it's better for me to stop this be, and, and, and do my prayer in its earlier time than to uh, let my nafs convince me in a few minutes, in a few minutes. And then we forget. We're forgetful, right? It's part of our nature. We forget. And then an hour lapses, two hours lapse. And then you're scrambling because, oh my God, Asad is about to come in and I didn't do the love. This is how many times has it happened to all of us, right? And that's uh, unfortunately, you know, one of the the tricks of Iblis is he, he likes to uh, push us to procrastinate for that reason so that we we don't uh, fulfill our obligations in their time. So making it a goal to perform your prayers in their time. And then also in congregation, this is another really important nasiha. Again, with all of us who are home, if, if like in my family, alhamdulillah, both my husband and I are working from home. We've been working from home for months now under quarantine. And so alhamdulillah wa shukurullah, all the prayers are done in congregation. Um, it's just, we've established that uh, early on. And we have even alhamdulillah, before COVID that whenever he was home, he would lead in, in his absence when he was working full time. And I was with the kids. We always pray in congregation. And I've said this in previous parenting sessions as well. Um, you know, the family that prays together stays together. You know, we, there's all these little, uh, you know, sayings, but in all uh, you know, seriousness, it's such an important thing to do with your family, with your children, to model for your children um, how seriously you take your prayer, you know, how important it is that prayer is entered, we pray together, and to have that memory that alhamdulillah, all your prayers when they were younger, inshallah, you know, they they'll have those memories as they as your children get older, that they prayed with with mama and baba and we prayed as a family. And, you know, it was a beautiful experience. It wasn't because nowadays, oftentimes when we're so all in our little silos, you know, operating, you're in your room, someone is in their room and, and someone's in another room and the whole family sort of divided because we're all either going to school or we're working or we're doing other things. We're all separated. But sometimes what can happen is that other things also start to be separated. Food, you know, people are now eating separate meals and then where's, where's the unit? Where's the family unit? Where's that cohesiveness that we all want, that togetherness, that bonding time? And then, you know, let's add in a bunch of other problems with the, uh, you know, devices that are in our hands pretty much all day. Uh, we have really a lot of um, just disconnection happening in our homes throughout. And so this is one way to stop and say, no, no matter what's going on, this is the rule for this family. If it's prayer time, we pray together so that you're not sitting in your room and just calling out, you know, across the hall to your children. If you're the mom or, or the father, you know, did you pray? And you know, you're seeing a lot of this, you know, yelling in the house about prayer because everybody's, you know, trying to hopefully be reminding each other at least. But wouldn't it be better instead of doing that to just have someone in charge of either calling the event? or playing the event, or even if you can schedule automatic events, if you have those clocks or, or apps, that it's just the whole family knows what to do. You know, this is our this is our family rule. When we hear that event, or when we hear someone ca calling the event or calling us to prayer, no excuses. And imagine, inshallah, you know, the ideal scenario, everybody's in a state of wudu, you know, all the, the father, the mother, the children, because we've all gotten into these really good habits of, of doing that. So that when prayer time comes, we, we it's just this nice, you know, subhanAllah, um, organized process and everybody gets in line and they complete their prayer and inshallah, the hearts are in sync and you, you know, do your du'as together. I've had, alhamdulillah, many opportunities after prayer where I feel I, you know, they're just golden uh, opportunities to teach a lesson to my children, to, you know, make the offer for someone in need, um, to give them really good habits so that they have those memories, but also, again, to build those habits for them that when you're pray praying, it shouldn't be rushed, you know, don't fall into what so many of us in our youth and in our ignorance may have fallen into, which is 
thinking that the world is, you know, our role in the world is so important that we have to rush through the prayer in order to get back to how important we are. And this is, again, the delusion of the nafs, um, because there's nothing more important than praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is, that's the reason why we were created. There's no other reason, right? Everything else is just his, his grace and his mercy and his generosity to us. But the purpose of our existence is to worship him. So we have to plan our lives around the prayer, not the opposite. And this is how you get that embedded into your children that says, you know, no matter what's going on, whether you're playing with your toys or doing your school homework, if, even if it's a really important test you have to study for, um, you know, Baba has a meeting, in, in, you know, that he has to prepare for. I have a presentation I have to do, whatever it is. We as a family understand prayers come in. We take our prayers seriously. We do our prayers. Subhanallah. And again, what is it? It's, uh, you know, five, maybe maximum six, seven, ten minutes if you're doing lengthier, um, raka, I mean, uh, surahs. But most of the time, even that, subhanallah, you know, we, we don't we do, not do right? Um, there's certain surahs that I think are are definitely repeated more often than others because of the nature of our of our world and and just the rat race that we're all in. But the point is, is, you know, it's, it's not a big chunk of time to pray. So making it a priority for the family shouldn't feel like it's such a hard thing to do. You should do it as uh, again, a show of, of your um, commitment and your seriousness so that it, it translates and inshallah, when you're not around anymore, because let's be real, you know, this, that's the way the world works, that our children will have had all of this time and experience with us so that they create those really great habits to carry forth, inshallah. So, you know, doing the prayers together and, of course, doing the sunnah prayers. Uh, forgive me again, this is a typo. should be S-U-N-N-A-H. Uh, sunnah prayers, um, also committing to that. You know, alhamdulillah, my kids, same thing. After our prayers, when there are, there are sunnah prayers, they know it's time to do your sunnah. And I also have a rule about no talking between the, the fard and the sunnah, where we just, you know, get up, you know, do your adhkar or your tasbih, but don't break the that moment, you know, it's a, it's a sacred time, it's a time of focus, it's a time of remembrance, and so if you start to play around or goof off or get silly or start to, you know, talk about other things, it kind of breaks that. So have those established rules as well, you know, get up, do, let's do our sunnah, and then after the sunnah prayer is finished and we've talked and we've had maybe an exchange of some type, um, then inshallah we can go back to just normal talk, but letting them know that where we pray, there, it's a, it's a space of of again remembrance of God. So we want to respect that space and be mindful. All of these, you know, terms that we now hear so often. That's the time to put it into practice. Is in those congregational prayer moments, um, inshallah, with the family. Really important and so relevant this nasiha because we need it, right? Performing the late night prayer at the Hajjid and fulfilling Witzir. Um, you know, I've heard, mashallah, over the years, many people talk about, you know, the importance of this. And even when telling stories about great, you know, saints or scholars of the past, and they would share their, you know, their, their uh, biographies and share different, you know, things that they would do. And it, it would always... I, you, you would marvel, right, at, at subhanAllah, how committed they were, how many prayers they would pray, and how much, how many uh, khatams of the Qur'an they would do, and it would just seem, subhanAllah, how will I ever reach that state, right? And, and inshallah, we all hope to wish to reach even a fraction of the state that uh, some of these uh, incredible people had. But, you know, when you think of it that way, that it seems so unreachable, then that's your nafs, right, telling you you're you know, you're not there yet. So the hajjid might seem to you like something that only the saints do or only the awliya do or only, uh, I mean, the you know, the people who are really, really super religious and just um, committed. Like you, you might have that, you, you know, idea or that notion that only certain people do that. But, you know, subhanAllah, the people of the hajjid are the people who know the value of the hajjid, you know, the ones who understand that this is such a sacred time and a time of, you know, du'a mustajab, a time of, silence you know in our world where there's so much distraction and chaos all around us and we see it you know with everything that's happening right now in our our country and our world there's a lot of just turmoil and instability and lack of certainty anxiety fear all of these things are are um 
everybody's experiencing it to some degree or another. So we need places of refuge. We need places where we can just get away from it all. And what better place than when everybody is, you know, the world is asleep and it's, it's just pit, pin drop silence in your house, inshallah, you live in a place where you can have that experience, but that it's that quiet time in the night where you can actually retreat in, into a space somewhere in your home and just connect with Allah and, and purge and, and unburden your soul and um, really show and reflect your love of him and your devotion to him and also your gratitude, you know, because it's easy to fall into despair and sadness and get really wor- you know, worn down by everything that's happening and just be in that negative state. But the opposite reaction is is what's what what we're expected of, which is to be patient, but also to be grateful, to start to count your blessings, and so that's a great um, display of of that of gratitude to Allah, like you know that you're you appreciate everything He's given you, your health, your family, your um, home, you know the conveniences of the lives that we all live, especially for those of us in the West. We have to be honest with ourselves. We are living lives of of immense uh, luxury, you know, many of us, you know, and we may not think that because maybe we're paycheck to paycheck and we struggle. But if you compare our lives and the way that we live, the clean water, running water, the fact that we have so much convenience all around us, you know, we don't have to drive or walk, um, you know, on bare feet or without shoes to get sustenance, for example. There's people throughout the world, they don't have access to drinking water or food with ease. They actually have to um, really physically uh, go out of their way. And it's it's an immense um, in hardship for them to just get the bare necessities every day. This is not a, you know, once a week thing or once a month or once a lifetime. We're talking every day that's their that's their that's their reality and they have mouths to feed they have children they have maybe parents or you know it's just if you really compare what we have subhanallah we can uh, with a click of a button um, we don't have to go anywhere food comes to us you know water comes to us everything can come to us we don't really have to even leave our homes um, so that's we have to understand our privilege and and then uh, be grateful for that privilege um, and show our gratitude so when you wake up for tahajjud uh you're waking up as a you know seeking from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we're inshallah seeking his forgiveness his guidance we're seeking from him and only him inshallah but we should also do it with that feeling of this is you know i could never truly show my uh, my gratitude to to, to the way to the amount or to the degree that allah is deserving of but at least this is, you know, an effort. It's something. It shows something. And inshallah, of course, Allah is the most uh, generous and the most forgiving. And uh, and so he'll accept it from us. That's the, our, our hope. But for taking that as something that is you know, tangible, it is something you can do. You just have to make the intention. And the way I um, like to present it is, you know, to also not make it seem so so hard that the way that you may have always thought of it is, oh, okay, I have to sleep, let's say 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, I fall asleep. And then I have to wake up at three, four in the morning and I have to pray for hours and then stay up and stay up and then pray Fajr. That, if you make it tahajjud, that type of an experience, you know, it's going to, you'll, you'll definitely never want to do it. But if you say that, what is tahajjud? It's praying in that last third part of the night, right? Or anytime you you sleep and you wake up in that night, uh, during the night, you it would count as tahajjud, right? Um, that you want to make it a, a, a process that's easy to do on a regular basis and that doesn't disrupt routine, does, doesn't disrupt your sleep, doesn't complicate your life, but it's actually something, again, easy to manage, easy to, to do. So waking up, you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes, just do it incrementally. Start off by, you know, just trying to wake up a little bit before Fajr enters. And so that you start to see the sweetness of it and you experience the sweetness of it. And then you increase and you can, you know, do it as much as you need. If you have a very early start to your day, 
and it's hard for you, then just wake up, you know, a little bit before Fajr. But uh, if you can afford longer time to do more than just pray extra rakat, or, um, you know, if you want to read Quran at that time or do a dhikr of some type and you have more time, then wake up a little bit longer before Fajr enters. So that way it's just an easy transition. And you can pray your tahajjud, you can pray your witr, and you can pray fajr. And this would be something that is manageable. And many people do that because they've committed to it. They know the seriousness of it. But, you know, this is, again, an advice for from uh, Imam Nawawi to tell us this is how we, you know, gain our knowledge of Allah and also just make solidify our our, our sincerity when it comes to wanting to be close to Allah. The next is fasting on Mondays and Thursdays and the three white days. This is something I um, I can't personally you know speak of. I, I pray inshallah that I can get to this level. I know people who do this regularly um, and, and I've, it's always been a personal goal of mine uh, inshallah uh, to do it on a consistent basis. And I know people who, again, will say once you start, it's always like exercise, like anything, right? It's always hard in the beginning because you're not used to it. But once you get in the habit of it, you'll find it's to, it's just part of you know your, your routine. And it's so easy, like anything else you do. So inshallah, but this is recommended. And we know this is from the sunnah, right? To, to fast on those days and the recommended days of the year to fast. And now we know within intermittent fasting, I, I try to do that, um, and I know friends of mine as well who are also really, mashallah, um, you know, committed to or, or disciplined when it comes to intermittent fasting. But these are all wisdoms of our tradition that now that we've known for centuries that when you give your body that break uh, to heal itself, to repair, um, and to restore, it, it can have immense blessings. And I know even during Ramadan, I spoke about this, but I absolutely feel the the difference when when fasting so inshallah may allah give us all strength and himma to do that as a regular practice um but this is all nasiha we all need nasiha right so inshallah that's something we can commit to as well um then we have reciting the quran with the heart's presence coupled with reflection upon its meanings i really um loved again the phrasing here because you know, when I was younger and we were learning to memorize Quran, children in many, you know, schools, madrasas, masajid, homes even across the world um, are taught to memorize Quran because, alhamdulillah, their brains are, you know, like sponges and they can absorb it uh, easily and mashallah, Allah makes it easy for them. So we get very focused on the memorization part of it. Um, but we don't realize that if we don't trans transition out of that, and into a more mindful state and to really pay attention to what we're saying, how we're saying it, um, and then, of course, the meanings of what we're saying, then we there will be a disconnect. So you have a lot of people who don't read the meanings of what they're saying, don't look into the Book of Allah and try to really understand um, the message. Um, but they'll know many surahs, you know. And or they they may have a lot of surahs memorized, but they never went through formal study of tajweed, which is also you know it's it's sad because when you study tajweed and the way to properly recite the book of Allah, it connects you even more to the book of Allah. So not having that, but having all these surahs memorized is in my opinion tragic, you know. And I know I was that was me for many years up until you know, my, my mid-20s or so when, alhamdulillah, I had the opportunity to, to study tajweed with, with, the, with, the, with the teacher. And so when that happened and I started to learn, you know, why we recite the way we do, why we stretch certain sounds, why we, um, you know, make certain, uh, you know, repetitions in, in, in certain parts, what, are the, what is the reason for that? And, and this incredible science of tajweed started to make sense of so much of what I was doing for years, my, throughout my childhood, my teen years, I had surahs memorized, but I didn't, never understood the purpose behind those rules or those, you know, the way I was reciting. But studying it and realizing the immense amount of, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's obviously a sacred science, but just to see how our scholars codified it and, some, you know, made it easy to learn 
um, and the way that the script is written, subhanAllah, you know, many of our mushaf, uh, when you learn tajweed, your teacher will teach you that the way that the script is written is also to facilitate the reading of it with tajweed. And there's little marks that, you know, are made to differentiate different rules as you're saying them. So suddenly the Quran starts to, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's unveiling all these hidden treasures within it um, just by the mere knowledge of the science and, and knowing how to uh, recognize the symbols as they come. So there's this connection that you make that way. And then, of course, when you start to look at the tafsir and look at the meanings and the interpretations and the difference, you know, uh, different interpretations that different scholars had of the meanings um, and the context of those uh, meanings. It's just incredible. And it makes you, your relationship with the Book of Allah so much richer than just, you know, memorizing and knowing surahs for prayer, because that's the reason why you memorize surahs, right? It's because you needed to know them for prayer. And that's, um, you know, your relationship with, with the Book of Allah. And unfortunately, that is the case for many uh, people in our community. I know, you know many people in, pre in, in the older generation, they weren't taught to read, for example, you know, from, you know, my family, I've heard that from many people that, you know, they never really learned how to read. And so they don't have um, that relationship. But for us, for those of us who have that capability, who are of the age, and of course, now with the internet, there are so many teachers, so many places that you could learn that if you don't have, or if you've never studied Tajweed, I would highly recommend making that a priority. Um, and it's Fardain, first of all, it, it's one of the obligatory acts that all of us should be doing. Um, so that in and of itself is enough reason, but it's also for, you know, our Iman, our faith, we need to hold on to the Book of Allah. There, these are really dark times and there's so much um, solace that can be uh, found just by turning to the Book of Allah when there's all this madness around you. But also for those of us who are parents and we want our children to have a connection with the Book of Allah, it's very hard to do that if we don't um, show them what that looks like, you know, if we don't prioritize and so reciting with, with beauty, for example, you know, it's so important to show them that that's how we recite Quran. We don't rush through surahs, you know, and I, I used to teach uh, Quran, um, you know, at the Islamic schools and I taught children and adults, but that was always one of the points I tried to make to the students and to their parents that, you know, we have to honor the book of Allah with, with beautifying our voice and our voice will naturally obviously be beautified because of the book of Allah. So it's this, you know, two way thing, but we have to make that effort. And so you want to teach your kids not to haphazardly recite the Quran. And I've seen this before, unfortunately, you know, where they will rush through surahs or just be kind of careless with the way that they are saying surahs and, you know, uh, and parents don't, uh, don't take a moment to correct them, maybe because of their age, maybe because they're just happy that they know the surah. But once you start taking that more seriously, then you want them to um, have ihsan when they, when they recite the Book of Allah and really take that seriously, bring the adab of the Qur'an, the adab um, that they should have with, with, with reciting and reflecting and, and being quiet, knowing not to speak over the Qur'an. So if someone is reciting or you know even if it's a, a video you're watching or on you know your phone you're listening to something that they know that there are there's adab and we shouldn't be listening or, or excuse me we shouldn't be talking over the book of Allah we should be listening we should be quiet so making you know the all of these things priority in your family but it has to start with you you have to show that you have to model it in order for your children to take it seriously so I encourage anybody who's watching, again, if you've never done thought of taking tajweed or you're always intimidated, maybe you're embarrassed. I've had people tell me I'm embarrassed. You know, my kids go to Sunday school. They know more Quran than me. I never learned. Um, but they let that embarrassment prevent them. You know, this is one of the diseases of the heart, uh, you know, blameworthy modesty. When you prevent yourself from doing the right thing, the right thing is to learn the book of Allah, inshallah, and to not let the embarrassment or the way that other people may, um, you know, react. And at the end of the day, does it matter really? You know, we shouldn't care so much about what other people think about us. Uh, the most important thing is that we do things for the sake of Allah. So 
don't be a barrier that stands in front of you, your, you know, in your own way, uh, but rather prioritize and inshallah, um, make that a commitment that you do seriously. Maybe, you know, put a, put a deadline for yourself that by next year, today, I want to have, you know, completed my studies in Tajweed and I want to be able to really read the book of Allah the proper way so that I can recite with beauty and enjoyment and fulfillment and then teach my children to do the same. Make that intention, inshallah, and Allah will give you tawfiq. <clears throat> um, and just on, on a, f- a final note on that, you know, when I was studying Quran, I wanted really to memorize and to read and to learn how to read. And I had, a, I had a difficulty. I was in a way dyslexic when it came to Arabic. I don't know what it was. I had a very serious challenge uh, making the letters connect. It was always difficult for me to read. Um, but I, alhamdulillah, memorized, you know, I, with, with different teachers by ear, just auditory listening and repeating and watching their mouth, you know, repeating after them. But it was, it was very difficult for me to read. And I remember... Um, you know, going through several teachers, and it was just a time in my life where I felt uh, that there was, a, you know, something blocking me, and I didn't know what it was. But Alhamdulillah, Allah gave me an opportunity to learn with a, a teacher for the first time the actual science of Tajweed. I had always learned, you know, the Qaeda and just basic, but you know, the te- this teacher really broke down the the rules and in a in a way that just made sense. So sometimes it's just having the right teacher, and I went from years having a hardship reading to subhanallah one month of uh, instruction in that class i was able to read uh, fluently and i credit of course uh, the teacher's barakah but also alhamdulillah allah his promise is true when we work hard and we put that mujahida forward and we try and try he will give us tawfiq so i feel like i can really speak on that i lived that experience of having a challenge and inshallah his reward is is uh, with those who um, you know struggle harder, inshallah, we know that, right? That we get more reward. So I, that's my hope is that all those years that I was struggling, then inshallah, I still get the reward for that. But alhamdulillah, within one month, as I said, I just went from having a really difficult time to suddenly being able to read. So it can happen, inshallah. Okay, so uh, bismillah. Uh, the next one is frequently asking forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is also really important. Um, I think sometimes we're not aware of because there are so many things that are normal in our society and in our world and even in our families um, that we may not be aware of the, how sinful they are and that they are actually harming our states. So that, aware, that lack of awareness and forgetfulness, which we are very much inclined to, is also part of the reason why we should be in the habit of asking for forgiveness every single day. And we know even the Prophet did this, and he was, you know, much perfect. He didn't sin, but yet he was practicing this for us. He was showing us that this is something that we should be doing. Um, you know, throughout the day, you can do it in, you know, just any time you have. But to have this idea always in your mind and this reality it's a humility that you are a sinful person and not necessarily by intention of course there's those people who outwardly do things that are sinful and may Allah guide them and forgive them Um, they should certainly seek uh, forgiveness but for those who may not intentionally or as I said be aware of their sin um, just being in the practice of, of daily astaghfir will inshallah help you to hopefully clear, you know, the, the, the slate uh, every day and to clear the heart, to polish the heart. Because again, there are things we might say, we might do, we might look at something, we might hear something or, um, you know, laugh at something. These are all things that we have to be aware of. You know, that's why when we study the diseases of the heart, some things are so, as I said, normal in our culture that we don't associate it as being wrong but in fact, it is wrong. It's haram, you know. Like as I said, like um, you know, laughing at something. We have to be very, very careful what we find, you know, as as humor, because a lot of the humor that we have around us is actually quite. Uh, it's 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 foul. It's horrible, you know, making fun of people, mocking people. So much of comedy is actually derision, which is a disease of the heart, right? 
where you are uh, mocking people. So much of comedy is mockery, which is in the Quran, it's completely haram. But again, if you're if you've seen that your whole life, all the shows you've ever watched, every movie you ever watch, it's like slapstick comedy and someone's falling and someone's, you know, being called out and made fun of, or, you know, there's impressions that people do and they're making fun of entire communities and, and races and languages or what have you. You might think that's normal, right? And so you don't think of it as, oh, it's harmless. It's just a joke. And so, you know, you, you fall into that behavior as well. Um, or like now, nowadays, we're in a meme culture where there are people exchanging on every social media platform all day long, Twitter, WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram, you see memes and memes and videos, so many videos, my God, it's, it's shocking sometimes how much people take time to mock other people. It's really actually disturbing that you have, we have this gift of life and that you would spend hours uh, videotaping yourself, mocking people or doing something, a prank on someone. You know, I've seen these videos are really harmful, especially for the youth. Um, you know, that, that what they call that jackass humor that became very popular in the 90s and early 2000s with, you know, shows uh, on MTV and some of these other shows that they just would go around, you know, and really, you know, just foul wrong circumstances. I mean, I, there's so many, too many examples, but the point is, is a lot of the jokes were just not what we, what we should in any way um, be a part of. But if you, you know, you know, are watching certain things or doing certain things and those things enter your mind, your heart, and you get a little chuckle out of it, um, you know, just it enters your heart in this in the way that it, it, it does other people even if you without intention you know someone sends you a meme and you think it's funny um catch yourself you know i've done that many times in the moment it's like oh that's funny because you know it, it looks fine there's something of value or some comedic you know association or thing that you may attribute with to it but when you actually think about it in what what's actually happening in in the scene or in the video or in the meme or whatever it is or in the joke then you think stuff a lot you know this is not funny it's not funny at all i remember um i don't know when it was but there was actually about a month ago when right before school was starting you know on tiktok and now reels on instagram if you're not familiar with these two good for you but they're basically um platforms where people post videos but it was a very popular trend to have, um, because of online distance learning, all these parents were doing it. It was so sad. They would find pictures of drug users. You know, sometimes you have mug shots of people who are heroin addicts or alcoholics online and you can access them. Or people with, you know, some form of disability or something. And they basically would take pictures of those people and create a little image of them on the phone that looks like it's an incoming call, like on FaceTime, you know how on FaceTime, it has that little image at the top of your phone. If you're an iPhone user, um, that's just something that they, that's the, you know, the, the way that it looks, right? So that what they would do is they would take that image and then take it over to their children who are innocent, you know, children are pure hearted. And just to capture the shock and awe of their child while they told them, oh, this is your new teacher, say hi. And, you know, it was just so, so despicable, honestly. It was horrible because the parents are laughing at the expense of this innocent human being on the other end who has no clue that their picture is being used in this awful way. But they're also teaching their children that this is okay to do. And at one point, um, they used the image of someone who was on TikTok, actually, and that person, they were, you know, they had some, uh, they were disabled in some way, um, a person with disability. And so they, they made a video, uh, you know, really just saying, please stop using, it was, I think it was the person's child, actually, it wasn't her herself, but she was saying, that's my child's video or picture that you guys are using for your fun. And that's not funny. It wasn't funny. It was horrible. But this is the kind of humor that people you know, fall into Al-Dubla and they think it's not a big deal. Um, but if you really analyze what you're laughing at, I, I can, I bet you nine times out of 10, it's at the expense of another human being. 
And you want to think about that for a moment. Like how would the Prophet ﷺ receive you if he saw you laughing at someone like that, right? So these are the kinds of, you know, things we have to take ourselves into account for. And then when we do that, we realize, you'll realize quickly, wow, I'm sinning likely all day, every day, throughout the day. Allah Billah, may Allah forgive me. So then istighfar just becomes necessary at that point. Like Allah Billah, uh, please Allah forgive me. So to just get into that habit. But be, being humble enough to hold yourself accountable, you know, on everything you do, on every moment, uh, every interaction you have, every thought you have, and catching yourself, well, I should have thought that about that person. I should have said that. That kind of self-accountability. Um, maintaining prayers and blessings upon the Prophet, so I said, um, you know, this is, again, very important part of our faith, you know, to not abandon the salawat of, on the Prophet, so I said, um, to do it as often as possible. Certain times and days, we know that it's even more reward uh, the night of Jummah, the day of Jummah, uh, there's even more reward. But subhanAllah, just to be in that habit, this is from the Quran, we know that we uh, we, we say salawat on the Prophet as a commandment from Allah. So getting in that habit, it also um, helps to connect your heart with Him, inshallah. And so not just, uh, you know, uh, you know, doing the, the salawat part, but also I would add to that, uh, reading his seerah, reading um, the shama'il, just being really connected to the Prophet ﷺ because, you know, he's the one who's, we're going to, I mean, we, he's our, you know, intercessor. We need his uh, madad, we need his support. And so we, we should look, we should remember that, that we need that connection with him. You know, we want him to be proud of us when he sees us on the day of judgment, inshallah, and that um, him to recognize us, right? Because we know that he'll recognize, uh, inshallah, his ummah by the marks of wudu. So, you know, we want that connection um, that he, that, that, you know, that we, um, yeah, that we make him, inshallah, proud and not disappointed with us. But how can we do that if we don't know who he is, we don't study his sira, we don't follow his sunnah, we don't, you know, say salawat on him? How can we expect that? So this is part of it, is that we have these habits and that we do it as an act of love, as an act of uh, devotion to him and inshallah so may Allah increase us in that but doing it as often as possible and remembering when you have free time and I, you know I, whenever you're doing something um, it, could, it doesn't necessarily have to be on the prayer mat you know when you're driving in the car if you have a counter you know sometimes people use counters sometimes people use tasbih but you can you know just do your salawat if you're um, you know, sleeping and you're having a hard time in bed, you know, rest, you're restless, just, you know, instead of daydreaming about, you know, things or thinking about the problems of the next day, just, you know, do your salawat in the post on anything, washing dishes, there could be so many chores, you know, as long as you're in, a, you know, a good place, there shouldn't be a problem with you using that time to do adhkar or, you know, any type of of uh, remembrance of Allah or of the Prophet but just getting in those habits of finding moments like that. And then adhering to the meritorious invocations of the morning and the evening that have been transmitted to us from the sunnah. So this would be the wird or the awrad, right? And Imam Nawi has one. I'm trying to see if I have it here. I don't have his, but I had, I don't know where it is. Um, uh, the Imam al-Haddad's, you know, wird al-Latif and Ratib al-Shahar. There's two of them that he has. You can access them. If you don't know what those are, um, they are a, a wird is a litany of prayers. It's like a formulaic prayers, uh, all based on the the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu But our many of our scholars of the past would have their own formulas of different prayers that they would do from the morning to the night. And so the main ones that we know of that our teachers recommended to us are the word of Imam Nawawi, um, who's, this is his advice, but also Imam al-Haddad, um, uh, he has two of them, and you can look up Wird, which is, you know, W-I-R-D, very easy word, and then you can look up their names, Wird Imam Nawawi, or Wird of Imam al-Haddad, and you will see uh, PDF files, there's YouTube videos where people have uploaded the the files as well. It takes, you know, like the Wirda Latif, we do it, alhamdulillah, my family and I, we've been doing it for years. I talk about this often. Um, and Sheikh Hamza actually, Yusuf, uh, he did a, a brilliant talk on the benefits of the Wirda Latif. Uh, you can find that also on YouTube. 
Um, but he, you know, he, he, he many of our scholars taught us that when you uh, do that as a regular, you should do that every day regularly in the morning and in the night. So alhamdulillah, and for us, we just, in the morning when we wake up, it's part of our everyday routine. During breakfast uh, time, we'll play it and we have the Bluetooth speaker. So it's, you know, throughout the whole house. And alhamdulillah, children are now, it's just, they know it, they know what to do, they go play it. And we just, you know, have that quiet time while we're listening to it. it takes about 18 minutes and it's all seeking protection. The, all the du'as that you want uh, to start your day off with. It's like creating a force field, you know, of positive energy, a shield of, you know, against harm around yourself and your family and your loved ones, inshallah. And you, you know, you do that every day, it just gives you a nice start. And then at night after Maghrib, you can also um, uh, do the same. There's prayers that are for night and morning, but even once a day is good. So inshallah, those are the, um, the advices. So I think we are almost out of time or we might be, ooh, wow, I went all the way to the end of the hour. SubhanAllah, time just sometimes seems to go quickly. So it's about 8.57, but this was the last, yeah, so that was the end of Imam Anawi's advice. And as I said, it was one paragraph, you saw it, SubhanAllah, but so much wisdom packed in, in that. So Alhamdulillah, I don't know if there are any questions. Um, this happens to me uh, every session. So I'm going to try to go on the Facebook page and see if there is anything um, where there are pick, there are any questions. And inshallah, if there are, I will answer those questions if I'm able to. So just give me a moment here while I click on this. Okay, I don't think that is the correct one. You know, Facebook changed their whole uh, interface. I'm not a fan of it. I don't like abrupt changes. <laughs> so um, anyhow, I can't see. Yeah, I don't see it. I don't see the video here. Okay, let me try the YouTube page. I'm sorry. I feel like every single week I do the same thing where I'm like, hold on, but I can't see anything. <laughs> um, maybe it's under the videos tab. I'll try one more thing. Oh, there are comments. Okay, alhamdulillah. Um, Oh, mashallah. Thank you. You guys are so sweet. I see some lovely messages. Jazakallah khairan. You guys are so sweet. Thank you. I really appreciate your, your uh, kind words there. Assalamu alaikum to uh, Sabiha, to Laura, to Sumaya, to Erlin. Mashallah. So beautiful to see uh, all these new sisters here. Thank you for being here. Um, I don't see any questions there, so I'm going to go to the YouTube page quickly um, and see if there's anything here, inshallah. But yeah, feel free, you know, that's, uh, if you have a question that may not necessarily be related to the text, if I'm able to answer it, I, I will try. I will certainly try. Um, so let's see. Alhamdulillah. Hanifa, assalamu alaikum, and Faiza, mashallah, so sweet. I'm always so tired when I pray tahajjud. I feel like I'm just going through the motions. I don't feel the closeness. You know, subhanAllah, that's a great question, Hanifa. Um, you know, you, clearly the, the time, you know, if you're waking up and it's hard for you because you're not getting enough rest or sleep, then this might require some tweaking of your sleep schedule a little bit. But honestly, the fact that you're getting up, you have to really hold on to that. That that is an invitation for you. That Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is, you know, it's because of His, uh, you know, uh, favor upon you that you're waking up. You know, sometimes we we forget that it's not really our efforts. Um, it's it's really Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. He wants you to be drawing close to him in that hour. So the fact that you're responding to that call and you're getting up and you're trying, even though it's hard for you, is a, 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 an amazing thing. But you also may want to look at um, the circumstance. Like if the room is dark and you, um, you know, they recommend, some of our teachers recommended, for example, using cold water when you're making your wudu, because if it's like on warm tap, you know, or hot water, if you like, if you like things hot, then you, you're just um, continuing the state of comfort and sleepiness and drowsiness, but that cold water is intended to really wake you up and to kind of get you out of that slumbered state. So you might need to do that. You might need to drink some water. You might need to just 
to make uh, subtle tweaks so that you have more presence of mind turning on a, a little light for me i have a, a, a light i pray close to my bed but i have a light that i started turning on because i i realized the same i wanted to have more presence and so um you know i would do that and also you can break up you know sometimes people get into the numbers with the hajj so it's like they just want to do blocks and blocks of prayer and that can be physically exhausting but if you do even two rakah of really present mindful prayers and you just sit and you are totally there totally mindful and making dua for all of your loved ones and asking you know making istighfar and all of the things that you really want from Allah um those two prayers are a treasure you know and don't uh, underscore or undervalue that for because you think i need numbers you know it's not about quantity it's about quality so if that's what you can do and still stay awake and still stay you know engaged then alhamdulillah try that and then make little other tweaks like i said try the cold water splashing try some drinking some water um turning on a light or moving the space sometimes leaving your bedroom into another space also helps you because the bed if the bedroom is too inviting and you just can't wait to get back into the bed because you're tired you might feel more inclined to you know rush through or not rush through but you know you're just you're kind of going through the motions so try disrupting you know your what your or the system you have a little bit you know change it here and there and see if there's an opening for you and of course dua ask allah to give you more rest maybe you're not getting enough rest when you sleep um so that when you're waking up and i've talked about this actually in previous halaqas but you can look up um you know the sleep cycles when you study and understand sleep cycles it's also really helpful because you'll know how to wake up uh you know during a, the time where you're not disrupting a really important sleep cycle you know so there's cycles that we need it's about i believe one and a half hours where we hit that deep sleep and when you hit the deep sleep that's when you're going to feel rested so if you wake up after completing that cycle you'll feel more rested but if you wake up in the middle of the cycle this is usually what a lot of people do because they're not aware so you wake up in the middle of a sleep cycle then you don't get the restful sleep that you need and therefore you wake up groggy um you know you just you're out of it right and and that's likely because you didn't complete that cycle so you go through i don't know 3 4 5 cycles i think depending on how many hours of sleep you get each night so um you always want to set your alarm or just you know get you'll get into certain habits where you your body will know from myself for example um after i had children you know i started having some back issues uh and and other health issues so i just by nature wake up every 2 3 hours i'm always awake uh, you know I, i there's nothing i can do about it i will always wake up and see that it's i've only been asleep uh you know about an hour and a half or 2 hours and then i you know i so i just alhamdulillah i uh, i'm grateful for it because I'm not in that slumber where it's really hard to wake up out of. But I don't remember ever having slept like that for years. I mean, I can't I honestly can't remember when I slept that way where I was just knocked out uh for more than 2 to 3 hours. So sometimes age and certain life circumstances like a health issue might facilitate it for you. So for me, alhamdulillah, I have that advantage is that I'm always waking up just by my own internal clock but i know that there is a way to train yourself to do that as well so sleep training just like you know they do for children adults can also sleep train so you can start to l- become less dependent on hours of sleep and really look for um getting the best quality of sleep in the time that you need and this is you know um if you study the way of uh, uh of of the prophets and of the awliya they didn't sleep a lot at night you know they did the recovery sleep qailula uh, we know is the, the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam but they did recovery sleep during the day but the night was for worship so it's very possible to not be a sleep dependent person um but you want to do your math you know to see how much you need for functionality and health and make sure you're definitely getting your sleep in some way covered throughout the day so you know just maybe need to do some research and see what works for you but i hope that helps you inshallah but may allah reward you for your beautiful intention alhamdulillah um i'm sorry faiza you were asking is this page 66 in the text that was a long time ago that you asked that question 
But that's where we started with Sidi Ahmed Zarouk's text. We re read from page 73. So today's session was from page 73. That's Appendix B. So I don't think there are any other questions. Um, I hope, uh, inshallah, I didn't miss anything. But thank you so much for all of you for tuning in. And let me know, actually, if you wouldn't mind, because I haven't told anybody at MCC, but uh, I am considering maybe doing a time uh, change or a day change for these sessions. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out if Sunday would work better for some of you, because, you know, middle of the week, I know with work commitments and school and, you know, with children, dinner, it might be hard, but weekends tend to be a little bit more flexible. So if you like this time, um, from eight to nine Sunday evenings. Can you let us know in the comment section on MCC? Just let us know if you prefer Thursday evenings or Sunday eight to nine, and let's see what happens. I'm not sure um, if MCC, uh, what, what they'll say, but at least we can explore maybe some options. But thank you so much again for tuning in. I will see you guys, inshallah, in two weeks at our, for our next session. And we'll continue with more from Agenda to Change Our Condition. So thank you again. Jazakumullah khair. And we'll end in dua. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal-Asr inna l-insana la fi khusr illa ladhina amanu. Wa'amilu swalihati wa tawasu bil-haqqi wa tawasu bil-sabr. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yisifun. Wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khair. And again, have a wonderful evening, inshallah. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks. All right. Assalamu alaikum. It's long. It's about seven pages long. And the three main areas that he covers is our current state. Um, and then he, uh, and this was, you know, published in 2013. So keep that in mind that this text was, you know, seven years, it's seven years old. Um, but, uh, but still, when we talk about our current state, a lot of the uh, things that he discusses is still very much relevant. Then the inner and outer transformations and the importance of family. So we'll likely not get to all three of these points because there's so much content to cover. So inshallah, we'll continue wherever we left off for the next session. But let's go ahead and begin. Bismillah. So first, um, the very first page here, I'm going to read along and then we'll stop for some commentary here and there. So he says, Islam is submission to what is real, with a capital R. It is a recognition and an acceptance of the way things really are and not as they appear. Everything is in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the real al-haq. You know, just uh, yeah, Friday I did another program where we talked about the dunya and the verses from Surah Al-Kaf, verses 7 and 8, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he has, you know, adorned the world. And we looked at, you know, the meaning of those verses and the, and the tafsir of those verses, and what it indicates is that, the, as we know, the, the word for the earth, dunya, is actually translated to mean a low place, right? Adna or dunya, right? It's a low place. And so what we, what we uh, can extrapolate from, from the verse is that in its essence, the dunya is low, but there's embellishments, there's beauty, there's adornments in the dunya, right? And so when we talk about what is real, we're not talking about what, what those adornments and embellishments are. We're talking about the reality of the dunya, right? Or the reality of things. And the fact that everything in this dunya, including us, we will all perish. Everything will, 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 be, will perish and be removed and destroyed, except for this, uh, the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? This is what, what we're informed of in the Quran. So, here, this is, again, speaking to the same truths, right? That when we submit as Muslims, we're, we acknowledge that there's reality and falsehood, and we have that recognition uh, that the, what we see in the illusory world around us is not reality. It's, it is illusory. It's deceptive. It's enticing. It's temptation. It's attempting. And it's by design that way, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created all of those adornments to test us, to test who is true in their faith, and to test who will fulfill, you know, be virtuous in their deeds and who isn't. So it's all part of the design element. So here again, this is the reminder that we are uh, the, the, to be a believer is to submit and to accept this as truth, right? And then he goes on to say, 
only human beings and willful spirits, which are the jinn, can rebel against our creator, right? So all other creation is in submission, animals, right? They can't, uh, all living things, they can't be anything in any other state but in submission, whereas we humans and jinn can, we have free will, we can choose, right? Over 1400 years ago, this path of Islam was renewed to mark the entry into the last phase of human experience on earth. It was renewed by the best of creation, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as the final prophet and the seal of all of Allah's prophets upon them all be peace. He was its greatest wayfarer, and he never deviated from its course. His blessed footprints remain clear and unchanged for anyone desiring to set out on that ancient prophetic path. So then the next paragraph, he now talks about um, what the this this text is, right? So he says, before you is a concise treatise on the path to taqwa. So now we're being introduced to this concept of taqwa, which is conscious awareness of our Lord. Devotion to God through taqwa is the primary reason for our existence and the means by which we are ensured continued succor from our creator. So this is a really powerful reminder because, you know, it's very easy to get caught up in the delusions and the illusions of the dunya and uh, get so preoccupied with all of our responsibilities, right? Some of us are, are uh, you know, we, we, our parents are still alive, so we're still dutiful to them. We have spouses, maybe uh, we, we have children, we work, we have dependents that we take care of, we have responsibilities at work, we're community members. So we have all these different roles and wear different hats, and all of those things can sometimes you know, take over uh, our, our, our frame of, of mind, our thinking, and we become so obsessed with all of those things that we can sometimes forget that even though those things are important, um, certainly they're important, the main purpose for our existence isn't necessarily those things or our career paths or our dreams and goals. Those are not the reason why we were created. We were created solely to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so that's what taqwa is. And so then he says, Allah says in the first command in the entire Quran, right? He says, O humanity, or O mankind, worship your Lord who created you and those before you in order for you to realize taqwa. So again, this is the whole purpose of our creation. And he's reminding us that this is the first command Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us. And it's right in the, the very beginning of the Quran, the second chapter, sort of the Baqarah verse 21. And then on the very next page, he says, he reminds us of the first prohibition. So uh, right after this verse, you know, where he's giving us the first command, now we have our first prohibition where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us, do not set up false deities besides Allah. You are aware of what you are doing. So what we should be doing and what we should not be doing, right? And then this next uh, uh, verse, which comes later, right? He says, while there are many false, this is Sheikh Hamza's commentary, while there are many false deities besides Allah, the self is the greatest and most subtle. So this concept of a false deity, you know, sometimes when we think of a deity or an idol, we think of a little statue or a big statue, something that people prostrate to, and it, it's symbolic, and there's, you know, there's uh, something real b before a person, and they, you know, they have this, uh, uh, they worship uh, that idol, right? But here he's making it clear that, of, uh, you know, there's many d idols in the world, there are many people who still ascribe to those beliefs, but the one that is the most subtle and the greatest is the worship of the nafs, the soul, the, I mean, the, the, the ego, right? The nafs. And so um, the, the, the translation of that verse is, have you not seen the one who took his desire as his deity? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us that there are people who literally worship their own desires and whims. They, they just live to fulfill their whims and desires. And if we are being honest right now, looking around the world, um, it is clear that this is true because we have never likely, I mean, again, I can't, I'm just making a general observation, but the amount of 
indulgence and extravagance and access to things that we have now is unprecedented. Uh, we don't, you know, have to really do much in order to get what we want. It's it's so easy now with everything now moving to digital and online formats. You can request services, you can order food, you can order gifts, you can order whatever necessities you have. Your medication can come to you. You can do so much. You can even have online doctor visits you know there's so many things that we can do in a click of a button so it's clear that you know this access to indulge in our whims and desires and this ease of access or ease uh, uh, in, in in doing that can definitely create a, a dependency and then uh you know some form of, of addiction preoccupation which is all in line with the same sort of thought right that this is a form of worship if that's what you live to do if you can if you eat and your whole day is, is centered around food and what you're going to eat and you can't wait to wake up and have this meal or that meal or you have a craving and you can just, you know, order it and that's how you live, then you become naturally, because of that, I mean, it's human nature, you'll become entitled, right? And once you become entitled to your um, and beholden to your nafs, you, be, you know, you become a slave of your nafs. Um, and then it's very difficult to uh, to do anything else besides that. So when it's time to pray, for example, well, your nafs is like, oh, I'm too tired, you know, I'm exhausted, I love, I'm too comfortable to get up and move right now. So all of those challenges uh, become, or or just the natural, you know, uh, nature of the of the nafs, which is to be lazy and to procrastinate, they are exacerbated because you've habituated yourself to doing these things, to giving into yourself all the time. So therefore, that is how you live. You live to serve yourself. You're not living to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the reality of most people now, um, especially in the West. You know, of course, there's, there's a lot of uh, poverty and, and a lot of people who are certainly not doing this because they, they are in impoverished states. But I'm talking about our reality. So in our reality, this is very true, right? That many people, um, they take their desire as their deity. So then he, um, he goes on to say that struggle with the self is, is the means by which we purify our hearts of false deities. So fighting those urges, fighting those desires, suppressing those desires is how we can overcome these things, right? It is the ancient way of the prophets. It is to walk the path toward a realized state of submission to the will of Allah. Our God is mighty and transcendent, exalted above and beyond the pettiness of this lower world, right? But he is also an imminent Lord who sustains and nourishes his creation at every level of existence. So then uh, he says here, I'm not sure actually if I have this. No, I don't have this verse um, in, in a slide, but I'll read it. Oh, humanity, what has caused you to be deluded about your generous Lord who has created you and made you so perfectly proportioned and fashioned you in whatever form he chose. Um, right? SubhanAllah, may Allah forgive us for our delusions. So now that he's introduced these ideas, right? That the believer is in submission to what is, to the real, to al-haq, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that we have a clear understanding of what taqwa is, and we also understand the first command and first prohibition that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gave us, and uh, you know, and and, to, and and the idea that you can actually worship your own desire. You know, that's something maybe people never thought of before. But that's again, these are verses from the Quran to get us to think about our own behavior. How are you proving your your ubudiyah, your you know, your uh, your uh, understanding of your relationship with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala as a servant? And he's your rub, right? How, how are you proving that if you're indulging in your nafs all the time? So getting that across, that it's very possible that you may we may fall into this behavior, a'udhu billah, unwittingly, because we're not, you know, we're, we don't know how to, or we're not aware of the signs and the symptoms of this. But clearly, as we as we said, many of us are very indulgent, and we do give into our nafs a lot, and we will prioritize our nafs over the worship of Allah. It's just this is what the what what the mujahida is, right? And so acknowledging all of that, and then that we can be deluded. So well, now that he's done that, we enter the uh, the first section of this introduction, which is the uh, titled "Our Current State." Okay, so 
let me go ahead and read this and we're going to get to these uh, to this slide in a moment. But in this uh, section, he starts off and he says, now the current state of the people of this ancient path is deplorable. Okay, subhanAllah. Generally speaking, we are powerless, bereft, morally bankrupt, objects of history rather than subjects of history, as were our pious predecessors who engaged the world with the power of truth and dispelled darkness with their spiritual light. Our condition is far from that of our noble forebears. It is as if we never recited or even heard the prayer of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which he recited every morning. Um, oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from grief and anxiety. Right? So this is, Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from grief and anxiety, impotence and indolence, cowardice and miserliness, and from being overcome by debt and overpowered by men. So this is our reality, right? He's comparing our state to, uh, to our, our noble uh, forebears, as he says, and saying that we're no, nowhere near them, right? So the question arises, well, how did we reach the state? There's two questions that when we examine our condition, this is what, where we are. How did we reach the state, right? And then how do we get out of this state? And he goes on to say that the answers to both of these questions are quite painful and complex. But subhanAllah, again, from the Qur'an, we get us an answer that summarizes both or gives the answer to both of these questions in, in this verse. And this is uh, verse thir or chapter 13, verse 11, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah does not change a people until they change what is in themselves. So... He then continues to uh, give commentary on this particular verse and shares the commentary of Imam Abu Talib al-Makki, who in the nourishment of the heart, he goes on to say that the beauty of this verse is that it comprises a twofold meaning. First, it means that Allah does not remove blessings that he has bestowed upon a people until they transgress from obedience to disobedience. So it works both ways. When we talk about change, right, it can work for the good or for, uh, for the bad, right? So here he's, he's giving that perspective. And so this is the response uh, to our first question, right, that we're in this state because of our disobedience. And then the second uh, meaning of this verse is that Allah does not change a people's outward state of abasement, humiliation, and objection until they change what is in themselves. So this then answers our second question, right? So again, when we ask these questions, how do we reach this state? Well, we're in the state that we're in because of our disobedience. How do we get out of this state? We must consciously move from a state of disobedience to a state of obedience. So subhanAllah, again, so much to think about there that, you know, instead of just, um, you know, some people when, when things get tough or difficult or it just seems so hard to, to, to move forward, uh, um, they want to give up, right? They don't have the will, the motivation. So it's like, what's the point? I'm, you know, damaged goods. It's, it's done. It's a done deal. And that's, you know, Westwasa from Shaitan, uh, because of course he doesn't want us to be motivated. He doesn't want us to have hope. He doesn't want us to think that change is possible or, you know, that there's potential. So he may, um, and there's certainly people who do that. They look to the past and they see the glory of the past and then they go, ah, oh, what's the point? We're just a ruined people. We're a ruined species. This is you know, human nature. And they get very cynical and just negative. But this verse is to remind us that, you know, doing that, if it just, if that's your end, you know, the end of uh, the result of, of, of contemplating the history and where we are and, you know, kind of assessing why we are, we, uh, where we are, that you just want to give up. You, you're not, you're not uh, putting your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This verse is, is empowering and it gives us hope, right? That if we find ourselves in any situation, we can change it. You know, I, I, um, I received an email yesterday from a sister who 
it's just it's hard because some, you know you see shaitan how he weighs on people how he strips them of hope and he um you know he really makes them uh feel worthless because you know they they falter they 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 do things that they have shame about, and then he fills their heart with all of this hopelessness, you know. And so we're reminded constantly, our teachers remind us, uh, and of course the Quran, that we, we're not a people that should fall into despair, right? This is, Islam is not a faith of despair, it's a faith of hope. And so when we look to this verse, we should, we should you know, remember this, because, you know, this sister, when she messaged me, the entire first, you know, few lines of her email were, you could just see the, she was guilt-ridden, she had done some things that she was very, very ashamed about, but she had very little hope in herself and just riddled with with guilt. And sometimes, you know, um, you know, this is a little footnote, but shame is, when it's shame between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's healthy, you know, it's, it's, it's healthy to have that, but we should also not fall into a, 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 a sense of again despair where we just think we where there's no hope those that's a when you reach those types of thoughts you should know that those are from iblis right there's there's a, a line a fine line so if you've done something you shouldn't do and you have remorse and you really feel bad and you just it sits, sits with you for a while and it weighs heavy that's good because inshallah there's purification in that remorse is a good sign right because hopefully you won't fall back into that sin so you shouldn't rush through that process either which is like oh well i did it and now you're just back to being carefree no sit with those feelings of remorse and um regret and really just um you know, bese- you know, beseech Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ask him, plead to him, beg him for forgiveness, make tawbah a, a process that you don't rush because of your discomfort with it, right? Some people, they um, have a hard time taking blame uh, and criticism. And so when even when things are clear, you know, it, it's undeniable that they've done something wrong. Um, maybe because they don't, they don't, uh, they're just not comfortable with that sense of shame and guilt. They just zip right through that process altogether. And those people are likely the ones that return to sins, right? Because they didn't really do the proper process of, of toba. So toba is something that we should, you know, uh, let, let uh, just sort of play out naturally. And, and the natural uh, process is to feel that guilt, remorse, um, maybe kind of, you know, not, not want to see people for a little bit um, and just be really preoccupied with uh, centering yourself back with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, trying to reconnect with him. That might take a few days. Maybe it takes a couple of weeks. Maybe it takes a month. Maybe it takes longer for each situation in person. It'll be different. But the point is, is knowing that there's a healthy way of doing that. But when you get to the point where your sins and your wrong deeds make you doubt uh, that you have any hope or that you're damned and you're condemned and there's nothing you can do about it, those are clearly from Iblis because he wants you to not think of yourself as being um, redeemable, right? He wants you to feel, uh, fall into despair, fall into depression, and then God forbid, do something to harm yourself or just lose faith because that's what a lot of some people do. They lose faith out of uh, out of total guilt sometimes, right? It's really sad, but we should just know that there's a balance to that, right? So the point again here is that you, you, when you when you take a verse like this, it's not just to, um, you know, look back and, and think, well, you know, get cynical, like I said, about where we are, the state and condition that we're in. Like, oh, we had this glorious history and now we're all doomed and look at our the Muslim ummah and we're all this way and that way. You can get really negative and, and that's not a good place either. You know, every period of, of time and every people have tests, every person has tests. So instead of, you know, getting to that place, just look at it like it is what it is. You know, these this is pretty clear. We are in this state because we disobeyed and we can reverse course. You know, that's what the verse is telling us, reverse course. You got here because you strayed. Now, if you wanna you know, uh, go back and, and, and uh, you know, be, be connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again, get back on course and you know what to do, right? So alhamdulillah. Um, and then he goes on to say, so we're back on, if, you're, if you have the text, I'm still on page three. So as I said, there's a lot of uh, text here. So we're, we're going to pace ourselves. But he says here that, um, let me see actually. So this question, how, right? How do we change our condition, right? So then he answers this question and he says, sorry, this slide shows a little slow. 
Uh, nope, went too far. Okay, so here, the first thing he says is that we must recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us guidance through messengers. Okay, in our case, the final Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that as long as we adhered to that guidance in large numbers, we were under the protection of Allah. So when you look at the, you know, history, you know, the, the Islamic history, and you see that, you know, all of the, the different stages of, of our history, and you see the tawfiq that we had, and all the scholarship that came out, or just so many incredible things that uh, scholars were able to do, you want to attribute that to obedience to Allah, right? Because we were in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gave us tawfiq. And we saw all the success, right? The golden age of Islam and all of the, you know, accomplishments that we had as a as an ummah, right? Came out of because of the the obedience to Allah. Then he says, um, as those numbers, right, the numbers of of people in obedience to Allah diminished throughout Muslim history, the outward enemies of Islam began to make inroads into the heartland of the Muslims until they actually conquered the Muslim lands. So he's giving us some, you know, a summary of, of the his, you know, historical facts. Like this is what happened. There was a period where we had, we were flourishing and we were successful. We were in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then, you know, as, as we started straying, the enemies, uh, you know, came in and they, they found a way to, uh, to further, um, you know, water us down and further take us away from, from our, uh, our faith. So he then goes on to say, today, both the Muslim heartland and Muslim hearts are oppressed by inward and outward forces that oppose the purpose of Islam, which is to free people from submission to created things by helping them achieve submission to the creator of things, subhanAllah. And he goes on and says, a culture of vice, usury, and consumption that enslaves people to the lowest aspects of their nature cannot survive amid large numbers of people committed to freeing themselves from those aspects of their nature. So when we see, you know, everything that I talked about before, all of the indulgence and the extravagance and all of the things that we have all fallen in, you know, these, in, into these bad habits of, of, of doing because it's easy to do or it's excess, it's, it's, just, it's there, right? People are doing it. So we do it too. Um, those things only can, can uh, uh, exist because there aren't enough people resisting, right? And so if we want to, you know, remove those, those things from our, our, our society or culture, we need to start working on restraint. We need to start working on disciplining the nafs and really, you know, uh, fighting our, against our own selves because that's the only reason why they're thriving. There's, you know, it's, it's, it, uh, as, as we, uh, learn in, in, uh, you know, economy 101, right. Scarcity and, um, now I'm forgetting my words, right? Uh, supply and demand, excuse me, supply and demand, right? So you see these things because there's a demand for it. But if we, uh, you know, don't ascribe to those things, then, then things will change. So we have to go back to ourselves and hold ourselves accountable. He goes on on now on page four and says that the earlier manifestations of such dark forces that succeeded in penetrating the Muslim lands also set up schools to inculcate their ideas and ways into the hearts of the young, impressionable Muslims of the last two centuries. You know, subhanAllah. This is actually really important because, I mean, he's, you know, mentioning the history, but even now when we see what's going on in our world, you know, a lot of the, the things that are happening to the young, younger generation of Muslims do happen in the schools, right? Indoctrination is a real thing. You have, um, I mean, I, I work with teens and I've worked with teens for several years and I can tell the difference between teenagers who are, you know, in, in Muslim schools or maybe homeschooled because they haven't been exposed to certain ideas or beliefs, um, or they don't have, you know, relationships and connections with people who are so different than them, uh, they, you can totally tell the difference because, you know, it starts early. And it, unfortunately, in some places, it's starting earlier and earlier. You know, and here in California, we have uh, had a lot of issues over the past few years of 
things being introduced, you know, early to even elementary school children or preschool children, ideas that are just completely antithetical to our faith. And we've had, you know, people trying to petition their school boards and there's a lot of, you know, just legal issues going on with things like that, because it's, it's, uh, you know, for, for us as, as people of faith, there's certain ideas and concepts that are just not part of our faith. So to have a school decide for families and communities that, nope, we are going to teach this no matter what. Um, it's really, it's really tragic. And it, it you know, it's, um, it, 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 what it's done, unfortunately, is it has affected the way that some of our Muslim youth see the world. They have adopted the lens of the, you know, the larger society because that's what they've been exposed to. You start them off. I mean, you're thinking about, and we'll just be practical. I mean, just be logical here. You you put your child in an environment for eight maybe 10 hours a day if you if you consider after school programming or tutoring or something else that's beyond you know the, the school day that they're out of your home and they are being with people who may have ideas that again differ from yours so if that's their predominant you know culture like that's what they see mo- the most of the time every single day and the only time they get to spend time with you and your family or your community you know is one day a week if that because some uh, kids don't necessarily, you know, because they're so overscheduled with sports and um, instruments that they play and all of these clubs that they're a part of, especially as we get to the old, you know, older uh, group of, of teenagers, uh, they don't have time and sometimes they have no interest in attending the masjid or on a Friday night, you know, youth program. I've worked with many families where that's the case. The parents are, you know, just really frustrated because they don't know how to get their child to want to be a part of the Muslim community because they're so over spread thin in other ways that are not part of their community, right? So all those personal uh, things that they are into um, with people, again, that not, don't necessarily uh, share the same faith, that is the, the most of their social experience or their experience outside the home. So it's it's a big challenge. And a lot of, uh, you know, Muslim families are struggling with this fact, right? I mean, I mean now with COVID and quarantine, inshallah, I'm, I'm hoping and praying that more uh, families are coming together and there's more connection with with the family but it's it's absolutely a reality for a lot of our our um our community members that this is an issue so going back to this point that subhanallah even historically you know schooling was one of the ways with which they were able to get to the muslim youth is not surprising right Alhamdulillah. So then he goes on to say, they undermined the spiritual authority of the scholars of Islam. I mean, again, this is this was written, you know, seven years ago, or even maybe before that, because it was published seven years ago, but it was, it was written, I'm certain, before that. But the undermining spiritual authority of scholars of Islam, that's what's been happening, you know, in our community, unfortunately, for a while now, with uh, social media, and you see cancel culture, there's been a lot of rhetoric that's just alien to our faith tradition, to many of our cultures that have been, has been you know, injected into the discourse amongst Muslims, uh, especially the, the younger generation. You know, just this idea of not really seeing religious authority as authoritative and, um, and, uh, or, or, uh, you know, um, or blurring the lines with, with what is an authoritative figure and what isn't. It's, it's, uh, it's happening a lot, yeah, unfortunately. So again, you know, this is it's history repeating itself, right? They undermine the spiritual authorities of scholars of Islam, making them appear backward and foolish. I mean, that's also the other thing. You know, there's, uh, there, it's, uh, we live in a meme culture and then a lot of, um, you know, mockery. And you see people in authority, whether they're law enforcement or politicians, and I'm not defending those groups, but I'm just saying that generally speaking, the idea that authority, whether it's religious or otherwise parents, parental authority, it's undermined very much in this society. You know, you can look at cartoons, films, they start them very early, right? Uh, I mean, I I was raised in, in the era of Bart Simpson. I know I um, it's still going on. I mean, it's the longest running cartoon, right? But you learn so much about, um, you know, mocking and undermining authority from those types of, of shows. And so it's just part of the culture to do that, right? So again, history repeating itself, that that's what they did. And they, they do that by making them into buffoons. And, you know, they're old, they're, they don't know what they're talking about, they have thick accents. And so there's this m- culture of mockery that unfortunately has 
taken over the youth culture and a lot of it sometimes is directed to uh, to um, to religious authority. So then um, he goes on to say that, again, they, they make them appear backward and foolish by promoting the idea that the scholar's religious cosmology uh, cosmology is paled before the impressive pillars of modern science and industry. This is another tactic, right? To the war between uh, scienceism and, uh, and and faith in general, right? Any type of religion. Um, there's it's an intellectual war, and they the people of science or atheists, you know, they posi- they posit themselves as being superior because they're more they have more advanced understanding of things. You know, they they have science uh, on their side, w- which is verifiable. And, and testable and then faith is is you know based on faith it's so there's definitely that these realities is still even today right then they then begin to remove the powerful cultural distinctions of muslims that had flourished for centuries and replace them with the accoutrement that's the french word right of western experimental cultural norms and mores subhanallah so the you know appropriation of muslim culture muslim foods um and just the again watering down of 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 our cultures of our traditions of our norms um and giving them that flair that western uh you know american u.s or or just western flair right that's still again subhanallah very valid Slowly, the dress of Muslims changed. The scarves fell from the heads of our women and the beards from the faces of our men. Robes and modest dress were replaced first by ridiculous brimmed hats, starched suits and ties, and finally by jeans and t-shirts, causing Muslims to appear not as caliphs of Allah, but as wage slaves of the Western-styled factories that sprouted up all over the world. Sandals so beloved to the Prophet ﷺ were replaced with tennis shoes made in sweatshops by people so poor that they could not afford the very shoes they produced. SubhanAllah. You know, that, um, I have so much to say on that, but I remember when I was younger and, um, you know, looking at, albums of, of some of the photos that my parents were able to bring back with them. We, we came as refugees from Afghanistan, but they had, they had some pictures. It always shocked me when I saw how European the fashion sense was in Afghanistan, because I just, I, I assumed that it was a culture where people dressed in traditional clothing, you know, and that they had, that that was the predominant way that people lived and they identified very much with their Afghan heritage. So it was really shocking to see my mom, for example, um, and my aunts and some of my other relatives wearing very European style clothing. And even my dad, you know, that the haircuts, the suits, the, the dresses, the music they listened to, uh, they were very familiar with Western culture. So, you know, this was something that um, always shocked me. And then when I, the first time I ever traveled outside of the U S um, into a Muslim land, it also troubled me deeply because I, you know, was I knew that I would have a cultural shock, but I, I, I think I was expecting to be pleasantly shocked, you know, going into a Muslim land for the first time as a practicing Muslim, who, um, you know, in that in that time there weren't very many visibly Muslim women like there are now. When I first started wearing hijab, um, even in my own family and amongst uh, my friends and community, it, there weren't that many. So I just couldn't wait to go to a land where I didn't, you know, have to um, hide or not that I did, but, you know, just feel a little awkward and out of place. I, 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 was, I was just so excited to do that. But actually the opposite happened where, of course, I saw Alhamdulillah Muhajibat and people who were dressed, you know, as Muslims and they spoke, you know, Salaam Alaikum. They had the, those same, you know, customs and, and all of that, which was great. And I loved it. But there was definitely an obsession with um, uh, American uh, culture there was uh, just this love, you know, and I went to Jordan um, for the first, that was the first country that I ever went to outside of the U.S., a man Jordan, and I just remember thinking, wow, I, you know, um, I just, I, I expected a, a, such a different scene than what I had, and even some of the people that I encountered, they were very interesting um, and very sweet and, and very kind and hospitable, but some of the conversations we had just left me, you know, scratching my head, like, how is this even happening? You know, they would be shocked uh, when I would... Uh, be, when I was introduced to some of them um, and they find out that I wear hijab in 
in California or in, in the West, they were shocked, like how, why? And they would question me like, why are you wearing hijab? You're in America, you don't need to. And so some of the things, even I remember having discussions with some of them who were so surprised that I prayed five times a day. So that was, you know, really a little difficult, uh, to be honest, to absorb. But, you know, I, I understood it was because and I figured it out quickly, actually, when I was driving through the city and I realized the um, ads and the stores, so many of the similar things that we have in the U.S., they, they had, you know, uh, set up shop in, in, in the Muslim countries, you know, a lot of big retail uh, chains and, and other things. But also what really, you know, made it clear for me was that, you know, I went to some of the poorest areas of Amman, and there are a lot of, you know, really poor areas, but I was struck by the amount of satellite dishes upon every single rooftop. It's like unbelievable. Um, you know, people, no matter what their, you know, socioeconomic level is, there were even, um, I went to tent cities, you know, there's there's a lot of tent cities in, in, in Amman as well, or areas um, there as well for, for people who are uh, refugees from uh, Palestine and, and other places. But Oh my gosh, subhanAllah, I was shocked because even there we saw satellite dishes. So I just realized like Western culture, they were so exposed to those things. And, um, you know, we can go and talk about that as a whole issue on, uh, in a separate <laughs> uh, program. But the point is, is they were exposed. And once they got a taste of that life and the Hollywood, you know, way that life is depicted here in, uh, in America, that's what they aspired to. So it was really, really sad, but it was uh, obvious too in the styles and the clothing and, and like I said, the shops and the stores and what people were really into, you know, the way that they gained status in, in, in there was also had to do with adopting very Western styles. So not surprising, right? SubhanAllah. One need only to look at the photographs taken by the first Europeans in the land of Islam 100 years ago to see the nobility of Muslim dress. So now we're, you know, being shown the other side, that before all of this happened, before these colonial powers uh, or imperial powers went into different lands in the Muslim world, where, how did Muslims dress, right? Let's, let's look at that. And he says, the American poet Ezra Pound remarked that he had no idea of the force that was unleashed from the Arabian Peninsula in the seventh century that led to a thousand mosques in Cordoba, Spain, until he caught a glimpse of it in the way a Muslim walked in Tangier in 1913. SubhanAllah. I mean, that's pretty powerful, right? The way that Muslims carried themselves were being, you know, reminded that there was this just natural izza, this way of, of, of walking, of being, of dressing, that we were, um, that was very custom to, uh, you know, customary in many Muslim lands, that even non-Muslims observe these things about us, right? Compare that image to the current Muslim cities teeming with desolate youth looking for a ticket out of their empty lives to anywhere but home, subhanAllah, right? Again, these are really powerful images. It's, it's very, you know, uh, descriptive language, but it is intended to really make us reflect, right? When you go to um, a doctor, the, you know, I, I just this past week went to, to get treatment for some things after a long time of not having seen a provider. And, you know, the first appointment took a really long time because it's an intake appointment and they make you go through your history. And so there's a lot of questions and back and forth. Uh, but that's part of the analysis process. You go over the symptoms and how did things happen and why did, you know, when did you notice this? And so doing that reflection is important in order to, you know, get the right diagnosis and then eventually to, to get, inshallah, the right treatment. So in many ways, that's what we're doing here. We're looking, visiting the, the past, really trying to look at what went wrong. Like how did we go from this place of, nobility, where even as in this example, non-Muslims were so struck by and in and, and awe of, of uh, just seeing a Muslim walking in the way that they dress to a place where 
we've lost that completely. We don't have any appreciation for those things anymore. We, we were, we're taught, or in some places we look down on those things, you know, all the billah, like it's, it's embarrassing for, uh, you know, someone to wear traditional clothing out in public. Uh, they should wear European style clothing because why would you do that? You know, it's okay in the home or in private places, but how did we go, go from that to this? Right. So we're looking at the history for that reason to really, you know, let it sink in. Like there was somewhere we went wrong. And in order to, again, know how to get back on course, we have to analyze things. Right. Then he moves into Muslim cuisine. Right. Once the envy of the world produced in the homes of the believers with love and remembrance of Allah's blessings. SubhanAllah. You know, people, I mean, I don't know if you've ever had some of, I mean, I ha I've had two very like memorable meals in my life where I just felt like the food was completely blessed. Once was in the city of Medina, we were invited to a large gathering, but you could just, everybody said the same. It was just so there was just something incredible about that meal and it wasn't anything that we hadn't had before, but there was definitely something there that we couldn't explain. And another time a friend um, who I just felt a lot of love from, uh, may Allah bless her and her family. I felt that her food was very mobotic. And it was like, I remembered those meals. You know, alhamdulillah, my mother is a wonderful cook. My sisters, uh, I have many people in my life, mashallah, who are amazing cooks. So uh, not to take anything away from them because everybody's food is delicious. But there's something about people of you know who are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they cook, they do it from a place of, of you know, it's, it's, uh, they're, they're remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even as they're chopping the onions and, you know, cut, uh, cleaning the meat or doing all those little tasks. It's, it's a labor of love and that reflects in the flavors of the food. So he's reminding us that this is, this was the envy of the world because people loved to have um, these meals and there's a reason for it, right? They were remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And now it's replaced, right, by techno food, which is not produce or livestock, but a prepackaged product bereft of barakah. Muslims have forgotten that food is the foundation of behavior, according to our scholars' understanding of Allah's words, right? That, oh, you messengers, eat of pure things and do righteous deeds. SubhanAllah, you know, you can see it too in the Muslim lands when you go um, to any Muslim uh, country. SubhanAllah, so many people, right? What what do they look to do when they get into a Muslim country? I mean, I've been guilty of it. I think it's because we're so deprived of certain things in the West that it's exciting to say, hey, I'm going to go and have a, you know, a halal uh, Big Mac or a halal, you know, this and Kentucky Fried Chicken or whatever your you know uh, special or your favorite food is, but you know that we we leave this land these lands and we go to Muslim lands to to have that type of food. We've lost appreciation right for our own um, the, the barakah that that our own food had, and so and the, and the fact that we are commanded to eat of the pure food. Subhanallah. Sorry, I'm just going to do a quick check of time. Let's see here. Um. Okay, so let me, um, look, uh, yeah, I have about 10 minutes and I, I want to make sure I don't go over and I can answer some of these questions. I, I've uh, received a question here from Brother Salman. So there's a sister who's asking, where are these two passages from? Uh, sister, I don't know if uh, which passages you're referring to, but everything I'm reading uh, is from this book called The Agenda to Change Our Condition. So, and this is the introduction, believe it or not, there's still a lot uh, more, mashallah, gems uh, throughout this book. But this is the introduction, and we covered just up until page four. So, uh, you know, inshallah, we'll, we'll try to get through this. But I think we'll stop here. Um, and then, yeah, because let me actually see. Mm -hmm. Let me see. You know what? Let me read one more paragraph, and then we'll stop. Uh, so this uh, paragraph that comes after this reflection about eating from the pure food, as Sheikh Hamza goes on to say, pure food is being replaced with fast food made with haste and waste, two attributes of the, of the devil, right? Ajada min shaitan right? Atani min Allah, ajada min shaitan Consideration is from God, haste is from the devil. It's a hadith, right? Sugared sodas replace natural milk, water, and juice. 
Corporate fast food chains with their mass-produced, disease-ridden, pathogenic food now appear everywhere, even in the sacred cities of Mecca and Medina. Meanwhile, Muslims who for centuries ate food filled with barakah, made by people with loving hearts who found joy in feeding others, now line up to consume products with less nutritional value than dog or cat food. I think that's, I know it's heavy on the heart to hear words like this, but we have to be accountable for our own behavior. And we've all likely fallen into, into this before, but it's not to do anything but to remind us of where we were and why we are here now. How did this happen? How can we go back to, uh, to being where we once were? We can't, like I said, do that if we don't have this uncomfortable um, real or these uncomfortable realizations about our own, uh, you know, behavior and hold ourselves to account. And that's really what this is, right? So mashallah, so, so many gems and so much um, more to reflect on. If you don't have this book, again, I'm going to urge you to get it in the meantime, until our next session, you can certainly read up ahead. Um, and if you do get the book, I ended at the top of page five. So likely for next session, I will finish, you know, I'll try to finish this um, introduction for the next session, and then we'll get into chapter one and, and proceed from there, inshallah. So I hope you found this of benefit. If you did, please don't forget to make uh, dua for our beloved scholar, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf Imam Zayt Shakir, for giving us access to these texts and to and for translating these, um, you know, many of the texts that they have worked on and, and have provided for us. It's their efforts that we're able to benefit from this from this knowledge. Alhamdulillah. So please remember them in your dua. Remember the, um, the people at MCC, all of the staff and, and all the donors and the board members and everybody who uh, gives us these spaces, these virtual spaces to convene and to talk and to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We could all be doing anything um, for this one hour, but inshallah our hearts are pure and we have the intention, the, the right intention to come together in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with, with the intention that he draws closer to us, inshallah, by seeing our efforts. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, bless all of you. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Unless, actually, forgive me, let me get off of the, um, I forgot to stop screen share, so I apologize for that. But yes, I will um, quickly check to see if Brother Salman has any other comments for me. And also, I know sometimes on the YouTube page there are some questions so I'll, I'll quickly survey that before i i go so that i don't miss anything excuse me just give me one moment inshallah but yes in the meantime um again may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you uh and make it easy for you and keep you safe inshallah and has any other oh, comments sorry <laughs> i need to do that okay alhamdulillah um I don't see any other questions on YouTube, Brother Salman. So if there's nothing else on the Facebook page, then inshallah, we can go ahead and um, we can wrap it up for this evening. And just for those of you, again, who are maybe tuning in for the first time, uh, these halaqas are... Um, you know, they're called, uh, you know, a virtual, uh, it's a sisterhood, sorority and sisterhood, but I want to make sure that you know, I don't personally mind if uh, brothers are tuning in. I know some people might have different views on that, but I don't mind, inshallah. So, you know, if, if, if you, uh, if, if your family wants to watch, I'm honored that you'd want to watch. So please uh, feel free to share this with, with others, but um, we will be meeting from now on. Sunday evenings, 8 to 9, inshallah, no longer Thursdays, uh, inshallah, until unless things change. But for now, we'll keep it Sunday evening. And we'll continue with the rest of the text, inshallah, um, the next time we see you, which will be in two weeks. So these are not weekly. They're every other week. So not next Sunday, but the following, inshallah. Uh, so I look forward to uh, seeing you all there. Have a wonderful evening. And uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again keep all of you safe. We'll end in dua. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal-Asr inna l-insana la fi khusr. Illa ladhina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasaw bil-haqi wa tawasaw bil-sabr. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika shadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Allahumma salam wa salam wa barik ala Sayyidina wa Mawlana wa Habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa salam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam tasliman kathira. Jazakum Allah khairan again. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
الحمد لله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, Welcome Alhamdulillah to all of you uh, brothers and sisters who are out there tuning in to our um, official second uh, uh, halaqa here or a session on agenda to change our condition. It is a text that we have been covering actually for a few, uh, several weeks now, but we started a little differently um, with the appendices in the back of the book. And so we're now reading the actual text. So if you don't have the text, I highly encourage you to get it. It will be easy to follow along with me, but I do have slides prepared, which I will bring up in just a moment. Um, but here is the book. Again, for anybody who's new tuning in, uh, it is a text that is written by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and Imam Zaid Shakir, um, and it is called Agenda to Change Our Condition. And again, this is our second official reading, so we're very early on into the text, uh, alhamdulillah. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up my slides here, uh, and that way we can begin, inshallah. Uh, if I have one minute here, or one moment. Okay, bismillah. So here we go. Um, I apologize, one second. Stop screen share, okay. Okay, um, hmm. I don't know what happened. Um, let me just, sorry. We had it all set up just a second ago. But for some reason, I'm getting an error message now. So if you bear with me while I pull this up. Um, your audio sharing application. Huh, okay, I'm not exactly sure why I'm getting this message, but once, I'm sorry for the inconvenience. We just had everything working fine. SubhanAllah. Um, screen, because uh, if Brother Salman, can you just verify if you can see my screen? For some reason, I'm getting um, a strange message. Are you able to see it? Oh. Brother Salman, are you there? SubhanAllah. We, we come on early and we can... Uh, okay, so I think you've, you've sent me a message. Okay, inshallah, then we're good to go. I apologize. I was getting a very strange error message I've never seen before. So alhamdulillah. All right, let's go ahead and begin. So again, um, the la last week or last time, it's been about two weeks now since we meet every other week, we started reading the text. Um, we were very much in the uh, beginning of, of, uh, you know, of this text. Um, I'm sorry, one more second. I'm going to full screen it so that we don't have any issues with the display. Okay, so now, inshallah, we should be good to go. Anyhow, alhamdulillah, we started reading this text together and, you know, I said there's so much to get through, we ended up only getting to a few pages. So where, we're, where we are right now, if you have the text, is we were talking about the, the rapid changes in the Muslim uh, world due to you know, um, imperialism, colonialism, a lot of Western influence that came into the Muslim world, uh, we begin to see. And so in the text, um, Shah Hamza here in the introduction, he describes all of these very rapid changes. He describes changes to the cultures in many Muslim countries, uh, food, clothing, language, even the infrastructure and architecture of, of Muslim lands started to change and become more westernized. Institutions um, and many th other things have just started to transform away from the traditional um, Muslim uh, architecture and design and and just you know the way that the the, the cities and 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 towns were built and more and more western influences were coming in so he talked about that and then on page 4 at the very bottom of the text 
He, he says here, one need only look at the photographs taken by the first Europeans in the lands of Islam 100 years ago to see the nobility of Muslim dress. The American poet Ezra Pound remarked that he had no idea of the force that was unleashed from the Arabian Peninsula in the seventh century that led to a thousand mosques in Cordoba, Spain, until he caught a glimpse of it in the way a Muslim walked in Tangier in 1913. Compare that image to the current Muslim cities teeming with desolate youth looking for a ticket out of their empty lives to anywhere but home. So again, he's just describing the contrast of what, how, where we were uh, to where we are now. You know, the stunning architecture he describes on page five, gardens, parks that engendered awe in the eyes of all who gazed upon them, right? Those were, were suddenly transformed uh, and uh, more commercial buildings uh, with, uh, you know, just brick buildings or, or stone buildings with very little color or dimension or design uh, took their place, right? And then he he goes down and he talks about the the schools, the madrasas, where the love of Allah and His Prophet Sallallahu was instilled in the hearts of the students, along with a rich understanding of the Deen of Allah, and with memorization of His Book, uh, have been replaced by secular institutions that instill in people a disdain for the past and a boredom that lingers long after the last empty book is closed and an equally empty career begun. So, you know, all of this is to really help us to see why we're in the situation that we're in. The text is about changing our condition and we cannot uh, help ourselves or heal from where we are if we don't first diagnose ourselves and see where the problems began. And so the problems in many uh, instances began with, with these uh, things that were introduced into the Muslim world, right? The government systems that we have currently, right? Uh, many of them are abusive systems of power, of rule. And, uh, and so he's describing all of this at length on in the very early pages of page four and five. And so and then he goes on, let me just change the slide here. Uh, Bismillah. Give me one minute. Okay, oh, went too far. So then he goes on and he says um, on the next page, on page uh, six here, he says that, you know, if Muslims were truly living Islam, our greatness would dispel any negative influence from the West in the traditional lands of Islam. And he quotes uh, the famous historian, Arnold Toynbee. He said, he said that he um, recognized Islam as a spiritual power that could help reinvigorate the dissipated state of society and its life-threatening social ills. So other people recognized the power Islam had, but unfortunately we lost uh, appreciation for our own tradition in many ways because we were so quick to replace it. And that's really what he's pointing out here. And then he talks about how, subhanAllah, I mean, today, first of all, I, I didn't mention it, forgive me, but it's, you know, the first day or now it's the second night of Rabi al-Awwal, the month of the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So uh, Mubarak to all of you who are out there, but important to reflect on the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his experience. And so in, in the middle of page six, he talks about how the Prophet ﷺ asked only one thing of the Quraysh, right? All he said is, let me be that I may invite people to Islam. He wanted them to just leave him alone so that he could do his dawah and do what he was uh, meant to do. And they didn't. They were relentless and they were brutal and they didn't give him that opportunity with at all. He had to, of course, uh, overcome them. But he, he, you know, Shaykh Hamza here says, we, on the other hand, are given leave to invite pe people yet we do not you know and again this is symptomatic of of the fact that we have lost appreciation and value for our own tradition and we have in many ways become preoccupied with uh with the world and the dunya and acquiring wealth and, and materialism and all the other things that this dunya can delude us with right um so then he goes on and he on again we're on page six here and he talks uh, about, uh, he says, 
we on the other, uh, I'm sorry, he, he says, this is not to deny that there are some who oppose the spread of Islam. Among such people are those who will not sit idly by and allow others to invite people to Islam without attempting to undermine Muslims, cause dissension in the ranks of believers, and place obstacles along the path. They ultimately manifest disbelief in a very real way, and their existence is a test from Allah to distinguish real believers from hypocrites. However, our Prophet wasallam. In a sound hadith said, "Do not seek confrontation with your enemies, but when it occur, but when it occurs, be steadfast." So again, he's just you know giving us some insight into the di- the current dynamic of our community, where you have some people who are just really disconnected and disengaged, and other people who are, um, you know, they're being obstructive, and so we have to be steadfast. Uh, and, and continue to do what we're meant to do, which is uh, spread this tradition, value this tradition. That's what our responsibility is. And so he goes on um, on the same page. And again, let me pull up the slides so those of you who don't have the text can at least read along partially here with us. Um, if you give a moment, there's always a bit of a delay. Uh, he says here, that true Muslims, so now he's you know, defining for us where we all should be, because we're clearly confused, we're lost, we've lost value for our tradition, we're, we're seeing it all over the Muslim world, and in many cases, those of us who are living, who are Muslim minorities living in non-Muslim lands, we're also reflecting the same uh, problem of just not really appreciating our faith tradition as we should, uh, because we're too caught up in, in the pursuit of the, the material or world, right? The, the material world. So he's reminding us here that where we all should be. And he says, true Muslims love peace, obey the law, but are also commanded by Allah to be witnesses unto humanity. In, uh, and in order to fulfill this, we must first be witnesses unto ourselves. So he's, you know, making us hold ourselves to account here. You know, we can enjoy um, the privileges, the opportunities that we have here, alhamdulillah, we live in a time and place and, and, and many of us where we do have immense privilege. And so we can certainly, you know, enjoy what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us and we should do our best to be the best citizens wherever we are. But our ultimate objective, we can't lose sight of it, which is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also to bear witness as Muslims that this is a true faith and to live this deen and to teach it in, you know, when, when we can, when we have the opportunity. But he reminds us here that in order to do that effectively, we have to first not forget our own selves. We have to hold ourselves to account. And so here in this uh, ayah from Surah Al-Baqarah, right? Do you command people to righteousness and forget yourselves? So this is really about not becoming a hypocrite. You know, you can't um, espouse the beauty of Islam, all of these amazing things that are true, haq, but then you don't live it yourself. You have to have consistency. You have to have truth. And so, um, you know, to this is the starting point. Know what your objectives are, but hold yourself to account and have the balance, you know, be in the dunya, but also know that you have an important, a very important role in this dunya. And now he's going to introduce what that is. So, and the next page, or actually, excuse me, the next section, again, if, if you're following along in the book, the very bottom of page six, we now have a section titled Inner and Outer Transformations. Um, and so here, did I, so let me just check if I skipped a, no, I didn't. Okay, I thought I skipped a, a, a slide. So Inner and Outer Transformations. Here, um, he says that the path for us, and now we're, he's speaking specifically to the Muslims who are in Western lands, okay? So he says, the path for us in these Western lands is twofold. Um, the first is inner transformation through spiritual struggle. Um, you know, I'm so sorry. I think I did skip a, a slide. Let me see if I put it somewhere else. Where did that slide go? Here it is. I don't know how this slide got all the way at the end, forgive me, uh, but I knew I, I definitely skipped over this. So here we go. So he, he, he talks about inner and outer transformation. So he says that the first is the inner transformation. It's, this is the spiritual struggle uh, with the soul, right? This is the very first um, 
part of our path here in the West. The second is the outer transformation. And this is struggle with the vices and degrading aspects of society. This means working toward the realization of social justice and a culture that embodies moral comportment, protects children and enhances family and community life. Now, again, you know, this book was um, uh, written uh, several years ago and published in 2013 as a text, but it was written even prior to that. And so when you think about where we are now, this is such incredibly relevant advice. I mean, I just, you know, gave a parenting, started a parenting class yesterday, and we talked a lot about um, some of the struggles that parents are having with their families. And so, uh, and, and one of the things that I hear a lot from people are the fears, the legitimate fears that they have about raising their children in this society and, and in other parts of the Western world as well, because so many of the things that are now acceptable and normalized in these societies are completely antithetical to uh, our creed, our belief. Um, and so it's very difficult to try to navigate, well, how can we live in these societies when every uh, thing that you see out in that, again, is acceptable and, and even encouraged is, uh, is, is pulling people away from their faith. And so you have natural fears from parents and uh, about future generations, about their children now, you know, what's going to happen to them when they get a little older? Are they going to be able to maintain their faith? These are all very, very legitimate uh, fears. And so this, you know, part of the text is really for us to contemplate where are we with both of these um, aspects of our path? Where are we with our own inner transformation, right? How, where are we with our own mujahida? What are we doing? Are we living this deen as much as we can? Or have we sort of just um, given up in certain areas? You know, are we, are we not really striving uh, to be better? Have we become stagnant and stale and we're just kind of going with the motions? Are we making efforts at all? You know, and the best way to really gauge that is to ask yourself, where were you, you know, just a few months ago? Where were you last year? Where were you uh, 10 years ago, five years ago? What major changes have you committed to in terms of your spiritual, your own individual spiritual identity, your own individual spiritual path? Are you having the same problems or have new problems emerged? Like, were you better five years ago? Um, or have you really overcome a lot of your struggles? Um, but where are you right now? And this is something we all have to do individually and independently and have those really honest conversations with ourselves um, because it absolutely impacts the second part of it. I mean, again, the whole book is agenda to change our condition. And we know from the verses in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he will not change the condition of a people until they change themselves. So if we want to see our uh, community healing, our societies improving, we cannot expect that to happen if we're not first willing to look to ourselves, which is what the entire purpose and the majority of this book deals with. It deals with really the inner, the inward lens, the looking inward and trying to figure out what all of us have to do differently. Um, because if we don't do that, then it's very likely that we're not going to have success when it comes to all of these other things outside of us that we so desperately wish we could control, right? So um, these two things, you know, for all of us, again, just to give us perspective, very important um, to uh, to reflect on. Now I'm going to go back because the slide got out of order. So just bear with me a moment while I find my placing here. Um, but let me go back. Bismillah. So this is the slide that should have come next. So here on the page, top of page seven, um, we have a quote from uh, the great uh, scholar, 11th century uh, Mufassir and uh, scholar of Arabic, Raghab uh, al-Isfahani. Um, and Sheikh Hamza quotes here that he gave us two main reasons, or in his opinion, there were two main reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the human being. Uh, the first is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Um, and so here we have the verse, uh, right? They were only commanded to worship Allah with purity, making the religion solely for him. So this is, again, uh, the reminder that this is part of our uh, 
creation. The second reason is to cultivate the world, right? Uh, so he brought you forth from the earth and has caused you to cultivate it. So this idea of uh, first recognizing our own purpose, we're here to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's solely uh, our purpose. But then also there's the other side of the coin, we have to cultivate this dunya that that we've uh, inherited, that we're a part of, and how do we do that? So then in the rest of the text, he now describes that. So he says here, um, again, if I can get to the next slide. Bismillah. Um, I went far. Okay, so here, so what cultivation means. He says here, cultivation here means to sow seeds that produce both temporal fruits as well as eternal ones. Such cultivation entails building schools, hospitals, farms, roads, bridges and cities and towns, wherein Allah is worshiped and the sanctity of the earth is preserved. In order for us to realize our God-given potential within our lifetimes, we must break the cycles of stagnation by abandoning methods that have proven ineffective in fulfilling our responsibilities as people committed to Islam. We can accomplish this only by changing our current condition. This requires courage, commitment, and above all, critical introspection. So, I mean, look, that's a pretty tall order, right? Uh, if you think about um, what we're supposed to be doing and what we're all actually doing, many of us, and I can speak for myself as well, it's very easy to get caught up in our own individual goals and pursuits and forget the bigger picture, um, right? You, we all work, we have families to take care of, we have children to take care of, parents, in-laws. And so we can just kind of get caught up in that routine and then lose sight of the fact that we should also be looking towards the future because our children, what are they going to uh, carry forth if we're not also trying to help in some way? So whether that means we actually get involved with institution building or supporting institutions and organizations some way or another, you can do that financially, you can you know, uh, volunteer and work, you can uh, serve onto committees or boards. Some part of us should feel compelled to do that. And I think that's what the point is here, that we, you know, we should look to the benefit that will, that all of this will bring for generations to come, as well as for our own uh, progeny, our own children, our grandchildren, they are going to reap the benefits if we prioritize these things. But if we just get caught up in our own material worldly pursuits, you know, just making money and buying homes and cars and vacationing, and eating the best of foods and buying, you know, all the, the clothes that we want. And just, it's all about what we uh, benefit from for ourselves instead of looking at these other very important uh, big, big picture things, then we have no one else to blame but ourselves when we see that our children, for example, are not really interested in being part of their community, right? If we don't take them to the masjid and have them appreciate, for example, uh, what a great resource and what a great um, blessing it is to have be part of a community and to have a community center, to have teachers, to have classes regularly. And, you know, we understand, I mean, it's understandable that you're, we're not going to always be able to attend every single event or lecture, but at least to value it, at least to have appreciation for it. So that when you get that email um, from the masjid asking for some support, some donations, that you don't just roll your eyes and become cynical and, uh, and you know, act as though it's a, it's just here we go again, but rather, you know, instead of spending money on, on uh, whatever big purchase you might have had your eyes on for a while, that you you see the bigger picture. That it's better to pay it forward uh, for your the benefit of your community, the benefit of your children and grandchildren, inshallah. So, really thinking big picture, but to think about all of these things that this is what cultivating means. That we actually invest in schools and hospitals and building institutions and and improving our uh, world and our society and taking that seriously. So civic engagement, you know, getting involved uh, with what's going on in local government and actually being a part of that is a big part of the, the role that we should have as Muslims here living in the West. So 
and have that really great, powerful reminders for all of us to reflect on. And that last line is so important, right? We can accomplish this only by changing our current condition. This requires courage, commitment, and above all, critical introspection. So we have to be willing to uh, think critically about our own culpability and why we are in the state that we're in um, in, as a community, because we all do have some part in it. Uh, And that's, you know, again, a very subjective individual process, but we have to start there. And that's what the whole objective of mujahida and and really um, trying to change your condition is. It's a matter of, let me first, again, diagnose the problems, look inwardly, look outwardly, analyze the situation, make sense of it, and then from there figure out what I have to do next. So it's an essential part of the process. Now, the next um, slide here, bismillah. Give me a second here. Okay, so the next section on page seven at the bottom, um, he has titled The Importance of Family. So here he says that the family is the first and most important unit of society and is designed to nurture and prepare the young to carry on the civilizational enterprise. It is in serious crisis throughout the world and our children whether in Muslim households or those of other faiths and beliefs are suffering everywhere. So, I mean, this is just an absolutely true statement and you can um, look at research, whether it's uh, from different, uh, you know, academic institutions or scientific institutions, journals, uh, psychologists, therapists, uh, there's a lot of people who are looking at what's happening with our youth and it's very concerning. Anxiety disorders are on the rise globally and uh, mostly in uh, amongst the youth, you know, teen, teen demographic, uh, young adult demographic, we're seeing a lot of mental health issues. And there's, it's just, it's getting worse and worse. And there's a lot of, you know, thought and analysis on why, what's happening. But the bottom line is, is it is happening and it's everywhere. And we have to hit pause for a moment and just try to at least figure out what are some of the uh, potential reasons why kids are, are suffering so much more today, maybe than ever in human history. Allah knows. Uh, we, I don't know if we can, you know, make a specific or, or exact claims, but when you do look at the data of how many teens are reporting uh, problems, you know, suicidal ideation, cutting, a lot of anxiety, as we said, disorders, social anxiety disorders, depression, these are not... Um, we shouldn't take them lightly or act like, oh, this is just a reflection of typical teenage angst. And, you know, all teens go through that and they can be dramatic. And, you know, we, sometimes people get very cynical. These millennials, these Generation Z, they're also spoiled and they're just brats. And that's not how uh, we should stuff a lot talk about people. I mean, clumping people and, you know, with those types of generalizations is never a good thing, but especially when it comes to young children, I mean, that I think is, is just deflecting because as adults, our, it's our duty to protect them and to take care of them. And so when you see children engaging in really risky behaviors, whether it's, uh, you know, drugs, alcohol, uh, premarital relations, all the things, the risk factors and the fears that every parent has for their child, when you see them doing those things, Um, and in doing things that maybe you couldn't even think of doing when you were their age, instead of blaming them and making it sound like they're just inherently flawed, I think it's more effective to look back on where did we as adults fail them? How did we fail them? What did we do uh, that that led to this problem, you know, in terms of of, uh, society and culture, uh, the messages that they're getting, the access to a lot of this thing, these things that they're getting. Um, we have to look back to ourselves. For example, I mean, very simple, you know, thing to, to look at is, um, again, access. Like when I was uh, in high school and even, you know, throughout my, my childhood and in well into even my college years, my parents had very strict rules. And I'm sure many people of my generation can relate about curfew and about, you know, who we could be around. And there were rules in terms of what we had access to. And uh, so that 
built in maybe, um, you know, just a, an awareness that was, uh, alhamdulillah, with us, even when our parents weren't there. We just knew we couldn't do certain things because very early on, those things were understood and communicated and they were, uh, you know, there were consequences. So when we are vigilant as parents and we can implement those types of rules and really, um, you know, be, be vigilant and be firm, our children will naturally fall into line. But a lot of what's happening is that we aren't as vigilant. And I can say that because the structure of our homes are different. You know, when you have at least one parent in the house and they're stable and they're consistently there and they are um, present and watchful over the children, you have, uh, you know, less likely chances of things, um, uh, you know, passing through that or, or getting the children getting through away with things. But when both parents are um, disconnected and just really distracted, I should say, uh, because of other obligations, and it doesn't always necessarily have to be work, it can just be, uh, you know, personal other things that, are, that come up or, um, you know, uh, roles that maybe uh, a parent plays in terms of other family members. You know, I see some, I've seen some friends and, and people that I know who are uh, very consumed by other obligations in their life due to other family members maybe, or other things going on. So the point is, is when we don't have that type of vigilance in the home, then you see a lot of things happen. And kids, of course, um, the world that they're in, uh, they don't really have to go very far to get access to some of the worst, most toxic, dangerous, poisonous elements of society. It's all within reach within seconds because of social media and devices and all of these very uh, dangerous uh, things that our children do have access to. So vigilance isn't always um, necessarily where our children are going outside of the home and watching. I mean, that's part of it, certainly who they're spending time with, who their influences are. But I think, um, in, you know, from our generation and previous generations, it's the opposite now. It's inside the home, what are the influences that our children have? Um, you know, are they watching a lot of television? Are they watching a lot of Netflix and all of these other streaming services that may seem like not a big deal because, oh, they're in the home. It gives you kind of like a false sense of security if you think about it as a parent. Oh, they're just in their room. You know, they're watching something with their friend or their sister. You know, they're, they're just watching a movie. But if we're not being vigilant to know what are they watching and do we um, – follow up, you know, do we have uh, measures in place to be able to know what they're watching, you know, or do we just give them all access passes to a lot of these, I mean, HBO, there's Netflix, there's like, there's all these streaming services that do not have very good content at all. And the, the sad thing is, is that their generation, the shows that are tailored for their generation are some of the worst, some of the worst shows that you could possibly imagine are made for and uh, presented to as as you know um, as uh, as um, as entertainment for for the teen demographic. Uh, for example, there's a show on HBO I mentioned, Euphoria. If you don't know this show, know that your teens most likely know about this show because it's very popular in that demographic. And I believe it just won an Emmy. It won some award recently. Um, and it, it was very, you know, it received a lot of awards, I believe. But the point is, is that show, if you watch even a few minutes of it um, as a Muslim, it should absolutely fill you with horror because every type of debauchery you can imagine is shown in that show from the get-go. It's like, uh, you know, just within a few, for a few minutes. There's many other shows as well that are like that, but they celebrate uh, ideas that are not part of our faith, and yet they are marketed specifically to teens. And so as parents, if we're not aware of the, again, the shows uh, or the music, look at the music industry and how much it's changed in the past, I would say 10, 15 years, even when I was younger, much different lyrics, many just different type of content that teens and young uh, children were exposed to. Now, 
if you're paying attention at all to what's going on at, at you know with social media anyhow you have um, on TikTok for example there are so many trends uh, with young children forget you know older teens who are at least you could say you know from our tradition they're young adults right mukallaf they, they have accountability i'm talking about young children like seven, eight, nine who are dancing in very provocative ways to uh, songs by someone like Cardi B. You know, it's like really horrific. Um, but this is the world that our kids are in right now. And so we have to pay attention. And this is where the onus is on us as parents to know that it is a very difficult time for children, but we have to stand vigilant and make sure that what is coming to what they have access to that we know what it is. So all of those, um, you know, uh, those uh, systems that you can find, whether it's online, you know, just security systems or, or apps or whatever it is that will allow you at least some level of control uh, over what they're, um, what they're taking in and consuming is, is, is essential. We can't take it like for, um, we can't assume that just because they say, uh, that they're going to do, not going to do something or going to do something that that's going to be the case because temptation is real. We all know what peer pressure is. We all know that young children and teens do not have a uh, very strong ability to regulate their themselves um, because those, those uh, functions aren't fully developed yet in, in that part of the brain. So we know these things. So we shouldn't assume that uh, just because they're good kids and, and they're, they're sweet and we love them, that they won't fall. Um, I mean, the, we know from, from uh, just reading uh, you know, our history that some of the best people have fallen. Um, and so that's just naive to think that a young child, just because they're good, that you can necessarily trust uh, them to not um, you know, get curious, to not want to look, to not want to do something. And also, aside from that, there's predators that are very good at grooming and luring children into traps. And so the bottom line is, is we have to be very serious about the crisis that is unfolding and has been unfolding um, in front of us re with regards to uh, our children and to really uh, be worried. We should be worried. If we're not worried, there's a problem. Anyway, uh, I mean, that's my my personal opinion because I work a lot with teens and I, I deal with a lot of issues that I think would really, um, to be honest, just um, startle, freak out and, and, and make a lot of parents just fall into deep, deep despair and depression because it's like, how, how can this be happening to our young children? Uh, unfortunately, it is. So, you know, here, I think that's the point that he's, um, he's making here is that it's, uh, it's children are suffering and they're and we really do have to help them. And then he goes on to say, now he's, he's, you know, giving us some insight into also another area that we have to be uh, aware of. And he says here on the bottom of page seven, he says, schools once meant to nourish and enhance the intellects, bodies, and souls of our youth now dumb them down and prepare them for a life of mediocrity and servility. In many instances, to perform meaningless jobs that neither benefit humanity nor help the individual grow morally and spiritually. Um, you know, he, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot more content here just regarding um the government and, and just different ways of how these uh, things are influencing our ability to parent our children, privacy issues and other things. But I think that point about schooling is something we should also take very seriously as Muslims, because, you know, as someone who is a, um, you know, who went to pu public schools my whole life um, when I was growing up here and who's visited public schools since then, um, you know, I've spoken at many public schools uh, for on Islam and, and other topics, I am shocked. Uh, I think the last time I went to a, a public high school was a year ago and um, to give a talk. And I just remember immediately from the get-go being totally shocked by my experience because it was so different than anything that I, I, I remembered or experienced in my own um in my own life. For example, uh, one of the things that immediately I saw was um, 
police uh, cars, vehicles in the parking lot of the school that I went to. And it wasn't um, necessarily a dangerous you know, neighborhood or anything like that. I came to find out that that's pretty much you know, standard now in many schools across public schools across, um, you know, the the country where in maybe in maybe in in major cities or close to major cities it may be more. But the point is, is I was shocked that there were so many police vehicles in the parking lot and all the school entrances were gated, completely gated, and they. I mean, it was a very tight knit security system which to be honest, it felt like a prison. I'm not exaggerating because they had metal bars throughout every entry and exit point of the school, the perimeter of the school. And so I just remember going, how do the, you know, people working in these institutions um, and, and attending these, how do they feel peace? Because in my short visit, I did not feel peace. I actually felt very anxious being there. And I remember um, I was walking, you know, being someone who is an adult and, you know, you you need all these passes. I had to go from one part of the parking lot around uh, the building. And there was um, a kid, he was, you know, a high schooler behind me, but he had his backpack on in a very strange way. And he was very closely walking behind me. And I remember feeling like fear. Why is he so close to me? And his backpack was uh, in front of him and he was like doing all these weird things. It just felt very uneasy. So then I thought, wow, here I am a visitor and I'm feeling so uncomfortable. Imagine this is every day for, for these students. So the point is, is, you know, public schools have just changed so much um, due to all of the violence and uh, the risks that, that are out there. And, um, you know, we're not um, I mean, this is just reality, you know, uh, that 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 many people have um, have have experienced, unfortunately, some really horrific things at, at the schools on, on site, you know what, and I'm not speaking just about terrorist attacks or any type of school shootings necessarily, but bullying, I mean, bullying is such a big part of a lot of teens everyday experiences, which is why you see so much, um, you know, depression and so many other mental health issues is because a lot of kids are are traumatized from from bullying behavior and then just exposure to other things that are when you think of teens and how vulnerable they are and what a difficult time it is in their life to have to on top of managing their own emotions and all the changes that are happening to them physically mentally emotionally all the fears of their future you know you have what am i going to be what am i going to do how well am i going to perform in school am i going to go to college all of these very legitimate concerns that they have the pressures that they have from their families on top of that to have to go into an environment where they are judged very harshly and critically for their appearance girls are anywhere girls of course we know um, are, are judged very harshly for how they appear, for how they look, uh, immense pressure, boys as well, for not just how they look and appear, but, you know, um, how, whether or not they measure up. You know, there's a lot of uh, very um, uh, just close minded narrow definitions of what it means to be uh, a boy or, you know, um, I mean, toxic masculinity, just look it up and you'll see what I'm talking about. But all of those uh, things are real. And so a lot of our teens experience daily anxiety and pressure because they are going into environments where those things are just, that's their every day for eight, 10 hours a day. That's what they have to deal with. And then on top of that, social media, which is just an extension of the school, school now, because everybody's online, everybody's connected. And so a lot of these behaviors follow them even after they go home, right? And if, you know, I know right now we're in quarantine, so this may not um, you know seem to be relevant in the moment, but if we're just speaking generally, about life before quarantine and likely what's going to happen when things resume. This is the reality that the public schools are are very toxic environments um, that we have to protect our children from. And so here, uh, Sheikh Hamza as well speaks about um, that. And he says that we must raise our children outside <clears throat> of the modern schools that are designed to make them no more than functional literates. So, um, And this is, I would say, also a moment of pause for many of us who may have become so um, 
wrapped up in the what we've been conditioned to think is the script, you know, that you parents work, whether it's one uh, income, double income, children go to school, we come home, we have our meals together, and then weekends we do things together. That's very typical for a lot of American or Western families because we work, you know, 40 hour plus work weeks and there's schools are, you know, morning to afternoon and then you have all these other extracurriculars. So there's not a lot of time in between for families to really connect. But I think that's the point is that that being status quo isn't good and and it's actually causing a lot of these problems. So just because everybody is doing it, we should you know, be able to step back and see that there's harm. And, and the harm is is obvious when you look at what's happening with um, parental authority over children and just the, uh, the total lack of respect that a lot of teens have for parental authority. Uh, if you look at um, Dr. Leonard Sachs's work, he really does a, a phenomenal job about describing the breakdown that is happening in the, what he calls the collapse of parenting in, in America. But this is affecting Muslim families as well. There is definitely um, uh, you know, a problem with, with teens just being so disconnected um, from their family because they're not spending enough time with them, that when it comes to parents trying to establish authority, it just falls flat. I have literally worked with many families and spoken to many parents who are completely at their wits end. They've lost hope. They just don't know what to do. They, they feel like they really don't have any options anymore because their teens or their even college students have lost total uh, respect and value for the family and they are you know rebellious they're just doing a lot of things that the parents don't know how to how to control so these are the you know symptomatic of the fact that we are not spending enough time with our children and our families need that bonding time and so we have to prioritize that and if schooling and the the model of schooling and you know I'm speaking now very specific maybe to where I am, which is in the Bay Area uh, of California, and it's a very highly competitive area. There's immense pressure on parents and teens to not only excel in their school, but then beyond school to have to be scheduled, you know, basically until they zonk out at midnight or even past midnight because they have all these extracurriculars and it's all about getting into the best schools and getting into the, this system and that system or whatever uh, dream, you know, uh, career path that, that they may have. But the pressure that that puts on the teens and then, of course, the um, the how the effect of that uh, pressure on the family the family dynamic is real it's very real and so we have to step back and say is it worth it is it worth it to push our kids so hard so fast and so intensely into that direction if it's at the um compromise of the family of their faith identity of their identity in general because you know this is um you know, they're, they're, when they're exposed to so many different um, groups or messages and, you know, different paths all at once, it, it, can, um, it can affect their ability to really discern what is in my best interest and what isn't. And this is why, you know, we have to study about, you know, teens, for example, like their peer group at a certain point has more influence over their decisions than their family. So if we're not even aware of who their peer group is because they just go to this, you know, school and then they, after that, they, they, once they get their license anyway, they can, you know, uh, drive themselves to wherever. But if we're not aware of the influences that our children are exposed to, we shouldn't be shocked when they come home and say, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to do that. Or I identify as this. And I, I, I want to explore this lifestyle. We shouldn't be surprised because that is their what their you know um, what their environment is for the majority of their day. They're spending time with with people who have different maybe views than you do. So I think the point here is that we have to step back and say, is this model effective? Well, clearly it's not. Um, 
we're seeing a, a major problem with uh, youth culture in this country. And a lot of it does stem from the school system, from social media. So let's step back and see what our alternatives are. And that's why he offers here, again, in the same text, he says, we must remove our children from state schools. And then the onus is back on us. So it's like, okay, you see the problem is in these public school systems or the, these systems that, again, do offer um, or influence and condition and indoctrinate children. It's just a fact. If there's a problem in those systems and you're aware of that, pull them out because that's your duty. But then at the same time, you have to work towards what we talked about earlier, the cultivation. It's your obligation to be part of that, to be part of uh, the building of institutions that are actually going to help your children and other children. So design, build, support, life enhancing places of learning. And alhamdulillah, you know, I personally am so grateful because I actually know uh, people who did this exact thing. And, you know, uh, if we look at here in the Bay Area, we have alhamdulillah, um, Islamic schools that were that were started grassroots from nothing, from like one classroom, one teacher, a handful of students meeting in a very humble humble beginnings. But mashallah, because of the sincerity of the people involved and their vision and their ability to see the long, you know, the the, the, the longer picture and and wanting to work towards that. They made it happen to where now we have institutions like uh, North Star School, for example. It is, mashallah, one of the most successful schools in our community. Uh, Peace Terrace Academy, Averroes. We have, um, of course, we have uh, the, the longest, um, I believe it's the longest established Islamic school in the Bay Area, the MCA, uh, you know, a high school and school system. Uh, so we have, alhamdulillah, great models, but all of those were started by parents who did not want to just, you know, let their kids fall into the system, but actually saw the problems and, that were there and they decided to do something about it. So that's on all of us to be actively trying to fix the problems that we see instead of just ignoring them, sweeping them under the rug, or just, you know, saying, oh, well, kind of uh, uh, you know, acquiescing to, again, the status quo that this is what everybody else is doing. I guess I should do it too. We have to be thinking about the consequences of these things. So that, you know, is a is for maybe parents who are uh, contemplating or have having children or have young children and they're thinking about their future. I just got a message actually recently, I think it was yesterday or today about about that, you know, um, moms who are worried about their the schooling of their children who are younger now. And that's good. It's good that, you know, they're worried because that's where, inshallah, some some good changes will come. It's that fear of the unknown, uh, the fear of the risks and the desire to not want your kids to suffer that will hopefully, inshallah, lead you down the path of protecting, which is our number one uh, job as as parents, right? So alhamdulillah, um, you know, he, he really emphasizes this uh, point a lot about moving kids um, from, from those school systems. And then this last point is also very important. We must abandon cruel and punitive child rearing techniques as this is the primary source of social dysfunction and hypocrisy. We all need to be reminded of this message because unfortunately some of our cultures and some of our family um, uh, you know, uh, philosophies of parenting that maybe we receive from our, our own families are really broken systems. They're just not, um, they're, they're, they actually contribute to so much of the suffering of, of children and so much of the dysfunction that we see in society. Because if you come from a culture or a family that condones abuse of any type towards children, this is, we should be very um, clear about it, unequivocally state to everybody out there that there's no room for that in our tradition whatsoever. As a good Muslim, as a God-fearing Muslim, you do not strike, you do not abuse, you do not, you're not harsh, especially with young children and and uh, those that are, are are weaker and smaller and who are dependent on you. You don't do that. I mean, subhanAllah, the Prophet so many of um, 
uh, his his the, the hadith that we learned from him, he defended the rights of animals who were being mistreated. So what about children? Of course, you know he he uh, rebuked any type of abuse uh, towards uh, towards uh, innocent creation. So we have to be very careful about allowing ourselves or justifying ourselves. Um, you know, to, to do that because, oh, we think that this is going to get them in line and that they'll respect us and they have to listen. And some children are so unruly and they don't learn the easy way. So we have to teach them the hard way. Those are all just excuses that you're making to justify your abusive behavior. And you're not, um, you know, willing to actually do the hard work, which is to maybe take them to the professionals who can help determine why they're acting out if there are actually legitimate behavioral issues that you have to deal with. But that is what the parent does. The parent uh, who's responsible and who understands that the child is an amana from Allah and that they will be held accountable for their treatment of that child um, doesn't look at the child as a burden and as, you know, just this nuisance that they have to deal with, but they look at it like this is a trust from Allah and I have to take care of it. So when I see that child uh, unable to regulate themselves or their emotions acting out, speaking out or doing something they shouldn't be doing, I want to fix it, right? That's different than I want to just subject them to some sort of punishment and shut them up and get them out of my face. That's a total different attitude, Sahrawah. You know, so we have to go back and really, um, again, have these internal dialogues where we hold ourselves to account about the choices we make with regards to uh, our children and protecting them. Because um, our families, as you know, Shah Hamza mentioned here, it is the most important unit of our society. So if we see our families are breaking down, um, we have to determine what the sources are if our children are not again um you know paying uh, respecting us following our uh, the rules of our home what is the reason is it because we ourselves are failing in some capacity are we um being hypocritical are we establishing uh, the prophetic model of parenting or are we just you know being um you know, uh, authoritarians who are uh, wielding our power and, and abusing our power in some cases, and then we're expecting our children to listen to us. Th this is a broken system. Are our kids being influenced by external sources? And what are those sources? Do we know what those sources are? Are they from media? Are they from social media? Are they from, you know, friend groups that, that are toxic to them? How are we protecting our children? Do they are they going into schooling systems uh, that are detrimental to them spiritually? What are we doing to protect them? So all of this is on us to determine and to really take seriously because again, the importance of the family cannot be overestimated. It is the most important unit. So we have to do everything in our power to protect it. But it's um it's really a matter of of doing this type of internal. Uh, introspection, analyzing, thinking, and holding ourselves to account. So, alhamdulillah, this is the end of um, today's class. I think, yeah, there's more, inshallah, um, that I uh, invite all of you to independently read in those, uh, in that section, the introduction. And then, inshallah, in two weeks, when we rejoin, we will start with chapter one, which is on taqwa, its definition and benefits. So, alhamdulillah, we'll, um, we'll actually start the, uh, the official uh, text uh, next week. But, you know, we did the introduction, alhamdulillah, we did the appendices. So, I look forward to um, our next meeting. I'm going to quickly uh, get out of screen share here and see if I see any questions. I think I did go over. I apologize for those of you who are um, tuning in, but let's see if there are any questions that I can get to, if you give me a moment. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Oh, thank you. I see some comments. Um, thank you. I believe they came earlier when I began asking about my screen. So I don't see anything on a Facebook group, but I'll check the YouTube page as well, because I know we have people tuning in on different platforms. And I, again, don't want to miss any questions. So bear with me real quickly. 
can do that. Uh oh, I hope it doesn't play here. I don't want it to play. I just want to see if there's any questions. Okay, Alhamdulillah. So we have a question here um, from, I think, uh, if Sister Anjum. Can you please give me an example of raising children outside modern schools? That's a great, um, great question. Alhamdulillah, you know, we, we do see a lot of alternative school systems, a lot of uh, co-ops, a lot of charter programs, a lot of, um, you know, s private schools. Uh, and people, I think, are getting even more creative now that the pandemic um, is fully underway and they're losing their maybe patience with um, with the online virtual public school systems. I think there are people who are thinking of other ways. I know some people who have actually opted to homeschool, um, not necessarily through a charter or, you know, any, any government uh, program, but actually independent homeschooling where they take full control. And, you know, as a, as a homeschooling mom um, and someone who has um, sort of explored all the different options, I think there is a lot of misconception and fear around homeschooling, unfortunately. And it's sad because when you actually, um, you know, come to this side and you see that your children thrive, um, and of course, it's it's hard work. I'm not going to simplify it. You have to do a lot of uh, the legwork to to find the proper resources and the curriculum and all the stuff that is required uh, um, to keep your child active and engaged and tailored for him or her. It, it, it takes work, but alhamdulillah, we have so many amazing resources. Uh, I'm very fortunate enough uh, to know many, many uh, homeschoolers. Alhamdulillah, we have, um, you know, there's Kinza Academy, we have, um, uh, let's see, there's, uh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, but there's a lot of different programs here anyway that they do uh, work with parents who are interested in exploring alternative options. Um, but we have, uh, you know, the East Bay here in the Bay Area, we have the East Bay Homeschooling Group. We have the um, Silicon Valley uh, Homeschooling Group, which is based uh, in the Silicon Valley. We have, uh, when I was part of the Southern California community for many years, and they have a very large uh, uh, homeschooling community. Many sisters who, mashallah, successfully homeschooled their children from, you know, young age, I mean, preschool all the way through college. And uh, successful, amazing stories, really, really done a phenomenal job. And they're available to talk to and to get ideas from. And they have a lot of resources online. So I think that the the fear we have to, um, you know, help people overcome that it's not like maybe what it was 20, 30 years ago. I understand, you know, there there's certainly a time where maybe I myself may have looked at homeschooling and thought, what, that sounds so strange. But, you know, I'm a teacher by profession, so I've, I've never really um, shied away from from teaching, but I, I know people who tell me, I just, I don't think I could ever do that. But alhamdulillah, I've also heard from people who were fearful and never in a million years thought that they would find themselves as homeschoolers. But then alhamdulillah, uh, Allah opened their heart to the idea and they began to do it. And suddenly it's, they're so overjoyed by uh, all the strides and, and the successes that they've seen with their children. So I think every parent needs to make that decision. But the point I think that Sheikh Hamza was making in that text is to empower parents to start thinking about their choices and to see uh, the consequences of, the, uh, of some of those choices and to know that there are, are alternatives. So uh, that's really what we should take from that, that, you know, um, that there are other options. And now, alhamdulillah, maybe because of the fact that so many people are exposed to a different form or model of education, even though it's not necessarily always ideal through the virtual system, but at least it's something different that parents can start to think, you know what, maybe I don't need to rely on um, this system that I thought was the only option and rather look at other options because my children, their mental well-being, their physical well-being, their safety, their, um, you know, their, uh, their spiritual well-being, that's the most essential thing, is, is, is the most important thing to preserve. And so I need to do my job as a parent to make sure I can, I can do that for them. So inshallah. Uh, but thank you for the question, sister. Um, and I don't know if there's other questions, but I'm assuming, because I don't see any more, that that is all. And I have kept you uh, five minutes past the hour, but thank you so much. And forgive us for the um, technical delays. Um, we try every... Uh, 
session to come early, figure all of it out, but there always seems to be something. And alhamdulillah, it's humbling, but I appreciate your patience, inshallah. We will see you in two weeks. Uh, we'll, we're, we will begin, inshallah, chapter one on taqwa. So please, if you would like, read ahead, and we'll see you there. Jazakumullah khair, and we'll end in dua. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal-asr inna l-insan la fi khusr illa ladhina amanu wa amil as-salihati wa tawasu bil-haqi wa tawasu bil-sabr. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika shudu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barik ala sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Alhamdulillah. Jazakum Allah khairan and again, Rabi al-Awwal Mubarak to all of you. Inshallah, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrib al-anbiya'i wal mursaleen. Sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear brothers and sisters, Alhamdulillah, it's uh, great to be with all of you again. Um, we were together just a couple of weeks ago. We do these every other week for those of you who are joining in for the first time. Alhamdulillah, these uh, sessions are open to, uh, to everyone. We are um, covering a text called Agenda to Change Our Condition, which is written by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and Imam Zaid Shakir. And Alhamdulillah, we are today actually, uh, we just finished up the introduction the last session, the last two sessions, we were working on the introduction part. And so today I'm excited because we're going to start chapter one, um, alhamdulillah, on taqwa. So if you have the uh, text, you can read along with me. I also have slides, which I'll share in a minute. But just for those of you who do not have the text, here is another image of it. I like to always show this just in case there are people who are joining us for the first time. So let me go ahead, and if you permit me, uh, excuse me, permit me just a second, I will share my screen, inshallah. Okay, and let me expand this so that you have a large view, bismillah. Okay, so I'm going to, again, we're gonna pick up uh, for, uh, uh, on chapter one, it's page uh, 12 in the text. And so alhamdulillah, this chapter is on taqwa. Um, and here we have, I've. The slides are all from the text, so you, if you don't have the textbook or the book, um, inshallah, the slides will be sufficient. So right off the bat, the very first thing that's shared is the meaning of what taqwa is. And we have a few different uh, scholars that are quoted, or a couple of scholars that are quoted. First off, Sidi Abdul Wahid bin Ashir um, defines taqwa as follows. It is the summation of, uh, or the summation of taqwa is avoiding prohibitions and fulfilling injunctions both inwardly and outwardly. And then Imam al-Jurjani defines it accordingly. He says that linguistically it means to ward off. In other words, it is to take precaution. According to other scholars of truth, it is to protect oneself from the punishment of Allah by obedience to him. And it is to guard the self from Allah's punishment due to an omission of a right action or a commission of a wrong action. What is intended is in one's obedience is sincerity. So subhanAllah, we can um, clearly see there the definitions are all pretty consistent um, of what it is. And especially this uh, last uh, definition, which is expanded on again by Ibn Ashad. He says that the aspects of uh, taqwa are four in number. And so we want to look at these four as well. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the next slide. Jumped ahead there. So Ibn Ashad, he tell, he says that the aspects of taqwa are actually four, right? Uh, and these four, uh, the wayfarer are the pathways of benefit. And the four are fulfilling obligations outwardly, right? So whatever is incumbent upon us, we do them. Uh, that are outward, we do those actions. Also those inward uh, actions, right? So whatever is within, from within our heart, the, the, what we should be believing, but also you could read this as, you know, outward actions versus private actions. So, uh, you know, thinking about being, again, consistent in one's uh, practice. And then also avoiding prohibitions outwardly and avoiding prohibitions inwardly. Because again, we know that the munafiqeen or, were the ones who outwardly they may have displayed a type of action or belief, but inwardly they had a total different reality. So the believer who has true taqwa is consistent 
in his his or her outward and inward realities, but also in their um, you know in their w when they're with people in private places, uh, I mean in public places or privately, they're consistent. So it's not that they only pray or fast or speak well when they're with people, but they're actually that is just their character. Right, so these uh, four th th qualities or these four um, uh, aspects of taqwa have to be applied to eight things, uh, and he's defined those as the heart, and then the following inroads to the heart. So, all of this has to be again consistent in one's internal uh, spiritual heart, in one's belief system, but as well is as well as the actions that one does with our tongue, eyes, ears, stomach, genitals, hands, and feet. So you cannot be a person of taqwa, but then have, you know, sort of cherry pick where you want to apply taqwa or on certain things you are obedient and you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or you claim to fear Allah, but then you make excuses in other areas. It has to be, again, across the board, these uh, four factors or four aspects of taqwa have to be applied in all of these different areas. Um so then we go on, and he says here, let me get the slides to pick up here. Bismillah. Went too far ahead. Okay, so then on page, so this is all covered, subhanAllah, just on that first page, all of this content given to us right away. And then we move to page 12, and now um, we have from uh, some gems from Imam uh, Ibn Juzay al-Kalbi, who tells us, that the uh, stations of, of the human being are five. Okay, so what are they? First is guarding against disbelief, right? This is the station of submission. As a believer, as a Muslim, as someone who accepts Islam, you're in a state of submission and you are uh, protecting yourself from disbelief. Guarding against forbidden things. So now it's not just that you uh, believe it or you submitted, but you're actually, this is, you know, be, uh, the next step, right? And this is the station of repentance. So you're actually really concerned about, uh, you know, uh, seeking repentance, but staying away from those things that are haram. Guarding against doubtful matters. So there's a lot of things that are kind of in that gray area, right? The haram is clear, the halal is clear, then you have the makru, and you have those things that are just not always clear. So this would be scrupulousness. A scrupulous person is one who's really just very uh, specific and tedious or, or um, you know, very uh, careful, very careful about their practice. So uh, they, they guard their, um, guard against doubtful matters, right? So that's the station of scrupulousness. And then you're moving, so all human beings, we find ourselves in one of these five. So you have to, as we're reading through the list, consider where are you in this list, right? Are you at that level where you really are trying to stay away from those things that are just not clear? Um, uh, and if so, then the next station is where you would, what, what, it's like a goalpost. Then the next station that you elevate to is guarding against extraneous matters. This is the station of freedom, zuhud, right? So really just trying not to be excessive in any way. Um, there's a lot of things in our world, as we all know, that we indulge in. So when you take a path of zuhud, you're trying to really just be limit yourself to the bare necessities and not really indulge your nafs very much and uh, and really more you're very much more focused on again your worship and your dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then the last is guarding against other than Allah occupying the heart and this is the station of vigilance obviously all of us our hope is that we can inshallah reach this last state to be totally free of all the distractions of this dunya. And, you know, I thought it was interesting, again, that, you know, this is the, the you know, we all, some, if, you, if you think about all of our uh, paths, right, we, we, inshallah, we're all obviously, as, as even is stated here, every believer is, we're, we're already past, inshallah, that first state. Um, but we're, there's growth, right? And that's the objective of, of mujahida, of constantly struggling against the self, is that you don't just remain in one state or get stagnant and resign yourself to just being comfortable where you're at. You're always looking to better yourself. And that's how we, inshallah, achieve taqwa, is that we're never satisfied with where we are. If you get to the place where you think, mediocre you know being mediocre is good enough or just your you know bare minimum effort is good enough 
then you want to really think about this list here in front of you. You know, why were, why are these things taught to us? What is the point of all this? It's because we're supposed to be getting better. We're supposed to be, uh, you know, working towards purification and transformation. And, and again, the whole point of this text is to change your condition. So think about really seriously where you would fall in this list and, Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq to give you the himma, you know, the the uh, the strength, the ambition, the will to want to elevate to the next level and to protect you from slipping back. Because so many people, unfortunately, that's also a very true reality. You know, people who do um, go through these different stations and maybe achieve a certain level of practice, but then because they weren't you know, maybe they got a little self-righteous. Maybe they they attributed their success to themselves, right? Which is one of the well, one of the great um, uh, tricks of shaitan that a lot of people uh, fall for is that they think that their spiritual growth is because of their own actions, and they forget to keep asking Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for for guidance, to keep asking Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to protect one from losing whatever they've acquired. Right. So it certainly happens to many people that, as I said, they'll they'll progress along and then all of a sudden they fall back and fall short. So we want to constantly um, ask Allah Father for protection from that. But you have to have the humility to know, first of all, that that can happen to anyone, um, but also to have the uh, understanding that the point of of our struggle, our spiritual struggle is to con- to move up this ladder to to be always looking to the next place. So, for example, if you're um, inshallah, you know, staying away from the haram, like you've given up, you know, or you just don't indulge and really try your hardest to not um, do any of the haram acts. And of course, there's clear haram, and then there's subtle things that m- most people still struggle with. Um, for example, you might, you know, people might not drink alcohol because that's very clear haram, but then they still indulge in gossip, right? So if you haven't yet purged yourself from uh, the haram and really understanding what is what constitutes the unlawful, you need to focus on that and look at your behavior, look at the conversations you have on a daily basis, your actions on a daily basis. What are you doing that is um, potentially, you know, not letting you move forward? If you, you know, I, I speak to people all the time who kind of express that they feel like they're not really getting anywhere and they haven't really grown very much, even though they do continue to pray, they fast in Ramadan, you know, they'll do things, but they don't really feel like they're, um, they're growing spiritually or, that they have hushu in their prayers, there's too many distractions, there's too many other things going on, or, you know, they're just, their thoughts are are not always clear. Um, there's an internal clear battle happening. So they're trying to figure out what the potential cause is. And a lot of times it could just be that even though they're abstaining from the clear haram, maybe they haven't purged other things that are still, that would still fall under the haram, like, you know, consuming riba, um, just things that we you have to take inventory and really think about what is preventing me from having spiritual growth. But always, again, looking to get up this ladder. Where am I? You know, if I've covered the, uh, if I, inshallah, don't indulge in the haram, then let's look at the makru. What am I doing that's potentially makru that I need to change? And then beyond that, how much um, am I indulging my nafs? You know, if I've covered the haram and the makru, okay, am I really, am I am I giving in to my desires so much that it's preventing me from really uh, doing my, my prayers with khushu, reflecting on, um, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his attributes, um, doing all the extra ibadah that I want to be doing, if, if, are my actions or my, my nafs, because sometimes, you know, um, the dunya is, is very tempting and we may not realize that the food that we consume or the wealth that we have that we're not uh, distributing fairly or adequately, um, the excess purchase purchases that we make that we don't need. You know, a lot of people have, especially now that we're in quarantine, you know, it's so easy to be bored that you may uh, think, oh, I'll just go, you know, Amazon just go do some shopping, online shopping, and you end up spending money that you really don't need 
and you're accumulating things that you, uh, like I said, they're excessive, that you don't need them, whereas you could have, uh, you know, donated maybe something to a cause or done something more important. So those habits, those actions are also sometimes contributing to why we're not increasing or moving forward, moving up on this ladder, this spiritual ladder. So uh, taking inventory is really important, but we all, inshallah, the objective is again to get to that last place where the dunya just loses its flavor. You know, you don't have, we don't, inshallah, want to um, to be here to the point that we're willing to uh, to let it take over that very, very special real estate in our heart. You know, the real estate in our spiritual heart is incredibly valuable. And it should be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for things that truly matter. And so if we're attached to things in this dunya, then it's going to take over that, that real estate. And that's where when you start to think about the value of things, what really matters, you know, what, what do I really want out of this world uh, then it's a lot easier to let go of some of those attachments. So that is, you know, the higher the higher level. Inshallah, it's a it's a hard it's not an easy process at all to get to. But we ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for tawfiq. So he goes on here, and this is from again Ibn Juzay al Kalbi. He says that every believer um, is at the station of submission, but we increase Allah's protection over us by attaining the higher stations. So, so the more we progress, then Allah will protect us, which is, of course, we all want his protection. This dunya, again, is not a place of safety um, for anyone, really. It's it's a place where there's a lot of danger um, to our person, you know, our personal selves, but also our spiritual hearts. Um, so you, we're always, uh, inshallah, in need of and seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's protection, and of course, protection in the next life. And then um, he says, because the vast majority of the Muslim community is only at the first or second level, we all suffer. This is a really important point because now it's talking about, you know, the collective responsibility we all have. When we talk about uh, the agenda to change our condition, this is uh, on a very personal level, but also, you know, a communal level. Like, let's think about the Muslim Ummah right now. Let's think about the suffering that's happening in so many parts of our world. Why is that the case? It's likely because, again, we're at those two bottom tiers and we haven't moved forward. Um, and he says, when a critical mass of believers commits to moving to the third and fourth levels, we will see the benefits of taqwa permeate our communities as promised in the Quran, subhanAllah. Inshallah, that's we, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. Um, so what are these benefits of taqwa? Let's look. The text is, now moving to describe the benefits, inshallah, on the page um, bottom of 13. So the very first one listed, <clears throat> um, here it says the first, the benefits of taqwa are innumerable, right? There's many uh, things that are hidden, we don't know them, but of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows all the benefits. The ones that are known are perceivable and are, and are important, he lists here in this text. First is the moral rectitude of one's offspring. Now, you know, I, for those of you who may not know, I, I do uh, parenting classes. I'm actually in the middle of one right now. We're having our last session next, uh, this coming Saturday. But um, this question about, you know, the worry that, so, or, or, you know, one's children, the concern about whether or not our children are going to maintain their faith, are going to be able to, you know, withstand all of the fitna of this world is probably one of the questions, the most common questions I get and I see, and of course I have it as well, I have two kids, um, it's always weighs on my mind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, please protect my children, you know, keep them in fitra, they're still young, but also preserve their iman, uh, let them only, you know, uh, uh, exist in, on this, in this world uh, with, with the shahada fresh on their tongues and, and, you know, they're connected, their hearts are connected to, to Allah and, and His Prophet وسلم, and that they really have a strong Muslim identity. That's my, certainly my dua for my children and I'm sure all of us. So here right away, it's the very first thing listed that if you really care about your children, then you have to think about your own behavior, right? But because, because it's connected. If you have taqwa, then this is one of the benefits, right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, um, assure you that your children will be protected. So here, 
the verses that are cited, Oh, my son, establish regular prayer, enjoin what is just and forbid, forbid what is wrong, and bear with patient constancy whatever afflicts you. Surely this is resolve in your affairs. Right? And then another verse, those who have left behind weak offspring are fearful concerning their well-being. Let them have consciousness of Allah, subhanAllah. Uh, so it's the remedy is right there. If you're worried about your children, and I know I've talked to parents who are worried. My child is so meek, uh, so kind, so vulnerable, gullible, gentle-hearted. I'm so worried so, you know, they're going to lose their way in this dunya. So if you have uh, sons and daughters or a son or a daughter that you are worried about, because, again, the world is increasingly becoming such a dark place. Well, here is the answer, you know, you know, have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Make sure you are fulfilling your obligations. And inshallah, it's one of the uh, the the benefits that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ease your heart in that regard. So the next one, the next blessing of taqwa for us, inshallah, if we commit to again um, taqwa, is that blessings come, which come from above and below. So, I mean, who, who doesn't want blessings to descend upon them, right? We all do, inshallah. Here uh, in chapter 7, verse 96, had only the people of the cities believed and had taqwa, we would have opened up for them blessings from the heavens and the earth. So all of us have to think about that right now, you know, that in this strange time where we all are seeing very odd weather patterns, right? Global warming is a big topic um, that's always, uh, you know, around or, or you know, it's a buzz topic. But let's think about if we want that, you know, if we want protection as well for from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to make easy for us, uh, you know, the, the, the weather and whatever else is happening in this planet that we are just completely unaware of. You know, things are always happening in, in outer space, for example, that we may not even have any idea that could be imminent danger. Allah knows, right? But we want peace, right? So here, this, this ayah, subhanAllah, is giving you a clear um, solution that if you have taqwa and you have strong faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then inshallah he will again uh, bring you blessings from the heavens and the earth so and that can you know come manifest itself in many ways I just used weather because it came to me but of course blessings from the heavens and the earth can be many different things uh, depending on what, whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees for us um, another blessing is provision from Allah and a way out of difficult circumstances. So how many of us struggle, right, with maybe our, uh, financially, there's a lot of people who are struggling right now. They uh, may not know if they're going to have uh, rent money or money enough to, to, you know, withstand, you know, the rest of this year or the rest of this quarantine and COVID lockdown period. Um, so there's that, and then there's also just difficulty, you know, it could be a very difficult situation, a relationship that you're in or a job or some other, um, situation that you find yourself in. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us the solution that if you are in a difficult place in your life, then taqwa could be the answer to giving you, inshallah, freedom and ease from that. So whoever has taqwa, we will pre prepare for him a way out and provide for him from where he was not expecting, subhanAllah. Um, and that's really deep if you, I mean, we could all, if we really think about moments of utter desperation, of just fe feeling like we had no solution that, you know, came to us or, or that we didn't think there was a solution to maybe a, a really difficult problem. Um, but maybe we prayed, maybe we got up, in the middle of the night and we asked Allah, Ya Allah, please, I, I don't know what to do, right? We have, I mean, that's what istikhara is for, right? Istikhara, salatul istikhara is really a dot of total, utter desperation. Like I'm stuck between two situations or I just am lost. So you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance. And when you do that with true sincerity and taqwa, how many of us have had those experiences where shortly after suddenly the answer comes, and it's again it's confirming what the ayah says. It, we never anticipated or thought that such a solution was even possible, and here Allah Subhanahu wa Taala makes it easy 
for us. Uh, you know, this happens to people every day. There's people who can attest to this, that they were in a very difficult situation, but Allah gave them a way out. So, um, alhamdulillah, and then safety, right? Uh, so again, similar themes here, but safety. Who We saved those who believed in us and had been people of taqwa. So safety can come in, uh, I mean, it can, the context of that can be, you know, there's so many different ways to, to interpret that. But if you want to feel safe, inshallah, this is uh, increasing in taqwa and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you safety or that feeling of safety. Because, you know, right now we were, um, I was just looking at some research uh, yesterday, actually, on anxiety disorders. You know, they're, they're it's the most common uh, disorder, mental health issue in the world globally, it's and especially here in the U.S., um, plaguing you know more than close to half a, a, a billion people worldwide. So a lot of people are suffering from the feeling of unease, the feeling of a- a- anxiousness, the feeling of instability, just not feeling safe. So alhamdulillah, this can. Uh, just ha- increasing our taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give us that, can restore that feeling of peace in our hearts and that feeling of safety in our hearts. Um, and the next is the divine presence manifested as Allah's protection. Again, surely Allah is with those who have taqwa and who beautify with excellence. And you do, I mean, alhamdulillah, if, you're, if you've ever been with people who have really strong faith, um, they don't get shaken up very easily. It's like Subhanallah. They're just they're they're walking around with um, you know these spiritual bulletproof vests or something because the world you know things can happen, but they just seem to be really composed and they don't they don't get shaken up. And it's likely because Alhamdulillah, Allah has just given them this state, and it's it's you know it's from Him obviously because they have that taqwa. And they um, they're working so hard on themselves that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala protects them from from falling apart in uh, you know in the event that something happens. Subhanallah, victory, right? Whoever obeys Allah and His Messenger. Um, oh, that's the next slide. One second, let me go to the next slide. Bismillah. So whoever obeys Allah and his messenger and knowingly has awe and consciousness of Allah, those are the victors. I mean, who doesn't want to be the winner, right? Who doesn't want to be successful in the sight of Allah subhanahu uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We all do. So this is it. If we want to, inshallah, be among those who are victorious uh, on the day of judgment and we show up inshallah with good news you know then this is how we do it knowingly having awe and conscious uh, consciousness of Allah so being aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but also being in that state of truly you know just having um, yeah, I t- I, I've talked about awe and it's so sad because when you think about children you know and we were all children at some point uh, but even if you're ever, if you ever spend time with children, it's like Subhanallah. We have m- m- all children have an awe. They have wonder, and the the slightest thing can impress them and put them in this state of just, you know, being uh, amazed by very simple things, things that we as adults often take for granted. Um, uh, and I, even with my own children, I teach, and I'm I'm around children a lot, and I just love to see how something that again, I may have maybe desensitized to because I've seen it so many different times. Uh, but for them, they are just in awe of one of the things my kids have recently really um, grown to love is to stargaze. So they'll t- we have these apps, you can get these apps, like I think it's one of those it it called like Skyview. Um, there's a few different apps, but they, they've been just, uh, you know, eager every night. And now that, alhamdulillah, it's getting darker earlier, it's actually um, even more time for them to do it. But I, we, we restrict it. We don't let them on that there for too long. But they enjoy going out and just looking at the, uh, the stars through this app. Because if you aim it to different, uh, you know, different directions, it'll tell you which constellations, which planets, whatever's going on. And at that time and so they're they just love it they they're so in awe with 
with outer space and the mysteries of, of the universe. And then I think about, you know, I've seen much all my share of document uh, documentaries and I've read different facts here and there. But I think because adult the adult brain can only maybe <laughs> juggle so many thoughts at once or, you know, responsibilities kick in. We sometimes just tend to, oh, yeah, mashallah, subhanAllah, and then we move on to the next thing. But if you actually take time, with, you know, to, to pause and to deeply allow yourself to reflect on a lot of things, the all will enter your heart, which is why it's so important to disconnect, um, you know, to, to take a break, whether you love the ocean or love the mountains or uh, love the desert. You know, there are people who, you know, like to go, you know, to, I mean, we have in Southern California anyway, there's a, Joshua Tree. There's there's places that are apparently really beautiful. I have not yet been, maybe one day, inshallah. But I've heard really amazing things from uh, even places like that. You know, the people feel spiritually connected because you can go out there. It's so empty, um, and uh, and and there's no light pollution, so that you can actually see the stars and you can appreciate the universe of Allah Subhanahu. But it's so important to connect on on at some in some way to be out in nature go on a hike even um walking in the grass without your shoes on can have immense benefits just physiologically there's you know research that shows just touching grounding you know being grounded to the earth is very healing but it also makes you marvel and appreciate the things that we take for granted, the simple things, the feeling of the texture of grass. I mean, of course, unless you have an allergy, don't do that. But, um, you know, touching sand, uh, things that are, that are that as children we loved to do. I mean, every kid at the beach is like, could stay there for hours playing, you know, in the sand while adults are, you know, eating, talking, and, and just uh, doing whatever, sometimes even on their phone. I've, I've been guilty of that. We, we lose awe. And this is the, pro- the problem with the modern world is that we're so distracted by so many toys and gadgets and, and things that sparkle and shine in front of us. And then, of course, uh, obligations and work and all the serious stuff that we lose awe. So I love that it was mentioned here that part of having taqwa is knowingly having awe, like really consciously trying to bring those feelings back into your heart and and really reflecting on things or just pausing and taking a minute to think about the blessings that we have that we take for granted. I mean, I know, I know Sheikh Hamza has talked about, for example, the blessings of eyelashes, you know, something that sad enough, it didn't occur to me anyway to think about the blessing of eyelashes until I heard him mention that. And so it's like, oh yeah, I've never actually sat and thought about the function of my eyelashes and what a blessing it is and how alhamdulillah I can you know see and do so many things because these little tiny hairs are able to capture dust particles and you know protect my eye from drying out when they're open for too long and all of the other amazing functions of the body but the point of reflecting on those things is that it leaves you with that just beautiful pure unadulterated love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's just you know from from a, a simple exercise of reflection or a purposeful expedition seeking awe when we go out and we're trying to you know have those moments of awe um that the outcome of that inshallah is that you really are subhanallah alhamdulillah al khaliq thank you ya Allah for this beautiful creation that you've um you know left us in and, and given us the experience of thank you for existence but those are the thoughts that really fill your heart instead of complaints and all the other negativity that are so often what consume us so the next um, benefit here is a good goodly end to life again we all ask inshallah for husna khatima we all want a beautiful end um, and inshallah an, an end where we're not um, compromised, you know, in some way. Our faith is intact. Uh, inshallah, we are die. We die in a state of uh, wudu, in a state of ibadah. I mean, there's people who die, subhanAllah, in salah, reciting Quran, uh, on hajj. I mean, how amazing of a death is that, you know, as opposed to um, other ways where people can be humiliated, you know. Some people, all the billah, are 
you know, who are not obviously, um, you know, uh, on the path or, or doing what they should be doing, they die in really horrific, but also humiliating ways, you know, so we ask Allah to always for, for, for protection from that and to, to be um, taken from this life in the best of states, but that's one of the benefits of having taqwa that inshallah. He will um, give us that. And that's, here's the ayah. Surely for the people of taqwa is a beautiful end, inshallah. Paradise itself, I mean, that's the ultimate prize, right? Um, we all want, inshallah, Jannah. We all want to, uh, I mean, that's why we're here. That's why, or that's what our objective is, is that we pass the tests of this dunya, inshallah, um, and we're sincere in our faith and that we, inshallah, receive the ultimate reward of being with those we love. And of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet said, and finally having the beatific vision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's the ultimate prize uh, that we all should be seeking and, and making our objective in this world, that that is what we want. Every prayer you do, every fast, every dhikr, every good charity, every or every charitable act, every good deed, it's all for that. I want the final prize, inshallah, to be in the highest of Jannah. So these um, are the benefits of taqwa, of, of attaining and really working on taqwa. So now, um, let's see here. So the text now goes into how do we achieve taqwa? The only way to achieve taqwa is through spiritual struggle, mujahida. Okay. Oh, wait, did I skip? Yeah, here, sorry. This is the correct slide. Um, now, in the text, it, you know, it, it mentions here that spiritual struggle is not something that miraculously just comes into one's life. So, you know, you it, it starts somewhere, and the starting point is the heart. So when you have a stirring, a movement of the heart that leads to the limbs, right? So there's this feeling of remorse, maybe, of guilt, of grief, right, of fear, there's a lot of motivating factors for why people suddenly wake up from their spiritual slumber and, and want to, uh, you know, get right back on track. There's, there's many life events that can put people in that place, right, of rethinking their choices and, and, and their life trajectory and really wanting to uh, renew their faith. And so the movement starts in the heart. Um, for some, you know, for me, for example, um, I was raised alhamdulillah, in a Muslim family, and I always had a strong Muslim identity, but that didn't necessarily translate in actions. I did not wear hijab. I was not consistent in my five prayers. But yeah, if anybody ever dared say anything about Islam or Muslims, I was very vocal and um, not afraid to defend uh, my, my faith or my you know, people from my cultural background. I just had strong cultural and religious identity. So it, it took actually a few different events but for me, one major event was the loss of my grandfather, you know, seeing uh, someone that you love um, slowly decline and and finally leave this world and then seeing their, their body. I mean, it was the first death for me, a personal death and the first body that I ever saw, which is, you know, really, I think, proof of the wisdom of the remembrance of death and of making sure that we don't fall for the, you know, the um, just the modern obsession with running away from death. You know, there's this fear, immense fear of, because, you know, when you have hubba dunya, which is one of the diseases of the heart, the, the attachment to the world, then obviously the last thing you want to be thinking about is death, disease, all those things that make you uncomfortable. So what you do is you start to obsess over youth, obsess over, um, you know, just maintaining anything that 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 is that uh, that erases the thought of death. And so uh, when you look at in our society, where are the elderly, you know, it's really sad. But because of our obsession with youth, you don't see the elderly out and about in in walking the streets in, in America, like you do when you travel in, in other parts of the world. In Europe, um, when I went to Spain a few years ago, so like everywhere, there's somehow they were everywhere. They're a very big part of society. You know, they're sitting in their little cafes or restaurants and 
you know, but they were there. They were, you know, part of uh, the city life. Uh, Turkey was one of my favorite things when we traveled to Turkey um, a couple of years ago. I think it's been a good gosh. Time just seems to uh, have stopped uh, since this year. But yeah, it wasn't last year, I think the year before. But Turkey was also, subhanAllah, um, you know, something really amazing when I observed how many elderly people were in the squares, were in the restaurants, were in the shops. Sometimes they were behind the, you know, counters working. It's like, wow, this is such an impression. I mean, they, they were not hidden. And so we have to think about our own, like I said, obsession with, um, with youth and, and not remembering death because it takes us away from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so for me, that was it. As soon as I saw that dead body of my grandfather and I realized like, whoa, that's going to happen to all of us. It started really making me think seriously about my faith. And then there were other events that eventually led me to really just making a commitment. Like I'm, I need to start being more honest of a person. I cannot claim to be Muslim but I don't dress like a Muslim. I don't behave like a Muslim. I don't um, do my prayers. You know, like what kind of Islam was that? That was for me, my own journey, right? So that stirring of the heart, Allah chose for me for that to happen in my, you know, early first year of college. And alhamdulillah, wa shukurillah, it's uh, alhamdulillah, he's guided me throughout. But it can happen like that for other people, car accident, near death experience for themselves, or maybe, um, you know, they just had a, a really tough relationship that they came out of. So there could be multiple, multiple, uh, you know, paths or, or experiences that give people the awakening. But it starts in the heart, moves into the limbs. And that's uh, when the struggle really takes in. And then it's, it's also from an awareness of the distance, right, that you've had for, between you and God, which leads to Toba. So when you start to realize, like, wow, I have really not been doing what I should be doing. And there's this remorse and guilt that enters the heart, that toba, it has a lasting effect. It's not just a passing fleeting thought. You know, sometimes we may feel bad about something, but it doesn't really stay with us. When we're repentance or tobas, you know, really filling the heart, the guilt is, uh, it's it's an agitation to the soul, right? It's like, you're, you're not um, comfortable in your own skin. You don't feel good about yourself. You could be the most successful, accomplished person, beautiful person, come from a great family in all of the material, you know, uh, from, from the material lens. But because you internally feel guilt for maybe sins that you committed, a lot of people, that's another path. They commit terrible sins that they feel so horrible about that it makes them yearn for Allah's purification, right? Like I want to be cleansed. So then they turn to Allah in Tawbah. So all of these things are where the mujahida, how it manifests, right? Um, and uh, it, 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 it's, it, like I said, it has that lasting effect. And so he says here that it, the, the, the mujahida is a move of the heart that affects the limbs and results in repentance in which we seek to purify ourselves of prior wrongs and remove them from our present activities and make a strong commitment to a future free of the mistakes of the past. So that is true mujahida, when you feel, um, again, remorse, but want to never turn back to what you were doing, the person you are. And the, you know, the, the best example of those really are people who convert to Islam. Mashallah, they're amazing because you see a lot of them you know, come from completely different backgrounds and then they make a 180 and are fully committed and you would never in a million years associate them with their past. That's taqwa in practice. That's faith in action. It's like, I don't ever want to be reminded of or remind anyone of, of the person I used to be, the one who drank alcohol, who had illicit relationships, who cursed, who smoked, who cheated people who lied to people you know they people have backgrounds like that um and so then alhamdulillah when they take their faith seriously and they take their shahada and they commit you see such a departure that you would never in a, a million years think that that was the same person that is true taqwa right um so 
on the page uh, on page 16 which is where we now come to the end of this first chapter or let me see here since we could yeah at the top of page 16 um he says here this is our purpose for being here we must simply start not tomorrow or the day after but today right now at this moment the heart must make a firm commitment and never turn back the rewards are immense the pleasure of mastering the self is second only to the subtle knowledge and pleasure of intimacy with allah that is a result of that mastery you know um so again wherever you are when we go back to that uh, to those other um to the initial slides right the five stations that we described wherever you are in that in that list you want to think about what is it going to take for you to move to the next level you know and then you know this is this this text is a transformative text so the advice is very clear it's it's telling us you know if you have a desire to change yourself and it's true and it's sincere and you want to be better then don't postpone that nia don't uh make false you know promises and procrastinate later you know at the end of this year once covid is over i'm going to start doing my prayers on time uh, a lot of times that's just waswasa from shaitan he knows that we're forgetful and that when the moment is gone we're just going to get distracted by something else and that's why how many people have that experience where they have high himma um maybe in ramadan for example a lot of amazing uh openings happen to people in ramadan and they start making all these you know promises i'm going to start doing this this and this and this but if you don't strike when the iron is hot you will lose the momentum you're going to lose it and it'll just then be a memory and watch it's happened to myself I, i've certainly this has happened to me many times but i know others as well is that when that himma is there and it's strong and it really feels like it's a new leaf or or you know you're turning a new chapter to turning a new leaf in your life then you want to um seize the day right seize the moment and say i need to do this now and for everybody that's different some people you know once they their word is their word and if they say they're going to do something they'll do it for other people they need to be accountable to someone so maybe you share this noble intention with your spouse or someone that you're really close to who's a support system for you spiritually but you kind of externalize it you verbalize it because holding good thoughts also is a problem you know there's an internal battle constantly happening uh where our ruh the part of us that is always yearning for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may you know have really great lofty ideas and goals but then the nafs and shaitan battling uh, it out against the ruh will use all the tricks possible to just you know destroy our momentum or or distract us so the best way sometimes is to verbalize it so that you can hold yourself accountable and maybe talking to someone about you know what i really want to start um the most important place starting point really for all of us if we if we're uh, thinking about you know making some lasting changes or or permanent changes to our worship is to look for first and foremost at our prayers because those are the first things that we're going to be asked about on the day of judgment. So we want to think about the timeliness of our prayers, right? The uh sincerity with which we come to the prayer. Are we coming dragging our legs, frustrated and tired and exhausted and just not really wanting to be there and doing it because we have to or are we doing it because we realize that we are we owe so much to Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala and this paltry act of praying um which will never be enough to show our gratitude sh- should be done with at least a present heart you know and of course we're humans we're we're going to get distracted but it's the intention right if you get to the prayer intending ya allah i want to really have khushu in this prayer i want to be present and you want that like it's a true yearning it's a true desire and you keep coming to the prayer with that inshallah you'll get there you know some people have this really crazy notion that unless they have that feeling what's the point of praying that's pure waswasa okay you can't get that feeling if unless you put the hard work in you know it's not like you you're going to stand uh, you know takbir allahu akbar and all of a sudden you're going to see a light 
and angels are going to descend on, on, on around you and you're just, you know, you're going to see visions of Jannah. Like, is that what you're expecting that should happen before you pray and then you'll commit to prayer? Um, if so, then Shaitan's just deluded you. You have to say the prayer is the debt I owe, um, which I'll never be able to repay for existence. It's the reason why I'm created. And so I need to really prioritize my prayer. Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, all of them. You can't pick certain prayers that you're going to do, you know, dutifully and, and devote your time and do them beautifully with amazing, you know, recitation and then miss other prayers and excuse yourself from other prayers because you're thinking, oh, well, I do, you know, the, the Maghrib and the, you know, Dhuhr and Asr, but I can't do Fajr. Fajr is so hard for me. If you're, if you're already letting yourself go with that because, you know, I have to work and I have to get up early and, oh, it's just too hard. Allah will have mercy on me. You know, subhanAllah, that's, I'm sorry to say, it's just another trick of shaitan because we're all in this, uh, you know, world for the same reason. We're here to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if the Prophet uh, who had been guaranteed Jannah is the beloved of Allah, not only prayed all of his prayers on time with excellence in every which way, but he did additional prayers. It's because we should be humble, we should be grateful, and we should be, uh, we should feel the weight of how much we should be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. And nobody gets exceptions to that. You know, people, of course, who are ill and who have other circumstances, Allah, of course, makes things easy. But the prayer for even the ill, even the one who's laying flat on their back and cannot move is still uh, fard upon them to do when it comes in. And Allah, of course, makes it easy for them with the wudu and um, it may, you know, facilitates all of that. But you could even do it with your eyes. If you're paralyzed, for example, you, you know, there's always uh, something that for each person's circumstances that will, that are acceptable. But the bottom line is, is that everybody prays who is of sound mind and who is able to, we pray. So don't let shaitan, you know, make you think you're special somehow, or that you allow your nafs and your, you know, your physical um, circumstances to seem like they're so extreme and so exceptional that you get a pass to not pray on time and that you can just wake up your alarm um, for for the time you need to get up for work or what have you. A lot of people, that's what they do. They convince themselves it's okay. Allah knows my intentions. I wish I could, but I can't. Don't do that. Commit. Say, Allah, I know that this is going to be hard for me. I'm probably going to have really tough days um, ahead of me, maybe because it's my routine. I've just gotten in a routine. I've never really committed like this before. I might have headaches. I might be grumpy at work. I might just not be happy because my sleep was interrupted. But you matter more. So if I have to set five alarms, I have to call my friend or, you know, do something to get myself out of bed. That's taqwa. That's realizing that I cannot make excuses for myself because Allah, who akbar, he is greater than anything that I can bring, you know, to, to justify why I'm not worshiping as he deserves to be worshiped. And so make those commitments and do them now. Don't make don't put them off. And this, for every single person, it's going to be different. Maybe, alhamdulillah, you're doing your prayers on time and you're um, really committed in your prayers. Then you look to the next level. You know, what can I be doing additionally? What can I take away, right, avoid um, that's blameworthy? And what can I increase that's praiseworthy? And you just start evaluating yourself on such a deep level that your mind is constantly preoccupied with what? You know, people sometimes think about, you know, the hadith of Iman, Islam, and Ihsan, right? Ihsan is, uh, you know, being in such a state that you, it's almost as if you see Allah knowing very well, you can't see him, but knowing that he sees you, right? This is the definition of Ihsan. And for some people that might be like, wow, wow, that's so amazing, you know, that people can be in that state. Well, if you spend your day trying so hard to take inventory of your actions and find where you can improve and you're really guarding yourself against those things that are harmful in many ways that is that is a uh, ihsan right that's a display of ihsan because what are you doing you're mindful of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout your day 
right? You're always thinking about what I, the choices before you. And if you think about every single choice that we make, every choice, um, especially in our transactions with other people, but also with ourselves, there's always a right way and a wrong way to do things, you know, from the most subtle things like just basic etiquette, you know, um, when, you, when you're eating, let's say, you know, we, I mean, we could just take it to that level. But if you, if you evaluate your behavior, you know, are you eating with, with Adab? Are you eating with the presence of, uh, you know, mindfulness of God? Are you saying Bismillah? Or are you just jumping right into that meal, slobbering all over the place, getting your fingers dirty and checking your phone every two seconds, watching inappropriate videos? I mean, people will sit at the dinner table over a meal where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has just given them a beautiful meal and it could be hand, you know, it could be made by their own hands, but even that is still a gift from Allah. He gave you the ability, gave you the ingredients, gave you the, you know, uh, the uh, every everything, the home, right, to be able to create these meals. So is it not, you know, does he not deserve to be thanked with, with at least something in the beginning? Bismillah, right? But how many people jump into their meals? No remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And not only that, They'll be eating this delicious food, um, but then they're doing things like gossiping, you know, or watching things, you know, zina of the eyes is a rea- reality. So you're watching the haram while you're, um, you know, you're, you're taking in this nourishment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. Those are things you have to watch for. But if you're co- co- conscious of your decisions, decisions and choices, what you do is you bring awareness to your mind. That, you know what, this is wrong. I shouldn't do this, Allah, and you start to change your behavior. That is the process of taqwa. Anything that you do, you're thinking, would Allah be pleased with me or not? And you start to change in that way, right? That pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so here in the last uh, pages of this chapter, we're reminded that Allah has commanded us to turn to him with sincerity O oh, you who believe, turn to Allah, all of you together with sincerity in order for you to have success. And then uh, this last ayah, Surah Al-Baqarah, right? Um, it is, O oh, humanity, worship your Lord who created you and those before you in order for you to realize taqwa. Ya ayyuhal nas, abudu rabbakum wa ladhi khalaqakum wa ladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. This is, subhanAllah, the first command that Allah is telling us, right? Um, we have to worship Allah as he deserves. And to remember constantly that everything that he has given us, every action we're able to do is by his grace that we're able to do it. And and if we just have that awareness, you know, of, of those things in the moment, or even as an afterthought, you know, and, and you're lying in bed and you're thinking about your day and you're just reevaluating things and you start remembering, like, alhamdulillah, Allah is so generous you know he was able to or you know he gave us this opportunity gave us that opportunity to start to, taking account of things that's that's taqwa that's bringing awareness and mindfulness of allah and having gratitude in in your heart inshallah so may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us in taqwa i'm going to i think i may have to check the time Ooh, very close okay we're well, almost at the end let me exit out of this so we can check the um the chat here to see if there are any questions inshallah ta'ala if you give me just one moment um alhamdulillah i'm gonna go to youtube as well because i think there's i know mashallah there's people on youtube who are tuning in and that's where a lot of our questions do come in so let me check youtube Uh, one moment. Bismillah. Okay, alhamdulillah. So, I don't see any... Oh, actually, hold on. Let me cha- do live chat. Okay, so I don't see any questions um, on the thread here. But inshallah, we do have a few minutes or a couple minutes left. If you would like to ask a question, you're more than welcome to. Uh, but yes, we are at the end of uh, chapter 60. I'm just going to make sure I didn't miss anything here. Oh, he mentions here that um, what follows next, so chapter two, the next uh, class we'll do, is a series of exercises designed to help us set out on the path. 
They are difficult, but earning paradise was never meant to be easy. All things of worth are only obtained through great effort, whether the pearl at the bottom of the ocean or the skill of the master craftsman. The pleasure of our Lord is infinitely greater than the material gains of this world. Um, so, mashallah, the next chapter, chapter two, is on the heart and its treatment. So now we're going to get into some more practical you know, exercises and reflections on how we can do this. You know, achieving taqwa is, of course, something that we know is part of that mujahida, but how do we battle it out with our nafs, literally? What is the, you know, how can we uh, fight our, our, um, our own nafs and shaitan and overcome our weaknesses? So inshallah, we'll, we'll look to that in the next session. Uh, but I thank you again for your time. And if you don't have the text, please do get it. You can get it from Sandala, S-A-N-D-A-L-A dot org. Um, Agenda to Change Our Condition. Check it out. But thank you so much for being here um, this evening with with us. Uh, inshallah, if you have any further questions, you're more than welcome to um, uh, communicate me, com- excuse me, communicate with me directly. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. Uh, so you can message me there. But thank you again. Uh, we are ending right on time. So inshallah, we'll see you next time and have a wonderful rest of your night. Okay. Uh, oh, before we forget, we should do our dua. Alhamdulillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa al-Asr inna l-insan ila fi khusur illa ladina amanu wa amil swalihati wa tawasu bil-haqi wa tawasu bil-sabr. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk. اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الحمد لله جزاكم الله خيرا thank you so much have a great evening everyone السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته. Again, welcome everyone for being here. Thank you so much. We are covering a text uh, that was written by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and Imam Zaid Shakir. It's called Agenda to Change Our Condition. I have the book here in front of me for those who are first time viewers. I like to just preview it right in the beginning so that you can bring you up to speed about what we're doing here. I do have a presentation that I've also prepared to co- go over the chapter that we're going to talk about today. So again, if you don't have the text, you can follow along with the slides. I do highly encourage you to get the text just because there's so much great content. And it's really a wonderful resource to have for just reference and to, to look it over. And we should review this text as, you know, maybe once a year or more often than that, whatever we need. So inshallah, let me go ahead and screen share. But just to, while I do that last week, um, we come, sorry, one second. Okay. I apologize. I need to quickly uh, message to get my screen share going. So just give me a second. Um, so last week, uh, what we did was we talked about the chapter on taqwa, how to attain taqwa, the benefits of taqwa. So um, you can, and all of the recordings, by the way, are available. So if you go to um, the, you know, previous, uh, YouTube, if you go to the YouTube page, the MCC YouTube page, you will find all of our um, our previous recordings. And so, again, just to kind of give those of you who may be tuning in for the first time a quick summary, the text um, is quite, I mean, it's not very lengthy, but there's uh, several different sections. But what I did is I started at the back of the text. So we covered the appendices and then we did the introduction in chapter one. So alhamdulillah, today we are doing chapter two. And today's chapter is on the heart and its treatment. So I'm really excited to get into that discussion with you today. So let me go ahead and screen share. And inshallah, I will um, bring this up in just a moment. Bismillah. Okay. One second, please. All these technical things we have to do, but inshallah, it'll be worth it. Okay, so bismillah, we're going to present here, and hopefully you guys can see everything. So yes, today we're going to talk about the heart and its treatment. So if you're following with the text, you want to go to page 18, inshallah. 
and you'll be able to read along. So let's go ahead and jump into the discussion. It starts off and tells us that facilitating action is based upon true knowledge, and action has two modes. So the first mode of, is the action of the heart, and then the second is the action of the limbs. As for the heart, there are two concerns. So what are the concerns of the heart? First and foremost, belief, aqidah. We have to have a strong aqidah, the creed, the belief. What do you believe in as a Muslim? What are the, you know, the, the points of aqidah that we should all know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about the universe, about our place in the universe? So that is all taught to us by our aqidah. And then the second concern of the heart is sincerity of faith, because you know people can claim to have faith, but only those who are sincere will have uh, tawfiq with Allah, right? Because there are many people who are munafiqeen, and they're the worst of, of people, the hypocrites, those who claim to be believers, um, but then their actions say otherwise. So the sincerity of faith is also a very serious concern and a primary concern of the heart. So let's talk about belief and sincerity a little bit more. Um, in the text, they write here that sound belief is accomplished by removing any doubtful matters from the heart. And alhamdulillah, this is you know facilitated for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by His grace, He makes it easy for us to remove doubtful matters. And alhamdulillah, this is why it's so important for us to be reflective, to think, to, to try to Look at the universe and just the awe that we should feel when we contemplate everything in creation. Again, from from the cellular level, uh, you know, atomic level, just small particle level, to the uh, you know astronomical level. When you look out into the universe and you see things that are beyond our imagination, very difficult for the human mind to conceive. Um, all of these things are signs, are ayat of, of that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put for us to 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 really remember that or or to reflect on the fact that this is not by chance, this didn't just happen. You know, stuff about there are people who um again from with no basis that that's what they claim, that this all just was some big large accident. But of course, um, that couldn't be further from the truth. This is not an accident. This is all intentional. There's design. And that's why you see design in everything, uh, you know, subhanAllah. So we, we have to look out into the world and really think about this. And when you think about these things deeply, and you, of course, you seek uh, answers from proper sources, right, from knowledgeable people, from people who know, they will be able to help you to, um, you know, go whatever doubts you have or issues that you have to just work through those things. But the answers are there. We don't shy away from asking, but we also accept that we can't answer everything, right? There's many things that we will just simply not know in this lifetime, but inshallah, we have high hopes that inshallah in, in the next world, we will have answers to those things. So, uh, but inshallah, that's been facilitated, right? The belief. Sincerity, however, we, as they've written in the text here, it's more difficult to achieve sincerity um, of the heart through the actions of the limbs. And this is really, you know, a lifelong process. When we talk about mujahid and nafs, and we talk about this, the struggle of the human being to, uh, to just fulfill all of their obligations, a large part of it does have to do with actually perfecting our deeds and making sure that we have the right intentions and that we do them with sincerity because many people accumulate deeds. You know, you could do a lot of good deeds in your life, but we don't know and we likely won't know in this life whether or not those deeds are accepted, right? We don't know. And that's that's the challenge is that throughout our lives, we're always doing that internal check to make sure that we are sincere when we do things, when we give sadaqah, when we pray, when we recite Qur'an, or when we give nasiha, or when we do any good act, that our intentions are always in the right place. And that is why it's not, that's not very easy to do. And that's something that is going to be, uh, for most of us, a very, uh, you know, part of our struggle, part of the, the lifelong struggle that we all have. And so even in the Qur'an, right? Here they say that the entire creation was at a standstill when it heard the words of, of the Creator. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed these verses, everything in creation was just, you know, it's, it's an amana. It's a huge trust, right? 
they were only commanded to worship Allah sincerely, mukhlisin, with the religion solely for him, right? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also challenges us here with this question, is not the sincere religion, the deen al-khalis, solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So we have to think about, you know, this is part of our mind or, or, or our, you know, every day, we, we have to have this presence of mind to know that, it's not enough that I'm doing. I have to be doing them sincerely. Because if you just look at it quantitatively, then, you, you know, a lot of times shaitan can delude you to think, oh, I, you know, and this is where self-righteousness is a disease of the heart. Many people who are practicing, uh, you know, their faith ritual, ritualistically, they're doing everything. You know, they do their prayers. They they, they do all of the, the obligatory acts. They may, you know, fall into self-righteousness because they think that it's enough that they do them, not realizing, well, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you're doing them, but the sincerity with which you do them, that's where you, uh, you know, you make your mark, whether or not you're truly sincere or not. So that's the, the, the part that you have to focus on more because the fact that we get up to pray is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we don't attribute that to ourselves. Guidance is from him, right? Guidance is the, you know, when you, when you have faith, you know that that's from Allah. He's inspired you, but how well you, uh, show your faith, right? How well you, 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 the ihsan that you put into your actions, that's on us. So this is where sincerity becomes more of a challenge. Now on page 19, um, they go into a longer explanation of this word uh, purity and really trying to understand why this is such an essential part of our struggle. And so I'm going to read a little bit here and there's just a, a an accompanying slide to give you a little bit of context. But here they say that the Arabic word khulus means purity and the term leban khalis means milk that is free of impurities. This is the milk taken from the animal before it is contaminated with anything else. So just giving you a visual of something that's pure, free of contaminants, right, in, in that state that that's preserved, right, that's pure. And then immediately they go into the heart. The heart's purity is contaminated by what? By wrong actions and can only be purified by repentance and remorse. Okay, so purity, now another analogy here, comprises a great station. So someone who's reached this station of, you know, being a, a person of ikhlas, right, of sincerity in the religion, it's, it's a high station to achieve. And they've given you sort of like the, you know, the, the contrast to say that just as fornication, for example, is a precipitous fall into wrong action, right? Someone who engages in, in that act of, 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 you know, something clearly haram, it's like a decline. So in the same way, a person who's achieving or who's achieved ikhlas, it's, it's gradual. It's something that's, it, it's elevating them, right? So it's kind of a, the contrast between the elevation of the mukhlas and the uh, the, the downfall of the one who engages in a sin like uh, fornication. So just to show you, this is a really heavy thing, a very important thing. Then they go on to say that scholars of the heart have identified both corrupting and purifying actions that affect the heart state. So this text, now the, the remainder of this text, and particularly this chapter, this text focuses on what facilitates the path to purity and how to draw near the way of struggle with the commanding soul, right? Uh, moreover, it clarifies matters that edify the way to free one's intention from any contingencies that cause one to act for the sake of anyone other, uh, for anyone or anything other than Allah. So inshallah, this is what we hope to achieve going through this text, right? That we are able to facilitate the path to purity and to uh, free the niya, the intention, to make sure that our intention is not, um, you know, contaminated, that we're not, uh, you know, in any way doing things for other than the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they go on and say that the likeness of the one who acts for the sake of anyone or anything other than Allah is described in the following example. A shop owner hires a laborer and then says to him, this is my shop and this is my work. Therefore, do all your work in my best interests. Despite this decree, the laborer performs his work in the best interests of someone else or himself, rather than those of the owner. As Muslims, we cannot do 
Allah's work and bidding when we have only our own worldly interests at the forefront, right? And this is where, again, purity of intention is so important because there are in many cases where people may uh, be outwardly presenting themselves as doing things for the sake of Allah, but their intentions, they have ulterior motives and they have, you know, it's not for Allah, it's for something else. It's for status, it's for uh, maybe to gain some worldly benefit here, reputation. There's many benefits to, in, in, in certain cultures, certainly in certain, uh, you know, positions of, of uh, in society, there's many benefits of presenting oneself as a religiously committed, serious person, right? So there's could be, uh, someone could have many agendas, right? But this is why it's so important to have purity of intention. So then, and the question becomes, well, how can we remove worldly motivations from our actions? How can we make sure that our actions are truly for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And it's not that we want attention. And, and this is a very relevant question, more so maybe now than any time in human history. When you think about how, um, you know, the world is turned into a giant fishbowl in many ways, everybody's lives or, or I mean, there's obviously pre- people who are not participating, but there is a great number of people, billions of people who are in fact participating in this experiment of social media where every, you know, part of their life is documented. And throughout the day, you get updates about everything that someone's doing from what they eat, where they're going, who they're with, uh, what, you know, where they work. So this idea of getting attention constantly and seeking attention is certainly one of the ways that one's intention can be compromised uh, because it's very, you know, alluring to have people watching you fame and and all of that that comes with it. Um, Or just even, you know, notoriety or people knowing uh, that you're doing something, that reputation that you get from that, even if you're not necessarily of a, you know, celebrity status, uh, you could be within your own small community or social circle or family even, there might be something that you gain from sharing your life with everyone else. But if this becomes part of the way that you are and you live, then you can imagine how um, how uh, how potentially every deed that you do that's you're saying is for the sake of Allah could be compromised because is it really if you needed to show everybody you know when you went to volunteer at the uh, soup kitchen and you're taking a selfie and you know showing everybody what you're doing can you make that claim that was truly for the sake of Allah or was it what they call you know virtue signaling where people do things of virtue. And they just like to get that attention for it. So this is a very deep uh, issue that I think a lot of us have to really think about. But this question is, you know, is something that the text is going to help us understand. And it says right away, answering that question, how can we remove worldly motivations from our actions? The answer lies in the rectification of our intentions. Actions are only in accordance with intentions, right? In the malamal biniyat. And thus, starting with the intention Behind an act is the beginning of achieving a state of living for the sake of Allah. So the process of actually asking yourself and knowing within your heart of hearts, you cannot, we cannot deceive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That, you know, we, we cannot, um, you know, try to hide what's really in our hearts. So you don't have to necessarily verbalize or articulate these things to anyone else, but certainly to yourself, you should be at that level that where you can honestly say why you did something was it so that someone could hear that you did it you could get you know status you get praise you get likes follows like again bringing it back to social media um but that process of questioning all of your actions especially those actions that are you claim or you you are trying to pass off as for the sake of allah go back and you know do that inner inner work of really questioning but they, they go on to say that if one applies perfume, it can be done in order to follow the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and also as an act of charity for others. When it is intended to be for the angels of my Lord and in adherence to the tradition of my Prophet Sallallahu we take a permitted act and elevate it to a recommended or obligatory one. 
Likewise, food should not be eaten merely for, for pleasure. We should intend the energy derived from the food to be used for the strengthening of our bodies to better serve Allah. So in this you know, case, you can go and, you know, as we said, question what you've done to ask yourself, is it really for the sake of Allah? But the flip side of it is actually acting with intentionality on this deep level, where every single thing that you are doing, even just regular everyday acts like eating or putting on perfume, that you are trying to find the way for it to become an act of where you're seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So aligning yourself with the sunnah, for example, as was mentioned with the perfume, right? Or looking back at, and you know, something like the blessing of food as not being just this, you know, automatic process that we have to do because we have to survive, but rather elevating the intention to say, Inshallah, I'm eating this food because it nourishes my body. And from that nourishment, I can, you know, my body can be strengthened so that I can pray more. I can go and help people more. Do you see? It's like you're elevating the niya with which you're doing actions by instead of just like robotically, you know, automatic processes that we've all sort of developed where we just wake up and just, you know, this is our, our routine, right? And we're not really thinking about how can I gain more reward for even those things that aren't necessarily worship, you know, we don't equate uh, basic things, uh, meeting our basic needs, for example, as being worship, but it could be, in fact, a form of worship when you take the time to apply this beautiful intention to it, right? And then um, they go on, again, we're still on page 19, and they say here that the following hadith emphasizes the importance of intending our actions for the sake of Allah. So this is the hadith. The first people to be judged on the day of resurrection are the following. A man who was martyred, who was brought into the divine presence and shown his blessings, who admits to them and who is asked, what did you do with all of these blessings? He will reply, I fought for your sake and was martyred. Now look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's response. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the exalted, will say, you lie. You fought to be called a courageous man. And it was said about you. And thus you have been recompensed. Right? It is then ordered that he be taken to the fire. So this man is claiming that he died for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah, of course, knows better. And he's telling him, no, you wanted that notoriety. You wanted the fame. You wanted all of those things to be said about you, the praise. You got it, therefore you were rewarded for what you did. You see, the reward was given to you already. And then all the Billahi sent into the fire. Then someone who studied the Quran and taught it is brought into the divine presence and shown his blessings. And he uh, again acknowledges them and is asked why he did them. And he responds, I studied knowledge and transmitted it and I recited the Qur'an for your sake. And it is said to him, you lie, rather you desired to be called learned. And it was said about you. It is an order that he is taken and he's dragged along the face and thrust into it. It continues and there's uh, you know, another narration about a generous man who also did the same. And uh, he said that his, you know, his generosity was for the sake of Allah, but it was for people to make praise him for being generous. And the same, he had the same fate. So this hadith is such an important hadith to reflect on because this is clearly telling us, as I said in the beginning, that we may never know if our intentions are sincere uh, in this life. And, you know, we, we will know in the next life. But revisiting the niyyah and constantly questioning and really being real with the fact that you cannot in any way you know, trick the Billah or, you know, delude, I mean, uh, you know, or, uh, conf um, you know, lie or deceive uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's, you know, we should know that. That's just basic common sense that he knows what's in our hearts. And there's no way that we can, uh, you know, try to defend any other position than the truth when, when we're being asked about it. So we should do that internal process in this life instead of, God forbid, facing a similar fate where, we end up on the day of judgment um, being called into question. May Allah protect us from that. But the point is, is if we do that in this world, right, we, we are really clear about our niya. Inshallah, we will um, make sure that our intentions are actually aligned with the pleasure of Allah and not for anything else. So um, 
let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So the next section, now we're on page 20. The next, after they related this hadith, now we're talking about achieving sincerity. Okay, so as we said, belief, inshallah, and getting rid of the doubtful matters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitates that for uh, us, inshallah, and many people have been able to overcome those whisperings and those doubts. But achieving sincerity is a different thing. And this is where the struggle begins. So some of the ways, effective ways to achieve sincerity are, uh, here we have guarding the tongue, right? So very important that we focus on the things that, you know, can potentially harm or as an inroad to the heart, right? And the tongue certainly, and the limbs can can uh, cause spiritual ruin. So we guard our tongue, right? We speak truthfully and we maintain discourse in private and public gatherings. So this is one of the first, you know, advice uh, that they give is it's very important to do these three things. Watch how you speak, what you say, make sure you're a truthful person and also make sure you're consistent that you're public and private person. That it's not that you're wearing you know, masks where you behave one way in your home and then in public, you're a total different person or vice versa. But did you have consistency? And of course, you know, there's certainly uh, just to, you know, make that clarification, everybody has a certain degree of, uh, you know, of uh, private behavior that would not be something they share publicly. We're not talking about that. We're talking about just your character. You know, if you are praying and you're, you know, you don't do foul things and you don't speak of foul things, that should be consistent. Those types of things should not change based on whether or not you're home or out in public, right? Um, so think about that. Like, are you the same person, you know, or would people not recognize you? May God protect us from that, right? And so the first step to, towards sincerity of the heart is to protect our tongues from these things and then to specifically protect it from falsehood, dissembling, which is to conceal our true motives, feelings, or beliefs, and prevarications, which is to deviate from the truth. So this is what we're seeking to protect our tongue from, these three things. And this is the first step to achieving sincerity. So then they go on and they um, describe for us the four sources of the, the destructive qualities of the tongue. Okay, very important. So there's four specific destructive actions or qualities that the tongue may do, and we should know what they are and really how to avoid them. So the first, of course, is lying. And so right away, we're on page 20, still moving into 21. The first, just help us to understand that we all know lying is you know, forbidden in Islam without valid reason. But what are the valid reasons? So across the board, lying is impermissible. It's haram, right? We don't, we're not deceptive. We don't lie. However, in certain situations, it may be uh, acceptable. And so let's look at what those three situations are. First, as a means to rectify between people. So as we know, you know, human beings, we don't, uh, some of us struggle with our temperaments, with our anger, with our, you know, moods. And so sometimes disputes happen, you know, things within families, within uh, marriages, there's things that can really be very uh, disruptive that happen. And so we can avoid sometimes things from escalating just by maybe, you know, slightly changing some, you know, saying some half truths, for example, like, let's say, uh, between a husband and a wife, if you are a family member who is involved in, you know, someone, maybe your sibling, maybe someone else in the family whose marriage is on the rocks and they're really having a hard time and you are trying to soften the hearts towards one another and, you know, just really help them to appreciate each other more or to turn their negative feelings into positive feelings. If the Nia, that's your Nia, and you go to the wife or the husband and you say, oh, you know, they were saying all of these wonderful things about you and they always compliment you. And maybe that's not true. You know, maybe uh, they don't do things like that, but you're just trying to soften the heart, right? Between the hearts between these two people, these two, the spouse, these, uh, this couple, inshallah, that's a benefit. Uh, I mean, uh, that's a praiseworthy thing to do because sometimes the ego gets too, you know, the, the egos prevent them from seeing uh, the truth about one another. And all they see is their own anger and resentment. And, you know, shaitan, of course, is there 
So for you to be able to give them a different lens with which to look at their spouse with just through a few soft, uh, you know, a kind words about one another or just slight, as I said, half truths or, you know, um, white truths, white lies, excuse me. Inshallah, that's okay. Um, oh, sorry. The next is, uh, of course, you know, in war, we know um, all is fair in love and war, right? And uh, as an effective military tactic, sometimes you may need to uh, deceive, you know, and that's uh, to save lives, thousands, hundreds of lives. You got to do what you got to do. So there's certain uh, rules of engagement that uh, would apply here when we're talking about military tactical situations. And then when an individual plays with his young children, again, sometimes, you know, we may tell tall tales or kind of, you know, just in a playful way, engage our children. And so if your Nia is to to do those types of uh, things, just to, you know, expand their uh, creative, creative mind, imagination, or be in a playful state, this would not be considered uh, deception, right? Which is a total different thing. And there, uh, there may be... Um, other nuanced situations too, but we get the idea, right? The Nia is good. You just are doing it for certain reasons, but um, they do also make the distinction here that the permissibility in the first two cases, right, to rectify between people or war is uh, through subterfuge and prevarication. It should never be through manifest lies, except in a case where the other party, party will clearly see through the stratagem. So you're try, you're subtly saying things. You're not completely being blatant with your lies, right? Because again, it would defeat the purpose. So in such circumstances, one may lie with the tongue, but must reject it within the heart. Okay. Um, again, this is only applicable in a scenario where one's well-being or provisions of those of others is endangered. Nevertheless, be cautious with the words because a lie might in some instances result in a binding obligation. So this is more just like, you know, FYI, be careful that you don't, be, be, you know, go too far with this, you know, try to be very subtle because you could entangle yourself into a much worse situation. So just FYI, extra cautionary advice there. And then they give an example, an example of a case where lying is permitted is that of an oppressor pursuing a just man. In that case, one should deceive the oppressor openly and lead him astray in this search, um, in his search. This is permissible because a lie is not prohibit prohibited for its own sake, but rather for the harm that is implicit in lying. In such cases, when, un when truthfulness causes greater harm, lying in its stead is preferred. So yeah, if there's someone who's after a totally innocent person and you know that person's innocent and you're trying to basically throw them off, you know, the hunt or the search and you lead them down a different path, your intention is to protect someone who's innocent from further harm. Um, and it's not about the lie that you're telling, right? So that's why it's permissible. And then they go on to say, for this reason, the notion that good is good for its own sake and evil is evil for its own sake is considered false. For example, a murder committed by an aggressor may appear identical to an execution that occurred in compliance with sacred law in both its outward form and its characteristics. Someone who is unaware of what actually transpired might confuse one for the other. Therefore, killing may be just or unjust. It is neither good nor evil per se. So that's a, just, a, again, another clarification. So that's the first thing that's mentioned as a destructive quality of the tongue. The second is backbiting. And this is, again, something we all need to be very clear about because it's not uh, always understood to mean what it is. Sometimes we, you know, people find these loopholes or they just don't have the correct definition of what is backbiting and they may think that it's, it is when it isn't backbiting or it isn't backbiting when it is. So let's clarify what it is. So backbiting or ghiba is, uh, again, haram, uh, you know, across the board in the Quran, the Sunnah, scholarly consensus, there's really no dispute about that. And it's defined as mentioning someone in a manner that would upset that person should they hear it. So if you think about, this could go in so many different directions, right? 
uh, speaking about a person's person, for example, their appearance, um, you know, things that they can't control. We know for the most part that, you know, whether or not a person may smile um, and kind of go along with the joke, if you, you know, most people don't like to be, I mean, it's offensive. Most people would take offense to comments made about their appearance and again, things that are just very, very personal, deeply personal. Um, But we still find a lot of people passing these things off like it's no big deal. Like, for example, coming up with a nickname, uh, you know, about someone who maybe is their stature is, you know, shorter than uh, than others or or maybe than the the average right height. Um, uh, A lot of people pass that off like it's not a big deal thinking, oh, well, they don't seem to mind. But just if you really think about it, what person, what person. Um, whether they, again, their reaction is irrelevant because it's really about just common human decency to attack someone for something they had nothing to do with and they had no control over, like their physical appearance, um, you know, is never acceptable. And so if you think, oh, it's not a big deal if I make a comment about someone just because they are that way, or it's the truth. I'm speaking about, I'm describing someone, let's say you're you're trying to describe someone who is... um, you know, heavy set. Um, and instead of trying to be careful with your words, you just kind of, that's the first word you use. You know, that fat woman or that fat man or that, you know, people can sometimes be so like careless with the words that come out of their mouth thinking that, well, I'm just speaking the truth. It's not a big deal. But here, right here, the definition is clear. Mentioning someone in a manner that would upset that person if they heard it. Would you say the same words if the person was sitting there? If someone asked you to describe the same person while they were in front of you, would you use a different set of words? If so, then you know that that uh, form of, you know, describing or the words that you used to describe that person would fall under this category of riba. It's, It's just not it's not acceptable. And so you have to be more careful to know that just speaking matter of factly or stating truths, even if yes, someone may be a certain size, it doesn't make a difference. The bottom line is, how would they feel if they heard it? If they heard it, it would upset them. It's riba, khalas. You see, very simple. Then it goes on to say that even if, uh, so, uh, so, sorry, would be upset, uh, that person should hear it, even if it is a true statement. So that's what we just said. Even if it's true, it doesn't matter. They're upset. Now, if the statement is untrue, so let's say now you are exaggerating something or literally lying about something just because you don't like them, right? The act is known as uh, calumny or calumny, I think. That's how you pronounce it, calumny. Uh, And that would be uh, namima, right, in Arabic. So this is where you're now lying and backbiting at the same time. And this is much worse. So there are some people who just out of their annoyance with a person, a hatred for a person, they may embellish things or just literally distort truth. I mean, just lie about them when speaking about them or if their name is mentioned. Um, And, you know, that's completely haram. Like there's just no way to justify that at all. You, you that's just a rotten thing to do because it's this is how rumors get spread and lives can be destroyed based on a single you know rumor that you created just out of feeling you know like you you feel anger towards someone you think that's okay so we have to be very very careful and of course we know um in uh surah al-hajrat chapter 49 verse 12 this is the whole I, concept of backbiting is described very clearly. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, neither allow yourselves to speak ill of one another behind your backs. And would any of you like to eat the flesh of his dead brother? You would hate it. So be conscious of Allah for Allah is most relenting, most merciful. I really love this for so many reasons. First of all, because of course it's the Quran and it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's words, but also because he is reminding us to not have, you know, be, don't be hypocritical. Don't be, don't have double standards. Don't make okay something that you know for yourself. If someone did it to you, you would hate it. So don't, in because, you know, when I have, in the past, sometimes when we talk about these topics, people who engage in this, they, 
you know, they, they, they may find or try to find ways to work around what they, you know, have done in the past, just a guilty conscience. Right. And because some people just don't really think it's that bad or, or if they're speaking about someone who's wrong to them, they feel so justified that they don't really want to hear you, um, you know, uh, correct them or reprimand them for speaking about people behind their back. It, they just don't like it. And, you know, I'm sure all of us have found ourselves in those awkward situations where we've had to shut down conversations and you get some attitude from people. Right. But this is again, calling us out on our double standards, because if you're going to justify it, uh, you doing it for on whatever, you know, basis you think it warrants that, then um, you cannot I mean, just be real with yourself. How would you feel if it was done to you? Right. If you had a taste of your own medicine, as they say, how would you feel? You would likely hate it and it would bother you and you would never um, accept anybody's excuses if you, your best friend or your sister or someone else you heard was speaking ill about you or mentioning even a slight, small, maybe blemish or problem or flaw that you have or bad habit. Um, you know, people sometimes, spouses do this, right? I've certainly been in awkward situations where a spouse may uh, unveil their their partner in front of a group setting and you can see that it's so uncomfortable for the whole group and you know there's going to be a huge you know fallout once they get in the car uh, but it's like those little tiny words that are said when you're not you know ready for it or it's just not comfortable to have people know your business can set off such a um, strong reaction, right? So you, we all have that. Every person would feel hurt to know someone speaking about them behind their back. So if you know that is true for yourself, then don't justify doing it for someone else. You know, may Allah forgive us, because sometimes, uh, again, we uh, were careless. And so here, on the bottom of page twenty-one, another reminder about this idea of al-dubla, you know, eating the dead flesh, you know, that analogy is just so hard to stomach, literally al-dubla, right? Likewise, you should detest backbiting because it tears into a person's good name and honor. And this can be much worse than actually tearing off a piece of that person's physical flesh, al-dubla. And we, you know, see that now in our world of cancel culture, how, you know, devastating it is when people's entire lives are completely turned upside down based on sometimes a rumor and we don't know there's it's very difficult to verify certain things we see it on you know and what i'm talking about like high profile cases but it's like really tragic if you think about how sometimes people's lives have been uh, completely destroyed because of this you know just creating false stories or you know gossiping backbiting whatever and then it just it's like a fire that just gets a flame that goes out of control and um at the end of the day that person's reputation is smeared it's completely run dragged through the mud it's very hard for people to recover right so we have to ask the last that for protection from that and then on page 22 um it says that in the above verse, Allah likens the, the absent one to a dead person. The dead person is gone and thus unable to defend himself. Just as the absent one being talked about is unable to defend himself or herself. Furthermore, biting off part of something causes harm to it, just as speaking ill of people causes harm to them. A poet said, a cut inflicted by the tongue is not unlike the cut inflicted by the hand. So again, just really important reminders for all of us to reflect on um, and inshallah to, um, to take ourselves into account for. So now we go into, well, are there circumstances where backbiting is permitted? And believe it or not, yes, there, there are specific circumstances where the act of speaking about someone's potential flaws or you know just things that they've done that's harmful wouldn't fall under the same category as what we just talked about because again it's about the harm that not speaking up about or or you know disclosing some knowledge that you have about a person may cause further harm than the actual harm of disclosing that knowledge and so let's look at those situations so here we have Backbiting is permitted only in the following circumstances. One, 
when appealing to an authority to remove an injustice. So maybe sometimes you have to unveil, speak about something or someone in a situation like this, uh, where you're again, speaking to an authority figure, and it could apply to many different circumstances, but you are trying to prevent further harm to remove an injustice. So you might have to disclose certain information, right? When seeking help from others to change a wrong or to stop an oppressor from his wrongs. So again, there's sometimes context is needed. You need to give context for something. That context may involve uh, speaking about someone when they're not present. And so in those cases, again, if the intention is to prevent further harm, it would be permissible. When seeking a legal opinion, uh, there are people who may be going through, you know, some business uh, issue with a ex-partner, you know, business partner, and they need to get consultation. And in that consultation, they may have to unveil unethical business practices or other things that are private knowledge, but you need to know what your rights are. You have to protect your interests, right? Or some, there may be, again, another issue that you're trying to avoid. And so you seek legal counsel or, you know, this would likely also apply to uh, seeking a counsel from for other situations as well. You know, maybe you need to speak to a therapist or a counselor about certain things in a relationship, for example, right? When warning others concerning commerce, marriage, neighbors, and companionship, okay? For example, it's acceptable to mention the violent temperament of a man to his prospective wife. So if you have knowledge about someone and then you find out that, they are, you know, being asked about for the purpose of marriage, you know, maybe someone asks you directly, hey, I'm thinking of so-and-so for my daughter, what do you think of him or so-and-so for my son, what do you think of her, and you have knowledge that you are convinced or that you have evidence of, you have proof of, and you really do think it would potentially cause uh, damage to this person, you know, um, I mean, there's a lot of People out of the bala who are they, you know, they 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 do this. They trick people. There's a lot of fraud that happens in our community, unfortunately, around marriage. You know, where people will present themselves as being a certain way, but then you find out later that they have a whole family, or you know, have children that they never spoke about, or health conditions, or debt, or all these other problems because they concealed those things and they were not upfront and honest and truthful. So if you have knowledge that you think is actually could potentially help people, you know, people avoid being hurt or being scammed or being, you know, and somehow abused, it's your, it's obligation to, to warn those people. Right. So that those are uh, situations where it'd be permissible. Um, when one mentions a man by a nickname, he's known by such as the lamented one, so this is, you know, again, if you're going to, if if you know of someone who has a nickname that might not necessarily sound like really nice, but that person is not being mocked or teased or you, it's not a nickname that's necessarily used to disparage the person, but, you know, it kind of doesn't have the most nice connotation or, or meaning to it. If you're using it, um, in that case, it would not be considered riba, right? Because it's sometimes nicknames stick. You know, people in childhood, they'll get a name that, you know, grandparents or a parent gave them. And their whole life, they're known by that name. And if they don't have a problem with it because, hey, it's not a big deal, you know, it's kind of what I've always known. And you've just, um, you know, gotten to the habit of referring to that person by that name. That's not that's not an issue. But if you specifically create nicknames or use nicknames that you know for a fact um, are actually to mock that person, uh, belittle that person, it could be anything, a totally um, original nickname that someone came up. It could be a play on words maybe that has to do with their name. I mean, sometimes people get really... Uh, they can get very crude when, when speaking about other people that they will speak in code, you know, it's like, I, I'm in order to justify or not even justify, but to, to uh, not 
um, reveal who I'm speaking about, I'll use this code name. This is the person's name. So every time I say this, you know who I'm talking about. And that nickname, you know, is to totally belittle that person, to disparage them. It would upset them. This would not be permissible. This would be prohibited. So the distinction is very important to understand. Nicknames that are the person themselves has no problem with, and it's kind of, you know, just everybody calls them that. It's okay. But anything done to mock them would be impermissible. Um, the next one would be mentioning uh, innovation. Someone's innovations in terms of their religious practice, right? So if you know that someone is doing something with their, or they have a, you know, practice or a belief that is considered, um, you know, again, outside of what are the acceptable differences of, of opinions, right? There's valid difference of opinion on certain things. Those things are not what we're talking about, right? We, you don't, you don't mention that, but if you know for a fact they have a, an idea about, let's say, and there are people in our community who have their own ideas about a lot of things, you know, uh, prayer, you know, you don't need to do this. You don't have to always do this. And they'll give people their own like fatawa, you know, like, oh, you don't have to make wudu for every prayer or you can, you know, combine this prayer and that prayer. And they just kind of speak from their own ideas. And you know that that's, that's not consistent. There's no... Uh, room for that in our tradition. Uh, it's just their own, you know, innovations. You can certainly mention that in, in a context that it, it would apply because it's important for people to know, um, you know, who people truly are. And especially, for example, in the case of marriage, you know, it's really important. Also, when mentioning the wrongs of someone who openly commits those uh, enormities, right? So if someone is openly committing sins, but that person's name is mentioned in some context and everybody kind of knows that they do that if they drink alcohol for example or they gamble um or they you know have relations outside of marriage and it's kind of something that everybody is known knows about and for some reason maybe you're discussing that person for um, some context maybe they are in the community and they're you know someone needs uh, their services for something. And so mentioning someone who their public, their sins are public and you're just kind of warning maybe someone or mentioning those things is, is, is okay, again, with the right intention. But speaking about their sins and unveiling people about what they do, what others don't know is completely forbidden. You can't, we're, we're not allowed to unveil people just because, you know? And so if you are even in the context of marriage, for example, if there is a specific issue or business, like if you're, you know, know that someone's about to go into business some, with someone and you want to warn them that, oh, did you know they went into business two years ago with so-and-so and it didn't go very well. And you can have, you have details, maybe very private knowledge that you know about. That is fine because your intention is clear. But if you're going to add on and say, oh yeah, by the way, he cheated on his wife and then I found out that he gambled or he fornicated or he, you know, or he, uh, I'm sorry, I mean, he he drinks alcohol and he does drugs. And you're just kind of piling on a list of all the sins. This is now, it's like a, you know, you just have verbal diarrhea. You can't stop yourself and you're just, you know, unveiling someone and you need to stop because that is not the, that's not in the context of why you're telling, talking about the person to, you know, the one you're speaking about. The context was, I'm warning you because of the business um, fallouts that they've had in the past, for example. And so the extra information you can't share, okay? So that's really important to remember. And so let me check time. Oh, wow. Wow, that hour went fast, subhanAllah. I still have a couple more. Let's see if I can do these. Oh, no, I don't think I can do these. There's a lot more context. Okay, content, I mean. So let me, I'm going to stop here at point number two, uh, which was backbiting. And I'm going to get to the question and answers because the rest of the sections, they uh, need more time and I'll just uh, cut them off. So we'll have to continue with chapter two for uh, in two weeks, inshallah. And yeah, I think it'll be a good uh, discussion, inshallah, because there's a lot more commentary Again, if you don't have the book, highly recommend because I love like to just peruse this book. Um, I'll just go over sections I've read before because it's they're just really good reminders, you know, for all of us. And we all have 
uh, this is our jihad. May Allah give us sincere intention, you know. And of course, may Allah give us, um, make our actions in, in line with our intentions, but give us sincere intentions. We want to have the niyyah, but we also want to follow up the niyyah with actions, inshallah. So, alhamdulillah. Let me go ahead and stop the screen share right now, and then I will, um, inshallah, come and check the, uh, the the discussion or the comments. Let's see. Alhamdulillah. Oh. Mm. Just give me one moment. I'll check Facebook as well as the MCC page just to see if there's anything going on. Okay. So if you have any questions, again, please feel free. I just see some nice comments, uh, just some salams and and mashallahs, which are always lovely to hear. Uh, but if you have specific questions, let me go on to the YouTube page. Let me know. Alhamdulillah. Okay, I'm logging on. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, the best view is someone who feeds others. Mashallah. Yes, some nice comments here. What about oils, sister? I'm not sure if that question was for me or someone else because we did not discuss anything like that. So I don't see any questions uh, pertinent to our discussion here. Uh, but we still have a couple minutes, like two minutes. So if you want to ask, please feel free. But other than that, inshallah, I hope you guys are benefiting from this class because I really do enjoy... Um, putting together the slides and, and having this discussion. I wish it was more interactive. I wish we were doing this in real uh, time, uh, you know, in person instead of the virtual. But alhamdulillah, we have to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the opportunities he gives us. And uh, we all remember what happened when we the quarantine started and it was Ramadan very shortly after. And I think a lot of us were really worried for good reason too, because it was our first Ramadan like this. But then subhanAllah, how many of us had probably the most exceptional experiences? I know many people did. I had a really, you know, amazing uh, Ramadan this past year. So sometimes we um, we think things are a lot worse than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us the opposite. So always have a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, it's a difficult time for most people uh, and it has been for a while. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's promise is true and we have to hold on to that. Always, no matter how um, intense things get, never forget because that is what gives our heart life. Like we believe in the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If he says after every difficulty there's ease, we believe in that. And inshallah, this too shall pass. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep all of you safe, your family safe, inshallah. And may... Um, What's to come in the next few months? Uh, again, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us strength and hold us together um, and protect us, inshallah, from the fitna. And uh, just, yeah, make all of this, uh, I mean, help us to come out of this with a renewed, uh, inshallah, understanding of our of our place and our, our purpose and to really um, just see the world with a different, lens because i think if we are being honest with ourselves likely why we're in this situation is because we we fell into heedlessness we became forgetful we lost our way and so sometimes we have to you know learn the, the hard way to come back and to remember who we are so inshallah we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for continued guidance and patience and uh and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Bless all of you. Thank you for spending your Sunday evening with MCC East Bay, inshallah. Please make dua for the organizers, all of the volunteers and the staff, inshallah. And support MCC. They didn't ask me to say that, but it is an organization. If you are in the Bay Area, they absolutely deserve our support, maybe more so now than before, because it is tough times, even for uh, organizations to just make their, um, you know, overhead costs and all the other, there's still, things still are happening, you know, even though we're, doing a lot of things virtually. So anyhow, that's just my little short uh, spiel for MCC, but do keep all of them in your du'as. And thank you. Thank you again for being here. We will go ahead and end, and I'll see you guys, inshallah, in two weeks. 
So Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim wal Asr illa al-insan allati khusir illa alladhina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawassaw bil-haqqi wa tawassaw bis-sabr Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdika ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala sayyidina wa maulana habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira Alhamdulillah jazakumullahu khairan have a wonderful evening you guys inshallah take care assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh السلام عليكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome everyone uh, Inshallah you all are doing well You're all safe in your homes Comfortable with your families And everybody's in good spirits uh, we just had a holiday break, so I hope you got some uh, chance to rest and relax. I know tomorrow is uh, back to the grind for many of us, but inshallah, we've had a good time off. Um, and so I'm uh, so happy to be spending this evening with all of you. Jazakumullah khairan for spending it with me. Now, for those who may be tuning in for the first time, I am covering a text uh, in this session or in, the, in a series uh, in the series called agenda to change our condition i have the text here in front of me it is written by imam zaid shakir and sheikh hamza yusuf and this text is really as the title says about changing oneself and working with practical steps on how to do that and so we've been covering um since uh, i mean uh, uh, several different sections of the book but currently we are on the second chapter, which is titled The Heart and Its Treatment. We didn't get a chance to finish uh, this chapter. It was two weeks ago that we last met. So we are going to finish the second chapter and possibly, if we have time today, continue into the third chapter. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, inshallah. So just give me a second. Um, bismillah. Let me present. All right, so now I'm going to do a quick review uh, because the second chapter, uh, we just started at the last session. So let's just quickly go over this. It, it'll be a summary, but of course, if you want to uh, get the more in-depth uh, reading of this text then or of this chapter, please look at the previous recording uh, from two weeks ago. So we started off with talking about, uh, first of all, the title, as I said, was The Heart and Its Treatment. This is the, the, the uh, beginning of the chapter. And so right away, we talked about the, that action has two different modes, the heart and the limbs, and then what the concerns are of the heart, which is establishing a strong belief or aqidah, and then purity of intention, sincerity, right? Ikhlas, as we say in Arabic. So we described those uh, two terms in detail here. What is belief? What is sincerity? Right? And then uh, we further expanded on this concept of purifying the heart and rectifying our intentions. And then we talked about achieving sincerity and how we can be more sincere. Because, of course, this is, for all of us, the most important thing. Uh, it's really about the quality of what we do, right? The quantity, there's many people, even the munafiqun, right? They uh, can amass a lot of deeds, but if there's no sincerity in the heart, then that's, it's all for nothing, right? So the most important objective for us is to have sincerity when we do anything for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how can we achieve sincerity? Well, first and foremost, we guard our tongue, we make sure that we are truthful speaking people. We're honest people. And then we maintain discourse in private and public gatherings, right? So we maintain our way of behaving publicly and, pi and privately. And then we went on to talk about specifically how we can uh, protect the tongue from falsehood, dissembling, right? To conceal one's true motives, feelings, or beliefs and prevarications to deviate from the truth. So how can we do this specifically? And so this is all from the text. Again, I hope you have the text in front of you, but these slides are just meant to guide us in this conversation. So Bismillah, sorry, it's sometimes we get a little delay there. So um, 
here we are. So after we talked about um, that, we went into the four sources of destructive qualities of the tongue. And so we talked about lying and in what situations they are permissible and what, when they are not permissible. And then backbiting ghibah, which of course we know is haram, and the difference between riba and namima, calumny, right? Um, and so we talked about that distinction. And then this is where we, uh, we ended on this particular slide, the slide about backbiting. And, you know, this is an important topic because unfortunately it is so common. Uh, it's, you know, human beings are, are uh, you know, prone to certain things more than others. And I would say that in our time uh, of uh, really being able to know so much about people's private lives, maybe more than ever before, we have access to information about people, right? Just with a click of a button, you can know a lot about how people live. You can see their family life, their home life, their relationship status. You can see their work sometimes, their vacations, uh, the events that they go to on the weekend. So because we have so much access to people's private lives and their choices, the way that they live, their lifestyle, um, it does give us fodder, right, to... Uh, to speak about them and to judge them. And so unfortunately, this is a very common problem that, that we have in our community and, and you know, within, in the world, I would say, uh, because, you know, there's the whole, um, uh, there's a whole industry, right, that thrives off of gossip, uh, the tabloid industry, we see it from, I mean, when I was a kid, we, we saw the magazines when we would go into the supermarket stores or even the television shows, right? Uh, shows like Entertainment Tonight. What were they but gossip shows? They were just there to, you know, speak about what's going on with different celebrities, but really give a lot of information, scandals, anything that was going on. And then throughout the years, of course, that's changed as mediums have changed. And so now there's TMZ and there's different websites that people will go to just to get access to gossip. So it's definitely a big part of our society to talk about people to gossip, even if though we don't know, you know, I mean, these are people removed from us often. We don't know them personally. They're celebrities or politicians, athletes, singers, but still the fact that it's such a acceptable thing and nobody really thinks twice of how grotesque it is, how despicable it is to spend your time judging other people, um, then it's normalized. And when it's normalized, you know, so on such a large scale, then of course, uh, you know, in private conversations with friends and family, you start to let your guard down and not become, you know, not be aware of yourself that what you're doing is so detestable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So really we want to talk about why this is uh, such an important topic of guarding the tongue from backbiting. So we did distinguish though, in some cases it is permissible because the harm of not mentioning certain things could be greater, right? So that's the wisdom of our deen is that it helps us to discern when certain behaviors are acceptable and when they're not. And so we talked at length in the last uh, session about the situations where backbiting would be permissible. So again, if you wanted to get more on that, check out the previous recording. All of it is available on the MCC YouTube page, inshallah. So now uh, there's four, right, sources. So we only got to number two. So the third one is where we're gonna talk about next. I'm just gonna wait for the slide to kick in here um, on this delay. Okay, and I went ahead. <laughs> okay, here we go. So argumentation for its own sake. To dispute using sophistical reasoning, right, sophistry, what is that? It's people who just like to argue, even though their arguments are fallacious, they're all based on fallacies, there's really no truth to them, but they just like to argue. They like to wind people up and get people angry over whatever it is, whether it's politics or some other issue, religious debates. There are people that do this and they enjoy it. They thrive on it. They love it. They love to, you know, prod people, just annoy them. And so uh, this is definitely something that is, is harmful and destructive to the tongue to engage in this type of behavior. So when you know that you are arguing a point that you really, there's no substance to it. There's no, you know, nothing really serious in your heart. You're not really invested in it, but you just want to 
argue for the sake of arguing, you just like to, like I said, rile people up, this would apply to you. That This is something you really have to watch. Contentiousness. You know, there are people, like I said, who enjoy this. They may, just part of their personality type, they like to pick fights or pick arguments. So we really want to watch our behavior. If this is something that you have been told that you do, that you just argue a lot, um, and this doesn't necessarily have to be verbal. We see now on social media a lot of people who um, use, you know, the the, pla- the various different platforms to just incite people, just to go and, you know, they call them trolls. They'll just go and bring up things that have nothing to do with anything, um, and then they move on. They go to the next person and the next person because. They likely have, you know, something that's going on personally with them or they're not happy in their life. They're, they're not, you know, they're not uh, content with their own circumstances. So it gives them some uh, relief to go and bother other people. And unfortunately, of course, this would be a disease of the heart, right? To, to go and harm people just because you can or because you don't, you can't contain your own emotions, of course, is unacceptable, right? This is uh, definitely a disease of the heart. But again, we have people who do this. So nowadays, it's not just verbal argumentation, but it can be behind a screen with a complete stranger that you don't know about. Um, so you want to think about that. Or here, for example, to defend a religious innovation intentionally. So sometimes people, just because they, again, don't want to lose an argument, they may uh, defend a position that they that they know is not true just because they don't want to look embarrassed maybe in front of a group or another person. So they will, you know, again, advocate for something or push for something, defend something without, while knowing that it's not uh, the correct position to have. So there are unfortunately, again, people whose pride um, and their egos get in the way. And so argumentation just becomes a defense that they use Uh, to protect their own pride and ego, but it is destructive. It's destructive to the spiritual heart. It's destructive to the tongue. So here the Prophet reminds us that disputation with the Quran is disbelief. So for anybody who, for example, um, will come and refute a clear position in the Quran, this is kufr, right? We cannot do that. If, If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says something, we accept it without any question that it is haq, it is true. But there are, again, people nowadays anyway, who believe, unfortunately, that Islam needs a reform and that the Quran needs a reform. And so they apply their own whims, desires, interpretations to ayahs, and they begin to, um, dis- you know, they, they spread messages that completely disagree or are in opposition to everything in Islam and and the orthodox positions in Islam, um, and they still call themselves Muslim. So we have to be very careful of these people because they may claim to be Muslim, but if they are assuming to know better or to um, to think that they their interpretation of something that is clearly you know been has a consensus about uh, is is correct. We have to be very careful of people like that. May Allah protect us from becoming people like that. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from being influenced by people like that. We have to do our best to guard our heart and our iman, which is why it's so important to make sure that we take from the correct sources, from teachers who have been trained, who uh, have the sanad, the, the chain of transmission, that you know that they have gone through the proper training because nowadays anybody can claim to be a teacher or a scholar or a sheikh just because they, um, you know, can read Arabic or they have, uh, they just claim it. And unfortunately, this is very common. I know uh, people, public figures who this is what they do and they are very controversial in certain community groups uh, because they will, for example, say, you know, the hijab is not something that is fard on women. Right. And it's and then they'll interpret the verses of the of hijab in their own way. And it, it causes a lot of uh, problems in families and in marriages because one person may take this this person as an authority. And so it just causes a lot of problems. But the clear sign for all of us is that when someone goes against the ijma of our uh, of our scholarship in Islam and goes against the majority opinion on things, we should definitely see that as a red flag 
no matter what they uh, assume in terms of their credentials, just know that right away that is a sign of, of some serious problem because again, our Dean has been protected and preserved over all these centuries because of the Senate, because we have respected this chain. And so to break from that chain and to think that you know better and to presume that, again, Islam needs some type of reformation, al is just kufr. So we, we stay away from that type of thinking um, and we ask Allah SWT to, to protect us from that. So that was the third um, destructive quality of the tongue. Now, the fourth is mirthful jesting on serious occasions, right? Jesting, making light of, joking around of a serious matter. Um, and this is something, again, very problematic in our society at large, in our world at large. We live in a time where, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a time where people really take things that are very serious lightly and um, it's, it's, you know, memes, for example, you see all this joking, inappropriate mockery, which is haram in Islam. All of this is very common now, very normalized behavior. You see it every day. If you open up your email or your, uh, you know, browser to check news, likely you will see some form of this of just you know not really taking things seriously or taking a very serious matter and then as we said making a joke of it making light of it so we have to you know ask Allah Subhanahu for protection from that that there is a time and place for everything and we do not you know lose comportment lose our um, our adab in in different environments or with different people in different scenarios just because we have this uh, internal sort of, you know, this uh, impulse to joke around. And so we have to regulate. And this is why it's so important to learn to regulate yourself so that you're not caught in those moments where, you know, you're uh, being wholly inappropriate in a situation, right? And this is unfortunately, again, very, very common. So here, um, the Prophet ﷺ reminds us, right, a beautiful quality in someone's practice of Islam is minding his or own, own business. Min husni islami tarku mala ya'nihi, right? So beautiful hadith that we should all internalize to really try not to get involved in other people's business, um, not to ask or probe or pry into the private personal affairs of other people because it's those questions that open the door oftentimes for the gossiping, the backbiting, the argument, argumentation, for the inappropriate joking, teasing, taunting, uh, mockery of other people, right? So sometimes it's just best to, again, only to take your, yourself seriously and to take the discussions that you engage in seriously, to take the the, the uh, gatherings that you uh, have or the people that you're with and those uh, times where you're you're speaking or just engaging with other people to take those moments very seriously um, and to to be aware of yourself so that you don't again fall into all of these really destruct uh, destructive behaviors so uh, these are the four sources of destructive qualities so let's go ahead and look at what's next so we're still on by the way chapter two let me just look at the book here to let those who do have the text know where we are uh, oh, there are actually some other um, hadith here, let me mention. Um, Qadi Abu Bakr said, and this goes back to the previous slide here, where we talked about mirthful jesting. He said, I once heard Imam Al-Tartushi say that the joker is an ignorant fool because, because Allah revealed to us a dialogue between the children of Israel and Moses upon him be peace. Do you take us as the brunt of a joke? Asked the children of Israel. And Musa salam replied, he said this, right? So he said, I seek refuge in Allah that I should be of the ignorant ones. So he took this accusation from, the, you know, Bani Israel, the children of Israel, that, that it was such an insult, like that he was seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for protection from, or refuge in Allah from, from being amongst the ignorant ones. So this was the commentary of, Imam al-Tartushi, and this is on page 23, again, of the text. And then 
Qadi Abu Bakr also said, it would seem to me that if the answer concerns a matter related to religion, then it is ignorance, but if it was some other concern, then it is merely speech. Its ruling is its ruling, and its characteristic is defined by what it contains. So again, just, you know, discussing um, uh, the how to distinguish, right, between something that is stated out of ignorance or, or otherwise. And then um, he said, or then the text continues and it says, after we've purified our hearts from other than Allah and our tongues from the aforementioned faults, then we have established firm foundations for divine protection. The next step. So now, again, we're, this is a process, right? So we're looking at all the different steps. So the next step on the journey towards sincerity is developing concern for the rest of our responsibilities. Among those, we should focus on ensuring the following two essentials, the five foundations of religion, the five pillars of Islam, and avoiding mortal sins, the kaba'ir vigilantly. So again, once we've done this work, this deep internal spiritual work, right, where we're really trying to look at our behavior and change our behavior, then uh, this would be the next uh, step is that we are um, focusing on the five pillars and avoiding the kaba'ir, which are the, the enormities, the large uh, sins, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you avoid what has been prohibited for you from the enormities, then we will cover over any wrongs. So inshallah, if we are vigilant in protecting ourselves from doing any of the major haram, then inshallah, Allah will uh, protect us and uh, cover us from other wrongs. And so then um, the text goes on to say, none truly knows the mortal sins with any certainty except Allah. Indeed, he has concealed them among the prohibited matters. However, some of the masters of knowledge have gathered them and codified them for us. They tally 17 in number. Abandoning the major sins makes it easier for one to leave lesser wrongs. And that's a really important point. I mean, if you think about it, if you're working so uh, diligently and vigilantly to protect yourself from the 17 major sins, then you will, inshallah, as a byproduct of that vigilance, guard yourself from the lesser sins. So it's really, you know, a two for one in many cases, just be vigilant about your heart, protect your limbs, protect your tongue, protect yourself. And inshallah, the frivolous or the smaller deeds, misdeeds, mistakes, sins, those will kind of just go away as well, right? So then um, he says, likewise, the lesser wrongs that one commits will be removed from one's record through ritual prayers, washings, the hajj, and the lesser pray, pil uh, pilgrimage. SubhanAllah, and that's out of the generosity and rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that just by doing some of these ritual acts that we do in order to do other acts, for example, wudu, right? We know that when we make wudu, that our sins are falling as the water drops, right? That is uh, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But how many of us really take that into account every time we make wudu, that we're actually imagining that happening, right? Um, so some of these things are just given to us without us even being aware of it or having it, you know, in, in the forefront of our minds, right? But it's still happening. So Allah, out of his generosity, gives us all of this uh, mercy and, you know, and, and forgives us of so many sins just by doing these things, right? And then the Prophet ﷺ said, one daily prayer to the next and one Friday prayer to the next remit wrong actions as long as enormities are avoided. SubhanAllah. So every single day that we are able to successfully complete our prayers, one after the other, after the other, after the other, and in between, we're not engaging in any of the of the larger sins or the heavier, weightier sins. Uh, and again, as the text says, most of those things are known only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, some of them have clearly been uh, stipulated for us but truly only Allah would know, right? So if we protect our hearts from doing those major, major sins from prayer to prayer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is removing our sins for us. And in the same uh, vein is from Jummah to Jummah, if we do the same thing, right? So subhanAllah, again, out of the generosity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, so... 
Now the next section here is on the enumeration of the enormities. Okay, so this is where we now talk about what these major sins are that our scholars have put it, put it, uh, you know, codified for us and put it in this list. So the very first one, the most important one, of course, we know is shirk, is associating any partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is, uh, according uh, to one narration, the one sin that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not forgive. And there are other narrations, of course, that speak also to the, uh, to the heaviness of the sin and that uh, it is, uh, it's uh, at the top of the list, right? It's, it's the greatest uh, sin that we can make is to in any way attribute a partner to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's right away. We, we know this, inshallah. We all know it because Tawheed is part of our creed. Inshallah, we all understand this clearly. Uh, the next is perseverance in wrongs, even in lesser ones. So this is important because when we commit sins habitually, even when they're small, they turn into enormities, right? So they pile up. You want to think about that, that smaller sins like grains of sand can eventually turn into mountains before us if we're not careful. So we have to be careful of habituating to sin and to making, uh, be, becoming heedless and reckless and not taking ourselves into account when we do sin. Toba should be part of our every single day experience um, because we should, even if we don't actively sin, we should remember that we sin sometimes passively. We sin uh, when we're unaware of it. So when we make toba regularly every day, we are mindful of ourselves. And inshallah, that will prevent us from engaging in sins, especially when we know that it's sinful behavior. So really important to make sure that we don't habituate to sins, even if they're small. Despair of the mercy of Allah. Despair is a really important one because you know, again, we live in a time where anxiety disorders, mental health uh, issues are on the rise, and a lot of people struggle with um, with their circumstances and trying to, you know, just find peace in, in life. A lot of problems are happening, and it's because the, the nature of our world. I mean, if you look at the world, it's just, it's become an increasingly difficult place uh, for people to find some semblance of peace. Uh, it, so all of these things are uh, are understandable given the intensity of our world, right? There's a lot of evil in our world, a lot of darkness in our world. So with that, though, there is um, something that has happened in terms of this concept of despair. Um, and, you know, it's a term that is thrown around lightly, but we have to understand that as Muslims, we do not despair. And it's actually considered a great, um, it's a haram to have despair because we should never lose hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So again, people who struggle with really serious mental health issues, we're not speaking about that, but people who kind of have, go through grief or stress or some problem in life and they immediately default into losing hope, we would say this would be, you know, something that you don't want to normalize and you certainly don't want to make acceptable just because you're having a difficult time. You want to challenge that and, you know, be uh, bothered by it and want to remove it, that I don't want to feel this way. I want to always have the best opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not to uh, think that my circumstance is hopeless um, in dunya or in akhirah. Some people, for example, sin and they do major sins and then they lose hope that they will ever be saved. This is from Iblis, uh, was 100%, because nobody uh, should feel that way. And that's why we have so many hadith where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us over and over and over again not to put limits on his mercy. You know, if he can forgive a man, a mass murderer, you know, then we should not assume anything about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's his and his decision alone, right? Um, but to have hope, because that is the better position than to lose hope, right? So we want to be very careful about that. And then also a false sense of security from the design of Allah. This would be, you know, the opposite issue of people just assuming that everything is going to go in their favor just because, right? Self-righteousness 
is a really serious disease of the heart, arrogance, self-righteousness, assuming that you kind of have it and, you know, you have it made and that, um, you know, it gives you this false sense of security with Allah. You, we always have to, um, you know, find that balance of hope with Allah, but also fear and awe and maintaining that respect and that uh, that uncertainty because we don't see our, 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 our deeds as being good enough, as worthy, right? It's a humility. It's humility before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in recognizing that no matter what we do, we could spend our entire existence worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala perfectly, but it will not ever be enough to show gratitude for all of the blessings he's given us. When you have that understanding then you don't assume that you are special or that you have some special rank with Allah, but you always, you know, kind of um, are, are walking between those two states, right? Or hanging in the balance between those two states of hope and fear. So those are the four enormities of the heart, right? This is why it's so important to have those really deep internal conversations with oneself to question and check in. Um, these don't, don't have to necessarily be verbalized to anybody. It's really about our, our, holding ourselves accountable and being truthful with ourselves, right? So the four um, enormities of the tongue are the false testimony. So this is very serious. If you ever uh, testify against someone or some, you know, in a situation you find yourself, but you are not being truthful uh, and you potentially ruin um another person's life or livelihood uh, or there, you know, many scenarios would apply to this. It's, this is huge. It's absolutely haram. We have to be people of truth and honesty. We cannot uh, anyway, you know, make claims about other people. And this is why it's so dangerous because, you know, there have been several public cases, right. Um, of, of people making allegations against someone. And then later on, it turns out that they were untrue and it was false report and we have to seek protection because this is something that people um, fall into sometimes because of greed or they have some other ulterior motive and they think that, you know, they can, uh, they can justify doing it because, Oh, you know, it'll serve a, a better purpose. I'll be able to do good, but you could, there's, you could put it so many different spins on it, but at the end of the day, it's haram. You cannot, uh, bear false testimony, accusing others of adultery. So this would kind of fall into the same category if it, you are lying, but also if you're basing it on just suspicion, right? I mean, you may see a situation and presume something, but without evidence and without um, really following the, the, you know, the, 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 the rules, I guess, of, of a situation like that, right? In Islam, we know there has to be a certain number of witnesses. It has to be done a certain way uh, before you make an accusation publicly about someone doing something like that. But you'll find people, again, uh, making light of these things and they don't think twice. They let their emotions get the best of them. They'll pick up the phone call and I saw your husband, I saw your wife, or I, I saw somebody, whoever. Uh, it's either a gossip train that continues or it's actually getting involved and meddling in another person's relationship, all based on suspicion, not true uh, facts or anything that could be uh, verifiable by another witness or other witnesses, right? So we have to be very careful of ever making those accusations. Uh, sinful oaths, you know, again, if you're um, promising or vowing to do things that are haram, making oaths, you want to be very careful. This is totally impermissible. I mean, we have to, you know, first of all, be careful with, uh, you know, what, uh, what we, you know, how we use our tongue in this way, but also what our hearts are, are uh, aligning with, right? So you want to be careful uh, that you're not uh, being loyal to or showing some allegiance to something that you know is clearly haram. So not making oaths and vows and promises um, that that are not uh, that are that are simply haram and wrong, right? And then magic, we know, if you're you know seeing people who are promising to look into your future or you know they're reading cards or tea leaves, 
this was, you know, this is very uh, popular in, in some cultures more than others to, to go to people like that, you know, and, and unfortunately in many of our cultures, uh, there's a presumption right away that um, if something isn't going your way in life, maybe you've missed some opportunities, some things haven't worked out for you, that it must immediately be seher, magic. And then that leads, in some cases, ironically, it leads people to seek out people who do seher or who, who, are, who are known to dabble in, in uh, black magic to seek revenge or to, you know, it's just, it's, it's really mind boggling, but we have to seek protection from Allah's path that forever engage, engaging in things like that. So those are the, um, the four enormities of the heart and of the tongue. So let's go to the next slide here. I want to get through this list because I'll leave some time for questions, but um, okay. So the next are the three enormities of the stomach. Uh, and so again, look at the sections and how they have separated each section, uh, inshallah, to, to get to this total of 17, right? So right away, of course, we know intake of alcohol or intoxicants of any type. If you are intentionally digesting or consuming something that you know has been spiked or is haram or is in any way uh, just not permissible um, because there's some, you know, level or, or of intoxicant in there, you should seek refuge from Allah. It's, it's definitely haram to do that, willingly, knowingly. Um, and so that's one, the first one. Consuming the wealth of an orphan. Um, how many ayahs in the Quran does Allah warn people of doing this? But unfortunately, it happens. There are many um, people who are caught up in this type of uh, behavior in countries and, and, and places where there are actual orphans and they may have something of their own. But also if you think about inheritance disputes and, you know, other matters that get into family politics, there are people who are, uh, may Allah guide them and forgive them, but they let their greed get the best of them and they will, um, you know, scam sometimes their own family members uh, in those scenarios. So, it can be in both ways, you know, actual taking the wealth and other ways, just scheming and plotting to, uh, to take the wealth of someone who, who again, would be categorized as an orphan. Uh, taking interest on wealth. So this is, I, you know, I'm not going to get into all the debates about this because um, there are different opinions on, on that when it comes to Muslims uh, living, you know, minority Muslims living in non-Muslim lands, and there's just a lot of different opinions on, on interest in general. Uh, um, but for the most part, we all know that we should avoid it, right? I mean, we have some of us have credit cards, you might have take a loan here and there. And that's when you have to just, you know, follow the uh, positions of whichever scholars that you listen to or that you follow, they may have different opinions on that. But most of the scholars, regardless, will always advise that it's best to avoid any type of interest. Um, is, and because it, it will, you know, eat away at the barakah of our wealth. So it's best to always try to avoid it. But the specifics of it, again, you can defer to the scholars of, that, you, that you follow and see what their positions are. The enormities of the genitals. So this is, again, another one that we should be very mindful of because it's everywhere. It's happening. Uh, we live again in a time where everything's inverted um, in terms of uh, what's normal uh, in society is oftentimes haram. You know, it's it's just it's a very strange time. But these things having illicit relationships outside of marriage, premarital sex is so normalized in this society. Nobody very few people think of it even as an issue. And if you are on the opposite side and you have conservative values, they will look at you like you're crazy um, and there's something wrong with you. And this isn't just with adults, but you find even, I work with teens and I, I see what's going on in teen culture and it's even pervasive in teen culture that if you haven't had sexual relations by the time you're a senior or even a junior and uh, maybe it's changed and now it's even a freshman or a sophomore. I don't know how early um, the pressure is to be sexually active, but I certain I know certainly that there is a lot of pressure and that you are considered weird or you're treated as if you, there's something wrong with you 
um, if you choose not to you know, participate and you want to be, um, you know, just protect yourself and be, be chaste, people will look at you like there's something wrong with you. So this is very common. And that's why we can't have, you know, this attitude that, oh, Muslims don't do these things. No, Muslims are absolutely doing these things. And that's why a show like Rami, you know, this show that got very popular and won an Emmy, I think, and probably other awards, uh, it's it's very open about, you know, young Muslim singles that are engaging in this type of behavior. Um, as far as I know, I haven't seen the show, um, but I heard enough to know that that is a very popular ongoing theme in the show. Uh, and so a lot of Muslims are fans of the show, by the way. Uh, it's not that it's just non-Muslims watching Muslims do these things or, you know, depicting Muslims doing these things. It's actually very popular with the younger Muslim American or Western Muslim generation because they likely identify with it or they have also adopted the same attitude about these behaviors. So we have to take it seriously that these are, are very... Um, you know, they're, they're enormous, they're haram, and we know just looking at Sharia and, and the rules and the positions uh, about, um, you know, these matters where what's acceptable, what's not. We know that premarital sex is forbidden. Of course, adultery is a whole other topic, but that would also uh, be included because it's illicit relations. And so illicit is premarital or adulterous. And then, of course, homosexual acts. This is now also very common and very, it's increasingly becoming normalized um, in society. Just yesterday on a group thread that I'm on, um, someone posted that um, a sister was inquiring about how to navigate a situation in which a young Muslim girl has come out as gay and wants to introduce her partner to her family and, you know, this is, we hear these stories now more and more with the younger generation um, because their generation has accepted the idea that gender um, and, you know, and sexuality are fluid and they don't believe that there's a binary, that, you know, this is what, unfortunately, they've been conditioned to think in, you know, it's indoctrination. It starts sometimes very young uh, but we have to just open our eyes and accept the reality that we live in a time where this is part of the the progressive social uh, movement, the left, the liberal movement to normalize these things as far as gender and sexuality is concerned. And therefore, um, that becomes the you know resounding message to everybody that, it's not a big deal. You know, you kind of just go with the flow, do what you feel. Why do you have to apply some moral lens to it? Um, you're born this way. You know, these are the messages that our youth are hearing. So what that does when you hear that throughout school, and I, uh, working with teens, I have had to intervene in situations where junior high school students have had, a con you know, conflict or with their gender or sexual identity because of these discussions happening around them with their friends or just with the um, celebrities they follow or the, you know, the singers and the different uh, shows and programs they're watching. It's so normal. And, you know, if you really are paying attention, they had, um, I think, yeah, it was 2015 that they call the year of the, the trans, right? It's like the, the transgender year where a lot of transgender uh, celebrities were coming out like Caitlyn Jenner and then um, I think it's Laverne Fox or Cox I can't remember her name uh, but there are others as well who are RuPaul we know right people who are transgender um, and they ha became very popular during that year of 2015 so since then if you are paying attention you'll notice that there is much more representation of the LGBTQ community in popular television, popular shows, music, cartoons now. There's, a, a, you know, pressure to make sure that there's representation. Even if it's just a character in the background, you'll see sometimes, you know, two moms, um, you know, pushing a stroller or something like that, in a, you know, in the backdrop of a, of a scene in a cartoon. So the messaging is there. It's quite 
uh, prevalent and it's continuously increasing. So you can see why people are accepting this as being normal, even though it conflicts with their faith values. And I have actually worked with groups, including teens, who have a really difficult time reconciling what the faith says and then having friends who are part of the LGBTQ community or just hearing the messages that come from the the left or the social movement that says it's all fine and respect people. And of course we should, we should respect uh, people regardless of their orientation, regardless of their faith. That's just a principle of our faith is just to treat people well and and be, be always civil. Um, so that's not, nobody's arguing that, but I think they have a hard time trying to reconcile, uh, you know, how the faith is very clear about these things. And then society says, no, there's nothing wrong with it. So people are having a hard time with this issue, but we have to be strong as Muslims and be confident to stand up for our values and our principles without, you know, getting, um, swept into or uh, pulled into uh, any types of, of traps that may be set up for us. You know, it, it's unfair, I think, in my personal opinion, that someone who chooses to practice their faith, whether they're Muslim, Christian, Jewish, or any other uh, faith tradition that doesn't uh, accept these acts as being permissible, that they are treated as though they're bigots and that there's something you know, inherently wrong with them because they don't agree with that particular lifestyle. I don't accept that. And I don't think we should. I think we should just be people that say we reserve the right to practice our faith and to hold on to our faith values without having to compromise or capitulate to political agendas and movements. And yet in the same, you know, um, breath, we can say we respect all people's rights to to live and to exist in peace and harmony and not to be harmed. And, and that's it. Leave it at, let's just have mutual respect. You live your way. I'm not going to bother you and don't, and you do the same for me. Don't dictate to me how, what I should believe in and don't label me as being someone who is a bigot or prejudice um, just because I have my beliefs. No, because, you know, as Muslims, we treat people, inshallah, based on the content of their character, how kind, you know, whether or not they're good people, um, and just basic civility. We're not looking at personal choices and lifestyle choices. And we should, that should be extended to us as well, you know, just have mutual respect for people. But going back to the topic of, is it an enormity? Yes, we believe that those acts are haram. And that's it. I mean, that's just, there's no, really no dispute um, about it from the orthodox position of Islam. You might find other people who claim that there's other um, positions, but orthodoxy is pretty, that's it. It's, it's, it is what it is. So that's the two enormities of the genitals. Then we move on to the enormities of the hands. Of course, these are pretty obvious, right? Killing and theft, we know our kabair, our haram, so may Allah subhanahu wa protect us from ever falling into those behaviors, um, human beings uh, of all stripes and backgrounds have unfortunately found themselves in these situations. So we should never think that, that we're above it. We should always ask Allah for protection, right, from ever um, falling into scenarios like that or situations like that where our emotions uh, lead us to do something so heinous as to, as to kill, take a life, or to take property that's not ours or something that's not ours. So may Allah protect us from that. Um, the remaining enormities are, hmm, let's see here. Just give me a second. Bismillah. Uh-oh, went too far. So the enormity of the feet is just one, fleeing from battle, right? So we know that, you know, the deflectors, uh, that's what compromised uh, the Muslims in, um, in at Uhud and other battles. So we know that it's over time. This is unfortunately it has happened where people have deflected. They've gotten afraid or some other reason. So this would be definitely haram. And then of the whole body, this is, you know, 
a really serious one for us all to think about, um, the disrespect of parents. Uh, so, so important again, because it's so relevant in our time when we see that uh, this idea of parental authority being constantly undermined and uh, parents being presented as, you know, just fools, buffoons, easily uh, gullible. This is what a lot of our films, our cartoons even, the characters in the cartoons, you know, like The Simpsons, you look at the parent, parent uh, you know, characters, they're usually very dull, dull, you know, just not very bright. Um, and there's a lot of undermining of the authority that happens. So it's very common. And this is one of the signs of the end of time as well, right? The, the Prophet Sussam warned us about. So we have to look to how we treat our own parents if they are living, inshallah, uh, one or both, if they're still living, how do we speak to them, right? Do we, what tone of voice do we use with them? And it's understandable uh, that, because I know several friends and people who are my age who are caring for elderly parents or parents with, um, you know, just really difficult uh, uh, circumstances and tough personalities. And, you know, they're not, uh, they're set in their ways. You know, some of our parents are just really set in their ways and they're, they're not always willing to compromise with their uh, young adult children. And so I've had to, in many, uh, many times in my life, help my friends or other people I know deal with calming their themselves down when they're talking with their parents because they get so angered easily and so frustrated you know it's it's a time where the uh generational gap um really is is common uh, you see uh, not just you know um because of the different uh circ or times that that each uh, the parent and the child were raised in but also just the age you know the the it, with age comes uh, a lot of challenges, right? You have health challenges. Our parents are oftentimes taking medications um, or they have their own long history of trauma, PTSD, God knows, you know, and a lot of our parents, if we're coming from cultures and, and backgrounds where they saw a lot of hardships and strife, they likely do have residual um, emotional baggage from all of that. And so we have to bear in mind that you know, the, to just be more as patient as we possibly can and to, um, to know how to deal with those situations by regulating our emotions because that's really the only thing we can control, right? So anyway, that's like a larger discussion. But the point is, is just to be very mindful of how we speak to our parents and, the, um, and also how we teach our children to respect us um, always, in my opinion, it's very effective to always attach the, uh, you know, the respect that our parents give, or excuse me, our children give to us as parents to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that it's really kind of, that that's the, 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 the trajectory, right? It's not that we are, um, that, that all of their awe, their respect should just stay with us, but it's more, it's like a conduit, right? If they can respect us and treat us um, well and be mindful of our rules and obey, then it will make their spiritual path easier. And so framing it that way, I think also keeps us accountable as parents so that we make sure we don't, you know, go over the boundaries because there are parents who certainly, um, you know, are excessive and, and can be uh, too harsh or just take advantage of the relationship with their kids and because they think that they have that right. But when you look at parenting, the prophetic examples, what parenting in Islam is all about, it really is about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our objective is to raise strong moral agents, you know, uh, servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can't get in their way. We shouldn't get in their way. We're just a means to an end, which is inshallah that they have uh, strong ubudiyah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we can give them that tarbiyah um, in our homes and as long as they're with us. So that should be the objective, um, inshallah. Okay, so the final comments here. One should avoid all the wrongs that relate to or affect 
any of Allah's servants because those wrongs can be possible, can be, excuse me, impossible to rectify. As for what remains between an individual and Allah, this is less harmful to others and is much easier. So this is an important distinction too, that any of these sins that have to do with wronging other human beings or another person are far heavier on the scale than the things that we do where we wrong ourselves. We shouldn't do either uh, as best as we can. We should always guard ourselves from either, but to know that when we engage in behavior that harms other people, this will be uh, likely much uh, heavier on our scales against us. So may Allah protect us from all of this, inshallah. Ameen. So I'm going to stop here. We didn't, we did, this is the end, by the way. I'm pretty sure. I don't think there's any more after this of chapter two. So our next uh, session, we will, yeah, we'll do chapter three here, which is practical steps to change our condition. Okay. So let me go ahead and stop the screen. And I will now look to the comments to see if there's any. <laughs> Bismillah. Hmm. I usually don't see any, so I don't know if you guys are just shy, um, but I'm going to look anyway. MashaAllah. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I see some people. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for your comments on the Facebook page anyway. And now I'll check YouTube as I always do. I try to cover both so that I don't miss anything. Um, anyway, just give me a second here. Here we go. Let's see if there's any questions. Sorry. Okay. So alhamdulillah. Um let's see. I see comments. Assalamu alaikum. Um or they maybe bother others to get a rise. Okay, good comments here. Assalamu alaikum. Very nice comments. Thank you. I see. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> I just see um, some some nice comments and salams and other things, but I don't see any questions. So Alhamdulillah. Thank you. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, again, it's always an honor uh, that you spend your evenings, uh, Sunday evenings with us here at MCC. So thank you so much. Inshallah, two weeks from now, we will continue the discussion with chapter three. I look forward to seeing you guys there. We'll go ahead and end in dua. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdika shadu an la ilaha ila anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barik ala sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim wa la asr inna al insana la fi khusr illa alladhina amanu wa amanu salihati wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bil sabr Alhamdulillah Sadaq Allah al-Azim Jazakumullahu khairan Thank you so much Um Thank you so much. I'm looking at some of the other comments that came in. Uh, thank you. I appreciate your feedback. Barakallah uh, fikum. Um, and I wish you all a beautiful rest of your evening and a great start to your week, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of you and bless all of you and your families and loved ones. Jazakumullah khairan. Have a good evening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal-mursaleen, Sayyidina wa Mawlana wa Habibina Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam, tasliman kathira. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear brothers and sisters. Alhamdulillah, it has uh, been a few weeks since our last meeting, and I want to first apologize for anyone who may have been um, online last week waiting for the class to start. I just got my schedule mixed up completely. So please forgive me for that. It was I, my, my responsibility. Uh, but alhamdulillah, MCC was uh, kind enough to accommodate us this week. So inshallah, it kind of works out because this will be the last session um, for uh, the this year. And then we'll resume inshallah ta'ala when we come back. But we know that a lot of people have already begun their holiday break. Uh, maybe they're traveling, maybe they're not, but they might be just spending time with family. So inshallah, you'll enjoy a nice break um, uh, when, uh, before we come back. But for today, alhamdulillah, we're going to go ahead and kind of pick up from where we left off last time. And so I do have the uh, presentation. Let me pull it up. For those who, who may be joining us for the first time, um, in case you've never um, been uh, or have never attended before, we've been covering a text that is called Agenda to Change Your Condition. And it is 
um, a, a, it was written by Imam Zaid Shakir and Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. Um, so Alhamdulillah, I have the text with me and I'll show you in just a minute. Actually, before I screen share, I should do that since the, the camera is nice and big so you can see it. So this is the text. So Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and Imam Zaid Shakir uh, wrote this and it is really a life uh, altering transformative text that just covers so many different topics. And so I'm really excited to jump back into it because we kind of, uh, we almost closed out chapter two last time. There is a couple more things to talk about, but we're going to begin chapter three, which is on the practical steps to change our condition. So uh, if you don't have the text, I definitely advise you to get it because um, it's just something that everybody should have at home. Um, and, but also it will bring you up to speed so that, you know, what we're going to talk about moving forward. Um, so look into that in the uh, the next week or so, if you, again, are new to the class and you'd like to stick around, inshallah, I think it'll be a great thing to do to pre prep you before we come back after break. So with that said, I'll screen share, bismillah, and we'll pick up where we left off. So just give me one second here. Um, here we go. So this is the uh, presentation, but we are quite a little bit ahead here. So we almost, yeah, we were on this last slide here. So actually, the last slide, if you go back, by the way, MCC Alhamdulillah records all of these sessions, so there are recordings available. You can go back and watch them, just kind of follow along. But the last slide that we talked about actually were was this slide. It was on uh, the different enormities, um, which are, of course, you know, the, the sins that we do with the, the different limbs that we have. And so we ended on this slide, and then the very last slide for Chapter 2 were recommendations um, on how to achieve or reach sincerity. And so these are just general advices, um, but again, very important for all of us to reflect on. Uh, the recitation of the Quran, first and foremost, that is the first advice. You know, if we really truly want to be sincere and we want ikhlas, inshallah, all of us want ikhlas in our ibadah and in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we cannot uh, underestimate the uh, importance of of really committing to a daily practice of reading the Qur'an and really thinking about its meanings, uh, inshallah, if we're able to. And then if we're not able to contemplate its relevance, um, then to at least recite it. You know, some people, maybe because of language limitations, um, they're, they, don't, they can't really, uh, you know, go beyond the recitation. They, they may be, I mean, I know I have family members who don't read uh, the Qur'an from the text because they were never taught and they're much older and it's very difficult for them or they have vision problems. So there could be a, many, many reasons why why someone can't commit to actually uh, doing more in-depth, you know, reflections on the meanings. Um, but if they're not able to, if you're not able to do that, then the least that we should be doing is reciting the Quran and really finding a routine and a rhythm that is that works for us. Everybody's schedule is different. Everybody's abilities uh, may range based again on on your experience or how much you've studied. But, you know, it's important to note that learning tajweed is one of the fardain. It's one of the obligatory uh, deeds or, or actions that we must all do as Muslims. And so, you know, in this day and age with so many opportunities online uh, to learn, um, you know, the, the, once upon a time, it may have been much harder for people because they didn't have access to knowledge. But now that we are in this uh, very, you know, connected world uh, and we have all of this access, we should take it very seriously to learn the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make sure that our recitation is done correctly. Um, before, you know, we, we leave this world, it's one of the, again, the line that we should commit to doing, or at least make the intention and start uh, looking around, shopping around, as they say, you know, ask around, you might find friends or, um, you know, community members that have that know someone, maybe there's someone in your community who is willing to teach you. Maybe, uh, of course, right now we're all in quarantine, so they could do Zoom sessions, they could somehow figure it out and be willing to pay if, if they ask for that, because this is something that is really important. And, uh, you know, don't get, uh, don't let that be a barrier to, to learning is, you know, try to find, and there's very reasonable programs. I mean, uh, I know many international programs now, um, that will accommodate uh, schedules, even if it's really late for them in different parts of the world, Pakistan, Egypt. I know uh, people who use different services. I've used different services. I still actually use 
uh, services uh, for my children that are international and they're very affordable. But the point is, is to make sure that you really take it seriously to recite the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the correct way. So tajweed becomes a priority. And then learning du'as and you know supplications and litanies or awrad, right, or du'as, these are very important to commit to. Um, I have written several posts on my social media about the importance of committing to a daily formulaic set of prayers. Again, this is all what our teachers taught us uh, for many, you know, many, many years ago, that we need to rely on the protective du'as that the Prophet ﷺ left for us. All of it is from the sunnah. And throughout history, all of our great ulama had this practice. They were very committed to regular, you know, recitation of the, the du'as and, uh, that the Prophet ﷺ left for us. And we know, alhamdulillah, our deen is complete. So from the morning, you know, time uh, the, that we wake up in the morning until we go to sleep, throughout the day, there are du'as to say at every point, you know, what, no, regardless of what we're doing. We leave the house, we eat, we get dressed, um, and going into the bathroom, leaving the bathroom. There are so many different du'as um, that we could we, we should memorize and learn right waking up uh, going to sleep uh, so uh, finishing our meals drinking right all of these different activities that we do throughout the day we should know those du'as and really commit to them and then the specific protective du'as that will protect us from all the evils and harms in the world so when we do these things regularly you know we recite the book of Allah subhanahu wa and try to really focus on its meanings, or at least get in the practice of regular recitation. And then we recite the du'as and the supplications of the Prophet ﷺ left for us. All, obviously, all of that benefits us in, in more ways than one, um, but it also inculcates the sincerity because now our claim of faith is proven by our uh, the follow-up of our actions, right? Where it's aligning. You know, a lot of people uh, are nominally uh, faithful people, right? In all uh, tr religious traditions, you have many people who will, you know, uh, claim to be a part of a faith, but the proof of one's faith is certainly in one's actions. And so that's how you want to think about it. And here, of course, the Prophet is uh, through these uh, hadith that he's left for us is re-emphasizing the importance of learning the Qur'an and, uh, of course, teaching it if you take it to the next uh, level. If you do know the Qur'an, this is also an incredible way to gain um, many, many rewards uh, is to teach the Qur'an. So those were the last, or that was the last section of chapter two. And so again, we're, we're back to now the text. And so the chap chapter three is titled Practical Steps to Changing Our Condition. So up until now, we've really been talking about, I mean, if you look at, Chapter one, right? We talked about taqwa, um, its definition and benefits. Chapter two is about the heart and its treatments. So it's really starting from, you know, the foundational uh, 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 beliefs that we should all have about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how to uh, inculcate, um, you know, taqwa, and then, of course, to, to prove our sincerity. So working on purification of the heart, working on uh, matching again or aligning our deeds with our, our beliefs. So now we're getting into more practical, everyday, day-to-day -day activities that our uh, beloved teachers here, um, Sheikh Hamza and Imam Zaid, have left for us in, in terms of really taking it to the next level, sustaining your faith, right? Because all of what we've been doing now is talking about how to purify and really try to um, maximize uh, the, uh, our potential in terms of our, our own devotion and our own beliefs. But now it's like, how do you sustain that? Well, let's look. Let's look at what the advice is. So chapter three, practical steps. So there are a lot of different sections in this chapter, which um, each section has a lot of, uh, you know, just amazing advice. And I've gone ahead and made this um, you know, slide just for us to kind of look at all of the different pathways, you know, practical things that we can do to, again, solidify, fortify, sustain, maintain our level of faith. And so let's, you know, just look at some of these. The five pillars, of course, we know. This is, you know, uh, Islam 101. We all know that you have to um, know what those five pillars are and know how to regularly tend to those every day, our prayers, our fasts our zakah, our hajj, of course, our testimony of faith, all of that is essential to the um, to sustaining your faith. But then also we look outward, right? Because that's very internal work. But then you want to look outward. So there's the active outreach or da'wah that, we, that we'll get into, the uh, focus, cooperation, good character, right? Coming break. So you'll see this theme ongoing 
throughout the text where, uh, especially from this point forward, where there's this back and forth, back and forth, this uh, emphasis on outwardly, you know, doing things practically, you know, basically, uh, you know, actions that follow that, that prove one's faith that benefit not just you, but other people, right, being good stewards of, of the earth. Um, but then it brings it back inward. And so you'll see this repeatedly and, and hear, um, you know, kinship, families, maintaining ties, you know, so important, giving charity. A lot of that is outward, right? Then we bring it back to the Quran. We bring it back to the remembrance of Allah, commanding good and evil. Again, we are, you know, doing that outwardly. When we see injustices and things that are wrong, we should be speaking up. Empathy, it's another very outward uh, action, you know, to be empathic with people is to feel their pain and to try to remove burdens and to really be selfless and to think of others, right? And then we bring it back to supplication, physical health. We bring it back to our own uh, taking care of the amana that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, being committed people, respecting time, our attitude, devotion. So all of these really um, great topics are covered in chapter three. Uh, now, obviously, we're not going to have time to go through all of them. So uh, we'll just do the best that we can in, in this hour that we have. So let's start off right away with the first one, the five pillars. So this is, again, remember, the point of this chapter is to, for you to sustain your faith. It's, it's The whole book is about agenda to change our condition. So if you've done all the internal work, or at least you're working on those internal things about, you know, purifying your heart, you need to also realize that burnout is real, right? Spiritual burnout is very real. And we also have a sworn enemy that will do everything possible to prevent us from moving forward, which is why we have to rely on the jama'ah. The jama'ah is very important in Islam. Uh, you know, we're, we're not, uh, we are a deen where pretty much everything we do in, in many ways, if you think about it, there is that group component to it, right? When we pray, of course, we have our own uh, internal, very deep dialogue with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we're praying, but we're also encouraged to pray in jama'ah as often as possible. Uh, when we fast, we fast in a month. Uh, we should fast as often as we can. Of course, it's very beneficial, but uh, there, the emphasis of fasting in Ramadan is that we're doing it as a group and everybody's doing it together. We go to hajj together. So the jama'ah is, is very important in helping to sustain the momentum and to uh, to take us to the next level so that we're always growing. So right away, you know, uh, the advice is that we we uh, form a, a serious study group to learn the five pillars. And this is really good advice too for all Muslims. You know, as, as you know, I said it in the beginning that it's kind of 101, but if we're really being honest, this isn't just something that converts should be studying, right? Every, all of us uh, can benefit from, you know, just reviewing and making sure that we have a clear understanding of the five pillars, the spiritual components, the benefits of them, and really looking at each one and trying to uh, perfect our practice of those things. So when we talk about the five pillars, you, you don't have to simplify it as something that, you know, like we teach in Sunday school or, you know, even in, in non uh, in secular schools, that's one of the first things they'll teach you about Islam. You know, that there's five pillars of Islam and you'll see a lot of references to that. That's not, you know, that's not a very deep uh, study of the five pillars. It's just naming them. But when you take, when you form a study group, this is actually looking at, uh, you know, the more, uh, detail, the, the, the more inter intricate aspects of these five pillars and really getting a detailed understanding of it with guidance, of course, looking at what our great scholars of the past advised, how to do the prayer, for example, just the prayer alone, to have a halaqa on the prayer alone, this would be impossible to cover in one session. It would have to be ongoing. So you could break it up. And there's many, many different ways to do it. But the point is, is to Take it seriously for yourself that I need this to sustain myself. If I'm feeling those, um, you know, spiritual low points, maybe it's because I'm trying to do all this by myself. But if I form a group with two, three, four, five, maybe uh, just a small circle, it doesn't have to be a big giant group. And I know, mashallah, there are many people throughout um, the country or world who are blessed to have uh, sahba, you know, good, good companions. Uh, that they can do these things with, and maybe they meet with them regularly. You might already have a halaqa that you're a part of, which is great. Um, and if you do, alhamdulillah, I'm sure you feel the weekly or monthly or biweekly, whatever, 
sustenance you're getting from that group, you feel the benefit of that. And in its absence, you also feel, you know, that that, uh, the effect of that. So this would be really for people who don't have that and they may have never thought of, of, of doing that. And I've, I've certainly um, had many, many instances where I've given this advice of creating halaqas and not to get intimidated by the idea that, oh, I'm not a teacher. I don't know anything. You know, what do I, uh, what, what can I teach people? And so a lot of people, they get deterred because they think, You'd have you have to be qualified with you know a certain amount of knowledge in order to do something like that, but you don't. You know, study circles are exactly what they are. Just like in college or in school, when you are a student and you're learning, and you realize, hey, I learn a lot better when I work with groups. It's the same idea. So you're an equal member with your peer group or whichever group you get together, and the purpose of it is to enhance the, uh, you know, the the studying instead of just being on your own and getting burnt out or kind of not being motivated. So there's immense benefit of it, and then of course you look to the to the you know the the texts that that like agenda change or condition purification of the heart, all these other great texts that can offer you guidance on what to talk about, what to uh, study together. You know, book just reading a text together, or even listening to. I know people who've done that. They will get together in a group, but then their study is the uh, drus of another scholar. So they'll listen to. Uh, scholars, you know, that's, and then they'll talk about it. It's like a discussion group. So there's so many different formats, but the point is, is take it seriously, take it to the next level, make sure you have a jama or a circle that you study with. And then here, the second advice, once you reach adulthood, it is required to learn the fardain, the individual obligations, which I mentioned earlier, one of them anyway, which was the uh, tajweed and the five pillars at a starting place. So you know, this is for uh, for our young children even. We should inculcate this in them that they should have knowledge of these things uh, when they reach the age of, of adulthood and maturity and that they know that these are very important things. And then, um, you know, back to, again, what we should be focusing on for our own development. We should learn aqidah or creed. What does a Muslim believe in? You know, what are the six articles of faith, for example? And what do we believe about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? What do we believe about heaven and hell? What do we believe about the prophets and about the scriptures? All of those things are very important and we should commit to studying them from sound traditional sources and teachers, but making sure our understanding is solid. And I would say, you know, just in my experience with working with the community, and I say this a lot, um, uh, that I really think a lot of, faith crises that we're seeing today is because people have uh, don't have very solid creedal understanding. Um, they may have learned, you know, just some basic things growing up or through their family or even, you know, in their local communities, but they haven't formally studied it. And there are, alhamdulillah, uh, you know, texts available, but I would, I would definitely encourage uh, you to look into studying it with someone who's qualified because there will be questions that you may have and you want to, you know, make sure that you you uh, get those answered correctly. I had actually someone reach out to me um, just earlier this week. It was a very deep Aqidah question. And, you know, it was on an Instagram direct message. And so I just replied to her. She was really struggling with certain faith concepts. And I just told her, you know, that the questions you have are very deep. And, you know, it's difficult to have a textual exchange about these things because they're very deep, high level. But I referred her to a clip um, of, of one of our teachers discussing the very issue she was asking about. So there are there is great content, alhamdulillah, online, and there are classes being offered. You just have to, you know, find out where people are teaching aqidah and try to, uh, you know, make sure that, again, they're, they're good sources and, and sign up because it will really help you to understand your place in this world and how to react accordingly. Because if you don't understand the design element, for example, of this world, or that's a, that it's ephemeral and it's fleeting and you shouldn't attach your heart to it, right? Then you, you may uh, be susceptible to things like, you know, the spiritual diseases like hubba dunya and because you're not seeing it for what it is, where when you study aqidah deeply, you'll understand the value of this dunya the, and, and, and especially when you contrast it to the akhirah and you start to just have a better grounded understanding instead of getting swept away. So it's very important to study Aqidah. Of course, the prayer, making sure that you understand the fiqh 
of tahara, of salah, of making sure you know how to pray and follow a, a madhab and, and, and make sure that you are doing it according to, again, how it's been done for, for hundreds of years and uh, that there's a consistency in your practice, you know, making sure you pray on time and that you uh, have that solid, inshallah. And then zakat, fasting, pilgrimage, all of those, again, as we talked, the five pillars that you have, that you've studied it um, as as part of your own journey, that this is something that you really did formally study. And then as you learn, you practice what you learn. Pretty simple, but you, you take yourself um, seriously. And I think this is something I've heard our teachers uh, say, which is an important little note to make, um, little side note. But, you know, we live in a time and era where there's just so much, um, you know, frivolity and everybody's just constantly joking around and entertaining themselves and eating and, you know, consuming and finding all of these ways to not take life very seriously. Um, you know, watching sports all day, watching movies all day, listening to music, uh, browsing, shopping, all of these things we do. Of course, we have to live in this dunya. But as Muslims, we know to do these things um, in moderation and when you know necessary. But that's not why we live. We don't live to do those things. We live to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we see that in the world that we live in, there's so much running away from responsibility, running away from uh, serious subjects like death. You know, nobody wants to talk about death. Nobody wants to talk about things that are too serious, you know, because it, we're also conditioned to think that life is about fun, fun, fun. Well, it's not. It's about taking, you know, responsibility for yourself, realizing you will be held accountable, um, making sure that you watch what you say, how you behave, but holding yourself to a really a higher standard than just being silly and trying to have fun all day. That's not the purpose of life. So you want to practice what you learn. You know, it's not enough to just learn something, um, absorb it, and then repeat it to other people. You have to put it into your own practice. So very important piece of advice. And then when all of these things with regards to those five uh, pillars are, are solid and you really are practicing what, you, what you've what you learned, then you go on to other aspects of fiqh, which are the rules of marriage, you know, buying and selling, um, and any other sections that would pertain to you specifically. You know, there's different people in different circumstances, but if you um, you know, need to study certain areas, that would be certainly uh, something that you should look into. And so that becomes your focus, right? That you're taking uh, account of what you know, what you don't know, and you really are trying to become better. And that's how we should all be. Every day or every month, every week, we should look back and feel like we're progressing because we're doing something. And that doesn't have to, you know, be a big monumental change. You know, we don't, uh, big changes are, are hard uh, to, to, to sustain, but doing smaller deeds, as we know from the hadith, is, is better, right, than just kind of going, um, becoming very, you know, super, uh, super religious uh, overnight and, and trying to, or ambitious and, and taking on too much, and then you go back to your ways or completely go the opposite direction because you're burnt out. So certainly not saying that, but you want to just keep yourself always um, per moving forward and feeling like I've been, I've been doing better than I was, right? If you're the same person or relapsing to, to worse, then there's something off. And that's what should tell you, I need to start doing something differently. Right. And then, um, go on to more advices about, again, related to the five pillars, commit to studying Arabic. So if you're able to, again, important to know how to read and write Arabic, Arabic is a language, um, it's obviously one of the, the greatest languages, if not the greatest language, because it is the, the language of the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, but in terms of study, you know, uh, many people who are, uh, subhanAllah, not even Muslim will, will recognize its beauty and its utility. So there's so much usefulness in studying um, Arabic, uh, you know, if you can. Um, just, uh, you know, some people have a knack for languages and it's easier for them. Other people, maybe they're not very, you know, that's not uh, easy for them, but you can at least learn the basics. And the basics in this case, which would be the most essential uh, part of learning Arabic, is tajweed, to make sure that at least you know how to recite the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you want to take that further to the next step and learn grammar and all of that, inshallah, of course, that would be uh, great. Um, so then the next um, 
advice here, we're going back to the slideshow, is to study at least one sacred text on purification of the heart. So there are different, um, you know, texts on, on you know, Teskiyat and Nafs, uh, and the one that we may uh, have heard, I've, I've certainly referenced it several times because it's uh, very much connected to this text agenda to change our condition, is the book that was translated by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf called Matarat al-Qulub, uh, which is um, Imam al-Mawlud's book um, on the purification of the heart. Um, and Sheikh Hamza uh, did a t- translation and commentary of this book. Uh, and so I have it actually right in front of me. I always have uh, the books that I think are are really, um, you know, just we should have them in every Muslim home library, at, you know, easy access for me because I, I do speak often and I like to refer people to them. So hopefully you can see this, but here it is again. Again, I'm posting this for people who don't um, are l- listening for the first time or may not be familiar with this text. This is um, the probably in my estimation anyway, because I've seen it. Uh, the most popular English, uh, written for the English audience, book on the diseases of the heart, and mashallah, and it's an incredible text. I, I love it. I actually have several copies of it. Um, I just think that everybody should have this this book, um, and you can learn teach it to children. I actually did a children's class uh, on purification of the heart. It's available through the MCC website. If you go through the playlist, you'll see it there. It was, um, I think we did it during Ramadan of this past year. We did, certainly did it this year, but I'm not sure. I think we did do it, yes, during the month of Ramadan. Uh, but check that out uh, for if you have children. Very important to teach these subjects to your children early on because, you know, you want to prevent your children from forming habits that are destructive. And that's the reality of the human being. We're creatures of habit. And so once we start, you know, doing something over and over and over again, especially, you know, in that, those formative years, right? Children before puberty are just kind of, you know, in in their own world. But once they come to maturity, they do start to solidify their personality, their temperament, all those things come together. And so you want to make sure that they are very aware of the potential, um, you know, shortcomings or, or, or spiritual pitfalls before them and recognizing the spiritual diseases, knowing its signs and symptoms, and then of course the cures is very important and critical uh, to help them overcome their nafs. Because you know, mujahid and nafs, or the struggle with the self, the ego, is the lifelong struggle all of us have. We all go through this every day, every um, you know hour, minute of the day. We're struggling against. Our uh, our base carnal desires, our you know our irascible self, the part of us that is quick to anger, um, that's just you know irrational or uh, you know just doesn't isn't thinking about long term uh, you know b- benefits. We have we all have our nubs, the ego, right? It's thinking about immediate pleasures, and uh, it can be very uh, indulgent and selfish. That part of us is. A barrier between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So f- for us parents, the best gift we can give our children is the tools that they need to overcome that part of us. And the earlier you start, the better. If you wait for your teenager or child to yeah reach, you know, mid-teens or late teens or early adulthood, and they've now have five, four, six, you know, years or seven years of bad habits. Um, it's harder for them to regulate themselves. But if you inter, you know, introduce these things early, then inshallah ta'ala, you can really help them to learn to pay attention to their thoughts, learn to pay attention to their inclinations, their desires, learn to self-regulate, learn to control those impulses. And inshallah ta'ala, that will really tremendously pay off for them, spiritually speaking, um, you know, as they grow older. And so if you have never studied as an adult the diseases of the heart, then certainly that's something that you want to look into and say, I, I need to n- understand what they are. How, what does Islam say about spiritual diseases? Because, you, know, uh, you know, other traditions, they have the same ideas about spiritual diseases, but they may vary, uh, you know, here and there. But, but alhamdulillah, our scholars identified 25, 26 different main diseases and um, how they, some of them are very subtle. And, you know, unless you really know their definitions, you may not know that you have that disease. So once you are aware of it, 
then it's like, whoa, I, I had no idea I had that disease. Astaghfirullah, may Allah forgive me. But a lot of these things are, again, um, all available in this in these texts, but this particular one, Purification of the Heart. So I encourage you to get that if you don't have it. So do that, you know, at least uh, once in your lifetime. I mean, you should, in my opinion, we should be studying this as often as possible and putting it into practice every day, but at least try to get the book and read it through once so that you have uh, some understanding of it, inshallah. And then um, in this case, or the last advice here, a qualified licensed teacher is always recommended, but if not available, find a study group based on humility and the ability to say, I do not know when necessary. I love this advice because it kind of, you know, what I was saying earlier about starting halaqas, you don't, it, it's not required to have a teacher that is you know, more knowledgeable or that has certain um, licenses in, in certain areas. It's not required. Of course, it's ideal. Certainly, if you can find someone who has that, join those groups. But if you don't, then you should just form that group with your friends or people that you know are committed and just agree to this philosophy that we have humility in this group and we're not trying to prove ourselves to anybody. We're here to study together. And if we don't know, we don't know. We can look to uh, getting answers from Again, those who don't know, as the Quran tells us, right? If you don't know, ask those who don't know. So this was the first um, section for chapter three, practical steps to change our condition. The next uh, section. So again, if you look at what I was saying earlier, this is a lot of it's focused on oneself, right? Again, we're working a lot on improving ourselves. Now we look outward. So it goes back to that, you know, inward, outward. So the this is active outreach. Um First step here, and again, the advice, you have to think about where you are on your journey. This may not be right for you right now. Maybe you just entered Islam and you're like, wait a second, I've got a lot to do. This is all, you know, it's not necessarily in any particular order. It's just giving us advice on how to move forward in our journey. So some people, they may have worked a lot on those internal you know, uh, 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 just uh, working on themselves internally. So they're kind of, they're ready now to move uh, forward or move outwardly. But if you're not ready, don't worry about this, but it's still valuable to go over. So first point here, create an active outreach Dawa program designed to produce results. So if you feel like, alhamdulillah, you've been practicing the deen consistently five, 10 years, you have a really good rhythm, you're really committed, but you want to do more. You feel there's this calling or something that's compelling you to do more for your community, more outreach. This is where you start. So you may want to look to, you know, does your, first of all, your particular masjid have a program in place that is focused on outreach and that one. And if so, alhamdulillah, you know, you can join them, sign up as a volunteer and figure out what your part in that uh, group would be. Are you uh, going to take a lead position or do you just want to be called on for certain events? But you kind of have to figure out what is best for you. Um, but if you do have that leadership you know, impulse and you want to start sort of start things uh, that aren't there, then here's advice number two. Reach out to the non-Muslim community through teaching, doing community work and feeding others. So you can start to you know, take your, um, again, those, those, that feeling of wanting to do more beyond just yourself and look to what other, uh, community groups are in your particular area and see if there's a way to collaborate with them. I know there are much, there's a lot of, uh, great interfaith groups and churches, synagogues, um, temples, other groups that do do things together. And this is really important. I think in this day and age when religion and religious institutions and religious groups are attacked so fervently. And, you know, there's a lot of, um, unfortunately, really negative mes messages uh, that, that are directed towards religious groups. I think it's important that we do band together on those things that we have in common, or, you know, shared values, shared principles. So obviously feeding people um, and just doing outreach is really important. You know, I was very fortunate, alhamdulillah, when I uh, first came into Islam, I met some great uh, pioneers in our community here in the Bay Area, uh, trailblazing women that I credit to. I call them my my sheroes. Uh, but we have people like Sister Amina Jandadi, Sister Maha Al-Janedi, mashallah, who started the ING Islamic Networks Group 
And I remember I was, uh, you know, I, I believe I was either fresh out of high school or very like first year of college when I became aware of their work. And I um, attended some of their sessions where they would go to churches or schools and speak about Islam. And, you know, I was so impressed by seeing these very strong, empowered Muslim women speaking to uh, non-Muslim audiences about Islam, but in a very, just a beautiful way, in a way of, um, you know, of not their, their intention was not to convert people. It was just to educate. And so I was just really impressed by, by their, um, their skills and their knowledge. And then a few years later or shortly after, I actually ended up working for ING for a while um, and it was really great to learn, you know, on just be on the ground. And, and uh, you know, I was a speaker. I spoke with them as well. I, that's kind of where I started a lot of my public speaking. But I learned so much, not just from them and all of the other great speakers, but also the, the non-Muslims that I had access to, going to churches, going to police stations, going to different, you know, events that we were invited to, high schools, colleges. It was really great because you uh, just see it, it increased Alhamdulillah, your, it increases your faith to do those things because you see this healthy pride, you know, that you, you start to have uh, about being a Muslim and just really wanting to share your faith. And so interfaith work, it's not for everybody, but if it's something that does call to you, then look into it and see how you can start. And I would absolutely say ING is a wonderful resource if you go to their website, ing.org, they have so much wonderful content. You can reach out to them and tell them if you're interested in learning more about how to get some of their resources and think about even opening. I'm actually not sure if they still do that, but when I was working with them, they had chapters all throughout the country of, uh, of different affiliates that were working with them. So you can see if it's something is lacking in your community, but you want to do it, that's certainly an option for you. But the point is, is to feel you know, to, to do it right, right? To do it right. So here, you know, point number three is something to talk about. Or point number three and four relates to this. So work to allay the fears of the dominant community and show them that we're not a threat to anyone's safety. As we know, because of Islamophobia, it's real. There is a, a very targeted attacks against Muslims and Islam. Um, to have that, you know, mission to say, I'm going to, you know, just do whatever I can, work with my community, work within, you know, my, uh, even if it's a school setting, like sometimes people are maybe not um, connected to their local masjid or the, the large scale, but even working in smaller efforts, like, uh, you know, at your children's school, uh, but somehow making that part of your mission, which is I'm going to make sure that, you know, people realize that I as a Muslim bring so much blessing um, because of my faith to whatever I'm involved in. And so this is why it's so important that we work on ourselves because when you're part of a group you're and representing that group, you should uh, have the highest standards because not only is your person, you know, being uh, represented, but you're also representing your faith. And so ihsan, itqan, doing things right. So when there's school meetings or boards or committees, if you belong to them, doing it just with that intention. I'm going to show up on time. I'm not going to come in late. I'm going to let these people know that I'm an asset to this organization. And so I'm going to hold myself to that high standard and inshallah, make sure that they realize that I bring so much value. And so that's a beautiful intention that we should all have in everything that we do because it's a slam, you know, just having, like I said, high, a high standard is part of our, is a big part of our faith. So doing things correctly. And then the, the next point, point number four, when we present Islam at the institution level, whether again, it's because we're doing interfaith work or just in our own private lives, in our schools, in our neighborhoods, in our work, that we do it with the aim of educating and informing, not trying to convert people, right? Because our faith is not one of, you know, where we go and proselytize or, or try to convert, you know, outwardly. We invite people to see the beauty of Islam through our, inshallah, good character, our care and concern, our, our desire for the common weal and really wanting to benefit people, that they want to know more about our faith because we're representing it beautifully. So that those are the intentions when we talk about outreach, interfaith work, any type of contribution you're making to your community, that you do it with that intention. And then back to a more intimate, you know, intention. Again, in our personal lives, 
we should be proud of being Muslim and we should be open to discuss and share our faith with others. You know, for example, you know, when you're, I know many people have over the years and I, I've worked with non-Muslims, I've worked in corporate settings. So I know um, that things have drastically changed. First of all, like when I was, you know, much younger, there weren't a lot of representatives or, you know, like Muhajibat, for example, in my community, of, it's grown exponentially since then. But it was hard to be a muhajaba when very few people knew what that was or what that meant. And of course, um, you know, prejudice was real. All those things were very real. I experienced it. So I know, and I know others have experienced it. So it was hard to sometimes have open dialogue about religion. And we know also in this society, there's certain taboo topics, right? So, and I would say that's still in place with certain things, but you know, you don't openly talk about politics or, or religion and, and certain things that are very private affairs, people tended to uh, not really be receptive to those discussions, but we've changed. You know, the society has shifted so much now that people are very open about their lifestyle choices. They're very proud. Identity politics is real. Everybody's out and showing up with their symbols, you know, whatever those symbols are, they're very proud of who they are. And so we as Muslims I mean, we sh we didn't have to wait for all of this to happen. We should have always had that um, that you know sense of of honor in our faith and and alhamdulillah feeling like we do want to share it with other people. But even more so now that all of those barriers, societal barriers and norms have sh have moved away, and we can openly discuss things. Things then, then why not? Why not talk about um, you know, for example if you're fasting during Ramadan, instead of shying away from telling your coworkers because you don't want to make them uncomfortable. Oh, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of things over the years where people are, you know, just trying to navigate these things and they don't know how, but they, it's a lot of it is, you know, I don't want to bother people. I don't want to impose. I don't want to impose. Well, you're not imposing if you just tell your coworkers, oh, I can't attend the company lunch or dinner because I'm fasting and I need to break my fast. That's not an imposition. That, I think we need to, to reframe the conversation. Um, what you're doing is just being honest and truthful and you're uh, being open and proud of who you are. Um, but also if you need to pray, you know, how many people don't pray in their workplaces because of fear that mm -hmm. they're going to be misjudged and, mis you know, the, the, there might be consequences. Oh, I, you know, might affect my, my relationship with my boss or my coworkers. You know, if I have to keep taking breaks, I don't want them to think I'm slacking off. I have heard every excuse that people have. Um, but fundamentally it comes down to, you know, you're not praying because maybe there is a hesitancy to share aspects of your faith with people. You want to address that and figure out, you know, what is it? Is it really, you know, is, it, is there a shyness there that I need to work out? And actually, if you study the purification of the heart, you'll find that one of the diseases of the heart is what we call blameworthy modesty, where there is a sense of feeling, right, um, embarrassed in certain circumstances when you shouldn't, and you become shy or, you know, it's, it's, there, it can manifest in different ways, but there is a bit of cowardice um, and, and it's considered a disease of the heart. So if that's the case, you want to have honest conversations with yourself and then say, well, you know, if I change that, if I start to be more proud of my identity as a Muslim, you know, you wear hijab or you have a beard, you wear a kufi, they're brothers, mashallah, who represent, who are out there very proud of their identity. They're, so they're outwardly clearly Muslim, but then also they're happy to tell people, oh, I don't drink alcohol. Uh, yeah, we, we don't, you know, we, we don't shy away from topics like that. And then if you do that, guess what? Your children will also learn from you so that when they're in high school and it's prom or uh, some other social event and someone asks them why they can't attend or can you come to this party? It's a mixed party they can be very strong to say, yeah, I don't do parties. I don't date. I don't do those things. I'm a Muslim. And there's no conversation beyond that that has to be had. You know, they don't cower when those conversations come up. So it's so important that we have um, that understanding of real just pride in who we are, not pride in the sense of we think we're better than other people, but that we are very honored, you know, alhamdulillah, uh, Islam, right? It's a dua that we should say every day. Thank God for the blessing of Islam, that we're so honored to share our faith with people. 
and to talk about things openly, Ramadan, Hajj, you know, not to minimize conversations. I've been in those situations where I can see the discomfort that some Muslims have around non-Muslims when talking about faith. And it's sad because, you know, they shut down the conversation sometimes. Oh, let's not talk about that. It's okay. Don't worry about it. And it's like, no, that maybe that person genuinely wants to know, but you've um, assumed or you've projected your discomfort onto them. And then the whole conversation has gone. And that person could have maybe benefited. Maybe they would have, you know, learned more and, and been interested more, or they would have uh, helped to counter all of these lies against Islam and Muslims because you gave them the knowledge to do so. So the point is, is, in our own personal lives, let's have, let's show up more, be more courageous to talk about things. Of course, with decorum, with uh, proper understanding, time and place for everything. You know, you don't want to take over a board meeting or an important staff meeting just to do dawah. No, and that's not what we're talking about. But it's more not shying away from those conversations for any reason, but being proud of your Muslim identity. And then, you know, the sixth point here, which is also really important, is that we should try to be collaborative people, you know, instead of just starting something um, on our, you know, on our own, just because we like control, you know, we just want to do things our way, it might cause further problems and how many, you know, communities have suffered in that way, because um, there were people who may have had initiative, but they didn't have that, that foresight to see, hey, you branching off and doing something on your own may actually affect you know, an existing group or an existing uh, you know, organization or something that's doing that work already. How about reaching out to them first and seeing if there's an opportunity to collaborate and being, that's the spirit with which we should do things. You know, it's not about me. And, and I think we have to get away from centering individuals in these types of uh, efforts. You know, it's not about the individual. It's about the the greater good. And in the case of starting up an initiative, whatever that may be, if you think it's something you want to do, Always look to see what's already in, you know, in, in, in existence in your particular area and see if you can work with them first. So this is, again, a great summary, great guidance on how to actively do outreach in the best way with hikmah and uh, with real, you know, just an order or, or a way, an organized way of doing things. Now, in the time that we have, I'll try to do the last one here that I had prepared because I only I, I knew we weren't going to get through all of them. So we'll do this one. Uh, focus. So now, uh, alhamdulillah, it's bringing it back to, you know, it's kind of uh, bringing it back to oneself, right? Uh, but also focusing on the work that we're doing, but just giving us guidance on how to focus our intentions here. So the first point, and it's it's a bit of an extension of the previous slide, but it's it's uh, let's let's look at it. So find an area of concern that instills a passionate response, and begin to work to alleviate the respective obstacles to produce change in that area. So there's a lot of people, and I would say maybe you know new Muslims may feel this a lot, or just parents who are looking to get their kids involved. You know, I work a lot with parents and families. So I know sometimes around those teen years, parents are like, oh gosh, I don't want my kids to be, get, get caught up in all those terrible, you know, things that, uh, behaviors that a lot of teens can, risky behaviors that teens can get caught up in. So I want to preoccupy them. I want to get them involved in the masjid. I want them to start volunteering. Do you know any things that they could do? Well, whether you're doing it for that, for your own self, uh, there are people who've retired and they may want to, you know, use their time. Alhamdulillah, they've worked. They're now in, in those, you know, comfortable years of life where they have ample time. And so they want to start to do more outreach or do something with their time. So this is really good guidance for all of those different, um, you know, people. Or if you're a young professional, there's some people who are students, college students, or, um, you know, even high school students who are working towards building their experience, you know, their, their, their CV, and they want more experience. So whatever your ania is, and whatever phase you are in life, you want to make sure that there is whatever you get involved in, it's passionate to you, you know, and there's some people who are very politically active. So they, an organization like CARE, may be right up their alley, because they're politically activated. They, as soon as something comes up about politics, that, you know, they perk up. Other people are more uh, oriented around relief work. So if you find yourself wanting to do, 
you know, local relief work, soup kitchens, you know, all those things, you know, pantries, helping build pantries and, and feeding, you know, working with immigrant communities uh, within your community to try to help new immigrants or the you know, things that are relief oriented. Alhamdulillah, there's a lot of potential there. Some people um, love education, you know, so if there's a way to teach and to go out and to uh, offer people, you know, workshops and different, you know, ways of, of teaching them something, you can do something. Orphan relief, you know, there's so many different organizations, but you want to make sure that the where you give your time to, uh, which whatever organization or group, it really does come from the heart and it's something that you're very passionate about. And then figure out, again, what you can offer in terms of time, resources, money, guidance, uh, knowledge, whatever you have, inshallah, those organizations will benefit from. But pace yourself. Don't, don't again, go overboard. Um, always be aware of that impulse to do too much, too fast, too soon. Uh, because a lot of times the, those are from, from shaitan. He knows that it's like a pendulum, you know, push, push us into something really fast, then uh, it'll overwhelm us. And then we just back away. And you see people do that, you know, they'll just want to do it all. And then all of a sudden they disappear. So uh, this is where being aware of yourself is important. Recognize the power of one do, you know, a lot of the, the wonderful organizations that we have, even the masajid, um, alhamdulillah, in our community, oftentimes if you go back and you read the, uh, the history of that organization, it's usually one or two people who were grassroots, bare bones, had nothing, very limited resources, um, but had so much high himma, right? Had a lot of ambition and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them tawfiq and now they're you know, have multi-million dollar organizations or, you know, groups or businesses or whatever. But the point is, is they, they started with that strong intention and with that trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so never um, let shaitan take that away from you and make you think, oh, I can't do anything. Because there's a lot of people who have great ideas, but they don't really go far with it because they let these thoughts of, oh, it's not going to happen, deter them, you know, but there is immense power in one. Uh, and of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is proof of that, right? He is one. So uh, that, and, and it's mentioned here in the book as well um, about focusing on that. They said, let me try to find that section. We should remember that the greatest, um, oh wait, sorry, that's not the right section. Um yeah, it is Allah's number. And everything good in this world of human endeavors was initially one individual's intention, action, and vision. When there is commitment with sincerity, creation moves to serve the purpose. And we must keep in mind that actions are judged by intentions, right? So very important to remember that. Also, we must work on changing ourselves. So now look, the advice even subhanAllah within the advice is bringing it back to ourselves. You can do all this outreach, do all this focus, try to find every cause or any, you know, a cause that speaks to your heart um, and have high ambition, but you have to commit to changing yourself first. You know, if you're trying to go out there and make the world a better place, but internally you haven't done the work at all or aren't really doing the work regularly, then, um, you know, you, you don't really have a lot of weight in your words, right? Or as they phrased it, little moral authority in demanding of others what we ourselves fail to practice. We, if you don't have those changes that you're, tr you're speaking about, you're trying to go out there and, and, you know, inspire other people with, if you're not even doing those things, then you, you have no authority to speak. So focus on improving oneself, committing to making those lasting changes constantly, this internal and external, you know, dialogue. It's always about what, what do I need to improve? What can I do to improve the world? But make sure that they are always at play and you don't leave one for the other. Then the greatest struggle is speaking the truth in the presence of unjust authority. We know that this is a, you know, it's very difficult. Most people um, struggle with this. All people, I would say, struggle with this. But I love how they took a different direction using this uh, very commonly understood idea, right? That it's it's one of the greatest things to do is to speak to someone who's unjust. But here, what do they say? This includes unjust authority at our own lower self when it disobeys Allah, subhanAllah. So when your nafs, takes over you and prevents you from obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
it is an unjust authority. And so you have to speak against yourself, you see? Uh, so actually being able to admit that you make mistakes and that you do wrong. And you don't have to go out and scream it at the mountaintops, you know, on the mountaintops or, or confess your sins to other people. But when you look at yourself in the mirror or when you're sitting there on the prayer rug, it, hopefully with your head, you know, hung low in humility, that you recognize with with internal shame before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where you've gone wrong and you are willing to rebuke yourself, you know, to really take ownership of those things. Um, and then the last point they made here is that the internal struggle or greater jihad is really purifying ourselves. So constantly reminding ourselves that that is lifelong. We need to be doing this. We're never going to get to a place where, you know, we're done with, uh, with mujahid and nafs. It is an everyday process. And that's why we have to revisit, toil away, work hard, and, and why it's so important to have these continuous conversations and a jama that we can work with. So alhamdulillah, wow, we are almost at the end of the hour here, mashallah. So let me uh, stop share and I will go ahead and open up the uh, Facebook page here. I don't know why I closed it, sorry. And I'll see if there's any questions, but inshallah, um, again, for those of you who are joining us, thank you. This is, we're still in the early part of chapter three. There's a lot more sections to go. So when we resume, inshallah, after this break and in the new year, we will pick up with um, with uh, chapter three from where we left off. So let me just quickly see if there are any questions. Um, oh, I realized I forgot to share the this on my page today. Hi. I'll share, it, I'll share it afterwards, but bear with me while I open up this page. And then in the meantime, I can also go to YouTube. So I hope you enjoyed today's session, inshallah. Um, and let people know if you have any, uh, you know, non-Muslims who are looking for a group, I hope inshallah, you know, that they can benefit. So please feel free to share with them. Um, sorry, let me, so I see some questions here. Assalamu alaikum. I need help learning the rules of marriage. Mashallah. So there are um, classes, you know, on uh, fiqh classes. I think I would certainly look at groups like the Rahma Foundation um, because they offer regular classes for women on a variety of different topics and fiqh is absolutely included in that. So uh, I can post their name for you. Uh, inshallah, it's called the Rahma Foundation. They are uh, here in the Bay Area, but they have online programs that anybody can join. Um, so inshallah, you can benefit from them. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm at the MCC page looking for the live video, but I don't see it. I don't know if um, it was posted, this talk. I hope it was, but I don't see it um, on YouTube. Hmm. That's odd. It's usually here. Yeah, I don't see the live feed on YouTube. So, um, Brother Salman, if you are listening, I don't know if you're there. Is this, is it available on YouTube today? Because I don't see a link for it. Brother Salman, I don't know if Brother Salman is there. Okay. Well, if you're on YouTube, I am sorry. I don't, I cannot find the link on YouTube. Um, it's not up or I don't see it. So I apologize um, if you are there and I don't see your question. But khair inshallah, um, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you and thank you for being here. You can always uh, send in your questions if they're urgent or you have any um you, you would like, uh, you know, any, uh, if there's a specific thing that you need, just let me know. You can check with um, MCC's uh, info, I think, email, and inshallah, they'll get it to me. Uh, but for Facebook, I only saw that one question, um, so I don't see anything else. But I do thank all of you for sharing your evening with us here at MCC Sunday evening. Um, it's nine o'clock, so inshallah, we will end in dua. And I look forward to seeing you guys next year after the new year, inshallah, in, in health, optimum health, the best of health. I hope all of you are, are stay, stay, stay safe, you're, you and your families, inshallah, and, uh, and that we resume, inshallah, in, better, in a better condition. 
Um, so let's go ahead and, and end. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, I'm sorry, one second. Oh, sorry. Uh, give me one second. Now I feel bad because I just got a message from Brother Salman. I, so Brother Salman, I saw your your WhatsApp, um, but where is the YouTube link? Because I don't see the YouTube link there. But are there any questions? No questions? Okay. Okay. Khalas. He said there's no questions. Thank you, Brother Salman. Jazakallah khairan. So we'll go ahead and end in dua. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shahadu wa la ilaha illa anta nasakhfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Allahumma salam wa salam wa barik ala Sayyidina wa Mawlana wa Habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa salam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam tasliman kathira. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. ولا عصر إن الإنسان لا في خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر الحمد لله thank you so much everyone inshallah again we'll see you guys next year I know that sounds like it's a long way off but it's only a little over a week so uh, may Allah subhanahu wa taala again protect all of you and your families and your loved ones inshallah have a wonderful uh, remainder of your year uh, and we'll see you inshallah soon السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته um, for those of you who are joining, we are covering a very important text called Agenda to Change Our Condition, which I have right here in front of me. And what I'm going to do, inshallah, is uh, screen share because we're going through some slides that I've created. So let me go ahead and... Uh, uh, share my screen if you just give me one moment. All right, so as uh, I'm just going to do a quick summary because some may be joining again, and I want to bring them up to speed. So we're on, we're in this, we're reading this text together called "Agenda to Change Our Condition" by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and Imam Zaid Shakir. We're uh, on chapter three, which is titled "Practical Steps to Change Our Condition," and we've covered so far. Um, let's see here, we have. The five pillars, active outreach, uh, and focus. That's what we, and I'll go back through the slides here. So we covered these three uh, slides last time. So it was about two weeks before, right, when we met. So we have um, these three that we went through for today. We're going to continue with chapter three. And actually, let me go back to this slide. Uh, in this chapter, this the, this is all, uh, it's, you know, there's several sections in this chapter, and so the, these are all the different sections. So that's where we cover the five pillars, active outreach, and focus. And so now we're going to, inshallah, do the next four se uh, sections here, and we'll talk in depth. So I'll go ahead and read from or get to that slide. So the, the slide for today we're going to do is cooperation. So this is, for those who do have the book, it's on page 29. So if we read this uh, particular section of the chapter, it talks about the, and I'll just go ahead and read, this religion is based on recognizing the abilities of the believers that constitute the ummah, the Muslim community, and facilitating the use of their respective gifts. We need to understand that if one person focuses upon an area that differs from our, our own area of concern, he or she is complementing our own work and not detracting from it, by not joining us. So this is, you know, again, practical steps to how on how we can change our condition, right? So we need to understand the importance of working together with our fellow community members, the people in, uh, you know, around us so that we have mutual goals and we don't see one another as in any way a threat or a, you know, competition, but rather we see that we all have the same basic desire, which is, inshallah, to do the work, the good works that will please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that can be in many different forms, right? There's people who are um, very politically activated. There's other people who do relief work. There's other people who enjoy teaching and grassroots, you know, uh, work, working within the community. So everybody has their own niche or their own calling, and we should respect that and also see that, inshallah, we're all part of a larger body, the ummah, and we uh, have to respect one another. And so this chapter or this section is really about cultivating that. And so, you know, again, if you continue uh, to, uh, point three here, to not see individuals or organized groups as competitors or antagonists, but rather, again, as brothers and sisters working towards the same purpose. And really, they go into a lot of detail about just the importance of the 
inculcating that love for one another, you know, through the, all of the sunnah that we're taught, you know, spread peace, right? We smile, so smiling is a sadaqa. So when we see one another, whether it's in the masjid or at events or just, you know, in the grocery store, when we know that people are working for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we wish them well, that we want their success, but that we're genuine in our love for them, and that we really uh, are, are about seeing one another as part of, again, one body, that ummah. And that there's so many hadith that reinforce that idea to always, right, that the, the ummah is one body. If one part of the body hurts, the entire body hurts. All of these hadith are to remind us to really see one another as being part of something great and not to in any way let those divisive feelings enter our hearts where we start to uh, compete or astaghfirullah maybe even do worse than that right to um to uh deter people or to to ruin or somehow affect the progress of other people's works there's you know people all the billah may allah protect us from those diseases of the heart that would lead to that but there are some people who um you know may sabotage another person's efforts just because they uh, don't see them as uh, as their brother or sister, but rather as a competitor. So really trying to rid your yourself from that. And they go on to say, so there are many paths to Allah and he guides those who struggle with themselves for his sake alone. We should not see other Muslims, either individuals or organized groups as competitors or antagonists. Rather, we should see them as brothers and sisters and either work with them or work separately with amicable relations, the least of which is giving them the greeting of peace with a smile, right? Our communities suffer from an unhealthy competition, viewing another's failure as our own success. We should all hope and pray for the success of any activity that is good in nature and beneficial to the aims and purposes of sacred law. So for example, competing masajids or, you know, um, organizations or even businesses, you know, subhanAllah, if you have, you know, a, a restaurant or some other business that you don't see another Muslim who has a similar business or restaurant down the street or in another part of the city as being your competitor, but rather as another believer who inshallah is providing, you know, the, community members with halal uh, risk and is inshallah you know putting halal income in back into the community so you always see the fruits that th these fruits will reach everybody but instead of just looking at your own personal maybe um you know uh, your own personal issues that you may have you know those we have to work out right so really getting rid of those those feelings in the heart and then they go on to say, Islamic work through diverse organizations should never be the basis for negating the bonds of brotherhood and sisterhood established between us by Islam. When that happens, we are no longer doing Islamic work, but are engaged in politics. So, you know, um, really may Allah protect us again from fitna, from in any way being a part of fitna, because we may be part of, you know, some organization or a masjid or other, you know, school or something else. But if we allow politics to enter, you know, um, the community and to cause divisions and, you know, parties and, and a lot of breaking up, then obviously, um, we're not doing much, you know, to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we may in fact be held accountable for our part in all of that. So we should really seek refuge from that. We should speak well of other organizations or be silent about them. You know, instead of trying to take down or discredit or, you know, just uh, uh, cast a, a negative um, you know, um, opinion or, or perpetuate maybe gossip, astaghfirullah, never do that, right? Just with, with anybody, uh, let alone an entire organization, right? Um, once we recognize that most of them are engaged in a different aspect of the same struggle, we come to respect their efforts. Now, we, it, there does, you know, there's uh, some space here for thinking, you know, if you feel that an organization or an individual may be all the billah doing something wrong. Of course, that's a different situation, right? So if some appear to be or actually are misguided, then we should offer counsel and pray for them. If they have deviant positions or beliefs, then we should request that qualified scholars clarify with clear proofs what those deviations are. In doing so, such a scholar must not use personal opinions, but rather those of the rightly guided scholars of our tradition 
who are recognized by the scholars of the past. So when there are, again, those people who may be doing something questionable, you want to always have the right approach, you know, casting people out or, you know, what now is very popular, which is cancel culture is, um, you know, it's really tragic because it's, you see uh, communities being really affected by that. And I've personally spoken with community members who have a hard time with their faith when they see fitna or people being canceled or entire organizations almost being shut down because of some scandal or what have you. Um, and most of the time it's because, you know, the approach to these situations is off. We should try to always seek you know, to uh, to fix the situation with good intentions, not just to uh, want to see something go down just because we're unhappy or upset or angry about it, but rather thinking of the collective uh, benefit or the collective harm, and, and that's where we make our decisions. So if there's going to be a collective harm, then of course we should be very careful, make sure that we approach the individual or the organization with discretion, uh, you know, request meetings privately, try to approach them that way first. And then, you know, however um, the consensus is to proceed, at least doing it that way, inshallah, the consciences are clear and we can avoid, um, you know, some really uh, horrible uh, things from happening. So just to make sure that we know that there's protocol and that protocol, we should follow that always with the best of intentions, inshallah. Rare opinions of one or two scholars that stand in disagreement with the majority of scholars on a given issue must not be used at the cost of unity through diversity, though the opinions may be valid. If it turns out that there is a difference of opinion among our scholars regarding the issue, then we should leave it for the sake of unity and not argue or fight over it. However, if it is indeed wrong by consensus, then we can bring it to their attention wisely and with a sincere desire to help them. So you can see the intention and the counsel here is to always seek to do things without causing bigger problems, right? To have the most minimal uh, effect, you know, that you can possibly have. Give the counsel, try to, uh, of course, um, you know, make sure that the right opinion is issued and, and is understood, but not to argue, not to fight, and not to let it, uh, you know, have ripple effects that, that affect the entire community. We ought to keep in mind that Musa a.s. was commanded to go to Fir'aun and speak to him with a gentle word, which is, of course, uh, chapter 20, verse 44, and this is advice for all of us, really, because giving advice is something that not everybody um can do. It really isn't. We should learn how to, I should say, uh, you know, just because you, th you want to correct someone doesn't mean you're the right person to do it. Because if you don't have the gentle or right approach, it could actually cause a further, a bigger problem. So you want to make sure that you're somewhat aware of the the you know, art of giving this, yeah, how does one do that? Being gentle again, not having, um, you know, um, not ac being accusatory right off the bat. You want to uh, approach it very just in, in doses and steps and make sure that you're aware of how to do that in the best way possible. And so this reminder is good for all of us just in general, but especially those in the community who may be charged with this responsibility to correct another individual, a public figure, a teacher, someone in the public eye, or, or an organization on an issue that's controversial, that person should absolutely know what, to, what how to approach it. And here's the advice, right? To be gentle, but of course firm, inshallah, and try to not cause further problems. And then they go on to say that, remembering that we are not more righteous than Musa a.s. and that our brother or sister is certainly not farther astray than Fir'aun, we can approach the matter with gentle humility and a genuine desire for the well-being and guidance for all. And that, again, is the mutual benefit, right? The collective benefit, inshallah, for everyone. We have an example of this gentle approach when Imam Ali sent Ibn Abbas an, to reason with the seceders, the Khawarij. Ibn Abbas an, su succeeded in guiding thousands of them by providing clear proofs. This mass repentance lessened the severity and length of the conflagration when the two forces met on the battlefield. 
So it's just, a, you know, from, from the history. We cannot view other Muslims as objects of hatred, no matter who they may be. If they are Muslims, they have the sanctity of Islam, and their name is to be honored, unless a situation obliges us to condemn an act or position that is in contradistinction to the sacred law and tenets of universal Islam, as opposed to sectarian views of Islam. And then, moreover, we should not listen to or partake in backbiting Muslims or people of other faiths. And I think this is really also very important counsel that, you know, backbiting or any negative quality, lying, you know, in and of itself, they're, they're blameworthy, they're wrong, they're haram. It's not a matter of the object, right? Sometimes people think, oh, well, if it's a non-Muslim, why does it matter? Oh, they're kafir or they're this. No, that's, you're, re you're reflecting the, the disease within yourself and the target of it is irrelevant at that point. The fact that you do it, the fact that you back by the fact that you lie is the problem. It's not who you're lying about. And so this distinction that we should not harbor negative feelings towards Muslims, but also we should not um, allow our these habits to extend to people of other faiths is very important. It's just wrong in and of itself, right? If it is necessary to point out deviations, to clarify them, we should do as the, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. On occasion, he declared, what is wrong with the people who do such and such? So when the Prophet would want to correct something or, uh, you know, someone's behavior, he would never out them. He would never mention their name in public and uh, stuff in any way, embarrass them or humiliate them. He would always focus on the issue. And so this is a very wise, mashallah, way of addressing the problem without speaking directly to the individual. Right. So that is certainly acceptable. And of course, we should be tactful and mindful of how the phrasing and the words we use. You know, you want to make sure, um, like our teachers would remind us, not to use identifiable or identifying language. You know, if you're speaking about a specific situation or incident or organization, you don't want to, you know, in any way reference things or give clues that would lead people to know who you're speaking about or which organization you're speaking about. So, you, you know, don't, you got to be tactful and very general in your, in your delivery so that people can't draw their own conclusions. Cause otherwise you're just, you know, um, you're contributing to further maybe suspicion and unwarranted uh, suspicion or gossip and those things. So you want to just keep it to the issue itself. Right. Um, we should also be vigilant in avoiding stale and sterile debates that have persisted for centuries and produced little benefit and much harm. Really, argumentation is there's plenty of hadith and proofs against arguing. It's really uh, blameworthy. It's something we should avoid at all costs. Healthy, you know, productive discussions are different than argumentation, right? In addition, we should avoid labeling people, right, or groups such as Salafi, Sufi, Wahhabi, for example, as these engender animosity. Name calling is condemned in the Quran if the intention is contempt. So if you are referring to a group of people and in, in your delivery, it's clear that you don't like them. Uh, this would fall under this. And, you know, may Allah forgive us because sometimes, again, we think we're in the right. You know, there's sometimes you see something that may be deviant or you just don't agree with and you feel justified. You know, why do they do this? You know, anybody who's been to the sacred lands, for example, you may have seen things or heard things that really bother you or trouble you. But if you are using those labels, again, in this way, this is what they're speaking about, that we have to be careful from that. If the intention is to elucidate a position, then we must examine our intention and also our level of understanding. Mo most of us are not capable of debating with any legitimate authority whatsoever. Imam uh, Raghab al-Asbahani said, disputation is detestable for scholars and those close to Allah. So what is to be said of the argumentation of the uneducated and foolish? Consider the words of Allah to his prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he said, debate with them with what is most excellent. This is in chapter 16, verse 125. So this is all still, we're still talking about cooperation. They've given, mashallah, more than, you know, two pages, almost three pages to this section. And it's because there is so much fitna that we already see in our community, but also to uh, hold ourselves accountable uh, so that we're not, um, you know, in any way participating or condoning or blind to what, what is behavior that would 
uh, billah be blameworthy on us. So all of this is really important to consider. Uh, then uh, they go on to say that thus Allah did not permit the Prophet Sallallahu to dispute without stipulating that it be with kindness and in a beautiful manner. Moreover, Allah describes the Prophet Sallallahu as being a vast ethical character and disparages argumentation in his words. Right. Uh, this is chapter 43, verse 58. They did not say it except to argue. And in another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, from among humanity are those who argue about Allah without knowledge or guidance or an, illumin or an illuminating book. That's uh, chapter 22, verse 8. And then uh, always they say, heed the advice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you find those who ignorantly discuss our signs, then turn away from them. That's chapter 668, verse 68. And Imam Malik said, عنه, he said, disputation is not from our religion. So this, all of these verses, all of these proofs, all of these quotes are to re reiterate the point of not falling into disputation, argumentation, especially when you uh, don't have the knowledge and you're not in a position of authority to do that. May Allah forgive all of us. And you see this a lot now, maybe not so in the masjid or in the community, um, per se, but a lot of it is online. You can go to anybody's, any of our scholars' pages online and you'll see trolls, you know, people who are, that's all they do. They just, look, you know, go around nitpicking, arguing. They've lost adab. They may even address the scholar in a really uh, contemptible way, just really lacking basic um, adab because they think that they have a position that's uh, superior or better, or they found some mistake the scholar made and they're ready to just cancel the scholar. You see this all the time online. It's very, very toxic behavior. And this is demonic behavior. It's not part of our tradition. So may Allah protect us from that behavior. And when we see it, we should certainly not encourage it. You know, you see some people liking this, these comments. Of, it's just vitri vitriol. It's just pure poison. Um, and you'll see a bunch of likes and you're just like, subhanAllah. So the one who's doing it, you know, subhanAllah, they, you know, at least they had, they, they were able to speak up and say whatever they wanted to say, even if, you know, they were wrong. But the cowards who um, don't say anything, but then fan the flames by liking and forwarding and sharing and spreading the fitna, those are also, we have to make sure that we don't do that. You know, because that's the, it's just as worse, if, uh, bad, just or just, uh, potentially even worse because you're spreading the fit, all right? So all of this is on the section on cooperation. Now we go into the next uh, slide here, which is on good character. And this is just a shorter um, section, but of course, reminder for us all, right? We must inculcate good character in our daily lives and always display courteous behavior with Muslims and non-Muslims alike. This is again, reinforcing what was previously said about just being a good person and not falling into, uh, you know, bad character flaws with anybody, Muslim or non-Muslim, it doesn't matter. We should rid ourselves of those character flaws and really display the best character, inshallah. The most effective outreach is good character. This is that if we want to do effective dawah to our family members, you know, there's people who have non-Muslim family or secular family, people who are just not practicing, um, you know, giving them lectures is not, really effective. You know, you can uh, guilt people. And I, I've seen it unfold in front of me, but I've also seen people um, really get worked up because, you know, so-and-so doesn't pray or they're not fasting and I get so mad and I can't help myself. And they get really worked up because they feel so justified to correct their family member when they're, um, you know, uh, when they're heedless or they're they're disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we have to be very careful from that because everybody's at different levels. And there's also, this is where, go back, going back to the point I made earlier about nasiha, not everybody um, is able to give nasiha because it takes patience. It takes understanding. It takes emotional intelligence to know where people are at. Are they emotionally stable? Are they even listening? Are they receptive? Are they having a faith crisis? You know, is there something going on? Um, if you're not aware of that and you're just, you know, caught up in your own self-righteous indignation and anger and frustration, then you may very well push them further away from Islam instead of, you know, what you may think is this tough love approach. So within our family, when it comes to Muslims who may be not practicing, we want to be very careful. And then, of course, outside of that, our neighbors, our coworkers, um, the people that we meet in, in this markets or wherever we go, 
we want to remember that the best dawa is not, you know, we're not people that, you know, go and force our, our faith on people. We don't proselytize everywhere we go. We're not preachers. We invite people, right? We invite people with good character. We're kind, we're patient, we're um, gracious. We uh, are, you know, generous, we're hospitable. We have all those, inshallah, prophetic qualities. We, we try to inculcate them in ourselves and we should display them so that when people meet Muslims, they are impressed and then they may inquire like, oh, wow, you know, or they're just curious, like, why are all of these people so kind or why do they treat their elders with so much, you know, respect or their children or all the beautiful things that we learn from the Prophet, so I said, I'm this will hopefully make them want to learn. And that's how we can do effective da'wah. And then they go on to say that with good character, people achieve levels of proximity to Allah that even those who are persistent in praying and fasting have a hard time reaching. SubhanAllah. That's really, you know, just a powerful reminder for all of us that the ritual acts, of course, they're far, they're important, we have to do them, but they are many times, you know, they're self-serving. They, they, they're, we're fulfilling our obligations to Allah and they benefit us. But when you, you know, suppress your, your, uh, or when you're, you're patient with people who are difficult or you're displaying these beautiful character qualities that may require restraint, that is harder oftentimes to do, right? It's a sacrifice. You're actually, it's, it's more of a mujahida. So people who have really great characters, mashallah, they've gone through, uh, they're disciplined people and they oftentimes do suppress themselves for the sake of, you know, the good, the sake of the other. And that is why there, there's so much immense reward in that. So that's the point here is that you could really advance in your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by having really beautiful character because the mujahida is so sincere and it's really truly difficult whereas some people may pray and fast but they don't work on their character and they don't really excel right they don't get as as a head because they may be impatient or rude or just you know and we've all i'm sure had incidences with people who outwardly look practicing but they just didn't really leave us feeling good you know and that's that that should be a sign when you're with a believer someone truly sincere you should feel good in their presence you should feel positive you should feel their light you should feel love genuine sincerity have the love all those beautiful qualities but if they constrict you and they make you feel bad, they chastise you, admonish you, or they speak ill or other things, um, even if they outwardly look the part, then clearly there's a problem there, right? So good character is very, very important. This is the most uh, you know, important thing that we should all be working on every single day, inshallah, to achieve. So then he goes, uh, I'm sorry, then they go on to the next section. So good character, again, very short section. This is on page 31 now for those who are following along with the text. The next section is on kinship. So we should strive to maintain excellent kinship bonds and forgive the shortcomings of our relatives for the sake of Allah in hope that he may forgive our shortcomings. The sacred bonds of blood must never be severed. One of the greatest of the major sins is filial impiety, which is prevalent in modern society. So we know what filial piety is, right? That's al-walidain, so serving our parents. Well, this is the opposite, right? Relationships are a trial from Allah, and the Quran reminds us, we have made some a tribulation for others. Will you show patience? This is chapter 25, verse 20. And they say, family is difficult, subhanAllah, right? Family is difficult, but the rewards of kindness toward family are immeasurable in this world and only realized in the next. Moreover, the least harm that is accrued from severing kinship bonds is a life of penury. So, you know, the fact that, and I, I guess because uh, in my work, I've, I've deal with this quite a lot, actually, you know, people have complex relationships with either their parents or their siblings or, uh, you know, mother-in-law or father-in-law or someone in the family. And a lot of times um, they feel that the only thing to do is just cut that person out of their life. And, you know, they don't have time for them. And there's a lot of just intense emotions and, um, you know, they want to, they're protecting their own interests. And so it just seems like the easier 
uh, route to take, right? To just say, I'm done. I'm not going to bother anymore. I'm cutting this person out and that's it. Well, we're reminded over and over again that, you know, cutting ties is one of the kabat. It is actually considered, a, a, you know, a grave sin. And so we really, an enormity, we really want to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, protect us from that. But also to just remember that, you know, the Prophet ﷺ told us in a in a sahih hadith, and this is uh, related in the, um, the Musnad of Imam Ahmed, that the believer who mixes with the people and endures their harm has a greater reward than the one who does not mix with the people nor endures their harm. So this is a really powerful reminder for us that, you know, in some cases, the family member who gets on your nerves, who maybe asks too many questions, who's you know you know prying and always you know into your business, and or you just don't really like to be around so much, um, not coming around or causing you know problems with the family because you just can't handle that person, um, you don't like that person, uh, is actually you know less. There's it's you're you're not getting you're you're losing out on so much reward. Here the the hadith is clear. If you go and you sacrifice your comfort for an hour, half an hour, however long it is, just for the sake of your parents, let's say it's an uncle or an aunt or someone that is close to them, but maybe you have no connection to, and you're there and you're just going to take a little bit of that discomfort for the sake of your parents, just imagine the immense reward in doing that, right? First of all, you're pleasing your parents, but then on top of that, as this hadith reminds us that you're enduring that hardship. And so the Prophet is promising that the reward is greater, right? So remember that if you have to be around people that are challenging to be around instead of just wanting to uh, to take the easier route. Because, you know, again, it's very, in this society, if you look at the, you know, the, the breakdown of the family bonds, it's just everywhere, you know, people don't talk to family members for decades sometimes, or they've lost touch with aunts, uncles, grandparents, um, and they don't really think twice about it. But then, you know, you'll know the value of your family over other friendships or other relationships that may come and go. Even marriages are not uh, sometimes they don't last, right? We know that divorce, divorces are very common. So, you know, sometimes people think that giving up their family um, is worth whatever they're going to get, you know, peace of mind, or because of this relationship I want, I need to, you know, give up my family. But the reality is, is those relationships um, are oftentimes conditional and you know, they may not, may or may not last. Whereas with family, in many cultures, traditional cultures anyway, there is this unspoken sort of understanding that even if you don't agree, even if you have very, very different lifestyles and just beliefs or, or, you know, you don't, you just don't see eye to eye on a lot of things, the bond of family keeps you together. And so, you'll be able to call on your family when, God forbid, you're, you know, facing some hardship. Maybe you have a debt or a health problem that you didn't know about, and all of a sudden you're in need. You know, how many people have, have, have had their lives saved because of a family member who stepped in, not because of that friend or that roommate or that coworker that you maybe, yes, enjoy a rapport with and you get along with and you, you know, everything's fine. But again, when uh, the going gets tough, that's when you really know, right? who uh, who is there for you and who's not. And oftentimes it is your family. So we have to really appreciate um, appreciate our, our families and not take them for granted. And so this is the reminder. And I apologize. I just realized there's a, a, um, an, a little typo here on this slide. This should be kinship bonds. I don't know what happened here. I was, uh, I clearly missed that, but so that's the, this is the slide on kinship. And then right after this uh, particular section is it follows up, you know, kinship of course has to do with, you know, extended family members. Uh, but now we get, bring it a little bit more closer uh, with regards to the actual family, right? And so the next section is called families. Um, so here they mention that we're obliged by sacred law to treat our families and especially our spouses with the utmost respect and dignity. The Prophet ﷺ said, the best of you are those who are the best to their families. 
A man is judged in this religion by the honor and love he shows his wife and children. Wives should treat their husbands with respect and flexibility. For most women, the spiritual struggle of this life is within the confines of home and family. According to the tradition, to bear this with patience and righteousness is to obtain the reward of a warrior for the sake of Allah. No room whatsoever exists in the Islamic tradition for domestic abuse or violence. The home is a sanctuary, and if the wife and children do not feel safe, it is not a Muslim home but a jahili house, and jahili means ignorant. Violence toward family is clearly prescribed prescribed in the sacred law, and the blight of domestic violence must be uprooted from our communities. Um, this is a really important section also to think about because, you know, there are so many homes where there's immense um, strife and conflict, and you wouldn't know it because we've gotten to a point where people um, are very consumed with their image, right? So social media, of course, adds to that. But even prior to social media, reputation, right? You want to have a good standing with your community members. Uh, you know, I'm an upright citizen. I go to the masjid. I do this. I do that. I volunteer at my child's school. So you have parents who are very um, concerned or are very good about keeping those um, those appearances and making sure that they look put together and everything's fine. They'll show up at weddings and events and parties and uh, and other things, and you would never know that behind closed doors is a completely different reality. And this, of course, is troubling, just hearing something like that should trouble anybody, but also for the people who are living that lie. You want to think about your standing with Allah, you know, that if everybody in the community sees you with respect, um, and they come to you and maybe they ask you for advice. Maybe you have that position, right, of, of status and, and uh, importance and, and people, mashallah, turn to you. And so you, you're you feeling the benefit of all of that. But then in your home, you are a different person. You know, you are a tyrant or you're abusive and you use foul language and you curse and you, um, you know, just threaten and you withhold and you're very harmful, you're, you weaponize your words, your actions are, are harmful, then where do you think your reality is? You know, is it because the people all um, praise you and you have the, their esteem? Is that who you really are? Or is it that your spouse uh, may be um, displeased with you, may not, may have issues with you? Your children may be afraid of you. You know, think about that. Think of what your family feels about you, right? How they would describe you is really, I think, a good indicator for all of us to evaluate where we are with Allah. Like if you're, inshallah, your family members, of course, are upright and good. But if, if someone were to ask them, what do you think about this person? Are they kind? Are they compassionate? Are they patient? Are they... Um, you know, do they care? Are they genuine? Are they sincere? All those beautiful qualities uh, that we readily display to strangers, you know, subhanAllah, some people, um, it's like a switch. They can go outside their house and their neighbor, they can be so kind and just engaging and really chatted up and generous and willing to help their neighbors or willing to help their family members. I've, I've worked with many couples where this has actually been a really big complaint in the marriage that with other people, my spouse um, is so gracious, is so kind, and everybody thinks that he or she is just an angel, uh, you know, um, has the best character, and they all sing his or her praises all day long. But in the house, it's a different story. And I always, you know, that's to me very, it's just subhanAllah, we should all really wake up to that, to the fact that what what does it matter if we are good actors, you know, what does it matter? How does that say anything about who we are if we've managed to impress everybody outside our home or at work or in the community to assume that we are upright and kind and this and that, if to the people closest to us, we are the complete opposite. And this is actually a reality. That's why we have, you know, domestic violence um, is, a, is a very common problem, unfortunately, in our society and certainly in our community. We have shelters, we have 
Uh, and it works both ways. I actually know of, um, of male, you know, males who have been abused or have been in, been in situations that are incredibly toxic and they have had, um, you know, uh, they've been threatened and they've had their rights taken or, uh, you know, th those things have been threatened against them. So they've been forced in really difficult circumstances, forced to accept conditions that they wouldn't normally accept. Uh, because of a threat that was a real threat to them, their finances, their their standing, you know, stuff for a while. There's a lot of very vindictive um, behavior that can happen in, in marriages sometimes and or in divorce situations. And we have to really ask Allah to protect us from falling into that type of a delusional state where we, you know, think we can get away with it, these things, you know, within our because nobody knows about it, right? Um, and and then go outside and present ourselves as something else. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees everything and we should fear Allah in that, you know, every injustice, every harm, harmful word, every harmful action is accounted for. And uh, he, you know, will certainly take us to task over those things. So not to get too comfortable, um, especially, for anybody in a, a marital situation who has more power, you know, we really want to think about what that means because it's not just about physical power anymore. A financial power is also very big. You know, that this is probably more of an issue in many marriages that the one who um, has more financial power tends to wield that power and they can sometimes be um, unjust because of it, right? So you want to be really... Uh, aware of these things that uh, how your spouse, your children see you is really telling about who you really are. And if you feel that there's been complaints, you want to work on those complaints. Because like I said, if social media, you have a great following and you're getting all this praise or in the community, like I said, people are just always turning to you and they make you feel like you're just the greatest thing ever. But in your home, that's not consistent then none of that is relevant because they don't have rights over you, right? Community members and strangers, but your family, your spouse, your children, they absolutely have rights. So those are the people that you want to prioritize and make sure you're impressing them and that you're, the best of you is, is to them. And this is why the Prophet tells tells us right here, the best of you are those who are the best to their families. That He didn't say the best of you are those who are, you know, the best in their communities or have the most friends, you know, um, or have the most titles and and get the most praise. That's not what the hadith says, right? And so really important to uh, hold ourselves accountable, inshallah. And then this last comment about domestic abuse or violence, you know, subhanAllah. Um, I've worked with so many couples and sisters over the years. It's uh, certainly, I agree 100% with the wording here, it's a blight in our community, in our world, and we have to do everything we can to remove it. So one of the advice or, or you know, something from my experience I'll just share is making sure that when, if we know that someone is in a situation where we think that they are either being emotionally, verbally, or Allah, you know, God forbid, physically abused, that we don't um, give them that advice of, oh, just be patient, you know, it's okay, be patient. Um, where we don't take their pain seriously, or maybe we are so uncomfortable with the situation. Somebody may turn to us and confide in us with their deep secret, and we just are really uncomfortable knowing that information and so we take that quick exit out of the conversation and say hey you know it's okay um, he'll change or maybe she'll do this and you just kind of give some you know just general advice because you want to move along from the topic you're not thinking about the person's well-being or their safety or what if you know there's children involved you're thinking about your own safety or I mean, excuse me, your own comfort. And this is wrong. You know, that's not Islam, right? Want for your brother what you want for yourself. So if you, if someone confides in you, you should really, you know, help them to get help. 
you may not be the right person, you know, and you shouldn't feel obligated to counsel them and check on them and do that, you know, because that's not for everybody to do. But the very least you can do is empower them to turn to the professionals in inshallah in the community or the services that are provided in the community where they can figure out what their options are. It doesn't mean that you're pushing them into a divorce and the family is going to fall apart. And now you're going to bear the brunt of all that. That's I think uh, in the line of thinking that a lot of people think, Oh, I don't want to be a part of that. You know, I'm just going to stay out of it because I don't want to be, I don't want that on my head, you know, that, that they divorce and the poor kids and everybody kind of takes the story to that extreme and so they recuse themselves completely and want nothing to do with it. But then they leave that poor brother or sister or, you know, situation, uh, they leave it. They just completely leave it and wash their hands clean of it. And then subhanAllah, we just don't, you know, there's so many ways that that story can end. We've certainly seen horrible, horrible uh, outcomes, the billah, where people's lives have been lost because nobody wanted to step in and, and do the right thing. So if we become aware of, of a situation of violence or any type that would even lead to that, uh, young couples, you know, if you know of a new couple where already red flags are present, encourage them, please, to be brave enough to speak up, you know, and that can be to their parents, to the people that, you know, are their appointed um, uh, mahram, if there's someone, you know, a convert, for example, or the community members that are uh, doing this type of work, whether they're a therapist or a spiritual counselor or someone who has the background to be able to advise them, but not to just turn away and be like, oh, not my problem, you know, because you could very well help, you know, that couple, inshallah, save their marriage instead of, um, you know, lead it, go, let it go down and, and into a really horrible, uh, worse situation. So anyway, uh, you know, just, uh, just a, an advice there about really being responsible with information that comes to you and putting the needs of the other people before yourself, inshallah, in your, in the advice that you give. So alhamdulillah, that, uh, concludes this section. So, okay, we're, sort of right on time. I'm going to go ahead and stop here so that I can see if there's any questions. Um, but again, I'm just looking over if there's anything else that I missed. So chapter three, we covered five pillars, active outreach focus, cooperation. Yeah. So alhamdulillah, the rest, uh, the next section will be on charity and we'll continue um, with the remainder of chapter three, inshallah. But let me go ahead and stop the screen share here. All right, alhamdulillah. So now if you just permit me, I'm going to try to go on here. And again, I'm doing this solo. Uh, Brother Salman, mashallah, was, had a previous engagement, so he was not able to facilitate tonight. But inshallah, he'll be back with us hopefully next time around. So let me look and see if there are any questions. And if there are, please do feel free to. I'm on, by the way, um, I, I'm not sure if this is broadcasting live to Facebook. I have no, or excuse me, YouTube. I have no idea. But I'm on the uh, Facebook page, so let me reload here and see if there's any questions or comments. Mashallah, salam. I see some lovely comments from some of you here. I just see, um, hmm, this is interesting. I see one, two, three, four comments, but it's saying there's nine comments. That's odd. I've never seen that before, but let me see if I switch this around. Do I see any more? No, I don't see any more comments. Okay. So I don't know where the other four comments or five comments are. I don't see them, but if uh, there aren't any questions, then inshallah, we can um, conclude and, oh wait, is there, uh, is it okay to ask a sister to make the off for a son or family member? Of course. Uh, of course, uh, we can always ask someone to make du'a for another person. There's nothing wrong with that, inshallah. Um, I don't, you know, you don't have to give the details, you know, if it's a private matter.